Hi everyone, I'm uh, Reno Vice Mayor Naomi Dewar and I just want to give you an update. We're scheduled to start at 10, we're just waiting for one of our colleagues to join on Zoom and then we'll have uh, a good number of folks to get started. So just be patient with us for just a little bit longer, thanks. Hey, Mickey, will you let me know when you're ready? All right, if we can... Just let me know. Are ready. you ready? Okay. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we do have all of our council members assembled, two on Zoom and four present. Um, I want to welcome you to the Reno City Council meeting. Again, my name's Naomi Dewar. I'm the vice mayor. Uh, the mayor is actually on the Zoom uh, joining us this morning. Um, we have a lot of people in the audience, and there's a lot of people outside. So I just wanted to alert you that um, as people leave the room, uh, more people can come in. So just be uh, aware, if you're here for public comment, that when you do give public comment, you might want to leave and give up your seat so more people can join us. We have a limit in the room for uh, what the fire marshal says we can have. Um, everyone out in the, um, in the foyer, um, there are TVs out there in several spots so they can watch what's going on and participate and it's, until it's time for them to come in. Um, the way our meetings work, since I'm going to guess several of you haven't been here before, is that we um, start with the Pledge of Allegiance, we have a roll call, and then we move into public comment. And at the top of the public comment, we have a special presentation uh, this morning that will take place before public comment. Um, what I'm going to do um, is to ask, um, first of all, our clerk, are you ready to move forward with our meeting? Is everything online? Madam Clerk. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. Um, everything is up and running at this point. I would just like to note, too, if you are out in the foyer and you'd like to make public comment, I have some city clerk personnel out there collecting comment forms. Um, and Vice Mayor Doerr did mention it, but what we would ask is if you are commenting and your comment is completed, please leave the room so that we can bring others in. Once the population dies down, we should have more seats able to like let people back in again later. But we need to make sure that we're getting um, due process to anybody who wants to make public comment first. Okay, thank you so much. And I um, am gonna start out this morning with the Pledge of Allegiance, and I'm gonna actually ask our city manager, uh, Doug Thornley, to lead us in the pledge if you'll join us. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, beautiful. Beautiful. So the next item will be roll call, Madam Clerk. Calling roll for Wednesday, April 10th, 2024. Councilmember Breckis? Here. Dewar? Here. Martinez? Here. Ebert? Absent at this time, Taylor, Here. Reese. Here. Sheevy. Here. Madam Vice Mayor, you do have a quorum of the Reno City Council. All right, thank you so much. And it's a great pleasure to um, start this morning with a very special uh, proclamation. And I want to call up uh, Leah Withrow, Eric Edelstein, and uh, if you will join us at the podium, please. Eric knows the way by now. <laughs> It's great to see you, Eric. All right. Well, I want to announce um, that I'm, I'm so incredibly excited to announce that Leah Withrow is with us today. She's just 28 years old. 
and yet she is known and recognized as one of the best groundskeepers in America for pro baseball. Let's have, and she's one of only four women who work as a head groundskeeper in pro baseball, and she's absolutely the best in the game. We couldn't be prouder to have a person of her stature in our community doing this important job. We have a very special proclamation for you, um, and I asked Eric Edelstein, our former assi assistant city manager, if he would read the proclamation. Wonderful. Is that green on or blue on? Green is Hi, good morning, uh, Eric Edelstein, for the record. Uh, pleased to, to read this proclamation on behalf of, of Mayor Sheevy. Uh, whereas Leah Withrow is the groundbreaking head groundskeeper for the Reno Aces in Greater Nevada Field, and whereas the 28-year-old Northern, Northern Nevada native is one of only four head groundskeepers in all professional baseball and is truly a big hit in her field, and whereas Ms. Withrow was recently featured in Forbes as a trailblazing female and groundskeeping all-star who won most prestigious award in her prof award in her profession when Greater Nevada Field was named the Professional Baseball Field of the Year by the Sports Field Management Association in 2022, and whereas after internships with the, with the Aces and Milwaukee Brewers, Ms. Withrow joined the Aces full-time in 2019 and quickly built a stellar reputation for her innovative techniques and excellence, including cutting, cutting uh, the shape of the Reno skyline into the grass for opening day just <laughs> last week. Now, therefore, on behalf of Mayor Hillary Sheevy, Mayor of the City of Reno, Nevada, do de hereby declare April 10th, 2024, as Leah Withrow Day in oh. the state of, or in the city of Reno. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, we're going to call you up for a photo in just a moment, so if you want to reclaim your seat, and thank you, Eric, for being here. Always great to see you um, and the job you do over at the Reno Aces. Um, we have a second proclamation this morning, or recognition, and that is I'd like to call Cody Shadel and his incredibly dedicated public safety dispatch team to come forward. These folks work incredibly hard to keep us informed about what needs doing. And I will remind you, when it snows, who is there on the front line at 3 a.m.? It is both our public safety, our, our public safety dispatch team, our um, public works team, and so on. But this is the team uh, that dispatches our emergency responders, everyone in Reno, to the job. Um, I want to thank you so much for what you do. It's an incredibly hard job. We all know, in fact, um, I think that the, uh, it is well known that um, the stress and tension that you experience in the job is only matched by the good that you do uh, for our entire community. So the professionalism, the strength, it deserves respect and admiration from all of us. Uh, you literally are a lifeline for all of our citizens, and I want to make sure every single one of you knows this. Uh, Cody, could you read the proclamation, please? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, Doer, and thank you for the kind words. Uh, so I, Coach Shadel, uh, Director for City of Reno Public Safety and Dispatch. You might want to come closer to the mic. <laughs> All right, try that again. Uh, so we'll read the proclamation. And whereas City of Reno Public Safety Dispatch is engaged in the operation of emergency services, re emergency response systems for Reno Police Department, Reno Fire Department, the University Police Services, Reno Tahoe Airport Fire, and the Reno Marshal's Office. And whereas these individuals answer calls for help on 911 and non-emergency lines for police, fire, and emergency medical situations, and serve as the critical link for the prompt response of our officers and firefighters in the field to save the lives and property of our citizens, and whereas calls include governmental communications related to all public safety and operations, amounting to an estimated 470,000 total calls handled for the year of 2023, and whereas public safety dispatch is the single vital link for police officers and firefighters and monitors their activities, providing information and ensuring their safety, and whereas public safety dispatch employees are dedicated and hardworking, often under difficult circumstances and with extraordinary workload. 
when whereas public safety dispatch is honored to serve the public daily and in countless ways that the community is often unaware of. Now, therefore, I, Cody Shadle, for Hillary Sheavey, Mayor of the City of Reno, do hereby declare April 14th through the 20th of 2024 National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week and in for the City of Reno and encourage citizens to recognize the professionalism and compassion of our public safety dispatchers and call takers who provide a vital service to our community. Yeah, thank you so much. And I'm going to ask the council if you'll join me for a quick photo with both uh, folks that we've recognized. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. We will now uh, get back to our regular order, and we're going to move on to public comment. And Madam uh, Clerk, could you read our disclosure, please? Thanks, Madam Vice Mayor. Apologize. We've got some craziness going on today. Okay, our first um, item today is general public comment. Members of the public may hear, observe, and provide public comment utilizing the following link, https forward, oh, HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash L-I-N-K-S period R-E-N-O period G-O-V forward slash capital C O U N C I L zero four hyphen one zero. It should be noted for those in the audience that comments are to be addressed to the mayor and council as a whole. Comments under the, heard under this item will be limited to three minutes per person and may pertain to matters both on and off the council's agenda. Council may not take action upon any matter not agendized on today's agenda. When you're called on for public comment, please state your name for the record and begin speaking. The timer will begin when you say your name and you will be afforded three minutes. For those participating in chambers in accordance with council rules 6.3.11, while in this room, please be respectful. Disruptive behavior from audience members like clapping, yelling, whistling, etc., which impede the meeting may result in a warning issued by the presiding officer. If the behavior continues, you may be removed from chambers. If you're an attendee in the Zoom meeting and would like to make public comment, please raise your hand at this time. 
Um, we do have quite a few public commenters registered at this time, so please make sure that you're ready to come up and speak on your turn. And again, we do have members out in the foyer, so if you can exit after your comments so the others can come in to participate. Our first public commenter today is Ron Trevor, followed by Terry Brooks, followed by George Campioni. And just a note, um, just because we have a lot of new people here today, several of us take notes, and it doesn't mean we're not listening. I always take notes so I can remember everything that's said. So if we're not looking exactly at you, know that we are taking notes and paying attention to what you're saying. So thank you, sir. Please proceed. Good morning. My name is Ron Trevor. I'd like to thank the council for allowing me to speak this morning. I'm a representative of SAVE, which stands for Senior Auxiliary Volunteer Effort that works with the Reno Police Department. Today I've got the recaps of the hours volunteered for the first quarter of 2024. SAVE currently has 73 active volunteers with another three in training. During the first quarter, there were a total of 4,223 hours volunteered by members of SAVE. This re represents a savings of $120,355 to the city of Reno. Some of the key areas that have been covered are as follows. We had 4,191 citizen contacts. There were 1,878 48-hour notices placed on abandoned vehicles. We had 955 school patrols. There were 398 handicap violation citations. Uh, stolen vehicles and fictitious plates located, there were 13. Any questions from anybody? Well, I'll just start. I don't have a question. We don't usually do Q&A, just again for the audience to know on a public comment. But um, the SAVE team works for us, and uh, they're incredibly valued volunteers. I had a privilege of attending the award ceremony uh, most recently where we recognized our SAVE volunteers and special awards to different members for the good work you're doing. So I just want to say thank you. Um, if anyone else wants to speak, just keep our comments brief. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Madam Thank Vice you. Mayor. Thank you so much, Ron. Terry Brooks, followed by George Campioni, followed by Jerry Mifsud. Good morning. It's me, Terry Brooks, again. And today I feel the responsibilities to address discrimination and politics when it comes to disabilities. Some politicians want to do what they can to help the disabled in any way. But some politicians don't care about the disabled and just want them to go away. Some politicians have done what they could to help the hearing impaired. And they helped to do such things because they really cared. But those who continue to discriminate against the hearing impaired won't explain why they do so because they haven't really cared. Some politicians have done what they could to help those who are blind, and they help to do such things because such caring stays in their mind. But those who continue to discriminate against those who are blind cannot explain why they do so. They need to change their mind. Some politicians care about the physically disabled who are in a wheelchair, so they help to get ramps in places when the disabled need to go there. But others haven't supported such ramps. They say it would be a wasteful expense. They waste their own time saying such things because they don't make any sense. Some politicians have supported a lot of mental facilities as a safe and comfortable place for those with mental disabilities. But others didn't support them back in the 1980s and shut down such mental facilities and forced the residents out on the street who had mental disabilities. The best way to help and treat people with disabilities is to let them have a safe place where they can learn to deal with their disabilities. I would like to thank Reno's Newton Learning Center, where children with disabilities are allowed and welcome to enter. All humans have equal rights, no one is above another, and we all have the responsibilities to care for one another. I would like to thank you all for listening to me today and for allowing even me to come in here today. Thank you, Terry. Always a pleasure. Thank you. George Campioni, followed by Jerry Mifsud, followed by Connie Silviera.
It's okay. Take your time. Okay, well, I want to, oh, there you go. Thank you so much. Okay, we have a problem. I can't really read that very good. All right. Well, they'll blow it up my to name, you as much as they can, right? My name is uh, George Campagnoni. I am at 301 Gentry Way, Unit 302, Unit Nevada 8902. What I'm here for is this complaint right here. All right, you can see the date, 331, 2024. All right, read it. Okay, well, I do this. All right, and what you're going to see is I sent them, I, I, you guys all have computers, right? Bring up that case number, SER0045284, all right? And you will see pictures that I downloaded, just a few of them, all right? And since that was done, this car was parked, all right? And you can barely see that, but that's okay because it's dark and it's black, all right? And it, but it was in perfect condition. All right, and and I have the details on this, and you could I could actually show you the uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 date on it if you would like. All right, and uh, Eric, okay, detail. again, I don't have that much time, but this one shows it was done on April fourth, five days after that, right? The same day, and that was at four thirty in the morning, Mr. Shipman and Mr. Hall. All right, because I did leave you guys a message too. All right, and that afternoon, you want to see what it looked like? I'll show you what it looked like. Oh, yeah, you guys towed it, too, finally. All right, the front end is missing. It's gone, all right? Every window in that thing is busted out except for the front window, which they did quite a crack. The back window is also cracked. And if you look at it, I got it. I got the pictures, all right? And grant you, I don't have back and forth, but they were right. This car was owned by somebody. Maybe you, maybe you, maybe you. And it got destroyed because you've done nothing, all right? And my complaint is your parking, all right? All right, parking enforcement. If you notice, right here I said the graffiti needs to take care of the graffiti on Jory Park, Jory Park. And guess what? They did it. It was done by Tuesday morning, all right? They do their job. Parking enforcement does not. I have so many pictures that I can show. In fact, when I was walking past on Sunday, Miguel, uh, excuse me, Mr. Martinez, all right, you grew up in our area, right? All right, well, guess what? I walked, okay, right past here, all right, and what did I, what did I have here? First off, I had this on the sidewalk, all right? Open window, right? Next one. I get, and I'm walking a little Maltese dog for somebody, right? Mm -hmm. Here's this guy, here's this car, still, truck right here, and I hear this rough, 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 right? See if I can get it here. You might not be able to see it on this one. If I can't. Oh. But anyway, there's a big old moose dog okay. sitting in there. This Mr. Is the dog he Mr. threatens you with. Mr. Campione, yeah. thank you so much for yeah. being here. And but I, 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 I can tell, you know. I can ahead. tell you're, you're legitimately upset. Yeah. I would like to ask that you meet with our uh, liaison in the back. I know there's a, lot, there's a shortage of room. But what I'd like to do is get you with our code enforcement and our police officers to be able to follow up. And I'm really sorry for what you went through. Absolutely. Okay, okay. thank you for being here today. All right, thank you for being here today. Jerry Mifsud, followed by Connie Silviera, followed by Craig Bronzen. Hey, Jerry the pizza man. Oh, you're going to? Well, um, okay. Welcome, Jerry. Can I, can I get some uh, young man? He's working on it. Just give him a second. Let's, pay, let's have patience today. <laughs> Okay, it's up. Good morning, City Council. My name is Jerry Mifsud, a.k.a. Jerry the Pizza Man. Um, I'm going to speak about seniors, but be before I do that, we have in the room today former councilman member Oscar Delgado. Let's give a round of applause for Oscar Delgado. Jerry. 
Thank you. Anyway. We recognize. We're very pleased to see Council Member uh, and back in the room. Uh, but if you could just focus on us with your comments, that would be great. She's talking. Go ahead. Um, Go ahead. But she took up 15 seconds of my time. Anyway. No. Okay. Uh, since I turned uh, 62 about 20 years ago, I dedicated my life to my fellow seniors. Would all you seniors in this room raise your hand? Terry, can I ask you to please address your comments to the council? That's just the way it's done. Well, it's done I'm just asking well. you. I'm a presiding I officer. For a Thanks, Terry. I appreciate Give it. Give me a break. Um, you know, seniors, we've been there and done that, okay? We're still here, and we're not done yet. Without us seniors, none of you would be here. Um, the, the most volunteerism is performed by seniors. We've come to the rescue of our own grandchildren by daycare. Our, our own grandchildren, that saves a huge expense. Uh, we're pushed to the wayside, we're forgotten. Uh, many of us live in independent senior complexes. Uh, that senior is dumped off by their relatives and forgotten. What happens? Isolation, depression, and hunger takes place. And who's going to care about that senior? You. As a society, we need to respond to seniors, to women, to children, to homeless people. You know, the homeless epidemic is overtaking the country for years. Jerry, unless you speak in the mic, I'm having a hard time hearing you. I want to hear what you, I care about seniors. You're right on point. Keep, keep it coming. Uh, I'm on 15 seconds back here. Come on, Jerry. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I can't think. Well, I can think. Uh, let's see. That is uh, Woodley Rice. Um, cheer. And Dandelin, um, the uh, the parks people. You see him sitting over here with an English ascot on. That's uh, uh, I forgot your name. Anyway, um, Nathan, what a job. Uh, the uh, the code people. They need money. I see them at the budget. They're overworked. They don't have. Thank you, Mr. Mistel. He has to listen to thank me you. quite frequently. All right, Jerry, thank you so much. Let me just say this. I totally admire your focus on seniors and parks. Those are things I've asked to prioritize in the budget, as have our other council members. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you. It's good to see you. Thank you, Naomi. Connie Silviera, followed by Craig Bronson, followed by Charles Albright. Hi, I'm Connie Silvera, and I'm just here to give you an update on uh, an issue that we're having at Liston Park and have had for the past year. Back in May of 2023, I did call the Parks Department, and I also filled out a, a Reno Direct request. And the reason is this is the condition of the playground. You'll see the side, the slides. This one's not quite as bad. Yeah. Um, this one is the circular one. And while they have put up some, some of them have the wood put up so kids can't slide down. But half the time, kids crawl up slides. So there's still a possibility of severe injury. Um, I did follow up with Ask Joe Hart on Channel 4 mm -hmm. in December because it still had, and I had been told in, the, in last May that. They were aware of it, and there was a six-month uh, lead time on getting parts. And then in December, nothing happened, and so I called Joe Hart, and he did a segment on it. And I also followed up with Reno Direct again. And 
this is, uh, these were taken yesterday, these pictures. And you'll see the wood was taken down on this particular slide, and this is the condition of it uh, towards the bottom. And this is another one. It does have the wood on it, but you can see it looks pretty dangerous, too, for kids. Yeah. And so I just wanted to let you know about what's not happening and it should be happening there. Um, I know it's kind of a marginal neighborhood, but it's a well-used park. Yeah. And if we don't maintain it, it's going to get worse. I mean, you know, you do have homeless people at times, but if people stop going there with their children, it's going to get worse. Right. So... Please look into it. All right, Ms. Silvera, thank you for being here. And I got to say, this is unfortunately a condition in many of our parks, including in some of our wealthiest areas. For example, Damani Ranch Park, same exact pictures of the slide. I, I totally hear you. I just want to tell you, it is a problem citywide. That is one reason, again, that we're trying to prioritize park maintenance to get these things up to code. Thank you for being here. Suggestion is yes. on Marketplace on yes. Facebook. They do sell used slides. Cool. So you okay. might look into Marketplace. Let's check it out, team. <laughs> Let's check it out. All right. And let me, Madam Clerk, could you turn up the mic a little bit? Um, I really kind of have struggling to hear a little bit. Craig Bronson, followed by Charles Albright, followed by Gary Cecil. Good morning, Honorable Mayor, members of City Council and staff. My name is Craig Bronson. I have the honor of serving you as a commissioner on the Recreation and Parks Commission. And I'm glad to hear that Parks is on the agenda on a number of issues today. I'm here just to lend my support to the Moana Pool Public Art Project that I think is B13 on your consent. And you have a lot of speakers. I want to be brief. I want to cover two items. Number one, I've spent over 50 years in the Parks, Recreation, Cultural Arts profession, retired to Reno. And I want to let Reno know, both the city council and the staff and everybody, that you are on the forefront of public art. I think public art adds livability to a community. It adds inspiration, education, and I just appreciate all the public art that is going on in this community. And the second one is just a caveat to remind city council, staff, Cultural Arts Commission, and the Parks and Recreation staff, which you have an excellent new director and staff, is that when public art is designed, it needs to have the owners of the property that are involved in it from the very beginning. So I think the project for Moana Pool is wonderful, but when you create an, a facility which you have, which is gonna be a hit, you are gonna have thousands of people every day. You wanna make sure that the, the add-ons of public art are things that the staff can maintain that don't create additional problems. And so as you go forward on more public art, which I hope we do on our recreation and park facilities, we remember at the very beginning to have all the people in the room that talk about the type of art, how it'll be maintained in that. But other than that, I lend my support. I appreciate serving you on the Recreation and Park Commission. You have a wonderful staff. We have a wonderful community. And thank you. Thank you, Craig. And just a note, we actually reduced the total budget for the art piece to make sure we had enough for maintenance. So I think you're right on point. Yep. Great. Thank okay. you. Charles Albright, followed by Gary Cecil, followed by Art Rangel. Charles Albright, River Advocate. I want to thank you folks very much for uh, seeing me over the years and knowing that I care about the river. Yeah. And I want to thank you for what you've done with the homeless situations along the river and what Reno Direct has done. And then I also sent you folks uh, some emails about the fact that I'd like to see you possibly all get together and take a raft trip through town from Verde all the way to say Rock Park to enjoy the river, but also see all the issues along the river, like dams that need to be removed. And uh, so that's that. And then uh, I also contacted the wet team yesterday for Reno, Sparks, and also Washoe County. And I'll be talking to them as well uh, about getting out on the river. Best time is probably May when the flows are higher. Um, next thing is um, just want to make the river safe, access, safety. Uh, and also, we, I personally want to thank Nathan for considering the fact that we might be able to have roll sessions in Reno again. I started doing them back in 1978 and did them basically every week, sometimes at two pools, for, for, uh, for 21, 21 years. 
and uh, so I stopped that to build a house. <laughs> but uh, uh, it would be nice if we had roll station again in Reno. All there is is Carson City and Truckee. Uh, so there's that. And then also, I'm hoping that I can get your eyes open up and see the Truckee River is a very valuable asset to us. And the dams on it are basically all owned by Tumwa. And you own Tumwa. And if and there's, I've been dealing with Andy Gabbard at the uh, Tumwa, and I've got basically what amounts to the fact that the proof is that they don't pencil out anymore. They don't make enough money, plus they get three times more money per kilowatt than the industry standard. And if you take three million bucks and divide it by three, that's one million dollars that they're making a year if they make it. And the, so I'm hoping that we can start working towards getting those dams off our river and letting the river flow naturally. And um, I've also contacted the uh, Pyramid Lake Indian tribe to see if they would be like to get in on this also. So I just want to thank you for your time and please go rafting if you can. I'm trying to hook you up with your wet team, which is the best one in the area and have them take you down the river and I'll kayak alongside and you can have it. Okay. All right. Charles, thank you for your advocacy. I've known you for, uh, I think, plus a decade yeah. and what you've done for our river environment. Keep up the good work. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's funny going past the bridge on Arlington. Some guy was standing in the middle of it on the upstream side on one of the pedestals and taking his stuff off. And I didn't know if he was going to jump in. So it might be news today. I don't know. Okay. Thank Take you. Care. That's concerning. Thank you for your time. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Gary Cecil, followed by Art Rangel, followed by Carly, Carl Fainley. Good morning, Madam Good morning. Vice Mayor. Good morning, Council Members. Um, my name is Gary Cecil. I'm a downtown resident and a Ward 5 NAP member. I'm speaking today with reference to budget agenda item D1. Our NAP members were recently reminded to be bridges between the community and our Ward Council member. So I'm very pleased to say that Council Member Taylor has been highly receptive to input from many downtown residents. She showed keen interest in a montage resident survey in which 123 respondents' prime issue was, quote, safety outside the montage and in downtown in general. She has responded effectively to many safety and noise comments from downtown residents. She's listened carefully to suggestions to improve the safety and quality of life for downtown residents. I can therefore confidently say that the budget priorities Ms. Taylor expressed at the Council's March 18th meeting are representative of many downtown residents' input. Your package includes supportive comments from a number of them. We especially support her downtown safety-related priorities, and I respectfully urge each of you to likewise support them by allocating sufficient funds in the 2025 budget. In, br in brief, first, please give code enforcement the resources to effectively and consistently enforce code and conditions for parks, entertainment establishments, and on the streets. In particular, please fund their request for an additional code enforcement officer dedicated to the downtown core. Second, to strengthen downtown law enforcement presence so disruptive, disruptive street activity during the day and outside bars and nightclubs at night is curtailed by one, the bar car. It's more than just a catchy name. It really works. It was potent. Rather than being reactive to service calls, it was preventive. It served as a strong deterrent to the kinds of disruptive street behavior mentioned during the recent Axe Bar permit appeal. Secondly, please fund RPD walking teams operated by day and night. Finally, the CSAS team has been effective and we would appreciate you funding the overtime necessary to support that going forward. We also look forward to hearing Chief Nance's enforcement plans for downtown at the April 24th council meeting. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you for being here. Great engagement. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'll be as brief as I can, given that I've, I want to speak to items uh, uh, D1, D3, and D4, and I have uh, left a copy with the city clerk of my comments. Um, for the record, Art Rangel, 255 North Sierra Street. Um, I support the point that Mr. Cecil just brought up. Uh, as a city council, you receive many requests, all of which cost taxpayer dollars. 
the items Mr. Uh, Cecil just brought up are no exception. The difference is that there are two funding sources available for downtown Reno that did not exist in most other parts of the city. We as downtown homeowners pay into the downtown business improvement district. In addition, our residential housing units are also within the Re Reno Redevelopment Project Area 1. The boundaries of the downtown bid are almost identical to the boundaries of the downtown redevelopment project area. Both the bid and the redevelopment agency have very similar objectives, which is to improve things within respect of their respective boundaries. In fact, state law requires that money generated from the bid special assessments as well as tax increment generated within the project area be spent for the benefit of those areas. Property values took a big hit in downtown Reno during the Great Recession, but now values are an upswing, and both the bid and the downtown redevelopment area will benefit substantially in coming years. I want to give you one example. We're all familiar with St. Thomas uh, Cathedral at the corner of Arlington and 2nd. For years, there was a vacant parking uh, lot adjacent to that church. The county assessor showed that in fiscal year 21-22, while that was still a surface parking lot, the value of that property was $377,300. However, for fiscal year 24-25, it is now valued at $14,253,683 because now it's improved with a five-story, 69-unit apartment complex. That's a factor of 37.8 times the original value, and most of that additional value, based on tax rates, is required to be spent to improve the downtown redevelopment area. With all the vacant properties we have in Reno now, downtown Reno, there will be, in the future years, significant tax increment and property taxes uh, generated for the bid in coming years. In closing, I want to say that is now's the time to honor our request because we all know funding will be there for coming years to support them and even expand them. One last thing, I hope the redevelopment agency and downtown bid will work together to make downtown safer, more livable for residents, attract new job, high paying jobs, attract complementary uses in the downtown area, as well as encouraging tax increment generating developments over the year. Thank all you. Right. Thank you, Mr. Rangel. Mickey. Yep. Carl Feely, followed by John Compassi, followed by Jeff Darling. Good morning, Mayor Sheevy, Vice Mayor Durr, Council Members. My name is Carl Feigley. My wife, Sarah, and I have been residents of Ward 5 for the last three and a half years. In January of 2020, we entered into a contract to build a new construction home with Toll Brothers in Somerset. And to put it mildly, our experience throughout this time of designing, building, and living in the home is not representative of what Toll Brothers markets itself as a home developer. I'm joined today by Mark Kapalongan, uh, who represents over 32 homeowners of the Somerset Owners Association, as well as 20 of my fellow neighbors who are here to speak today on behalf of over 150 other homeowners living within the Kif Cliffs community in Somerset. As you will hear from others, I am both concerned and baffled the city of Reno released the developer, Toll Brothers, three years ago from 90% of the development and revegetation bonds required to permit and develop our community, despite the fact this neighborhood has yet to be completed as of today. The Cliffs neighborhood was permitted for development over six years ago by the city of Reno, and over five years have elapsed since final grading was completed within the community. Yet today, our hillsides are barren, marked by weeds and erosion. Members of the city council, including Councilwoman Taylor and Councilman Reese, have been provided this evidence of revegetation failures over the last two and a half years. In addition to these common areas, our experience with Toll Brothers has been finding bottles of urine during job site walks, bottles of liquor and beer scattered within underfloor crawl spaces, and discussions with construction personnel which lack authenticity and credibility. Standing here today, I can say unequivocally that both Toll Brothers and its subcontractors have in, inappropriately substituted the company's general warranty as standards for both international residential code and specifications and tolerances of various construction trade societies. This amounts to misrepresentation. But what I'm primarily here today is to speak to the cavalier attitude 
expressed by this company's representatives, which would lead an average person to believe this company believes and operates as if no one, not the federal government, not the state government, not the state contractors board, or even the city of Reno and development services will hold them accountable to the civil engineering and architectural plans that they have submitted to the development. Additionally, I'm here from homeowners. I am hearing from homeowners who have contacted Toll Brothers about these construction defects and are being told in writing by company representatives that the city of Reno and development services approves of these construction methods, which have otherwise been identified as non-compliant non with international building code. So the question is, why is the city of Reno approving these construction defects? Where is the accountability? We live in a society governed by a social contract. We pay our taxes to the city of Reno with the expectation that the city is fulfilling its responsibility to serve the public. Please show us this is possible. Please show us that a billion dollar corporation isn't running the city of Reno. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Carl. Um, I'm sorry for your experience in that of your homeowners. Um, I wanna make sure, I don't know if uh, Tyler's around, but he helps several of us uh, follow up on these kind of issues. I want to make sure he has your contact information. I know you say you've already contacted the city, but not me, per se, and probably not several others here, too. So we want to make sure to amplify your voice in this. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Okay. Please hold your applause. John Compisi, followed by Jeff Darling, followed by and Mark And Tyler's Capologan. in the back with the tie on right there. Good morning. Thank you to the council for allowing me to speak. My name is John Compizzi, and I'm here with Linda Compizzi and numerous other residents of the Cliffs in Somerset. And I'm here to, to comment on Toll Brothers' pattern of arrogance and lack of concern for city standards and the community's safety in the Cliffs. Our neighborhood has been victimized by two burglaries in seven months due to Toll Brothers' negligence in failing to lock a construction gate at the rear of the cliffs, which is a gated community. The front gate gets closed, the back gate is left open. It's their arrogance and sense that they will not be held accountable by the city of Reno that most offends the residents of the cliffs. Who do they believe, why do they believe they are untouchable? As an example, in October of last year, I sent an email to the head of uh, customer service relations and, and production saying that the back gate was left open all week and through the weekend. And I sent that on a Friday. On Monday, I get a response saying, uh, thank you for your email. I am aware the gate was open. We plan on leaving it open as needed for the duration of our construction. That flip attitude really set me off. Um, they actually were vandalized themselves at a project area, and they installed very expensive uh, mo nighttime monitoring cameras to protect their job sites, but they totally disregarded what the uh, residents, homeowners needed. So I asked them what they would advise that they're gonna do or we should do to, for our safety. I didn't get a response. I followed up, and in November I got a response that said, hello John, Toll Brothers obviously has interest of the resident safety and job security. This gate is an access gate, and we will use it as needed while we own it. That's the end of that. It's a security gate. It's not a security gate, it's an access gate. Finally, on uh, February of this year, well, in December, uh, one of the neighbors mentioned that, again, access through that construction area, uh, they had packages on their front porch that were stolen by a random car driving up that back way. Finally, on February 26th, two doors down from us, our neighbors were burglarized sometime between Saturday, 7.30 p.m. and Sunday morning. Uh, they had jewelry and passports stolen. The burglars crowbarred the side garage door to, to gain entry, and the construction gate was open all through that weekend. Uh, when I sent this information to them, I didn't get a response from uh, Ms. Uh, Crane, but finally I did get a response from uh, the production supervisor. Hi, Mr. Compizzi, thank you for making us aware of this unfortunate event. We have a camera on site. If the Reno Police Department is interested in the footage, we would be happy to work with them. Thanks. Totally disregarding the fact that homeowners are now forced to harden their homes with extra security precautions at great personal expense. The second issue I'm here to talk about very briefly has to do with common areas. Uh, Mr. Feigley already talked about it. I asked in October if those common areas were Toll Brothers' responsibility. There's nine of them. They came back and said yes, that it was still theirs, uh, and that they had a revegetation plan in effect. 
and I'll take just a couple minutes, seconds if I can. Yeah. And they acknowledged the revegetation was their responsibility. But in uh, March, we got an, a letter to all residents going around the HOA saying that, oh, we're going to enhance that. We're not going to do revegetation. We're going to put boulders and rock uh, mulch. Those boulders look like slag from a, a, a steel plant totally unattractive and totally disregarding their responsibility to work through the SOA. Thank you okay. for the extra time. Thank you for being here, John. Uh, we'll try to follow up, as I said. Thank you. Jeff Darling, followed by Mark Camp 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 Kappa Logan, followed by Tara Tran. Mayor and City Council members, thank you for your service and the support you provide our city. As a resident of Somerset for the past four years, living in the Cliffs development by Toll Brothers, I'd like some further clarification as to the parameters by which you hold big developers accountable. It's my understanding that Toll Brothers had to provide a two plus million dollar performance bond as collateral so they would revegetate hillsides and public spaces, stabilizing erosion, beautifying the hillsides as originally detailed and approved on the original engineering plans. This has not been accomplished to date. It's also my understanding that the City of Reno has released these bonds and told Brother of their obligations to perform the work. Why was this allowed? Who authorized the release of these bonds? What inspections took place and what were the parameters of the release given? Who holds Toll Brothers accountable? It appears they have no accountability to follow and complete the original engineered commitments. Is this lack of accountability also occurring in other Toll Brother developments in Reno? Is Toll Brothers the multi-billion dollar company, the tail wagging the dog? I completely understand the desire of the city to build more houses for tax revenue, but how much of that revenue is lost in completing projects the developer is originally responsible for? In the case of residences of Cliffs Development, will be assessed a special HOA fee to cover the issues that Toll Brothers was required to complete under the original development plan. Why should the Cliffs homeowners have to pay additional assessments for items that should have been completed by Toll Brothers? Let me give you a small example of erosion in the neighborhood. We have a small hillside behind our home with a culvert between the hillside and our backyard patio. I had a 6 a.m. flight out one morning and it had rained heavily all night. Before I left, I thought I should check the backyard. What did I find? The culvert was completely backed up from the dirt mud coming down from the hillside, the water encroaching into our backyard and patio. In a dress shirt and slacks, I proceeded to put on snow boots, get two shovels, and clear enough of the culvert to negate our home from being flooded. With the Lord's help, I did make the flight and reported the issue to Toll Brothers on my return. Their answer to the predicament was, I'll see our guys keep the culvert clean. What about fixing the hillside erosion? Our hillside erosion issue, personally, is nothing compared to the other hillsides in the cliff development. I would not want to be the owner of a two-story walkout home here in the cliffs. With the changing environment we are experiencing in Reno and western Nevada, we could be setting ourselves up for a major disaster as a result of poor risk management, ending up like a condo collapse in Surfside, Florida. We purchased our home from Toll Brothers. We were elected to pay a significant premium for our lot. It has an open space to the east. Our space has been used for a staging area, dumping ground, cement truck clean out, and porta potty landing area, rather than the park like sh setting shown in, Mark, in Toll Brothers brochures. I've got more. I will uh, Could leave you with submit the city it for the record. And, uh, and we are going to follow up. I know you have several with you, but it is a very concerning. Thank you. Please hold your applause. Mark Kapalongan, followed by Tara Tran, followed by Lewis McGreal. Uh, thank you, esteemed members of uh, Reno City Council and uh, Honorable Mayor. Um, thanks for this opportunity to speak. My name is Mark Kapalongan. I'm actually the Corporate Secretary of the Somerset Owners Association. And I'm representing the more than 8,000 homeowners and residents of Somerset. I'd like to comment on the... Um, it's a hillside development of over 200 homes, and it's been uh, developed over the last seven years. And because of the steep terrain on this hillside, it's only been possible through expensive grading and cuts and fills and engineered slopes. This is a picture of one of them here. Um, 
city development plans and engineering specifications were designed to stabilize and protect those slopes from erosion, but they've never been followed in the nearly seven years of this development. To ensure that this work was completed in accordance with plans and specs, the city properly required performance bonds to be released only after this work was successfully complete. That process has failed. 90% of those bonds have been released by the city, some in 2020 and some as late as 2023. Despite the fact that most of this work was never done, no inspections were ever made, no independent analysis was ever conducted. Right now, many of the slopes are still bare dirt and suffer erosions with every rain. In releasing, in releasing these performance bonds, it appears from the paperwork that the city simply relied on a letter from the developer's contractor that the work had been complete. It was a simple check the box process. There was no inspection, no verification, no enforcement. It is disappointing that some of the city council members have actually visited this site in 2022 and seen the issue firsthand, and yet thereafter, more of these bonds were released. Our concern is that the home builds are nearly finished and that without bond protection, Toll Brothers will issue quit claim deed transfer and will simply walk away from this development, leaving homeowners to deal with the continued erosion and the cost of completing the Toll Brothers commitment under the development plan. We have one request of the city. Please hold Toll Brothers to their commitments under the city plans and specifications for the neighborhood. Do not allow the release of the remaining performance bonds until this work is complete as inspected and independently verified. Um, I have a letter and independent license uh, engineering report, which I'll give to the city clerk. Uh, homeowners should not be saddled with these risks and substantial costs of completing the work that Toll Brothers was committed to do. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And Madam Clerk, can you make sure that um, Tyler gets that letter too? Okay, thanks. Tara Tran, followed by Ilya Arbitman, followed by Lily Barron. All right, uh, Tara Tran for the record, uh, Ward 1. Good morning, I'm here to give a little bit of background on the Community Assistance Center and the story of how we got to this point. For those who don't know, the Community Assistance Center, located on Record and 4th Street, downtown by the train tracks, was a multi-service facility that provided necessary resources to the people who needed the most. It took 25 years and $15 million um, to build with funds from charitable foundations and local and federal funding, some specifically for community development and support. The CAC housed, just to name a few of its services, a primary health clinic, mental health services, transitional housing apartments, a maternity unit for at-risk new mothers, a women's shelter, a family shelter, a men's drop-in shelter, a closed closet, and a community garden. Located in the heart of the urban center, adjacent to the St. Vincent Stein room in the Reno Sparks Gospel Mission, this stands in stark contrast to the city's new, haphazard, unsafe, and insufficient emergency tent of a shelter, the CARES Campus. Now, when an unprecedented number of community members are left unhoused with little resources to move forward, we must ask, what happens to the Community Assistance Center? Under the city's ownership, the CAC was shut down and vacated in 2020. It was left to total disrepair and dilapidation at a time when people desperately needed the resources it once offered. Due to the neglect of the council and the city manager in particular, it accrued $3 million in water, toxic mold, electrical, and amenity damages. For years, your community has pushed for the CAC to be upkept and restored back into the transitional supportive housing that we so desperately need. For years, the city has shrugged off our concerns of a plan to turn the critical community resources resource into unaffordable housing. On September 27th of last year, this city council denied these concerns and told us that this building was beyond saving, but did formally agree to agendize a community discussion on the future of the CAC. And we have been left in the dark until today, where we have a deal already in place in agenda item D3. A deal that you have been entertaining since July of 2023. 
The CAC was said to be uninhabitable and beyond repair, but now it is not only good enough to be lived in, but good enough to sell for high cost housing. It, if it's going to be sold for pennies, it needs to serve the people that have been and threatened to be displaced by your quote unquote revitalization of 4th Street. From neglect of the building to shady backroom deals, this process has been disingenuous, deceitful, and unlawful. If the city intends to sell the property at less than market value, it must do so in the public's best interest as per NRS 268063. You don't, you haven't asked what our best interests are. The council owes the community to oppose item, agenda item D5, sorry, not D3, and follow through on its promise and agendize a public community discussion of the future of the CAC to actually understand the public's needs and interests. Thank you. I'd thank also like to uh, just thank Doug Thornley for his resignation. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Ilya Arbitman, followed by Lily Barron, followed by Natalie Handler. Hey, I'm going to use this thingy. Okay, just be patient for a sec. He's pulling it up. Okay, so yeah, I'm asking that the council decline Bash's offer, item D5, and put the CAC up for an RFP. Discovering that over the past year, while we have been regularly coming here and essentially begging council to agenda as a discussion on the future of the CAC, staff has actually been working on a backroom deal with a private developer all along. I feel heartbroken, to be honest, and hurt. We have been asking in good faith to be part of this conversation, and you have shut the public out completely. An offer like the one Bash has submitted does not come together overnight. Brianna Bulantini, a Bash partner in this proposal, was writing to to the city, I am waiting on Tesla to get back to me on their desired unit mix here in July of 2023. But we seem to have missed a critical step. Council never adopted a resolution of any kind on the future of the CAC. Selling a publicly owned building like this is not a regular commercial transaction, especially if the sale is below market value, which the pr proposed sale is. Council is required statutorily to determine that selling the property would be in the public's best interest. And how exactly can council determine such a thing if they refuse to engage with the public on this very topic? Fortunately, there are many compelling reasons to deny Bash Capital's offer. Let's start with their foundational premise. Quote, our attainable housing project targets individuals earning between 20 and 25 bucks an hour, a demographic and urgent need of attainable housing solutions. Is this true? Is this demographic and urgent need? Um, say I earn that much and I'm looking for housing. What kind of new construction could I potentially live in? Well, here's the ballpark apartments. Here's base camp. Do you want to turn those so we can see them? Yeah, here's uh, something on Pine Street. Here's the mod. Here's Riverside. Okay. Here's some stuff on Mill you, Street. You can take a minute and Ah, so okay. Here's Grand Canyon Muse. Uh, okay. <laughs> Um, seems like there are actually quite a few options. My need is already seeming a bit less urgent. How about if I'm on a fixed income or a very low income or have no income at all? Maybe I lost my job or had an expensive medical procedure or got no cause evicted, which is very common here in Reno. I'm in need of housing and the word urgent feels a bit more appropriate here. Where can I go? Well, there's really only one place that has been constructed in recent years and it looks like that. Um, Village on Sage Street, technically too. Uh, it's uh, repurposed portables next to the dump and they're actually not that easy to get into. Um, Brianna seems to be a bit confused in her proposal. We can forgive her though. She has not actually been living in Reno for some time. As you can tell by these two now long since closed 4th Street businesses she included in her slide on the neighborhood. The bike project is closed. The Morris is closed as well. Her hastily constructed slides that repeat without citing any factual information whatsoever that neither the city nor the county um, have, quote, have the funds to renovate the CAC, CAC or, quote, reopen the shelter are completely missing the point and incidentally ignorant of what advocates have been saying for years now. The CAC can and should become housing and on this Brianna is not wrong. We know it does need more housing but the kind of housing we need is not millennial playtime rooftop view nonsense. It's intentional, low barrier, actually affordable, transitional, supportive, helps people in need housing. There's so many different directions a renewed CAC could take, let's actually talk about it. Please forget about BASH, have an open conversation with us about what we can do with this unique and invaluable asset. At the very least, put it up for an RFP. Thank you. Thank you, Ilya. And can you make sure we get all of that to the clerk? Because those looked interesting. Thank you. Mr. A M Madam yeah. Acting Mayor, I want to just make a comment about this because I think I sure. was called out in some reporting on this issue. And I think, um, you know, it provided some backstory to this issue uh, because there was a public records request about these negotiations with BASH. And um, I um, was not any part of those. I told BASH I would not meet with them because I wanted a conversation from this council about how we were going to deal with that. I, the concept of Tesla was something I never heard about, but there was a public record of a 
of a meeting of a report that went to me from staff because there's an embargo for me for meeting with staff. So I think I sh kind of showed up as the one who was, you know, in these conversations or knowledgeable of this. I was not. And in fact, this item D5 shows my request, September 29th, pursuant to our rules, asking for a discussion on the future of the CAC. You know, I, yeah. I didn't even know happens. at the time about this bash. I've asked for that. I was deprived of that, which I think is against our rules. Any council member can ask to have an item on. That's how I wanted the item on. But somehow a public record came that I am in discussion, those discussions. Okay. And it was one-way communication from staff not even telling me what right. they were doing. Well, so, thanks for clearing thank up the record. Yeah, thank and I'll, you. I'll, I'll expand upon this when we get to D5. That's it's good. Just, that it's would been be great. reported in the last couple of days. There's been references to this discovery. And so I want to speak okay. about it at this time. Thank you. You bet. Okay. All Lily right. Barron, followed by Natalie Handler, followed by Lewis McGreal. Good okay. morning, Welcome. Um, Vice Mayor and Council. Um, my name is Lily Barron. I live in Ward 1. Um, I am here just to kind of level set and talk a, a little, tell a little story about a time where the city of Reno, I see our champion unsung hero, Jackie Bryant, back there. She does not get enough kudos uh, for the work that she does. Um, about a family that was living outside in a tent uh, who we'll call the woman Iris. Uh, she was pregnant with five children in a tent. And uh, during 2020, and through the emergency housing assistance program that we had, we were able to put this woman in a Siegel Suites. This was not a unique situation. Many families were put in Siegel Suites. A company valued at over $2 billion. And they uh, received most of our federal funding as, as far as emergency housing assistance goes um, throughout the state of Nevada. Now, those uh, Siegel Suites, the one that is right by where I live on 7th Street, goes for $1,500 a month for a studio apartment with a hot plate. Many of the people that live in there have two and three, four, five five children. Um, this this family was evicted from a Siegel Suites for being two days late on their rent, lived in their, uh, lived in their car for one night, at which point, um, you know, a police officer knocked on their door and their children were taken away because it is not appropriate for a child to live in a car. We can all agree with that. Um, after that, we were able to get Iris to come to our place, which is a uh, women's and family shelter that I'm the board president of. And uh, through that process and being able to close the gaps that were that are needed um, for our place, I can proudly say that four years later, that family has not only gotten their five children back, they've gotten their sixth child back, who is a 13-year-old. And they are very happily um, working and happy as a family together in a, in a house instead that is appropriate. Unfortunately, there are still many families that I met a couple of days ago that live in Siegel Suites, and there is no other option for them. On my street, just to give perspective, there is a two-story, two-bedroom house with a literal white picket fence that is going for $16.50 a month, and none of those families in the Siegel Suite will be able to move into that house. That is two hundred feet away from Siegel Suites because they were paying such an exorbitant rental price. Um, that is the kind of thing that we could mitigate by using the CAC in a better way. I think that we have such an amazing opportunity right now because people in Reno have great ideas. We have incredible agencies, incredible um, you know, folks that are working on these issues to help bridge the gap between homelessness or temporary housing and community supportive housing. Um, and this could be one of the ideas. I will also remind you that RISE submitted an RFP for a project like this two years ago, and we have been fighting to be able to open this discussion for many years. RISE is equipped for this building. We have about 30 families on a waiting list, and we could be moving these families into homes much like we did independently between Jackie and I as people. Um, I would also just like to, with my remaining time, remind, uh, remind you about some things that you said in a similar discussion in 2019 um, about the Sinai Mansion. Uh, Mr. Thornley said, we can't just dispose of publicly owned property without a process that goes through an elected body. Um, Councilwoman Ma Vice Mayor, you said, I don't want to blow this discussion up in any way, but I didn't know how the public would really know how, what we're considering here. Thank you, Ms. It Barron. doesn't tell the public. Yeah. Do you want to finish your sentence? And Thank continue. you. And then... Um, we, uh, Thornley also said they wanted to better, better understand the development of the potential space and that by going through a formal RFP proposal process, the council, council has indicated that they would like themselves and the community at large to be more involved in the decision than okay. what a straight auction or lease of the property would right. allow. I would like that same energy for Thank this you. project, please. Thank you, Lily, for, you. and we're still the same people and we probably believe the same things. I hope so. Okay. Thank you. Um, let me just put on the record that um, we've been joined by Council Member Ebert. Thank you. And let me, let me just inquire, do we have people online? Yes. Two? Okay. 
Okay. So um, thank you. Thanks for that question, too. Uh, who's next? Okay. Natalie Handler, followed by Louis McGreal, followed by Nicole Anagapasis. Hello. Natalie Handler for the record, um, going back to the Community Assistance Center discussion. I was going back through some past council meetings where we were talking about the CAC um, and it wasn't in, on the agenda um, or when it was on the agenda, but not in a specific way um, other than the insurance policy. This was back in September 27th of uh, 23. Um, it was part of the, there was there was a part of the conversation where council member Breckis is asking manager Thornley if there's been any discussion with private entities to sell the CAC to make room for ballpark parking he replies no then she asks if there has been any other conversation uh, about the possible possible sale of the property and he again replies no on the record at this meeting according to the public records published by this is Reno we now know that that was false and that bash had been speaking with staff and manager Thornley since as early as July 2023 at this same meeting, Breckis asks that the CAC be prioritized um, at an upcoming um, meeting as soon as possible so that the community has an opportunity to talk about its future. Mm -hmm. The mayor states, we will all get to talk about this soon. Yet here we are today with a possible vote to sell with no prior community discussion, nor RFP or anything which defines the democratic process. At that September meeting, and at many before over the years since it was closed, the community has repeatedly stated the need for shelter for women and families, which is still high. The county stated that 30 plus families were on a waiting list, and I know that number is only growing. There is also a need for housing to support survivors of domestic violence. The women's shelter is always near or at capacity due, the, due to the lack of housing for them to enter into as they exit the shelters. The city often comes down hard pointing the finger at the county for their slow movement on sheltering. And now it's time for the city to be accountable to their responsibility of creating housing opportunities which help people exit out of shelters and into the next level of their housing journey. After looking at Bash's presentation, which wasn't posted for public viewing until late yesterday, I can say that I think this project would be better suited at a different location in the downtown area. I can think of around 70 parcels of land owned by Mr. Jacobs, who may be willing to support Bash in their quest to build market rate attainable housing for tech workers. With all the site hurdles present, presented in their project description, I just don't think the Record Street corner of our community is right for them. What would be better suited for this public property and is highly needed is transitional supportive housing or housing that can be attained by those who fit into the 30% AMI bracket, not the 80% AMI bracket that is uh, proposed in, with BASH. Let's open this still very much needed, uh, open this up to discussion um, and not give it away to for pennies. Um, either RFP and community discussion, please. Yeah. Thank you. Th thank you, Natalie. And I just want to, since I assume several people are here to discuss the same issue, we've already had several comments. I just want to explain one thing, and that is that the city receives unsolicited proposals that we did not solicit. We did not ask people to submit. They do submit. You mentioned two years ago, RISE submitted, uh, this submitted. So I don't see it noted on this uh, agenda item. But I, I will be asking staff to formalize our policy on unsolicited proposals so everyone knows how they'll be handled. But it's, a, it's an important area and one we need more clarity about so everybody understands the ground rules. Thank you. Okay. Louis McGreal, followed by Nicole Anagapasis, followed by Bill Shrimp. Hello and good morning, Council. My name is Louis McGrill for the record, and I want to start by thanking you for agendizing the Community Assistance Center in item D5. I'm happy to see that we are talking about this. However, I and the other advocates here are not happy about the proposal itself or the process or lack of process that's taken to get here, so we are in strong opposition to D5. Now, you've heard from others about the background of the facility and why we're unhappy with the current deal being proposed. My comment is to establish our request on how the city should be moving 
moving forward instead. First and foremost, we simply deserve a formal process for public input on the CAC's future. We've been promised formal discussions, and as far as I know, nothing has come through. Now we're finding out that city staff have been working on a deal since at least July of 2023 without letting the public know. I know that there is a policy of allowing unsolicited proposals to come forward. However, the emails seem to show that there has been a lot of direct communication with city staff in regards to putting a deal together, which to me strikes as more than just unsolicited, but rather an ongoing discussion happening behind closed doors. The current deal is a complete ripoff. It's a low ball offer, and it utterly fails to meet the transitional supportive and low income housing needs of our community. And to be honest, the lack of public process in regards to the CAC has been beyond frustrating to witness. I saw a Reno Gazette Journal article that came out this morning where our dear mayor, who is not here today, was unhappy that the community was bringing too much, quote, dangerous and distracting outside noise. We happen to find that the real danger is an utter lack of transparency in giving private developers sweetheart deals on city properties that are worth millions of dollars. I think the actual distraction here is gaslighting us into thinking we don't have a right to say something about it, with the exception of Jenny Breckis, who has been a great champion for this issue. You can't just sweep the CAC under the rug and you can't wash your hands of it. We're simply asking that it be agendized and that the community gets input on what should be done. We're also asking that a formal RFP or RFI be put out for that possible sale and future use. This would let everyone have an equal chance at putting together proposals, ensures equal access to information about the building and the site, and lets us have buy into the process. After all, the city requires RFPs for things like fitness equipment at the Moana pool or a video display board at the event center or to have artists paint electrical boxes. If things of that severity, to say not serious at all, require an RFP, why don't we have one for a multi-million dollar publicly invested shelter? To be honest, it feels like a slap in the face. I also want to echo attention to NRS 268063, an identical language in the city code saying that the city has to adopt a resolution justifying a private sale of public property as being in the public's best interest. If the city does not pass such a resolution, it's my understanding that accepting the offer on the the table today would be unlawful and that there would be probably some amount of legal retribution or reaction if they were to accept the offer today. We've been asking for months, if not years, about some action on this issue. Our request for public engagement here is not only fair, but legally necessary. So please do not accept the offer, put out an RFP, and agendize substantial discussions on this facility's future. All right. Thank you, Lewis. And um, I can assure you that Council is not going to be taking any unlawful actions. I can just give you that. Thank you for being here. If you're going to, Madam, if you're going to editorialize on each comment, mm -hmm. I'm going to editorialize. Okay, and I apologize. Wh why my letter to you went ignored? What asking, letter? Asking of September 29th, notifying you that I wanted a discussion on the on the CAC on the agenda. Me? Yes. You received that. You were okay. given that. Well, thank you. I don't set the agenda, but I appreciate but that. You said there were discussions okay. So, Madam Clerk. Nicole Anagapasis, followed by Bill Shrimp, followed by Jeff Friedman. Hi, my name is Nicole Anagapasis, and I'm an organizer with Family Soup Mutual Aid. And I gotta say, the tea is piping hot at City Council right now. This is insane. It's like watching a sitcom. Anyway, um, I'm not going to stand here and wax poetic today about the pattern of irresponsibility that the city has shown in its stewardship of the CAC properties. The simple fact is, is if the city accepts its offer from Bash Capital, it will be in violation of an, uh, existing Nevada statute 268063. I hope I got that right. Um, let's see here. Uh, frankly, I don't think that the proposal by Bash is in the best interest of the public. Uh, it's people or the myriad of created and forward-thinking problem solvers who could have the opportunity to continue the legacy of these properties in fulfilling their original purposes and intentions. Um, I do believe that a lot of folks would agree with me, but then again, I could be wrong. But the fact of the matter is, is I don't know and you guys don't know because we haven't had frank discussions about it. Um, I'm uh, requesting that there's an open forum made in transparency with the intent to inform the people in the community whose future will be directly impacted by any decisions that could possibly be made for today. Uh, we are asking City Council to agendize a community discussion on the CAC and open a request for a proposal so that other offers can be considered before it is decided what happens with this vital resource. Um, as well, in response uh, to the proposal from Bash Capital, utilizing 51% of these uh, possible affordable housing units to 80% of the AMI, um, 
I'm a person who that project would directly benefit. I make about 20 to $25 an hour, and though I do believe that there are kind of few and far between options as far as housing for people like me, we're ignoring that there is a significantly greater need for other peoples who are below my tax bracket, right? So I am uh, basically directly asking that we no longer continue this cycle that keeps low-income people in situations of desperation and poverty, that we don't continue to um, incentivize out-of-state real estate developers to gentrify our neighborhoods. Frankly, what we're doing is we're keeping women, families, disabled people, and veterans on the street. People that can't afford to live here, they can't afford to move either. And where are they going to end up? At the CARES campus that's already full? No, they're going to end up on our streets. And guess who's not going to want to buy real estate in Reno if there's a bunch of people living on the streets? More developers, right? So this is a longstanding issue. We have been actively trying to have this conversation for years now. And it seems, frankly, disingenuous for Bash Capital to say that this is affordable housing to anybody. It's just not. We can do better than this. And I would like to see an opportunity for other people to have proposals on this particular bunch of properties. So um, yeah, just do a better job. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Nicole. Bill Shrimp, followed by Jeff Friedman, followed by Kim Maples. Well, uh, good morning. Um, what I have to talk about is small in regards to what everybody else is bringing up, but uh, I want to say something positive. Um, and specifically, um, on Sunday, I put in a little thing for a pothole to be fixed, and by Tuesday afternoon, it was fixed. So, Mr. Thornley, I don't know who does that, but if you would, please tell somebody whoever actually does that, like somebody says, keep up the good job. On the heels of that, here's another opportunity to do more good work, okay? This is a notice that typically property owners receive. And this has to do with engagement in the public process. And I will remind the council that when this country was first founded, the only people that were allowed to participate in the public process were people who owned property. That's it. These notices go to people who own property. They do not go to people who rent. Whether you're renting your business or you're renting your home, if your neighbor's doing something, that changes the character or the aspect of your neighborhood, and you rent, you don't get this notice that it's happening. I want you to notice that the first notice here is the Neighborhood Advisory Board. The Neighborhood Advisory Boards are really part of the public process. It's the first step to really have people sit down and have a conversation, change emails, change phone numbers, and say, hey, here's what's going on, here's my point of view. By the time the big yellow sign goes up, by the time it gets to the Planning Commission, the ship's pretty much sailed, right? So tell renters they are worth a cheap piece of paper and a 40 cent stamp. They are not second class citizens. This is an easy fix. We have everything we need in the city to, to turn this on and to manage it and to measure it. This is an easy win. We can do this very easily. This is the third time I've talked about this in public comment, and I've emailed every single one of you and had some lengthier conversations about this. This is so easy. Madam Vice Mayor, yeah. Mr. Manager, please let the people who rent their businesses, who rent their homes, know that they're worth a small piece of paper and a stamp. Thank you for being here. Thank you for doing the job. All right. Thanks, Bill, very yep. much. All right. Jeff Friedman, followed by Kim Maples, followed by Tara Webster. Good morning, Council. My name is Jeff Friedman, and I've been a uh, resident in Reno in Somerset for 11 years. Um, I purchased another house in October 2023 from Toll Brothers in the Somerset Village 6C, known as the Cliffs. I became aware of an issue with nine common areas that the grading plan says private to be maintained by Somerset Owners Association. 
I've not seen in the plans or specifications defining how these areas are to be improved by the builder or developer prior to be handing over to the homeowners association. I've been informed in written communication by the president of the Somerset Owners Association Board of Directors that the plans and specifications call for these common areas to be seeded, irrigated, and returned to native vegetation. The developer apparently did not communicate adequately with the Somerset Owners Association and instead chose to survey some of the residents. I did not receive a survey. Apparently, based on these survey results, the developer chose to rock these areas and not follow the original plans and specifications granted with the permit. The property that I own is a fill lot with 14 feet of fill that backs right up to Peavine Mountain. The rear of my property immediately slopes down to a very steep grade to a swale that drains several lots into a large storm drain pipe. The swale has been compromised by drainage that was, not on, that was on the grading plan that was not constructed and fines have blocked the swale from draining. The city of Reno, the county of Washoe have come out and inspected the site, seen the block swale and confirm that this is an issue that needs to be remediated and addressed. The stormwater is ponding and directly draining underneath my lot, underneath the street that I am based on as well. This raises the potential for a compaction of soil to be compromised. I've been attempting to communicate with the developer about this issue for 10 weeks. One of their employees has written to me and put in writing that they incorrectly verbally informed me that the maintenance of the swale was responsibility of the SOA. And the employee passed along the name of a executive and email address to address the issue too. I did and have not had any response. All right, thank you for, for being here, Jeff. Sure. I appreciate it. Kim Maples, followed by Tara Webster, followed by Vera Miller. Hello, um, I'm Kim Maples. Um, thank you guys so much for allowing the public to come and talk to you all. Never done this before, so I'm a little nervous. Yeah, um, deep breaths. Okay, I am also here on behalf of hundreds of Toll Brothers, the Cliffs residents, and thousands of Somerset residents who are unable to attend today. I move, my family and I moved to Reno for the wonderful community, the closest to nature, and for the Cliffs dream home that was advertised to our family by the Toll Brothers, of which I still love. But um, we, I have noticed that the hillside is eroding, and in discussion with the other residents, you know, estimates that have been discussed by people who are way more knowledgeable on the topic than myself are upwards of 10 to 15,000 per resident for remediation, which was shocking to me, which prompted my attendance here today, um, as the expense would be very hard to um, handle for a lot of the residents and my household included. So I'm here on a personal level to ask the, uh, on behalf of the CLIS residents who have spoken up previously on the same topic. Um, just to show consensus and support. So I guess my res my request um, and ask of you all, thank you, would be to please hold Toll Brothers accountable for erosion control and common area efforts that don't release and don't release more bonds until they have fulfilled their commitments to revegetate the cliffs hillsides to natural habitat with vegetation that includes native species such as sagebrush and rabbit brush because um, we have received com communications for them saying, well, we left it alone and it's natural vegetation, which in turn equates to cheatgrass, which is also very flammable right next to our houses. So they consider that natural vegetation, but we all know in Reno, right? It's the lovely sage, it's the rabbit brush, it's all of that stuff that is what we consider native and should be in those areas, really providing the erosion control needed 
uh, versus uh, large swaths of, she of cheatgrass, which is there now. So anyways, thank you. All right, thanks for being here. Tara Webster, followed by Vera Miller, followed by Skylar Dart via Zoom. Hello, Council. Uh, Tara Webster for the record, Ward 5. I am here today to express my strong opposition to item D5, the proposed sale of the Community Assistance Center to Bash Capital uh, for market below market value. Bash Capital is proposed to build attainable housing offered 80% AMI to Tesla employees, for Tesla employees. This doesn't free up urgent housing for minimum wage workers, families, women, and those experiencing or near homelessness. Our community has begged for years to rehab the CAC to provide transitional housing for those who are in need. Ultimately, this proposed housing isn't attainable for most of our low-income neighbors, many whom all live downtown. I'm here to ask that council opens up a path for transparency and not rush into this deal with Bash Capital. Please stop this back alley deal, open this up for an RFP, and consider opening the future of the CAC up to community conversation. Thank you for your time. All right, thanks, Tara. Vera Miller, followed by Skylar Dart via Zoom. Did Vera leave? Skylar Dart via Zoom. Oh, there's Vera. Thank you for waiting. My name is Vera. I'm from uh, Ward 1. Um, I'm here to ask that we agendize the things that we're asking to agendize, but also to agendize the ceasefire and the siege re resolution, which has been emailed to y'all. Oh, sorry, I was running. <laughs> the last time I was here, uh, someone from Greenpeace scoffed and asked a seemingly rhetorical question. What does Palestine have to do with anything here? Three minutes will never be enough time to lay out the human rights atrocities of beyond imagination happening right now, let alone explaining to you exactly how it is deeply connected to Reno, as well as environmental justice and housing justice. I can explain the, that billions of tons of bombs dropped on a space the size of Manhattan, what that does to a water table, to our ozone layer, but maybe it would be more effective for me to stand here and just sob uncontrollably for the three minutes, or play the devastating screams and pleas of people just before they are shot and bombed to death. There is six months worth of daily stories like to this, but I think of Hin's story today. <laughs> I think about five-year-old baby Hin's final words often as I wake up and as I go to sleep. The voice recording playing on a loop. Her and her family were surrounded by tanks hiding in a car. They were calling the Red Crescent to come evacuate them, to save them. This phone call was recorded and in the recording we hear Israeli, Israeli tank gunfire as a woman is begging on the phone for evacuation. She screams, then abruptly, nothing. Next to her family member, five-year-old Hin picks up the phone. She's surrounded by her dead family members in this shot-up car. She asks if someone will come get her, that she's scared. Imagine being five years old, afraid of the dark, begging someone to come get her, begging to be got. What happened to Hind? A clearly marked ambulance does reach her. About 10 feet away from each other, two weeks later, people find the bomb and clearly marked ambulance next to Hind's body. Council, the biggest thing I'd like to explain to you with all the care and grace in the world is it's okay to be wrong. It's okay to make a mistake. And I'm not talking about Israel's intentional shooting, execution, and bombing of a five-year-old child and medical staff. That's evil and on purpose. What is a mistake is to not acknowledge what's happening in Palestine as a genocide. It's a mistake to keep funding entities that fund genocide. It's a mistake to not take action right now. I am here to make sure that when people look back on history, that Reno knows that we gave you the opportunity to make the right choices. I hope that when we look back on this time, we can say, see that you made the right decision. Listen to the community you are supposed to represent and agendize the things that people are begging you to agendize. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Vera. Skylar Dart via Zoom. All right, and Madam Clerk, um, how many people are signed up on Zoom? Just this one. 
Oh, just one. Okay. All right. I just wanted to give um, the audience uh, understanding of the progression of events today. Um, around 12 o'clock, we'll be taking a break. Um, it depends on when, uh, where we hit on the agenda items or where we are in the consent. And uh, just, we'll have been here about two hours. So I just wanted to let you know so you can prepare for that. Okay, keep going. And will you show them on the monitor? Okay. Oh, hi there. Can you all hear me? We can. Please state your name and begin speaking. Sorry if I'm a little nervous, first time speaking at something like this. Uh, my name's Skyler. I was born here at Washington Medical Center in 1997, and I've spent 20 years here. Uh, I'm really glad to see people showing up to talk about the Community Assistance Center, item D5. Um, I work in affordable housing, and 20 seconds into reading the proposal, I knew it was a terrible deal. So uh, I'd like to agree with what everyone has said before that what Reno really needs is deep income targeting, 30, 40, 50, 60% of AMI. I am in the 80% AMI bracket. And uh, like the woman in the black hat said, I do have options. Would it be great if there were more options? Absolutely. Everyone likes options. But if you're considering an urgent housing need and what to do with a building that formerly was used to help people who literally have nothing, uh, I think that's what should be done with, with the CAC. And I think it would be great to uh, solicit more input from the community and from more developers than just this random person who, who appeared on your radar uh, back in July or recently. I don't know which one it actually was. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is that on the Zoom, I, I understand that maybe some of the apparently absent council members are viewing via Zoom. We can't see what people are showing on the overhead projector. So I don't really understand. I, I was going through the schedule. Meetings happen every two weeks. Like, I think maybe there have been three variations I counted in the last six months where it was maybe an off week. How is the city council not entirely present and the people who are viewing it from Zoom can't even see the documents that people are showing. I think that's kind of pathetic. And I think that the energy that I'm getting is that you all are up there not really caring about what we have to say and not really showing up for us. Or as in right now, talking amongst yourselves instead of listening to somebody in your community who's trying to speak to you about what I see. So uh, thank you to the council member, perhaps singular, who seems to actually listen, and um, I can't wait for the rest of you to be out of office. Thank you. All right, thank you, sir. Um, and then Madam Clerk, was that, that it then? Oh, Frank, we do have one more Frank Shank via Zoom. Okay. Frank, if you can unmute yourself and begin speaking. Madam Vice Mayor, his hand is raised. We have not had any audible or responsiveness from him at this okay. time. If we're able to get him through, sure. we'll put him on the next one. So at All this right. time, I would just like to state for the record that we did receive 20 comments, which were general in nature, are not directly associated with an agenda item prior to 4 p.m. on April 9th, 2024. 
These comments were voicemail and or written correspondence received via our reno.gov online public comment form or by email to our office. Copies of these have been distributed to the Reno City Council and are available to the public on reno.gov forward slash meetings. Two letters in favor, four letters in opposition, and 14 letters of concern. And with that, we have no additional public comment. We're moving on to item A4, approval of the agenda. All right. So I'm looking for uh, information from Mr. Thornley uh, about the agenda. The only information I have is that items D3 and D4, Delta 3, Delta 4, um, we'd like to set those for a time certain at 1 o'clock. Okay. 1 p.m. or as soon thereafter as we can. Um, let me just see. And could you say what those items are so people know? Of course. So item D3 is uh, the Downtown Reno Partnerships Business Improvement District's Operating Plan and Budget and Annual Assessment Adjustment. And item D4 is the resolution to set the date, time, and place for the Business Improvement District's assessment role hearing. Okay. Um, very good. Let me just take a moment and make a note. I'd, uh, I'd like to be, um, yeah, acknowledge. Um, I'm having a, a challenge adopting this agenda with D5 on. Okay. okay. This is a letter of uh, inquiry from the Spash Capital. <laughs> and the narrative that you said is, you know, we have a process. Whoever, you know, puts on a solicitation, they ask for it. No, I said we need to define the process. Okay. We do need to define. But as it is defined is, it's on our agenda. That item jumped ahead of my request of September 29th that was given to all of you and to the manager for a general discussion on what to do with the CAC and pursuant to these procedures. So the only reason that did not go into the agenda, onto the agenda, because I have the privilege of that, okay? The process is clear for that one. I have the privilege of having items on the agenda. Mm -hmm. Is it was an objection by the city manager or the mayor to my reading? So. I think an explanation is known why my request did not go and why this group got to come on the same topic, okay? okay. That's, that's not right. I won't support an agenda that, you know, does that, that jumps a member duly elected to have a discussion here on a topic over someone else's proposal mm -hmm. that now I've learned has been in discussion with STAP since July of 23. Okay, so um, I'm troubled by that. And when Bash called, reached out to me, I said, look, I'm not going to meet with you. It's not even fair to them to get come up here and be bashed by the community mm -hmm. because of our mismanagement of the agenda here, which is in the manager's and the mayor's office. So I am going to ask that, and if you will take a motion, you'll take a motion, that we pull off D5 today. I don't even think it's, it's you know, I, I have a little sympathy for Bash because I think they're being mis, misled. That we pull off D5 and that we do what we should have done with our process is give a member of the body an opportunity to have an agenda item on. And that is an open discussion about the CAC. Mm -hmm. So I am not going to support an agenda that has D5 as it's written. I want to talk about the CAC, but I want to talk about it in the context of process and ideas and not a transactional item, which is what staff has brought to us. Okay. All right. Um, and then uh, let me ask Mr. Manager, you said uh, D3 and D4, you wanted around 1 p.m. We've had a request to remove item D5. Um, and is there, are there is, was that you, Mr. Reese? Online? Uh, no, and then Vice Mayor, that was Mayor Sheevy. Yeah. Okay. Vice Mayor? Mayor, Mayor Sheevy. Hi, a um, couple of things. I would like to know if we can obviously have this discussion. And I just want to be very clear. I don't think the council member is wrong. And the reason I brought this forward is because there were discussions. And I was told when someone brings forward um, an interest that we have to entertain that. So for transparency reasons is why I was letting this on the agenda because I don't, I think that the council member is correct in that I think the process is flawed. Um, I have not had conversations with them other than yesterday and I thought a 
and I told them directly, I thought this is sort of a disservice um, to the council, to the community, and to them, um, because we did ask for a process, and but I wanted to have the conversation left on there out of transparency so everyone would know um, what had been brought to staff. So I just want to be clear, this is the very reason I wanted it on there for complete transparency. And as we know, a lot of times things can end up on the agenda and the council doesn't necessarily feel that way, but I think it is a disservice if we don't bring it forward so the community can weigh in whatever capacity it shows up on our agenda. But I, I agree, um, you know, partially with councilwoman in the sense that um, it shouldn't be heard, but I think in full transparency, it should be so people can weigh in. I think we're doing it backwards and that's problematic. Um, but I, I want everyone to understand that's why I brought it forward because I wanted people to have a voice regardless of whatever the outcome is. Um, I, I think, you know, the council is very, very sympathetic to what the community needs are. Um, so I, th that's why I had it on there. No other reason to be like, hey, you know, this is the route we're going. I thought this was a way to be able to express the concerns of the council and to go back and say, what is the process? Because I know Councilwoman Dewar's been concerned, um, you know, the other council member, Breckis, and that's exactly why I kept it on here, so we could have the discussion uh, for no other reason but out of transparency and to have the community come down and weigh in. So that's that was my thought behind it. Uh, do I think it was done backwards? Absolutely. But here we are, and I wanted to... Uh, because there were discussions, like I said, I haven't been in those. Um, that is why I wanted it to remain on the agenda. I hope that gives some background. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. Let me ask you one more question, though. Um, in terms of approving the agenda, do you want it to retain, remain on the agenda so that there can be discussion, or would you rather have it pulled off? I mean, I can go either way but I think it's a disservice and it might be a good time. That's why I was asking about our attorneys to talk about what it does look like, because I don't think that again, and I think the council member Brock has even mentioned that it's not fair for their time or anyone else. But if this is the way that we can get to what the process is going to look like, um, you know, and also I'm sure that if they're here, I don't know bash capital if they're here or not. Uh, you know, if they want to present what they, you know, brought forward, that's fine too. If you don't want to have the discussion, I think we should have the discussion because I think that we need to clarify what it looks like moving forward. That's just my sense. Right. Um, okay. I want to be supportive of what, you know, Council Member Breckis would like to do as well. I guess my fear is, is if we don't have the discussion, how will we know what direction we need to even go in? Right. So, I, you know. But, but I'll be, you know, I'll support okay. whatever, you know, All right. the majority of the body wants to do. That's my well, thought. Okay, thank you. I'll just weigh in myself. Um, I was very concerned when I saw this on the agenda, as our staff know, because it was an unsolicited process. And to Councilmember Breckis's point, we haven't had uh, open discussion about it, and it's an important public building in the public ownership. So um, I'm inclined because the people are here to have the conversation and hear from them. We've already heard a lot in public comment, but I'm sure there's more to be heard during the item itself. Plus, I would like to hear um, and give direction to staff on what we would like to see for next steps, and that may very well include a different kind of workshop. So I'd like the opportunity as a council member to weigh in on process myself. So that's just some of my thoughts, but I am looking for a motion to either approve or amend the agenda. Madam Vice Mayor, a motion to approve the agenda. Wait, who? Who was speaking on the line? I'll second oh, Ms. You'll... Taylor's motion. Okay, Ms. Taylor, were you making a motion? I'm sorry. Yes, Madam Vice Mayor, to approve the agenda with the time certain changes. Changes. Okay, and you were seconding, Mr. Reese? Yes, Madam okay. Vice Mayor. I don't think that we've got a very full audience. I want to make sure if there are audience members for a particular agenda item that they can move some of our other, um, you know, routine items. So I, yeah. I that would be only request um, is that if there are folks that miss, maybe our clerk can tell us who is here for what items and that would help us to prioritize certain of the items but I'll I've a 
I seconded Ms. Taylor's excellent motion, mm -hmm. and we'll see what happens in the consent items going forward that okay. we could move people up. So what you're saying is we could potentially move this up, given that there's so many people, after we address the consent agenda? Well, I'm saying any item for which there are people in the audience. Okay, I, I very want good. I want to have the most access, and I know that there are people who are working today yes. that don't have the ability to sit through some of the theater going on, and so I would like them to be able to speak. Sure. Okay. Well, a lot have spoken and a lot still to speak. So let me ask, is there, uh, did you have a comment on the motion, Ms. Preckus? I'm not going to vote on the motion because I think the statements that you just said to discuss the process and give direction are not contemplated. I in think the they item. are possible direction I, I don't to think staff. So. I think it's a letter in response to the in response to the letter that Bash has done. So that's the starting ground is the letter, and the questions only before us are: Do we go into an agreement with them? Do we, we obtain an appraisal with them? Do we do some boundary line discussion? You know, those are the only th options we have. You know, we, the RFP, um, you know, I've asked for months to get in the building. <laughs> I don't know if Bash was given an opportunity in the, mil in the building. Um, I don't see anything other than just having Bash out here. Okay. And yay or nay on that. Well, there's public comment that. as well. So, I, and I, so, okay. And then let me ask our attorneys, yeah. just since you've raised the question. Um, the, the agenda item is titled Presentation, Discussion, and Direction to Staff on Potential Disposition, which I assume means potential non-disposition of the Community Assistance Center. So will you keep us on track? I mean, can we discuss this proposal and all its ramifications or not? Yes, you can. Okay. Please. We can have a full That's discussion yes. on this proposal or any related proposal? Correct. Okay. Thank you. So it sounds like it is properly agendized for a discussion. Okay, with that, um, I have a motion and a. S oh, did you have a comment? Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I didn't comment. see you over here. So I, I have issues with keeping it on the agenda as well, and particularly because we had a council member that asked it to come to council. Um, there's a process there, and I. With respect to everyone here, I know it's important that you're here. It's obviously important to everyone. So I don't understand why um, it wasn't prioritized when a council member asked to have it brought forth. Um, I think we could have had this discussion when council member Reckus asked it to be agendized and we wouldn't be talking about it um, under the same context. We wouldn't be wasting people's time. You know, if we decide today that this is not the way we want to move forward with it and we, we have ideas, other ideas, we could be in a place where we were actually making a decision today versus, you know, just talking about things, you know, had we um, had this on the agenda previously and had community feedback before we were, um, we came to the process, we were, we were, we were having discussions about selling the property. So uh, I don't, I don't support keeping on the agenda today until we have more um, community feedback in uh, direction. Okay. So. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so we have a motion and a second on the floor to approve the agenda as is, with, along with the time certain. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. And uh, all opposed. Um, yes. Mayor. Yes. I I just think if we don't hear it, that we are doing a disservice. And then how long does it take to come back? I think we should recognize the community comments. Um, and there isn't a process, so I want to be clear because. There was just stated that, you know, there's a process. And that's why I think we should have this discussion. I think if we vote not to, I think that is problematic. And it, to me, you know, I heard the community loud and clear. They want to know what it is. They want to know process. I think out of transparency. And that's why I will support it, because I think we should have this discussion today. Um, otherwise, we're going to kick down uh, the can down the road. Um, so I want to be supportive in order so we can give direction. And it sounds like from our city attorneys, I want to reiterate that we can uh, do that the way it's agendized, okay. correct? Okay, gotcha. So I'm sorry, I missed your comment before I called the vote. So thank you for that. So um, I, again, I'm going to ask for all those in favor of the... I, I have another question. Oh, you have a, excuse me, we have more. I Just a question. So will this discussion include the process for getting something agendized as a council person? Because that's part of my complaint here is that the, this was requested to be an uh, agendized item prior to this and it didn't happen. So that's... That's the main problem I have with bringing it um, on the agenda today. Gotcha. 
Okay, I'm sure sure you can comment on process. That's, I want it. That's yeah. why I want it to be yeah. on the agenda. Okay. Are there any other council members that would like to make a comment before I call the vote? Anyone online? All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any, aye. Op any opposed? opposed? Opposed. Okay. So motion passes 5-2. We will have the item on discussion today, um, and we'll take it from there. All right, um, we're going to move on to the consent agenda. And no, item A5, approval of the minutes for March I apologize, 13th. apologize, apologize. Okay, let me go back in my order. Thank you. Approval of the minutes. We're looking for a motion to uh, consider the Reno City Council minutes, minutes from March 13th, 2024. Um, I'd like to hear a motion. Motion to approve. Mr. Martinez. Second. Ms. Taylor. Are there any comments, am amendations on the minutes? All right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion passes unanimously. We're going to go on to the consent agenda. And let me explain what I like, given the hour and the fact that we haven't had a break. Um, what I'd like to do is go through the agenda, find out which items we want to pull, um, approve, consider the remainder items, and then take a, a short break for everyone in the audience and all of us, and then come back and start on the items that were pulled, unless we, I will have the clerk um, poll. Um, in fact, I may poll, are there, well, let's see what's pulled and then we'll go from there. So, uh, opening the consent agenda, and I'm just gonna go in um, ward order, I think today, or I'll start with Council Member Breckus. I'll just come down. Nothing to pull off the agenda. And Madam Vice Mayor, if I might, you, you do have public comment on the B items. So just before you take a motion to of pass, course. please of course. stop so we can take Yeah, let's see comment. what's remains and what's pulled. Um, I'm going to go through the on ward order. So on two, um, I had an item, which was um, B13, which was about the Moana art. Okay. So ward three. Mr. Nothing Martinez, nothing for you? No, thanks. Okay. Ward 4. Ms. Brooke. B9, B10, B11, and B13. B9, B10, B11, and B13. Okay. And then um, Ward 5. No, Madam Vice Mayor, thank you. None? Okay. And then uh, at large, Mr. Nothing. Reese, nothing Madam for Fine. you. Madam Mayor, did you have anything to pull? Okay, nothing? Okay, all right, thank you. So just to recap, I'm going to go over these items, and please correct me if I miss something. I have B9, B10, B11, and B13 to be pulled. Okay, all right. Uh, I'm looking for a motion on the remainder items on the agenda. So, Madam Vice Mayor, can we, we need to take public comment before Oh, we before the motion. Yes, okay, very good. Let's call up the public comment. Thank you. And this should be on, just to keep, keep folks straight, I recommend it's on the action we're about to take, which is to approve or deny the rest of the items. That's what I would Our recommend. first public commenter is Oscar Delgado, followed by Travis Walker, followed by Laura Vargas. Okay. All right. All right. Council Member Delgado, welcome. Yes. Okay. That would be fine. Well, we only have one comment period for consent. Okay. So, but I well, but that. let me ask. We do have comment period on pulled items. No. No, we don't. We only do one comment period for consent agenda. Well, then bring it on. I, I, it was my understanding we have a comment on each of the pulled items. So, okay. Well, thank you, Madam uh, Mayor. Who's not here but listening to us on Zoom? Council members, city manager, and of course the city of Reno team. Great to see all of you. Um, again, my name is Oscar Delgado. I'm the CEO of Community Health Alliance. I'm here today to support, I'm here today to provide my, hopefully support a B item B10. The community around Neal Road is one and very dear to my heart. There was a time when I was a young boy where I actually lived in the neighborhood. And as many of you know, I represented those neighborhoods for 10 years plus when I was on the city council. And I'm incredibly lucky to now continue that work as the CEO of Community Health Alliance. I'm a parent, just like many of all of you. And nothing means more to me, and I'm sure nothing means more to you than when your kids are sick, that you could provide a safe place for them to get health care. 
But imagine that you're that parent with a sick child, and you don't have health insurance. And if you have Medicaid, you don't have anywhere to take them because they don't accept the coverage. What do you do? Do you write it out? Stay home from work? Hopefully you get paid time off. Do you go take them to the ER? Which of course, we've been told time and time again, don't take your folks to the ER because it plugs up the system, et cetera. Do you Google Doc? Jump online and see what can I do to save money before we know the bills start piling on. The simple answer is you take them to CHA. We provide outstanding health care to everyone regardless of their ability to pay or their insurance status. And the health center on Neal Road has been doing that for more than 20 years. First under the banner of St. Mary's and now as CHA. The problem that we're currently, that's taking place on Neal Road is that we're at capacity. So those who have been able to take a tour understand that we have and utilize in every square inch of Neal Road as we speak. We serve nearly 4,000 patients a year and it's difficult to get new patients in. And then that's where we see an opportunity to expand those services. Last year, the council made the wonderful decision to help the Neal Road neighborhood by allocating ARPA funds to a building that the city owns that would allow CHA to provide primary care to an additional 3,600 patients, open a prescription food pantry, begin offering behavioral health services, and also start a pharmacy. This expansion and these new service lines are desperately needed, as many of you all know. And Nevada has some of the worst access to primary medical and behavioral health care, as we all know. And we also know that this is most typically is done, is happens, unfortunately, to communities of color, which we all know that's what Neal Road is. The Neal Road Health Center means a lot to so many. Some of those people are here today, of course, and some had to leave, unfortunately, because like many of the people in the community, they have to go to work. My hope is that all of you will keep your commitment in supporting not only them, but also the community. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here, um, Council Member. Really appreciate it. Travis Walker, followed by Laura Vargas. Uh, Madam Mayor and Reno City Council members, thank you for your time. Sure. Uh, my name is Dr. Travis Walker, and I serve as the Chief Medical Officer for Community Health Alliance. I am a family physician by training uh, and a resident of Ward 2, um, and I'm here to support item B10. I stand before you today to really just extend my deepest gratitude for the City of Reno's strategic foresight and unwavering commitment for health equity. This decision to allocate $5 million from ARPA funding uh, for the expansion of the Nell J. Redfield uh, Health Center on Neal Road is really a monumental step uh, toward our shared mission to care for our community. Uh, for those who know, don't know, this health center has served Reno citizens, as Dr. Or Oscar Delgado uh, mentioned, uh, for decades. And we've been able to take on that mantle of caretaker uh, since 2012. Uh, this center represents the epitome of we at CHA, what we at CHA strive to achieve, providing quality health care regardless of rate, age, race, gender, sexual orientation, ability, but moreover, the increasingly difficult task of providing health care regardless of economic status and income. The impact that this health center has on public health cannot be overstated. Data clearly shows that health centers like ours significantly reduced health care costs. By focusing on preventative care and the management of chronic conditions, we reduce the need for expensive emergency room visits and hospitalizations and avoid untimely reactive care in favor of quality proactive care. Not many people realize either that generations of medical providers uh, have also benefited from the city of Reno's foresight to utilize this space as a community clinic. I remember being a medical student rotating with Dr. Jason Crawford at Neal Road when St. Mary's was the tenant. Countless other medical students, physician assistant students, nurse practitioner students have passed through ne uh, the Neal Road Clinic adding to our shared mission. We aim to continue this tradition of serving and training uh, established by our predecessors and address the health needs, but also build the base of medical providers that our community needs. From growing up as a Reno native to now being able to serve my hometown as a physician and leader, I'm proud to know that together we can ensure that your support yields the maximum benefits for the health and well-being of all Reno residents. 
This investment stands as a commendable example of visionary leadership from previous city councils through you guys and the ongoing commitment to a healthier and more equitable city. Thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you, doctor. Appreciate you being here. Laura Vargas followed by Michael Johnson. Good morning. My name is Laura Vargas and I reside in Reno, Nevada, Ward 5. I'm currently employed as the Grants Development Director for Community Health Alliance, and I'd like to speak to consent agenda item number B10. Between 1986 and 1996, I was employed by the City of Reno as a community development planner. In early 1990, the city began its neighborhood planning program, and the Neal Road neighborhood was one of the neighborhoods I was assigned to develop a plan for. I was at the table with other community representatives when the concept for the construction of a park and surrounding service facilities came to be. The intent at that time was to provide much needed human resource services to lower income families residing in a high density, low service area. Working in partnership with the county and community based organizations, the city made a commitment to the residents of the Neal Road neighborhood to bring the concept to fruition. The needs of those residing in the immediate Neal Road neighborhood, as well as the general 89502 area, have not changed. Families still need access to health care and health care related services, and CHA has the proven and time tested ability to provide that. The planned expansion of the CHA Health Center will include additional exam rooms, access to behavioral health services, a prescription food pantry, and a pharmacy. This expansion will provide more space for additional health service providers and serve an additional 3,600 unduplicated patients annually. Support for this expansion honors the original intention, community partnerships, and commitment made by the city to ensure access to services for residents in the Neal Road neighborhood. This is an opportunity to recommit to an investment that has and will continue to have a long-term positive impact and benefit for residents of Reno. Thank you. Michael Johnson, followed by Alexis Adams. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, Madam Vice Mayor, City Council members, employees of City of Reno. My name is Michael Johnson, and I'm a board member of Community Health Alliance Foundation. I've been with that foundation for 12 years in its existence, and prior to that, I was the chief operating officer for Community Health Alliance, had the responsibility for operating that Neal Road Clinic. Prior to that, I was the vice president at St. Mary's Regional Medical Center, which operated those clinics on Neal Road. And I want to also correct the record in that that clinic has been in operation since the mid-90s, when on the corner of Peckham Lane and Neal Road, a maternal child midwife program was established by St. Mary's to serve that specific community. I make this point simply because with that kind of track record over all these years of serving that many patients, it's a remarkable investment in that community. It makes perfect sense to extend that, especially since it is the property of Reno, Nevada. My career has been in healthcare, and I can tell you with operating hospital services, community-based clinics, the big emphasis needs to be in shifting that burden of care into the community. It is the most cost-effective way to do it. This concept the CHA puts forth in its other operating clinics and proposes for this clinic is really ground-shaking. Can you imagine seeing a primary care clinic uh, professional, such as Dr. Travis Walker, that is accessible, it's affordable, you're able to get an appointment. But with that service, you have bundled with that a prescription pharmacy that is low cost prescription medications right inside the facility. As well as, you have behavioral health offered. Now, it's a unique opportunity to provide behavioral health in a world that is struggling to meet those kinds of service needs. I'm a patient of CHA, and when you are a patient there, your physician does a hot handoff where they bring in a behavioral health specialist right into the exam room to meet with you, to start that relationship. Besides that, you get a prescription for food that is necessary for your care. Not just food, but prescribed food that is beneficial in a therapeutic way. 
You have WIC services, you have immunization services, all under one roof. So for working families, can you imagine what that saves in them in, in transportation costs, in time, and being able to get the kind of services that are bundled around them in an affordable way? I urge you to continue your commitment to this particular project because it makes good sense. It's a good value for what you have. You can see by the people here in support, there are actually employees that were from that original clinic in the mid-90s that are here that are a testament to the kind of services that they believe in. So I thank you for your time. I thank you for your past investment. And I urge you to consider additional. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mike. Appreciate it. Alexis Adams, followed by Jacqueline Maloney. Jacqueline Maloney, followed by Mana Fernandez. All right. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and Reno City Council members and Vice Mayor. My name is Jacqueline Maloney and I currently am the Development Director for Community Health Alliance. I am also the Director of our Community Health Alliance Foundation Board. I am here supporting item B10 today. This is an amazing project that has the potential to do so much for the Neal Road neighborhood. As you know, the Neal Road neighborhood has historically been one of the most underserved neighborhoods in Reno. The council should be commended for choosing to use ARPA funds to address health equity. This expansion will allow CHA to serve thousands more patients at our Neal Road Center through the expansion of primary care, the addition of behavioral health, the addition of a prescription food pantry, as well as the addition of a pharmacy. CHA has quite a bit of experience over the last three and a half years with expansion. We raised 1.5 million to complete the expansion of our Sparks Health Center in June of 2021. And we raised an additional 2.5 million to complete the relocation and expansion of our Sun Valley Health Center in August of 2022. We feel like we've become pretty adept at the process, as well as the costs associated with these types of projects. While we are very confident that the cost of the proposed expansion at the Neal Road will land around 4.5 million, we know that we can raise whatever additional funds may be needed to see the project through to completion. We've had several discussions with some of our biggest supporters, and they are incredibly excited about this project. This expansion will provide more health care and behavioral health access to some of our most vulnerable citizens, and it'll have a positive impact on health outcomes in this area. That's a pretty easy thing to get behind. Yeah. Again, thank you for the time to speak with you today, and thank you for your, for your commitment to the Neal Road neighborhood. All right. Thanks, Jacqueline. Maria Fernandez, followed by Victor Salcido. Hi, for the record, Maria Fernandez. Uh, good afternoon, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Maria Fernandez. I'm a family physician and medical director at Community Health Alliance, um, and I'm here to speak on advocating for the Neal Road expansion. You could say that I'm very biased in this as I practice family medicine at Neal Road. And so I take care of these patients every single day. I see newborns all the way to elderly patients, insured, uninsured, uh, poorly insured. And so um, I can speak first and foremost about uh, what I see every day. Um, the, co the clinic is located, it's embedded in the community, um, so most the majority of the patients walk to, to see me. They bring all of their family members, they live at the local apartment complexes, or they live in the houses nearby. And so um, it's truly the definition of public health that we are meeting the people where they are. This expansion would be revolutionary for that uh, community. We would be able to provide uh, more providers access to more to seeing more patients, 3,600 as they mentioned. Behavioral health, we know there's a, a behavioral health, mental health crisis here in Nevada. Um, as well as food pantry for my diabetics, I would be able to get them access to foods that are good, for, you know, when they have diabetes for my patients with heart disease, I could get them heart healthy options. And then what I'm most excited about is I could um, send them over to the pharmacy. And a lot of the times when my patients come, they 
say I wasn't able to get to the pharmacy, I had transportation issues, I had difficulty getting my medications, the medications were cost prohibitive, we would be able to avoid all those barriers to care, um, which actually worsen health outcomes. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is that a lot of times these community members, these kiddos that we've seen over the years, as they mentioned, they actually come back and work for Community Health Alliance. They um, become front office staff or they, they kind of come back and serve and work with our with our organization. Um, I have a patient, uh, someone who is a patient of mine who lives in the local community, who goes to UNR is, pre, is pre-med and she comes and shadows me. And so it's kind of incredible to see this cycle of being able to both serve the community and then also empower them. So I uh, welcome you to come spend time with me at Neil Road if you want to uh, see this gem of a clinic as I love working there and I hope that you consider this. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Victor Salcido followed by Osvaldo Jimenez Estapieda. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, Madam Vice Mayor, members of the council. Uh, for the record, my name is Victor Salcido with Community Health Alliance. As you've already seen and heard, um, we have a number of supporters here who will happily talk to you about the impact that CHA has on this particular community and the excitement of what bringing new lines of desperately needed services to Neal Road will mean to those neighborhoods. I wanted uh, to take a little time to address a specific concern that I know maybe some of you may have, which is our collective ability to meet deadlines from the federal government for these funds. When the council voted to support this project on March 8th, 2023, I was the one on the Community Health Alliance team that reached out to the city staff that very next week, asking for a meeting to get the ball rolling on this. We had that meeting and things got off to a great start. After that meeting, Community Health Alliance took it upon itself to conduct its due diligence on finding the right design firm for our project. <coughs> our team, uh, with, our, through, with our own expenses, flew, our, flew down to San Diego to meet and tour with an architect that specializes in maximizing space, working specifically in the healthcare sector and federally qualified health centers such as ours. After some time of seeing if that was a good fit, we ultimately decided that having a local firm with a tremendous reputation was the best way to move forward. That was Teutonics. Working hand in hand with city staff through November and December, it is our understanding that Teutonics provided staff with the required conceptual documents on December 20th, 2023. At that time, the goal was to get on the agenda for the January meeting. After some modifications and edits, we were told on February 7th that it was ready to be presented to council. We were then told it would be on the agenda for March 13th. Then we were told it was delayed until March 27th. Here we are now on March, April 10th. Now the important thing of where we are now is this. Teutonics is here because they believe they can get this project completed by the deadlines. They would not be here otherwise. They understand the deadline and they believe it is still possible. And considering the need of those in this community that we are trying to help, I believe we owe it to them to do everything in our power to bring this to fruition. I ask you to please support this project and help bring those desperately needed services to Neal Road. I'll also add that at our last meeting, city staff agreed with Teutonics and with CHA that this was still possible. Um, so again, I, I thank you for your time I thank you for your consideration and commitment to this neighborhood and to bring these desperately needed services to them. And I also thank you for your public service in serving in these roles. Thank you so much. Thank you, Victor. Appreciated that. Osvaldo Jimenez Estapieda, followed by Carolina Martinez. Hello, Madam Mayor, City Council. Uh, my name is Osvaldo Jimenez Estupiñan. I'm a small business owner, and I also work at UNR as Director of Hispanic Latinx Community Relations. I'm from Reno, and maybe just like a lot of people here, I've seen it grow from more of a small rural town to what we are today. One thing that has always been important to me is healthcare. Being from a first-generation family, access to healthcare was always something we needed support with. I'm here today to advocate for Community Health Alliance or CHA and the ARPA Fund Grant for the Neil Road Expansion, Origin the Item B10. 
Uh, generations of my family have gone to the CHA healthcare clinics, and I'm currently a patient and board member there. The reason that I say I've seen the town grow to what we are today is because I've seen that same thing with CHA. I've seen it grow and impact the lives of tens of thousands of community members and providing the best healthcare service possible. I've seen them grow and outgrow spaces. Neil Road, just like all of their clinics, has reached capacity, and we need to be able to serve more people. Every day there are more clients, Reno and Sparks are growing so much and we need to be able to meet that demand of growth and give people quality and affordable health care. With the expansion, it will give CHA the ability to serve around 3,600 more patients. We need to ensure that the original grant is followed through so we can continue to provide the best health care possible. I think it's important to note the amount of growth that has happened in the last few years in Reno Sparks. We're only going to continue to keep growing and we need to be able to provide the best health care possible for everyone here and everyone who will move here in the future. Uh, this is more than just expanding New Road. It's about providing the best health care in the city and state of Nevada for everyone. Thank you, City Council. All right. Thank you, sir. Okay. Hola, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Carolina y estoy aquí para apoyar el artículo la, la agenda B10 con el servicio de nuestra comunidad. Hi, my name is Caroline Martinez and I'm here to support uh, agenda item B10. Y estoy aquí para apoyar la la clínica Community Health. Con todo su servicio, nos gustaría que recibiera su ayuda con el servicio que tienen. Tienen muy buenos doctores. I'm here to support Community Health Alliance and then all of the medical and healthcare services that they have. They have amazing staff and doctors. Y nos han ayudado muchísimo a ayudar a mantener nuestra salud saludable, nuestra vida saludable. And they have helped ensure to keep our life just within more healthcare and making sure that we are all taking care of ourselves. Y nos gustaría que recibieran ellos su ayuda también para que sigan ayudando a toda nuestra comunidad a salvar vidas saludables. And we would like to continue to see them grow and helping and impacting more lives here in the state and in the city. Muchas gracias y se, la, se los agradeceremos toda la vida por su ayuda. Thank you so much and we'll appreciate it for our entire lives. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Madam Vice Mayor and Madam Mayor, with that, we have no additional public comments for our consent agenda. For the record, we did receive six comments which were directly associated with various um, B items prior to 4 p.m. yesterday, March 9th. Five letters in favor and one letter in opposition. Those have been distributed to the Reno City Council and are a part of the record on reno.gov forward slash meetings. Okay. So um, what I'd like to do now, um, I really appreciate everybody's time and attention. I know everyone's been sitting for a long time almost three hours, uh, me too, and so is our clerk. And so what I'd like to do is take a 20 minute break and then I'd like to come back and um, tackle our first item on the consent agenda, which is P10. Um, I wanna let the uh, group know that there are bathrooms on several floors, not this floor. Uh, it's on floor uh, two and there are uh, floor three, floor four. I think, I don't know if people need a, uh, a guide, Mickey, uh, to go on the elevators up. No. So you could go to floor two, no problem. But anyway, we'll, we'll be in recess. And then at that point, uh, Mayor Shevi will take back over the meeting. And we'll see you then. Madam okay. Vice Mayor, before we yeah. go into break, can we take a motion on the remaining items? Oh, thank you for reminding me. That's thank okay. You. So just to re reiterate, we have pulled items B9, B10, B11, and B13. So we're voting on the remaining items. OK. May I ask, I'm look may yes. ask a question Oops. on the remaining items? The, the, the one we just received input on the B10. community health lines, that's only on B10, correct? That's what I understood. Okay, I didn't pull it, but now that I've heard some of the comments, I, I wanted to confirm it was, so okay. Yes. We'll get, okay, thank you. Okay, all right, so I'm looking for a motion uh, to approve the remainder items on the consent agenda. Motion. Okay, I had a motion from Mayor Sheevy, a second from Council Member Ebert. Uh, are there any comments on the motion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion passes unanimously. Uh, we'll be in recess until uh, 10 to 1.
All right, Madam Clerk. Is she over there? I don't see her. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Sorry, Mickey. All right, Madam Clerk, will you do me a favor? I want you, based on the amount of public comment uh, present also in the room, I always like to sort of prioritize so we can get people back to their jobs and the things that are important in their lives. Absolutely, Madam so Mayor. So if we you want, we're, we're going to reconvene uh, at 12.54 and uh, Council Member Ebert is absent at this time. Um, so if you would like, I think we can just knock out the consent agenda items, B9, B10, majority of the population here is for B10, and then I think some of our D items. So if you want, we can take B9 first. Monica promises to be very speedy. And then we can do B10 for most of the um, commenters that are in the room. Okay, thank you so much. And I believe that Councilwoman Dewar took a uh, public comment on that item. Yep, we're all set with public comment, so we have no more consent agenda public comment at this time. Okay, thank you so much. Hi, Monica, nice to see you. You too. Good afternoon. Yes, Okay, good afternoon. the floor is yours. Well, uh, Councilwoman Ebert pulled this item, so well, I don't know. Well, she is somewhere to... in the room, but we will get going. Okay, well, I have a brief presentation if there is not questions. I think she's eating lunch. I'll okay. just ask a question. I, I, I wasn't going to pull this, but since it's been pulled, I had a question about accounting for this money. Does it show on our books? Because it seems like it's money that is going to the city. It is going to be spent by the council under the government accounting rules, is it something that shows on our books? And you're not finance department. Finance department said they'd take notes and get back to us on that. Because I just, it seems like an off book kind of fun. And, you know, that's where the auditors, you know, get involved. Did you get an answer on that? Uh, Monica Kirch, for the record. No, I did not. I do not know if uh, Director Rambiran is in here. But okay. the funds okay. will be donations from developers to the community foundation to establish a fund for affordable housing initiatives. I get They're not that. funds coming to the city. But in your presentation to me, you said the city council some later date would be allocating those funds. And I just... No. The, the city council will have authority over how the, the, the projects for which the, um, the funds will be spent. That, to me, seems like a, a government action, fiscal policy. I just, I'm going to just raise um, the flag that... I, I think that this money has to be accounted for in the city's books somehow from my novice understanding of government accounting. Yeah. And it sounds like I did ask that. It did, sounds like no one from finance looked into that. Okay, Councilman Breckis, let, let's have her present first and then we'll come back to the body. I'm trying to. Okay, thank you. And that's fine. Along. I just want to, I, I would like to hear your presentation okay. and then you might have more questions, Councilman Breckis. So uh, after okay. we hear what you. Got for us today. So go ahead, okay, Monica, I just have take a it short away. Presentation again, Monica Kirch for the record. Um, today I'm here to request approval of an agreement with the Community Foundation of Northern Nevada to manage an affordable housing donation fund. Um, as you can see from this slide, between 20 and 22, Council approved five projects, appro approximately 6,100 units, with conditions that um, development that the developments would contribute $500 to $1,000 per door to an affordable housing fund. Uh, in November, we came back and council authorized staff to negotiate an agreement with the community foundation for the management of these funds. The fund will be established to provide a mechanism to collect charitable donations from developers to assist with affordable housing initiatives. The contributions are estimated to be approximately $4.2 million and start between tw and so we'll start coming in between 2024 and 2027 with a 10 to 15 year build out. The community foundation has supported the community philanthropically for the last 25 years and has a long history of managing public private partnership funds for charitable purposes. Since these funds will be tracked will be trickling in over the next 10 to 15 years. This fund will be established as a mechanism to collect these, do these donations and invest them in a collective pool over this time period. Um, at the time that the balance reaches $4 million or at a time council deems necessary, a di distribution strategy will be established and approved by council. 
The strategy will be dependent on the needs at that time um, because these funds will be coming in over the next 10 to 15 years and there could be a different need at that time. And here is the proposed motion. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. I'm going to start with you, Councilwoman Breckis. And just to remind everyone, we're going to stick to our typical process. Three minutes for everyone. We'll go around again, make sure everyone gets their comments on the record. Okay. And we'll continue to go around again. And then uh, you know how it works. Give me a motion. And we'll move from there. So I'm going to start with Councilwoman Breckis. Go ahead. Yeah. I didn't pull this one. It was Ms. Ebert. But I'll just, because I do want these recorded for the record for verbatim, so there'll be a history is um, I did ask questions in my briefing how these would be accounted for on the city books. And um, I haven't heard, you know, and no one here is here from finance, but my understanding is that we have money that is under our authority to spend. We have money that we've made authority to raise, if you will, through a revenue action. Um, and I'm just calling out the question, does that show on city books under general accounting principles and requirements that are you know, in place? And the reason I bring this up is I didn't support any of these. There's a mechanism under Nevada law to get these um, sort of commitments, and we didn't do it. So it came through, again, a very transactional way of you know commitments sometimes written at the table of approvals and I just think that um, it's a it was a workaround about a revised statutes of impact fees or exactions uh, it was ad hoc and case by case I think a lot of developers agree with that but as the money trail continues on I just want to make sure that there's accountability on, on our books for this money thank you all right thank you so much councilman Martinez Anything? No, I'm good for now. Thank All you. All right. Councilwoman Taylor, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I just have one quick question, Monica. Um, as far as administration goes on the, something like this, if I saw your schedule right, it looks like it came to us November of 2023, and then it took another five months to get to this point, not because of any delays or anything, but just because of the, the operations of how things like this work. Correct. So when it came back to council, it was a difference of five minute, five months. Correct. Okay, thank you so much. All right, Vice Mayor Dewar. No, nothing. All right, uh, <clears throat> go ahead, Councilwoman Ebert. I I just had or just wanted to have a presentation on okay. that. Okay, so thank you. Thank All right, you. Um, Madam Clerk, is Councilman Reese on the phone. Yes, I, Madam Mayor, but I don't have any questions. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, sending it back to you, Councilman Breckis. Anything? Uh, no, I didn't pull yeah. this. I'm okay. Not. A uh, couple of questions. Curious, um, are you seeing other cities do this? And if so, what does that look like? Because I guess part of my fear is, number one, it might be hard to build another affordable housing project for $4 million, right? We might take a while to get to that $4 million. In the meantime, we could be using those funds uh, you know, to help assist. One of the things that's been, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, we, al we, we have allocated um, and spent nearly $7 million on rental deposit assistance, that is which I have seen it be a miraculous program. It has been unbelievable because it's really hard for people to save up for that big down payment. And then also it really can help us keep people into housing. Um, so I would hate to sort of, so I kind of want to see what those mechanisms are because if we say, okay, we need to get to 4 million, then I mean, we might be sort of sitting on this for a while. Uh, maybe the council does want to have direction to build, you know, housing with it. Um, not all housing is the same, you know, Sage Street type of uh, housing could be in effect. So I kind of think the council should have um, leeway to be able to figure out how those funds should be used. Maybe it's mental health. Maybe it's, um, you know, just different aspects of, uh, you know, helping rise with it. Something like that. Have yeah. you thought about that, Monica? Yeah, agreed. Uh, and that's why there's a clause in the contract that um, says when the fund reaches $4 million or at a time that council deems necessary to um, start those conversations again. Um, right now, we don't know exactly when the funds are going to start coming in. We know it's going to be over 
a, a long period of time, and so we are trying to get the mechanism in place for the donations to be made, and then um, the community foundation will come back each year and give an update, and then council can have those discussions on is it time now to decide how we want to use these funds. Um, and with the regards to the question of other organizations doing this, the county has a fund also, an affordable housing fund set up with the community foundation, um, and they had a I guess, large seed amount. So they were able to start their process right away uh, and they're doing like a grant application process um, because they had funds in there already. We don't have any funds yet. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is why we kind of set it up this way. So wait, are you saying, cause I know we've asked uh, for developers to put into that fund. Are you saying we don't have any of those funds? We don't have any of the funds yet. We're expecting that they will start coming in because they're at time of building permit. So they are. So they have to be building. Yeah. So um, between 24 and 27. So sometime this year, um, all the way through 27, is when we expect that they'll start coming in, and they'll come in. Um, my understanding from development services is in chunks. Um, like we're going to pull on 20 houses or, or whatever the number is, and then the fees will come in for those, and this will happen in like a 10 to 15 year build, build out. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like an incredible concept really support it, but I think you have to look at the details so that it, it really does work and it's super effective. Um, so like you're saying, because we see a lot of projects that come here that never come to fruition, right? So I understand that time of build. And if I'm correct, we're having less building, uh, less permits coming into the city. Uh, a lot of those projects have sort of halted. And then how much do you decipher that a, a developer should be putting in per door? Those types of things. So I think there's sort of a lot to hash out. Yeah, those those numbers were decided um, by council. Some of them are 500 per door and some are 1,000 per door. Those were decided um, when those those projects were approved back in 2021 20, and 22. Mm -hmm. um, and so now we're trying to yeah. get the But we did it here at the table, so yes. I, I haven't seen consistency. So I'd like to just make sure, because I think it's a good program. It's totally worthwhile. Okay. So thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Go ahead, Councilwoman Ebert. I, I do have a question. So do you think that this will help like with the um, wait list time for people trying to get into affordable housing and all? Um, like for rentals or? Yeah, just in general. Um, at this time, there isn't a, I guess a, there, it hasn't been decided how the funds are gonna be spent because they're gonna come in over the next 10 to 15 years and the thought was to get the mechanism in place. The community foundation is experienced with managing these funds, these types of funds. And then once there is a substantial amount of money in the fund, then council can decide at that time what the priority is. Is it, it could be rental assistance, it could be down payment assistance, it could be mental health, it, whatever it is deemed at that time, once there is a sufficient amount of money um, in the pool. Right now there isn't anything. Mm -hmm. um, and it, there's probably not going to be a substantial amount at, at least for maybe five years. Okay. So there's going to be a long time before we see kind of any results yeah. from yeah. this. They were designated as for affordable housing initiatives, which could be many things. Okay. And we didn't want to yeah. put those kind of parameters right now if in 10 years it wasn't the same need. Okay. And I would just really stress in the contract that it needs to be the decision of the council, so there's public comment, public process, and not up to them where there's some trigger that, hey, we want to go do this project because it's affordable housing. I do think that the community should weigh in how those funds should be utilized. Yeah, and, and we set it up with the council having maximum control over, over the um, pool of money. Okay. They're just being basically the fiscal agent. Okay, go ahead, Council. Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you brought it up, and I'm so glad to hear the answer because that was my main concern. I didn't want it, the decisions to be made by a nonprofit, we've as seen good as they are, as good as they are, where they're fantastic and they're our partner. But I didn't want the decisions being made. Nonprofits don't have to do open meeting law, uh, comply with any kind of public process. And that was what was really important to me this whole time. You've heard me say it before. I brought it up at my briefing. I'm bringing it up now. So I'm glad to hear the assurances. And that's how thank it's you. written in the agreement. All right. Thank you so much. Councilwoman Eber, I'm going to send it to you for a motion. I'll make a motion to approve. All right. Thank you. I have a motion. Second. I have a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. All right, thank day. you so much, Monica. All right, sending it back to you, Madam Clerk. 
Thank you, Madam Mayor. We're moving on to item B10, pulled by Councilmember Ebert. All right, go ahead, take it away, Councilwoman Ebert. Three minutes. Or actually, you're going to give us the staff presentation, and then we'll go to Councilwoman Ebert. Good afternoon, Madam Vice Mayor, Council Members. I'm Justin George, Senior Civil Engineer for the Public Works Department. And um, what I have for you is a quick presentation on this item. Um, this item is for the approval of a consultant agreement with Tectonics Design Group for the Neal Road facility remodel and expansion project in the amount of 342583 this slide shows how this project aligns with the city's strategic plan. As a reminder, Council allocated American Rescue Plan Act funds to healthcare priority category and approved the Neal Road facility remodel and expansion project during the March 8th, 2023 meeting. Today, we are asking for approval of a consultant agreement for the design and construction administration services for the project. As a reminder, ARPA funds need to be encumbered by the end of this year and projects completed by the end of 2026. This slide shows the vicinity map for this project. The Neal Road complex is in Ward 3, east of Interstate 580, to the south of East Moana Lane and Airway Drive, and to the north of East Peckham Lane. Building two at the Neal Road Complex is currently leased to Community Health Alliance to provide critical health care services to a traditionally underserved community. This slide shows an aerial view of building two of the Neal Road Complex in the center. That white footprint is of the existing facility at 5,120 square feet, and the aqua blue footprint is the proposed expansion of 3,500 square feet. This project will include expanding the facility by adding 3,500 square feet of new space and remodeling the existing 5,120 square feet of space for a total of 8,620 square feet. Also required for this project will need to be site improvements for access to the building, adjacent parking lot upgrades, and utility connections, among other ancillary items. Once this project is complete, it will provide 14 exam rooms, an on-site pharmacy, on-site prescription food pantry, and on-site behavioral health services. The preliminary opinion of probable cost ranges from five to nine million dollars. This is an early scoping level of the project and includes fees beyond construction, including fees for design, permitting, utility connections, site improvements, adjacent parking lot services, and other soft costs to get the project completed. Once the design is finalized, we will get a detailed construction cost estimate from the design group, narrowing that cost down. The schedule shows major, this schedule shows major milestones for the project. Today, we're asking for approval of the consultant agreement with Tectonics Design Group. They are a local design firm with commercial, municipal, and medical experience. They were selected from our unranked SOQ list for architectural services. The design will begin with approval of the agreement today and will continue through July of this year. And at final completion is when we'll get that detailed construction cost estimate based off of the final design. Following design, we've got to get that through permitting and plan review, scheduled for August, September this year. We look to advertise October, November of this year, open bids in November, and bring back a construction contract for award in December. January through January 25 through October 26 is the anticipated construction timeframe. 
that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, Councilwoman Ebert, I'm gonna send it to you. Yeah, I have some questions. So this, this is in addition to the $5 million that we've already allocated of ARPA funds? Or is this just deciding how we're gonna allocate five, uh, some of the $5 million? So the, the 342,000 for the consultant agreement comes from the, the 5 million ARPA allocation. Okay, um, and this question um, is kind of ties into a lot of the discussion we had earlier today about the Record Street facility. Um, I understand that this is an investment in the Neal Road facility that the city of Reno owns so that Community Health Alliance can use the facility. Um, what was the process that, that Community Health Alliance went through to do that? and is another organization able to follow that same process to use the Community Health Alliance building? And would the city of Reno follow that same process to fund any repairs at those facilities? I think that question is, is uh, beyond my purview and I'll <laughs> ask Carrie to step up. I'll help you. Uh, Director of Public Works, Kerry Kosky. Um, to answer your question, uh, we, the Community Health Alliance has a lease agreement for that particular building. The building is in uh, good condition, um, and basically they are asking to expand their social services. Okay, so how would another organization get a lease agreement for the Record Street facility? Um, a, a lease agreement would have to come through, you know, once the lease is, um, uh, if, for example, the health, the Community Health Alliance decided they did not want to continue the lease, then they would approach the city and then we would bring that forward to council to um, make a recommendation to uh, go, forward, uh, go forward with another lease. No, but okay. she asked about Record, Record. Street. Oh, with the record? She yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. You're oh, asking no, no, about okay. Record Street? Yeah, yeah. I was oh. just saying, you know, we have kind of a, a similar situation with a facility that's owned by the oh. city of Reno, and we're using ARPA funds to um, expand and, and repair, repair a city of Reno property so that an organization can use it. And I'm trying to understand what the difference is for this facility versus the Record Street facility, which we've let fall into disrepair. And is there a process and another organization can use so that we can bring the Record Street facility up to what we're doing with the Neal Road facility? Or does it just require that, you know, a former city council member run the organization? Director Kosky, let me. I, Thank you. I'm not certain uh, exactly. Um, I, I might be misstating it, and I'd have to defer to Mr. Hodge. But I don't believe the ARP funding is available for ordinary maintenance uh, projects, which is what the Record Street project would be. Um, it is available for the expansion of facilities that um, provide care or the establishment of facilities that provide care. OK. All right, Correct. that was three minutes, so I'm going to move on to anyone else. Go ahead, Councilman Brackus. Uh, something, you know, I wasn't going to pull this, but um, a lot of the public comments sometimes helps inform your thinking, and then you do want to. But when I was reading this, um, something caught my eye, and, and I think someone here talked about familiarity with this building, you know, when they it was originally worked as a clinic, and I was city staff in 1998 when it was, so I have some history with it also. Um, oh, it says here, here, the Neal Road facility has been leased by St. Mary's and is currently leased to Community Health Alliance. Correct. Okay. And I think I brought this up when the five million came forward. Where is the lease? And I want to understand the lease. I haven't seen the lease. I've asked for the lease, I think. We provided the lease in a memo to council. Okay, who is the lease with? The lease is with the Community Health Alliance. The Did, current lease is. As a successor to the St. Mary's lease? Uh, uh, yes. Okay, so that is um, what I thought. And a lot of leases will have heirs and successor provisions. But I'm really concerned moving forward with an inheriting a lease that contemplates occupation by another party of a completely different facility. And to me, the front loading of this should have been, Mr. Manager, I'll turn to you, the new lease, okay, the new lease. And I, I, I'm really troubled by that, that the council, I know there's time frames and that's problematic, but the, the council needs to have in front of them a lease 
with CHA before we move forward. Not an error in its successor to a lease that it doesn't even contemplate this activity. And you've ha we've had months to do that. So I, I just, and, 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 I'm, and I'm open to it. I'm very open to it, but that should jump ahead because the other questions are, Mr. George, you said in response to my colleague, this 342 is out of the 5 million. So let's say there's 4.5 million, but the project you told me was between 5 and 9 million. So, you, you know, where's the 4 million coming from? If Community Health Alliance has access to make the project go to nine million, good for them. But I want the city to have terms on that lease. And that's that's where I'm at. I'm okay moving forward. I didn't support, I don't think, the five million. I thought we should have put it to other things. But the council said yes and they want to go forward. But I want to do it right. Okay, I want to do it right. And you know, Living with this old lease as we move forward on the design is just not where I can get at this point. I'm really troubled. Why didn't you bring forward a new lease, Mr. Uh, Thornley? Because there's an existing lease in place and it's active for at least Correct. another year or two. Correct. There's but no I'm, reason to bring it forward right Correct. Now. But I think there is because if we're talking about a five to nine million dollar project and they bring investment and we bring investment, you know, we should outline those terms of uh, of it. I, I really, you know, often right. I, I say the city's too transactional, but here's a transaction that I think is leaving us behind. And I thank anyway. you, Councilman Breckis. Yeah. I'm going to uh, move on. Go ahead, Councilman Martinez. Thanks so much for Three the opportunity. Minutes. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Mr. George, uh, for explaining uh, everything that's going on. I do want to just remind the council that we had already made the decision to invest the ARPA funding that we had gotten into increasing access to health care and making sure that we're investing those $5 million in uh, that access and providing equity to a neighborhood, which I just walked around over the last two weekends and had heard from our constituents about the, the need that they have, the benefits that they see from the, the all-inclusive family resource center that it's located at Miguel Rivera Park, whether it's the child care center that's provided by the Boys and Girls Club, the services that the Women and Children Center of the Sierra provide, or getting access to health care from our Community Health Alliance partners. Uh, we see the need and the amount of folks that come in to that facility to receive services. Um, and it is a space that was already uh, called uh, by uh, Laura Vargas as a high density, low service area that is in dire need of these services. And so I urge my fellow council members to continue to support something that we had already put in motion. And this is just part of the uh, process for us to get there and allocating the $5 million so we can have a full understanding of what the total cost is going to be for us to get there, whether it is $5 million or $9 million, um, it does sound like we have the support from our, our current leaseholder to meet that delta and get us to where we need to across the finish line. So we need to be good partners uh, and go on our word and make sure that we support this expansion. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, Councilman uh, Reese. Sorry. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, first of all, um, I want to thank all the speakers who are there today. I, I was particularly moved by many of the health care workers, the doctors who are providing the care. But I was also very moved by the speakers who some of them spoke in Spanish uh, and have a very personal and deep connection to the work that's being done out of the facility that we own. So the second thing I wanted to talk about is when the council originally allocated these monies, for the expansion of the facility we own. Uh, we were, of course, in the throes of a, a pandemic and post-pandemic world. And so I think we all had top of mind the importance of, of health and health equity. And I think it is important to continue that conversation. It's not every day, I think, that this council gets to have an impact on health outcomes. Uh, sometimes we're dealing with the more minute and mundane issues of city life. But in this particular case, this really is and does speak to, um, I think, some meaningful work. There's legacy work being done out of this facility. And also, I think there's intergenerational work that 
happens here to provide health outcomes for families who are impacted both today and, and certainly into the future. One of the primary care physicians spoke about seeing entire families. So I am very encouraged by the conversations that were had uh, by our public uh, commenters today. The other thing is, is Council Member Breckis, I think, is right and correct that an important component of this conversation is uh, a lease and an examination of that lease, although I, I perhaps disagree that they have to be coupled with this particular vote. I think we can vote today to move forward with the design process, which is a necessary component of expanding the facility we own without having the lease in front of us. I, I do believe that a lease extension is appropriate, and certainly we will see it in its normal course. It's not unusual for leaseholders to not come to talk about the lease until, you know, maybe six months out from the lease expiring. Um, I will say that this facility has been three or four different entities have operated out of this facility before CHA. And so I don't, I, I really am not concerned as to who the operator is. It's more about the building we own. We own a facility in an area of town where health and health um, access are incredibly challenging. Uh, and so uh, I think no matter who is in the building, expanding the physical footprint of the building we own is an important component of our commitment to equitable outcomes, especially in the health space. So um, again, I think Councilmember Breckis is, is wise on this point, but I don't think it's preventing us from moving forward today. I also think, and I'll just say, it's sort of a chicken or the egg thing. Until we make our decisions here about spending the money, which we have already allocated, it's very difficult for the foundation work to be done where other players are going to come to the table and add to the bucket. And so I think for us, we've got to get moving on this piece so that the next parts of the puzzle can be had. Thank uh, you, Madam Mayor. All right, you're 17 seconds over. Thanks so much. Okay, go, going to you, Councilman Taylor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I have some questions. I, have, I, I think the work that CHA does is phenomenal. I've visited the sites. I'm, it, for me, this is not about the work that CHA does. This is about a building that the city owns. So I have concerns on the schedule. And my, my first question is, is this money time sensitive? The $5 million that we allocated for this, is there a time sensitive condition to it? Uh, Carrie Koski, your director of public works. Yes, it is time sensitive. It needs to be, um, uh, we, we do need to have a contract in place by the end of this year. So okay. yes, it is time sensitive. So if we, if we don't meet that obligation, we're gonna lose the money. That's correct. Okay, so that's my first concern. My second concern is this building that we're thinking about renovating, is there anything wrong with it? Other than it is too small. Is it for dilapidated? This, it, Does it have mold? Is it leaking? Is there... It, n none. It's perfectly usable right now? Yes. Okay. In the schedule, we have an estimate or in our packet of about five to nine million dollars. Correct. And then I also heard that we are in the early stages of the scoping. Correct. When we say early stages, the cost estimate that we have, like what percentage is that that you're giving us? 20, 30, 40? Where are we at in the early stages? Well, in the early stages, we're at the very conceptual stage. Uh, the We've met with the... Uh, the architect and the owner, and they are. We, we've had several conversations about the scope and the layout of the facility. Is there room for this schedule to slip? Is there contingency? There is um, a small amount of room. A small okay. amount. I would say we've got about 90 days. So my other question is, when? What's the next step of coming back to council for this? We allocate three hundred thousand dollars. When will we know what the actual cost, or a, a eighty percent, seventy percent level of cost? We will know that in July of this year. Okay, and then you'll bring it back to council. We will know that that cost at that time. Now, if it, say that cost is at five million dollars, then we will move forward and we will put it out to bid. And I'm talking about total project cost here. So we've allocated $5 million total project. So the construction cost is going to, for the building itself, will need to be quite a bit smaller than that, right? Three sure. to three and a half million. Um, 
say we get those part, say that that cost comes in at that amount, then we will go forward with the bid. Um, if it goes over, what we will do is we will meet and we will look and see if we can make that scalable somehow when we take it out to bid, so that um, it gives the uh, Community Health Alliance an opportunity to c fund the gap that that Councilman Martinez was talking about. So I, I might have another round of questions, but I just have concerns again about this schedule because we just heard in an administrative item it took five months for us to bring back an item no again no fault of anybody else sure. but for us to to be able to make that decision so thank you madam mayor sure thank you so much all right go ahead councilwoman yeah. doer thank you so Three much minutes. yeah thanks so much for bringing this forward um i i am so impressed with the work that cha does and so impressed by the community support it's it's really you know, heart filling. I, I don't know what else word to use. They're doing such an important service to our community. Um, that's why we put this item on the um, list for ARPA. Um, it, it was a question at the time I was here. And, you know, the county is generally the one who handles health. I mean, they have the district health board, they have health initiatives, they have the seniors, they have all kinds of programs to work in health. And what I'm wondering is, um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand this five to nine million because I know most of the people in the room don't know, but I'm a geologist, so I managed a lot of construction projects over my career. And one of the things I never did was start a project that I couldn't finish. And I'm very concerned that we don't know the cost and that you, um, your own department, have done an engineer's estimate. Yes. Right, yes. which is has been quite reliable before. What I'm concerned about is the gap. I don't. I'm not used to hearing five to nine million. And so, what I'm wanting to understand is, you said it covers design, permitting, utilities, soft costs. Well, let me ask a few questions. What does that mean? Does it include um, flooring? Yes. Carpeting? Yes. Um, does it include counters, like these kind of counters where you come in? The furniture and fixtures would be um, provided. Uh, by the Community Health Alliance. Okay, and um, maybe I need to c call up a member of the Community Health Alliance, but I want to understand what do, have you done an estimate on what that is? I have not to get we've operational. Had some, we've had some conversations, and I believe that they've got set aside approximately nine hundred thousand dollars. Okay, and that's coming the, out of their own funds. Correct. Okay. Um, 900000 for furniture and fixtures? Yes. Okay. So what happens, if, assuming we approve this, what happens if, let's say it's $6 million? You just said we have about $4.5 million left after we do this. Right. What happens if it's over? Then yeah. we, we talk to the, the Health Alliance and we ask them if they are able to make the gap. Do we move forward with putting it out to bid? Can they make make that gap or can we scale the project back to stay in in budget well what would be a scale back because as i understand this covers both renovation of the existing 5000 square feet and then building a new 3500 correct it does um, so scaling back would be um, less square footage but i mean would you add only a thousand square feet i mean what what I'm concerned about, what if you're right? right? And what if it's the nine million? Right. Not like six million. Yep. So I, I would think that'd be very difficult to scale something like that when we it would and and subsequently since we put together our cost estimate and, and what we do internally is we use a square footage number okay. which is not real reliable, but it okay. is somewhat reliable. Okay. Um and 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 just to kind of give you an idea, we have, you know, for the public safety center, it's a 115,000 square foot building. That came in at $650 a square foot. Okay. But if you look at the size of the building that we're dealing with here, a 350 square foot expansion and 5,000 remodel, it's probably, you know, we put together a number around $800 dollars a square foot. Okay. Now, they could it could much it could come in lower than that. And after talking to Tectonics and the Community Health Alliance, they've got some ideas on materials that they would use that we're not going to build a Cadillac obviously, but we're not going to we're going to build things that were are built to last. So, they've got some ideas on how we can utilize some different materials that might save cost. Okay. Well, I know my time's over. I'll come back. Cut you off. I'm sorry. 
All but, right. Well, uh, I wasn't I talking. Sure she was. That, but. I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just always want to make sure everyone. Uh, hold on. We're on. Um, I'm going to start now. We're on round two, and I'm going to start with Councilwoman Ebert. Go ahead. Okay. Hi. Thank Hi. you. Um, so these updates. Are they specific to Community Health Alliance's needs? Like, I, I heard that the facility is functional now. That it doesn't necessarily need all this work done. So we are taking City of Reno funds to kind of tailor this facility to the needs of Community Health Alliance, correct? To expand the services, correct. Okay, okay. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to ask is, are we considering using union labor to ensure the cost um, remains we, what we've this been would quoted. Be a prevailing wage. Okay. Okay. Job. So prevailing wage, but also union. I mean, it's prevailing wage. Okay. So what? And isn't that required? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Okay. Okay. But but the contractors do have to pay prevailing wage. Okay. Well, yeah. I just wanted to make sure specifically that you know that we're yes. considering using union yes. labor, not yes. just paying prevailing wage, because I. I, you know, having concerns about coming in on budget and on time, Correct. I think, you know, we should look into using union labor. In our contract documents, we specify because it's federal money, we will have to yeah. use um, uh, prevailing wage or Davis-Bacon, whichever is higher. And that is, that is the strictest that we can require in our contract documents. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, Madam Clerk, I cannot see on my screen has their hand up, so I've just been calling on pretty much everyone. Uh, at this time, I believe, Councilman Reese? Yes, Mayor, thank you so much, um, and I do have my hand raised. So I want to make sure that I uh, represent to my uh, colleagues that I, uh, t I did visit the site to see what the expansion would involve, and one of the things that I will say is it's not in any way retrofitting the building to uh, make it better for a particular operator. That facility was designed 20 or 25 years ago, and it is bursting at the seams. They have doctors there in that facility who cannot see the number of patients that are coming in the door because they don't have enough exam rooms. They, the facility is very small and it's they're using every square inch of it um, to the best of their ability, but they are literally turning away potential clients, meaning the people who most need healthcare because the facility is too small to accommodate all of the people who wish to use it. Uh, it is a unique area. I was, uh, I grew up uh, just off Neal at Filbert and went to Smithridge and Pine Elementary School. This neighborhood has been long overlooked as a place for our most uh, sort of marginalized communities. It is largely um, Spanish speaking, um, and there are folks who utilize the facility as their only means of healthcare access. And while I was there, I was struck by uh, two things. One was how many people they were making use of the space that they had, but also they were mo operating a dental clinic out of the facility, out of a, a, a essentially an RV parked out back. Um, it's just uh, this facility needs to be expanded if and, and it we have the land there. Now, whether in five years or 10 years, a different entity is operating the clinical space there, they would need the type of space that this expansion would allow either way. Um, I also want to come back to something that Ms. Kosky said, which was uh, about the timelines and feasibility. Again, our council has already approved these funds. We're now being asked to essentially approve spending a portion of those funds for the design work that needs to be done so that we can determine whether or not it can be built for the cost we have. I think much like any of the projects we have, we sometimes have the initial approval and then we come back as we start approving various contracts. I think this is an easy uh, win for our community because it allows people to access healthcare. If in the scoping of it or the design phase of it, somehow we learn that it is more expensive than we thought, well, we're going to have to come to our uh, tenant and see if they want to put in additional dollars. I assume they're going to be working with foundations to do that. Whatever delta there is, I, I think they would be able to meet. 
And so I'm not worried that it's going to be over the amount we've allocated. Uh, we have the time and I think the technical expertise as staff to be able to make this project happen along all the guidelines that are required by ARPA. And so I'm confident that we'll be able to do it. What we need to do is, is just move the project forward in this small way today uh, so that we can have meaningful legacy generational impacts for health care in this community. All right. Thank you so much. Councilman Breckis, go yeah. ahead. You know, and I, I do appreciate the work of CHA. I, I met um, Mike Rodolico, I think, in 1999 when he moved from New Mexico to run Hawk. And then um, I think later on, uh, Charles Durant came over from the state. I worked with him at the state. I thought he was one of the most brilliant people I've ever worked with on any issue. And then, of course, I served with Mr. Delgado for many years and known other people who've worked there and been clients there. So I, I think the work is good. But I, I do think the central question to the council is... You know, if they end up bringing in more money to the deal, and not unlike Sky Tavern, you know, what is their rights and privileges of the building? Because it almost gets to ownership. And that's fine. You know, maybe it's 30 years or, or something. But if it's beyond, you know, con con um, typical tenant improvements, I think the council needs to go into this very clear-eyed. That's, that's my thinking. Because, look, our responsibility is really to the those who took a tough vote for the federal government to bring this money down to us. And we have to be very solid on delivering to that. It's it's good faith. And this $5 million is what percentage of the money that we got? Did we get, how much do 20% of the money that we got from the federal government. This $25 million. Up to, that I, we allocated. I thought we got 54 million. We got 52 million, 25 okay. went to affordable housing, the okay. other went to these okay. projects. Okay, so it's a large contribution of the money that people took hard votes in DC during the pandemic to deliver down here. And we have to do a good job and a good faith, very solid on that. And I, here's my concern, is that we get a little further down the road and you know, the Stictonics does some bidding and it's five, but they want eight. And then we get into it with CHA. And I think we need to clarify the role, rules. Maybe not to the full of the lease, but Mr. Manager, come back in two meetings with an MOU negotiated with CHA to show us how we're going to work through this, leading into concepts into the lease. If there is a design and a preference by CHA to go beyond the money because we can't be on the we can't be on the hook for anything more than we've already allocated. Okay, if there is, then there will be a negotiation of a lease, and you know the the council needs to think. You know, if CHA brings two million, but you know. Do they get the bill? I mean, what do they get in return for that? We really, that's the central question and we all know it. And I think rather than doing that when you get bid documents and you're trying to issue a bid and bundle the money, the council needs an MOU of how to take us through to this point and also then build concepts for the lease. Because that's, that's the problem. We've never had a private party bring money into our facility when we're managing the bidding, bidding and have money in. So I, I'm... This is a hard one for me, but I'm a little uncomfortable, and I, I really, at, the, at my, my biggest heart is being good to those in D.C. who brought that money down to us. Okay, thank that, you so thank much. You. All right, any other second round of questions? Go ahead, uh, Councilman Martinez. Thank you so much, Madam Mayor. If I may, I know in the past we've asked the specific folks who are on the agenda items to come forward. I'd love to ask uh, Mr. Barrett Donovan, uh, from Tectonics, if he can come in and address some of the concerns that have been brought up. And I know we are in the initial phases of this and just the initial, but if you can maybe talk about some of the concerns when it comes to the timeline and the costs of this project and any of the information you may have to address those concerns. Uh, sure. Yeah, my name is Barry Donovan. I'm a principal at Tectonics Design Group. We're an architecture and engineering firm. Um, as far as schedule goes, I'd say the schedule isn't necessarily luxurious, but it's definitely reasonable. If it gets pushed another couple times, it may become unreasonable, so that's why I'm hoping it gets approved today. We have a staff of 25 in our office. Um, we're split between civil, structural, and architectural, and we have people that are ready to go and start on the project. So I don't think schedule is an issue. My understanding is 
we've worked backwards from the time frames we need to meet at the end of the year, and that's where we ended up with end of July. It seems like a totally reasonable design time frame, and I'm used to doing tight deadlines, and it's, we, I've been working at Tectonics in a principal there for 18 years. I don't think that's an issue. Um, we've talked extensively with the city about making the project scalable. I think that solves the budget concerns. Um, we have a lot of options, and we've done our pricing estimate. It's on the low end of that five to nine million. It's at five million. Uh, there's two other contractors that have also weighed in with their cost, and they're actually lower than ours. So we really need to start design to see where we are. But I don't see these challenges that folks are bringing up right now as insurmountable challenges. Thank you for clarifying that and giving some more context. I will uh, also add and not point any fingers, but I know I've personally been asking, and just to put this on the record too, for updates on all of our projects that have to do with ARPA um, since November. And so um, I know we were scheduled to talk about that, and we are at this point now. Um, and whatever we can do on the council to not delay any of our projects moving forward, um, because we've already had the discussion of where we want to allocate these funds, and having to go back and hash some of that stuff out is just going to to me, open up another kind of worms that we're going to have to find ourselves in. Um, and so I'd rather just uh, keep moving forward with the projects that we already have, unless we have partners who are not willing to work with us um, and that we have identified, which is clearly not the case um, in this in, 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 what's, in what's in front of us today. I will also say, uh, for the record, that I, I do think it's imperative that we do look at that lease um, with our current leaseholder and that we, we look at those terms. And if it does come to a point where we need to renegotiate those, um, then we do. I, I think we do need to address that. And I just want to say I appreciate the clarification from our city manager of why that wasn't included um, here. And it makes sense because it wasn't up for renewal at this point. Thank you, Councilman my Martinez. Time is okay, go ahead, Councilwoman Taylor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, again, back to the schedule, a couple questions. On the approval of the ARPA funds, so I guess, Carrie, this is for you. We have. Um, we have a couple of different things that are going to be driving the schedule on this. It's not just the design, right? It's the construction. Right. It's the bidding. It's the, so I'm not trying to you know say the design isn't going to go forward or anything like that. And again, for me, it's all about the schedule and making sure that we use these funds and not lose them. We had a, a block of projects that I think we approved in, uh, Jade, uh, Mr. Hodge might have to ask this, in March of 2023, yes. as far as allocation for ARPA funds. Yes. Where are those projects? Um, I'm trying to understand where this project lies in the overall schedule of the other projects. Are we behind on this project? Are we ahead on the, this project? Or are we kind of in the middle of where all those other projects might be? I would say, no, Kerry Koski, your deputy, your director of public works. I would say we are near the tail end of the rest of the projects. Um, we have um, several projects that are still in design, um, and that are we're looking to scale all of those projects as well. So this is not, you know, way behind, but it's not at the at the at the le leading the pack either. So um, there's still time in okay. order to get this one done, but it, it it doesn't raise a red flag for me. Okay, and then my other question, and I'm not sure if you're available or if you can answer this just because of it's a broad question, but if we wanted, if the council wanted to move forward with the expansion of this building using other money where there isn't such a time, there isn't such a schedule constraint on it, is this maybe a project that we would be able to look at community project funding requests for, like we did with Evelyn Mount, or other, are there other sources available where we might be able to use funds for this expansion project? Uh, yes, a short answer is there is other other uh, opportunities out there to put in for uh, grants for a project like this. Um, I would say that um, the amount that we'd be looking for, we may have quite a bit of competition in any other grant uh, procurement. Okay. So um, I'm, I'm not sure the timing of how that would, when that would occur. And the grant um, criteria, the access to health care would be pretty compelling and the the I would, yes, constituents I would believe that, so. yes. Okay, thank you so much. All right, uh, thank you so much. There, a couple things I just wanted to 
put on the record. I agree with Councilwoman Breckis in the sense that when you talk about bringing the lease forward, I asked about that in my brief. Um, and the reason I thought was a, a very legitimate reason, because you typically start to look at leases six months before. Um, so I thought that that was completely legitimate. I also wasn't worried because we are the owner of the building. Yes. <laughs> we're going to be we're we're going to be good landlords. Yes. Um, so that was where I you know I think Councilman Breckis makes some good points, but I think um, I wasn't as worried because of that because I know we would do right by the people that we are um, the landlord to. Yes. So, but that that being said, though I think when it comes to clarity, being able to raise money to um, look at timelines. I think the long term probably helps them. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily yes. know, but I would think that it would be beneficial. Um, then I also understand we have a timeline here. So I, I think also whoever, and typically, you know, when we look at making a motion, that needs to be included at least to bring it back because a long term lease yes. I do think is beneficial, um, you know, in conjunction. Yep. So I don't think that Councilman Breckis is wrong. I just think that it probably, when I heard it, it sounded premature. Yep. But now sitting here and listening to the long term and, and that vision, um, I think it could be beneficial. Okay, I'm gonna move on <clears throat> to Councilwoman Dewar, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a qu I, first a comment, then a question. So I've been struggling because every single one of our upper projects, with no exception. So it's like 10 projects have all come in over budget. And when I say budget, over the amount that we budgeted for them. And we are on dead stop on every single project. And every single project needs, this, needs to meet the same deadline. They have to be under contract by December. And I don't know how to make those projects, which we made commitments to all of them, mm -hmm. not just to CHA, but right. all of them. The river, yes. placemaking, a, um, uh, the soccer fields, uh, fencing, um, and, and there's five more. Yes. We make commitments to every single one, and yet every single one has come in over. So none of them have moved forward. And what I am fearful of is that we get to that December because we come in, let's say, with an estimate here, and it's six million. Okay, just six million, yes. not five. I mean, every project's been almost double or fifty percent, and. We have to either scramble to reallocate one of those projects to, to be able to do any of them. They are all on hold. Every single one, none of them can move forward as they were originally envisioned. And so my struggle is um, how do we, you know, fit, I guess, uh, $40 million of requests into $25 million bucket. And so if we're to move forward with this, I would want to know a very clear deadline that from Tectonics that we're going to get a number. And then we have to be queued up to make hard decisions because every single project has come over budget. Yes. We are moving forward none, and we are going to leave $25 million on the table, not $5 million, not any project, all of it, because we could not figure out how to mush this all together and move forward with at least some. And so that's a difficult prioritization that we're going to have to undertake because I can tell you, we already know while we've been waiting for this information, every other project has done their cost estimate. That's how we know. Every other project has done their cost estimate, done their community work. That's how we know. And so my question is, every single project has said, if you want to move forward, go find more money. Okay, everyone, every project. So, or cut it in half. And some projects you just can't cut in half. I mean, I'll just use a, a simple one, half a million dollars, you can't cut a fence in half. So um, you can scale back, maybe placemaking. I mean, some of them are scalable and some just aren't. And so that's my struggle here today. And if we're to move forward, I would want to see an MOU and an understanding that uh, what concerns me and is the expectation from the community that if we do this cost estimating, that means we're doing the project because we're going into 30% design. We, we have already done 30% design on every project and we know every project's over. So the question is, how do we bring all these projects back to the table and figure out where we're going? That's my biggest concern. I like the MOU idea. 
personally, because I want to know when, what I mean is not before, it could move in parallel, but when we reach that number, I want to know when you're coming back and that there's enough time. I, I don't want to waste 25, the opportunity for 25 million. I'm sorry. I just don't. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. We are done with our final rounds. Uh, with that being said, out of respect, we jumping in, council, or uh, Sorry, Councilwoman uh, Mickey. Mickey. <laughs> Mickey. Yeah. Councilmember um, Ebert's trying to say Yeah, like no, this. hold on a second, because I think we were on, um, you've had two rounds, correct? Yeah. Okay. I did have a couple more questions, so. Okay. Um, hold on, because we're at our final two. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Delgado, uh, if you would like to come up, I always try to ask whoever um, is... Basically, the applicant. Sure. Thank you, <laughs> Go Madam ahead. Mayor. Thank you for the opportunity, and I appreciate the discussion. I know you guys are in a tough position, and I know no money ever wants to be left on the table. No money, especially with the amount of needs that are coming before the council. Uh, I am committed to all of you. I'm speaking on behalf of the organization uh, as a CEO, and from my board, that's vested in me to be able to speak and say we are a strong partner in making sure that this project is fulfilled. As you, as you heard just now from Tectonix, we are working very diligently in making sure that we are at the table, constantly make sure that we reach all the deadlines. Deadlines should not even be a part of the conversation. We are ready as of December to move forward. And so we are stead ready, as Tectonix has shared, more than enough staff to make sure we hit those deadlines. We have foundation members that are here in the audience as well to make sure we hit that gap. So I am saying to all of you, more than happy to sit down and have a conversation regarding MOUs or bring a lease to the conversation so that our piece is, is out of the way to make sure that we bring, again, support to 3,600 more patients and lives in our community. Behavioral health, which does not exist right now, and we all know the dire need for that. Prescription food pantry, and also, of course, a pharmacy. So that's my commitment, Madam Mayor. Uh, my word is my bond. I hope that everyone uh, could appreciate that. Uh, we're just excited to have this opportunity. As you all stated before, this is usually a county endeavor where you have a healthy human services work with an organization like ours. But that was old thinking. Here's a great opportunity innovation thinking where cities are actually coming to the table, working with FQHCs like ours to make sure that healthcare outcomes are part of the design and the build out of a city. You guys are part of the social determinants of health and making sure that cities are not, the healthcare isn't just done in the four walls of a clinic, it's done throughout the process. And so again, we're committed as a partner. I don't know if you have partners as part of your other projects. As, we do. Okay, but, and, and I don't know if they're as forthcoming as I am, and maybe, maybe a little too overconfident, but I know we'll hit it. Uh, we've done it in the past and we'll, we'll be excited to do it again. All right, thank you thank so you much. Mayor. I appreciate it. Okay, we've exhausted our rounds. However, Councilwoman Ebert, I'm going to let you go with um, one you. minute. Okay, thanks. And, uh, so take it away. Okay, so I did have a quick question. This might be for Oscar. Do you guys currently have, and Carrie, I'll have one, a quick one for you too. Um, do you guys currently offer mental health services? You kind of mentioned behavioral health. We do. Health. We have offer mental behavioral health services. Uh, we do not have in person. We don't have enough room. On Neal Road, but we do at our Wells Clinic. We also at our Sparks and also at our Sun Valley. Okay, so will that be in included in the expansion? We'll okay. Have two, uh, la two, we have two uh, spaces to allow for two providers to come in. It's also something, uh, Councilwoman, that we'd love to do in North Valley, as we're the largest Medicaid provider in North Valley for your community as well. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Um, uh, another question. Um, was this facility originally built to be a medical facility? Yes. Okay. And then one last question, um, and this is kind of bigger picture. Um, I know that there's a lot of concern that we might not meet deadlines and, and you know, miss the boat on some ARPA funds. Just real quick, if you can allow me. Um, maybe, I don't know if it's possible for council to come together and prioritize projects and say, if we don't hit a certain deadline with projects, that we pull the funding for some and apply it to the higher priorities so that we don't miss the boat on 25 million. And I'm, I think Community Health Alliance does great work. I think that they should be funded as well. But, um, and I'm not saying that this shouldn't be a top priority, but maybe we should come up with a, uh, some kind of contingency plan to make sure that we don't lose any funds. Um, if there's a project that's way behind, we just have to be honest with ourselves and say, hey, we're not gonna make it. Let's put this funding where we can cross the finish line. So I just wanted to put that out. I don't know if it's a possibility, but if we could just maybe have a discussion about it. So thank you. Thank you for giving me an extra minute. All right, um, that being said, I'm gonna send it to Councilman um, Martinez to give me a motion. Sure, happy to. Uh, again, thanks for everybody being here, for all of your input. 
and I appreciate the discussion today. Uh, in terms of item B10, I move to approve the consultant agreement with Tectonics Design Group for the design and construction administration services for the Neal Road re facility remodel and expansion project in an amount not to exceed $342,583 and authorize the mayor to sign. All right, thank you. I'm going to second that for discussion because I know this council so well. We're going to go into discussion. Uh, Councilwoman Brackus. Nothing. Nothing? Okay. All right. Councilwoman Taylor. I, I don't know if it's discussion. I'm just curious. Um, I want to make sure that we have the staff, the team that Carrie has to move this forward. So go ahead. Uh, yes, I do have the staff to, uh, to carry this forward. We have leaned on Tectonics to provide the construction um, services, administration services, and that that is in their contract. So what, what I was lacking is in the tectonics contract okay thank you okay go ahead councilwoman yeah. in the motion i'd like to see a date that this would come back because if the date slips let's say we say july 1 or i think that's what you told us um if the date slips and it's september we're, we're so close it, it puts every project in jeopardy I, I mean i don't know where to go some of the projects don't have project sponsors except it's all on reno you know placemaking doesn't have a project sponsor do we not do it you know, it's a top priority to fix downtown Reno. Do we not do it? Um, and so I also would like a, at least a letter understanding, uh, if not a, a, a complicated MOU, to understand that I've been here before. We've taken a first step on a project. And I was told by our attorneys long ago, don't annex if you, don't, if you think you're going to have trouble in the next phase of the project and have difficulty with conditions. Don't even take the first step. That's what they told me, Mr. I got to give the credit um, to our attorneys. They warned me and they've taught me. And that's what my concern is here today. Do I take the first step when I know in my heart every project's coming over? This one is too. Where are we going to go? And there's an expectation from the community. I've got expectations from the community on every one of these projects. There's a soccer community. There's the downtown business owners for that one. There's all the advocates for the river. So I would like to see two additions to the motion, if the motion makers would consider it. One is a date that we expect to have back the um, cost estimate. And the second is um, a letter of understanding, memorandum of understanding, could be two pages, to say that you know that this does not commit funds past this. It does not, because we, we cannot approve a project we don't have the funds for. So that's all there is to it. Mm -hmm. okay. So I want to see those two ads. All right, thank you. Anyone else for discussion? Well, I mean, I support those changes, too. And, you know, our practice is once we go into design, staff more or less has the authority to go to bid. Yeah, well, then I, I'm with, I would withhold. Their, they have to bring it back. I, I don't think that authority is a good idea at this time. And um, I think the, the design consultant needs to come. And then as you prepare, is, is the scope involved preparing bid documents? Yes. Well, I think the council needs to no. look at those bid documents. I agree. Yeah, we need to hear the cost estimate before we take a step of going to prepare all the bid documents and doing the next step. Madam Mayor, make make a suggestion. Go ahead. That I confer with uh, our city manager and look for a, a date in July to we should have our we will have our um, design complete. We'll have our cost estimate. I'll work with Tectonics and bring that back to the council before we go out to bid. Okay, good. does that That's sound good. like a reasonable plan? All right, are there any more comments? Uh, Councilman Reese, is there anything you wanted to say before I wrap up with my comment? Well, no, Madam Mayor, I think that Ms. Kosky has hit it on the head. I don't think I need to ask for Mr. Martinez to change the motion. I just think it's additional direction from to staff to say we've got to see those things in July. Um, I'm, I think I'm confident that the motion encapsulates the decision we need to make but I also take very seriously Ms. Kosky's commitment to us, which I think answers Ms. Breckis and Ms. Dewar's questions, or yeah. Vice Mayor Dewar. Yeah. And I think it's reasonable to ask, you know, what is, what's the clarity? Where are we at? What's the cost? Because, and, and this is not CHA, but with everyone that we've worked with, I mean, I got to tell you, look at Polenium, not happy with them, right? Um, so I think it makes us a little bit more gun shy when we walk into projects. So any clarity, because on both sides, you can't have them come back and say, hey, we actually really need a lot more. There's also a piece that we did not talk about. And um, because 
I think a lot of people don't also realize what the the funding sources look like when they come into the city, what they look like at the county, uh, what the role is of a city, what the role is of a county. Uh, just so most people know, Health and Human Services is over on the county side. But I've always said, because I think now more than ever with the crisis that we're seeing on our streets, with mental health, with addiction, they cannot do it alone. We all have to do it together. And that is no joke because it's so massive of a problem. I think it's the number one crisis in America. And one of the big reasons this is so critical because what we're seeing too is that the lack of access to medications whenever it comes to mental health can absolutely be deadly. Matter of fact, I had a friend, didn't have his medications for two days and was found dead in a ditch. And that is why Sorry. on the mental health side of it, is so critical for them to have access to. Um, and I want to apologize for one of my council uh, council's comments uh, at the beginning of the meeting because the work that you do um, is absolutely outstanding. And I also want to thank you that you, I've um, asked you to help some of uh, you know some of some people that I know um, in massive massive need uh, on the streets, and you immediately jumped in. Um, and we don't talk about those things in public. No one really gets to see the work that you do behind the scenes that where you're literally saving lives, whether it's with Narcan and things like that. So I just want to say I'm so grateful to CHA. Um, and it's funny, even there are people that can afford health care, they choose CHA because uh, honestly, the, the health care is so good what you do. And it's very, very rare to see that in a community. Um, but also, I, I, I commend you on the mental health side because it's so critical. But I also wanted to apologize. But I do think uh, the work that you're doing is truly, truly outstanding. The other thing is, we, if we had just a ton of money, it would be great. There would be so many other things that you know are so worthy of funding. Don't get us wrong. Um, I, I really want people to understand that. There are just so many things that are worthy. And it's so hard. It's so hard. Um, and because I, you know, there are other incredible programs like Hopes. Those, you know what I mean? They're amazing. Um, so I want people to know that it gets very challenging. But I do think we've got to start looking at the mental health crisis, the addiction crisis, with and providing every possible service that we can. So, but I also understand my colleagues' concerns about the clarity, how much money. I don't want to get down the road and then people are like, oh yeah, it's going to be 11 million. Like we can't do that either. And we also have to have a stop gap where the city says, this is what we provide and then that's it. Because we would love to provide everything to everyone, but we can't. And I got to shut up because I've been telling everyone else to shut up. <laughs> so, okay. That being said. Um, well, Madam Mayor, do we have, I, I, uh, despite my colleagues' comments, I agree that we don't, uh, need to uh, memorialize um, our public works director, but we do need to memorialize a date and we do need to memorialize um, bringing back uh, or making sure there's an MOU in place and understanding. So can we, would you amend your motion to include that? Uh, you can just say first Go meeting ahead, in July or Martinez. whatever. Take it away. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So um, I don't know if, uh, Carl, do I have to restate the full motion or do you want me to just make an amendment to the motion? You can just amend, Councilmember Martinez. Thank you so much for the clarification. So with the motion already in place, just like to amend that we're gonna bring a, either a uh, letter of understanding or an MOU back in July to get an understanding of what the progress is on this project. Well, no, what I was asking was that would be in place with our manager and um, you know the applicant I think you can do that, a letter of understanding about what the process is. But what I'm looking for is to bring back the cost estimate. And in the letter, in the memorandum of understanding that he would have signed, he would have explained that this is not a commitment beyond this commitment. You know, we're not committing $5 million today. We're committing 342000 that kind of stuff. Does that make sense? That it, I'm just asking for a date. Just, just say prior to no, I, with these bids. I'm asking for our manager to... to um, um, negotiate a letter of understanding with CHA about this process, and I'm asking for a date to bring back the cost estimate. That's all. Second meeting. And you July. want to see that before we go out to bid no. is what you're saying? Yes, until, at the first meeting in July. So the second meeting in yeah. July yes. is the feedback we're, we're getting. Yes, second meeting, okay. the second meeting in July. Second meeting in, in July. July. 
Okay. Okay. So uh, the amendment would be to bring back the cost estimate in the second meeting of July. Right. And to, to do for our manager to uh, negotiate with CHA on the process. And for our manager to negotiate the a letter of understanding. The letter of understanding with CHA throughout the process. Right. For the process. Yes. Yeah. You got it. All right. Well, and okay. then you have to agree with your second, Madam right. Mayor. Yes. Okay, so thank you. Appreciate it. So I have a motion. I have a second. I second for discussion. We have discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. All right. Thank you so much. Okay, moving along. And then also I just say we have Commissioner Clark in the room. I would love to see your participation over at the county as well because I know you care about health care. Correct? Yes? Thank you. I appreciate it. No, I, we should always recognize when any commissioners are in, uh, in the house. So thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you so much. All Moving right. on, Madam, I would like to make sure, um, Madam Clerk, I was going to call you Councilwoman Huntsman, <laughs> but Madam Clerk, um, uh, next agenda item, and I believe it's... That's okay. Uh, yep, we're moving on to item D3. It did have a time certain of 1 p.m., so we're a little bit behind on that, but we're going to go apologize. ahead and open up item D3, the DRP FY25 operating plan and budget. All right, come on forward. It must be previous council member days. <laughs> Day. Yeah, you get two of them back to back. <laughs> Hi, Chris Shanks. I'm the uh, current chair of the Downtown Reno Partnership. Just wanted to take a brief second to thank the City of Reno, um, Madam Mayor, Council Members, staff, for the last six years of your guys' support and a very strong working relationship with the DRP. Um, just wanted to make my comments known. Really appreciate working with you guys. Um, our executive director, Naomi Jardin, is going to present our year in review as well as our 24 25 fiscal year budget. Um, without further ado, I'd like you to introduce Naomi Jardin. Thank you. And Madam Mayor, sorry, before we actually go into that, can we do public comment on this item? Absolutely, but before we even do that, uh, we just kind of jump again, but let's start the process before we start. Um, I do, Madam Mayor. Um, Madam Mayor, fellow city council members, and Madam Clerk, in the interest of full transparencies on items D3 and D4, I am disclosing that I serve on the board of directors of the Downtown Reno Business Improvement District, a nonprofit organization designed by city council or designated by a city council to implement a clean and safe program of safety ambassadors and maintenance workers throughout downtown Reno. Items D3 and D4 involve the DRP's operating plan and budget, annual assessment adjustment, and sets a hearing for objections. On this matter, I have sought guidance from the city attorney's office. Here, city council appointed me to the DRP board of directors. As a director, I have a per se commitment in a private capacity to the interests of the DRP pursuant to NRS 281A. 0656, the DRP provides clean and safe services that would otherwise fall to the city to provide because the DRP's interest goals and operations closely align with the city's interest goals and operations. My commitment in a private capacity to the interests of the DRP would not clearly and materially affect the independence of judgment of a reasonable person in my position to warrant abstention under NRS 281A 423. See, um, the public officer is not required to abstain from acting on matters involving a nonprofit and a nonprofit entity. Madam Clerk, please accept this disclosure and lodge it in the record for this meeting and subsequent meetings pertaining to these agenda items. Thank you. Received. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, any other council members? I believe I have a disclosure. So hold on. Um, I don't want to keep anyone. Uh, from moving forward, but uh, Madam Clerk, do you have any public comment on this item? I do. We have Jeff Siri with the Club Cal Neva and Series Casino. Yay! Hi! Come on up. Great to see you. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, City Council members. I'm Jeff Siri. I'm the President, Chief Executive Officer of Club Cal Neva and Series Casino. Um, Cal Neva is now 
the oldest casino in the city of Reno. I've been downtown Reno now for 43 years, seen a lot of changes in the city of Reno, and we've met with a lot of challenges in the last few years with uh, the, the post-COVID issues and with homelessness, with drugs, with uh, uh, um, mental health issues that have come up. Um, challenges to our business, those, those challenges include, you know, people coming into our businesses and, and disrupting our businesses. And so the DRP has been a fantastic resource in helping us keep our business operating in a manner that is uh, safe to us, safe to our customers, and um, hopefully will allow us to continue to be successful long into the future. With that saying, Naoma has done a fantastic job as the executive director, um, and I'm, I'm happy to support her in, in everything she does. She's met a lot, a lot of challenges over her time, and she always finds resources to, to make those challenges work and get, get things done in this area. So um, I encourage you to give her the, the financial support um, and the resources that she needs to continue working with all the agencies she works with to keep this uh, DRP moving in the right direction and we can continue to have safe and clean and prosperous uh, businesses in downtown Reno. So thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Appreciate the comments. Okay. Uh, any more public comment? All right. We have one more registering right now. The one and only Phil McDougal in the house. And I should... You have a son that is one of Reno's finest at our Reno Police Department. So come on, come on up proud. and give us your public comment. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Phil McDougal, president of the National Automobile Museum. Uh, I just want to share just my experience the last three years uh, under the direction of Neoma and her team. I have not seen such a uh, impactful. They've, they've been so impactful. I can't even explain it to you. I'm going to just share a couple of things that we're on the Lake Street side. Anything from the Lake Street side, it's a different environment from my perspective there. And when we have a call, when we have a need, before I even hang up the phone, I walk in out the door, the ambassadors are there. So in our world, when people are coming to visit us through our entryway, we could not do it without their support. And I just think it's important when people are typically talking about their complaints, not only today to support them in the budget, but make sure the community knows and they know on a regular basis what an impact they make. So I'm here 100% behind them to support them and the budget needs because firsthand, I see it on a daily basis where we are and we could not do it with them, their program and their support and her leadership. So thank you. All right, thank you so much, Mr. McDougall. Madam okay. Mayor, with Anything that, else? we have no additional public comment, but for the record, we did receive 12 letters or voicemails, um, 11 in support and one of concern that has been distributed to the Reno City Council. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. So here's what I'm going to do, um, clerk, uh, Madam Clerk, for the record. We will have a presentation. Before we take any action, I need to read a disclosure. Okay? Thank you. Go ahead. Hello, Mr. McArdle. Hello. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members. Brian McArdle, Revitalization Manager, for the record. Do we have my presentation? Cool. Excellent. Great. Um, so we're here today to present uh, something we do annually, The uh, allow the Department or the Downtown Reno Partnership to present the Downtown Reno Business Improvement District operating plan, budget, and any proposed assessment adjustments. This is something we do every year. We've done for the last seven years. Uh, and this is the first step in the process of not only um, allowing them to showcase what their plan is for the year, but to start the process to actually levy the assessment. Uh, and today is the first day where we do that. The next agenda item would be, uh, once that budget is approved, is setting the date and time to have a, a public hearing, where at that public hearing we hear any complaints, objections to the assessment, as well as any hardship requests. Uh, there is a process for people to request a hardship based on, based on income. Uh, we will hear those, and then on May uh, 8th, we will hear those and then do the first reading of the assessment, and then it gets, it gets ratified. So this is just the first step in a process we do every year. Just to bring you up to speed on how the bid was created, um, NRS 271 allows for the levy and assessment 
for neighborhood improvement projects. And so the downtown business improvement district is actually considered a neighborhood improvement project. And in 2017, that Puma Downtown Action Plan requested or recommended that the city create a downtown business improvement district. The following year, a management plan was developed and the DRP was contracted, the Downtown Arena Partnership was contracted to uh, essentially, essentially manage and deploy based on that, that management plan. And the Downtown Business Improvement District has mainly four objectives. It's one, to stabilize downtown streets, focus on economic development, community development, be a unified voice and champion for downtown, and provide accountability to those people who are paying that assessment rate. Just to cover what the bid does and does not do, uh, the bid does not cover standard base services in the downtown area. Um, currently, the downtown as a base level receives all the same services the rest of the city receives. What the bid does is provide a budget to do additional services on top of all that. Um, and the first one is the standard service. It is a assessment based on the property values, and that is to do a clean and safe program, which is the ambassadors we see going around. They engage with the homelessness, provide uh, hospitality services. It also provides for leadership and economic development for all the things that the bid does. And then it does a marketing communication. So that standard service assessment provi provides the budget for those three things. Beyond that, there is a premium rate that is based on the linear footage of how those properties faced a designated area. And that allows for additional cleaning and services like litter removal, pulling weeds, um, cleaning public infrastructure and, and, faci and facilities and fixtures. And then the last one, the third rate, is uh, more daily improvement and maintenance on Virginia Street specifically, and they pay the businesses that affront Virginia Street directly pay for that services. Um, the bid does contract back, so the bid collects the money. Uh, it does contract back with the city uh, maintenance and operations team to do things like pressure washing and stuff like that. So they collect it and they actually contract it back with us to do those things. And then for the first three years of that management plan and the contract, the bid agreed to pay for supplemental police services, but only for the first three years. And this is the boundary line. Everyone in that red uh, perimeter pays for that standard level of service. The beige area is the premium, and that green along Virginia Street is the premium plus boundary. In that agreement, it requires that the, the downtown range partnership come on an annual basis and essentially do the following things propose if they want to change the boundary line at all. Uh, they they'll propose the services they provide, plan to provide for the next fiscal year. Uh, they estimate what those expenses will be and what sort of revenues they expect from that assessment. Uh, they can change the rate up or down by 5% annually, and they have to state if they're, if they're rolling over, if they have a deficit from the previous year, and if they have any revenues coming from outside agencies. Just to give a teaser, and I'll let uh, the executive director, Neoma Jardin, come up and explain this a bit more. Uh, the bid board can decide to raise rate or lower rates by 5% every year. They've decided to lower rates this year. Uh, but that rate essentially has not changed since the creation of the bid. Either the standard service or the extra services have primarily remained flat since the bid was created. This year, they decided to, to lower rates by 5%. However, Given that property values have been increasing in downtown, even with the lowering of that 5% assessment rate, the bid has a 4% increase in their annual budget every year of about $170,000. This is their, the budget summary that they uh, provided. Uh, the program services is mainly ambassador services and things like that. They do have some rollover funds from the previous year. They do have $100,000 in revenue that they get from outside entities. And then based on the operating expenses and that maintenance they pay every year, this is how that budget um, lines out. And so again, this is just the first step of the process. I'll invite the executive director to come up and give their annual presentation. Following that, we'll roll into actually the process of, of levying the assessment. Um, I can get to this in the next agenda item, but the process is that we hold a public hearing, we hear any complaints, protests, and objections, and those hardship requests after that is passed, we start the process of adopting the ordinance. And I'll leave that motion for after the presentations. Madam Mayor, yes. do you want to give your disclosure or may I ask a question of staff? Um, I, as long as I, just, I just want to make sure. 
uh, our city attorneys, um, I'm okay to hold off on disclosure until we, before we make any deliberation and action, correct? Um, I th has the disclosure been delivered to you? Yes, but I'm reading it to, for its accuracy right now. Okay. So, yes. So it's okay to... Yeah, don't, you're not participating, you are just, yes, you're, this is a placeholder until okay. you can give your disclosure. All right, thank, thank you. you for putting that on the record. Go ahead, Kevs Warren Breck is three minutes. Okay, so Mr. McCardo, last year, um, I did not support the process, you know, it's multi-step as you mentioned. And the reason for that was there was gonna be a five-year review. And we, you know, my history is the longest with this. I was the city liaison when I came in in 2012 to the two assessment districts, the maintenance and the police ones, which were the precursors, as you mentioned in your staff report. I was the advocate that we do to the downtown action plan that then came into the concept of having a BIT. So it was kind of like something I was very involved in, very invested in for many years. But I also understood we had an obligation. We did the engineer's report. That's good for 10 years, as I recall. But that five-year analysis report, evaluation, I was never contacted. Um, I never saw it. W where is that evaluation? There was uh, some work done to essentially qualify that we had completed that evaluation. Uh, but the bid did do a five-year annual review this year. We have gone through and um, reviewed all the services provided, essentially reassessing and readjusting everything for this next coming fiscal year. Um, that is sufficient in many people's eyes as, as for the five-year evaluation. But you're correct, at the end of 10 years, the bid essentially does have to be re-looked at and essentially rechartered in a way. Yeah, well, you know, because I have the history and right before Mr., um, who was the gentleman who was the first director? Um, what was his name? Alex Titsky. Yeah, oh, he and yeah. I were having very solid discussions about the process, you know, and he was the executive director about what was gonna happen and how it was gonna happen, recognizing, you know, the importance of it. <laughs> And then it just went away, and then I recall he left, Miss Jardin came over, she had a cooling off period and couldn't participate with the city for a while. So I didn't support it last year, but I really wanted to see it. And when you say some people think what they've done is adequate, I mean, I'm the one who has to make the commitment to tax, particularly the residents. So, you know, I'm the one who I feel needs to be satisfied that we're owning up to and standing up to what you know, we outlined of how we do do that. And I don't see it. I didn't I was really looking forward to reading your proposal and here's the five year evaluation, even though I was never, you know, asked to be an evaluator. But um I just I, I don't know. I, I guess, you know, I'm disappointed that, you know, I take it very seriously of assessing these people each year and we're not following through with what we said we do. All right, any other council members want to weigh in? No? All right, anyone else? No? Okay, great. Then we're going to move forward. Thank yeah. you. I'll invite Neoma Jardin, Executive Director for the Downtown Arena Partnership. Okay, to come thank and you give so much. The presentation. Well, hello. Well, nice hello. to see you. Nice to see like you. Like I said, it must be uh, past council members' day. It must be, it must be. What an exciting day to be on uh, this side of the dais. I can say from experience that uh, the work you all do is tremendous and important and um, you guys deliberated beautifully earlier and worked through some issues. And I just wanna say from sitting out in the audience that uh, kudos to all of you for the questions you asked. I, I haven't got to witness it all from that side. So thank you very much. Um, I am gonna run through some slides. I know you all have had a very long meeting and it, it, it's not even close to being done yet. So I'm gonna run through these, gonna do a little look back for the last year and then we'll talk about some of our priorities going forward. Do I? Oh, oh. Hang on, here we go. I can do this. Um, so first things, I'm gonna run through this and where? Yep. I think we got it. I think we got it. Am I supposed to point it at a certain place? Can I just say next slide? This, there we go. 
Okay, so I'm going to run through this really quickly. I know um, Brian McArdle went over it already. Again, 110 block area that the downtown Reno partnership represents. 1,500 property owners, again, formed in 2018. We are a 501c6 nonprofit that is governed by a 17 member board. We levy assessments, we do not levy taxes. We, again, are a private entity, we are not a public board, a uh, government board. Um, and I did want to point out of our 17 member board that five of those 17 members live in downtown. So we get great representation in the downtown area. Uh, here I have just a quick summary. Maybe some of you will recognize some of these faces and the very diverse areas of downtown or businesses that they represent. So just, uh, of course, we have our board chair, Chris Shanks here, and our vice chair, Tony Marini, and uh, you saw Jeff Siri was here a little bit ago. He may still be here. Um, and you see behind me is the most important people in the room, which is the ambassadors. I'm going to be as quick as I can because we want them out on the street doing their jobs, but I know many of you have interacted with them, and so we wanted to have them here in the event there were some questions. Uh, just some quick snapshots. I, we have printed this out and you have it before you. Um, I appreciate Councilwoman Dewar's um, liking things in a bigger font these days. I need them in a bigger font as well. So we printed that out and we gave it to you so you could see some of these impressive numbers of which I will run through them with you. Uh, 117, 200 pounds of trash collected in a one year period. This is such an astronomical amount of trash collected and disposed of. I just can't even tell you just to quantify how much trash this is. It is a lot. We're out there 24 seven collecting it and disposing of it. And this is just some visual representations of, of what the ambassadors do on a daily basis. 486 pieces of graffiti that we remove. We remove it from public spaces. We try to uh, do everything we can. If it's on some painted areas, if we need some special paint, we can paint over it. And again, they are there quickly to remove it because if you know, if, if graffiti stays around, it proliferates and becomes a much bigger problem. So they are very fast to remove graffiti in the downtown area. Shopping carts, 836 shopping carts that we have recovered and returned to their owners in the last year. So, we at the Downtown Reno Partnership have made it a priority to engage with individuals who may be using these carts to transport their personal items. And what we are um, talking with individuals about is how these shopping carts prevent them being able to access services. You can't take a cart into a transport to get to a service. You can't get into a shelter or a service with these carts. And so the ambassadors have great trust and relationships with the individ homeless individuals, and we offer them bags or suitcases to better help them transport their personal items. And then we collect these shopping carts. We have a great partnership with the city of Reno. We bring them back to our base, and a uh, individual with the city of Reno comes, picks them up, and gets them back to their rightful owners. Again, these are stolen property, um, and we want to get them back to where they belong. Five, uh, over 5,000 pressure washes. 15 minutes, we try to get there. If you call us on our hotline and pressure wash all the things you can imagine that happen on our sidewalks and in the public spaces in the downtown core. Uh, people aren't as diligent about picking up after their dogs as we would like them to be, or maybe there's been some uh, sodas or things or encampment uh, leftovers that need to be pressure washed, and we are out there with our pressure washing truck uh, on a daily basis responding to calls um, and cleaning those messes up. Over 38,000 stakeholder check-ins. This is such a significant part of what we do on a daily basis. Our ambassadors are always out there cleaning, always engaging with individuals that may need services, but they also go into the businesses and engage with the proprietors. And they are constantly conversing with them. What are you seeing? What do you need? Um, is there something that you have been witnessing that's maybe a little different in your area? This information that we get from the businesses is just invaluable to help us respond and deploy services. And um, we find these check-ins to be really, really valuable. Social service referrals, you can see just the huge volume of social service referrals. Everything from the VA hospital to shelters to social security to mental health facilities to healthcare facilities. Our ambassadors individualize what the need is and help to transport the individuals to that need. So you can see just the volume that we do on an annual basis of those referrals and transports. 
Just going to run through some before and afters. This is the river walk area. You can see some of the encampment um, things that can occur there in a very short amount of time. The ambassadors engage, connect individuals with resources, and then they clean up and clear the areas. And we try to do that before the sun comes up um, and everybody opens their doors for business. Again, just some before and afters under the Arlington Bridge. You can see some areas here that they, they're addressing. And Wingfield Park. Uh, this is a significant park in our downtown, and we spend a, a fair amount of time here connecting people with resources, cleaning and clearing the areas, and um, coming through and pressure washing after. Before and after on some railroad tracks at 4th and Record. Um, we had a meeting earlier this week down in Carson City uh, in front of the NDOT board to talk about the difficulties that we at the Downtown Reno Partnership are having, as well as the city of Reno is having, in ha getting Union Pacific to help in addressing issues that are on their private property. This is a representation of where the ambassadors go and help connect people to services and clear the area at a volume that is inordinate to anything else in the downtown. The railroad tracks are really a, a problem area that we continue to have difficulties in resolving. We have the Congressman Amade's attention and he helped us to get in front of the NDOT board to try to come up with some resolutions to get Union Pacific to come to the table in a more substantive way to help address these issues on a more uh, and a higher frequency to, to address this public health and safety issue. So this area here is an ongoing problem. And again, this is at 4th and Record if you're standing on 4th Street looking north. And you can see if you look a little closer there, those are fire remnants that uh, occur there with some regularity. If you stand on 4th Street again and you look to your south, this is looking at Record Street where the Community Assistance Center buildings are as well as uh, the Gospel Mission who has some services that they provide. And you can see the sorts of crowds that gather here and some of the uh, materials that can uh, grow here. Additionally, we do see a tremendous amount of trash, waste, human waste that occurs in this area. And uh, we come in and help to clean, clean up the area. But this, as you can see on the left, is when there is some services being provided. And then on the right, um, Gospel Mission was closed for a little period of time. And you can see that um, not as much gathers there. Overnight Ambassadors, last time we came to you, we were very excited to announce the launch of an Overnight Ambassador program. This was such a big deal for us because one, it hadn't been done here in, in, in Reno before for sure, but as a 24-hour town, the ability to have presence and patrolling over the night hours is so significant for our downtown because as you know, um, lots of things can happen in the dark of night or they can establish that all of a sudden when the sun comes up, people are having to deal with. So our team of ambassadors overnight, they go out and they patrol all the dark spaces. They're going down the alleys. They're literally shining a light in the dark places. And we really have seen a tremendous improvement um, in some of those early morning things that we would see before because of this overnight team. So they don't always get all the kudos that they deserve because they're out working in the middle of the night. But I just want to give a special shout out to our overnight team who has just done a tremendous job. Two new tools that we got in the last year. We have, if you see on the left there, we, we name all of our equipment and we have dubbed this piece of equipment Scrubs. Scrubs is actually on loan from the city of Reno and it is a sidewalk scrubber sweeper. And we take uh, her out and, and clean the sidewalks and, and she's just been a great uh, piece of equipment for us to have. On the right is a Tommy truck and our Tommy truck, we uh, got a ARPA contribution from the city of Reno. We were able to purchase this truck and I can tell you, the pounds of trash that we picked up from last year to this year went up significantly because of this truck, because we didn't have a place in which to put the materials and get them to the dump. So the truck has done just a tremendous job of helping us to really increase the volume of trash that we can dispose of uh, in the downtown core, and it's much cleaner because of it. City walks. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about Jackie Bryant and the incredible uh, thing that she proposed about a year ago to bring all the different entities and agencies together to do city walks in downtown to do a number of things. I don't think she knew when she started this, the success that we would have. But what it did is it brought everything together at the street level to experience what it's like out on the street. 
You can experience the things you're seeing. You can experience what uh, homeless individuals are encountering and experiencing. It brought together code enforcement, law enforcement, our ambassadors, housing specialists. It really broke down silos that may have existed within the entities and agencies previously because there is nothing like walking with a group of people in below freezing temperatures or 100 plus degrees and dealing with issues and then you just get a great understanding of what other people are doing in a similar space. You may have had a perception or an impression, but when you're out there working together on a common goal, those things go away and you have a better relationship and understanding of the, of the, the mission that we're all on and that's to make a safer, cleaner and more vibrant downtown. So kudos to Jackie Bryant. Marketing and media. Marketing has always been a component of our contract with the city of Reno, and we are happy to say under the great um, leadership of Kristen Sabini with us, if you've seen our social, it has increased tremendously. And we are out there um, on all the social sites, posting information, providing stats, and really trying, trying to drive up information about what we're doing on a daily basis in downtown. We have, uh, we have newsletters, lunch and learns. We go out into the communities and really hear from the individual neighborhoods about what they're experiencing, what their needs are, what their wants are. And um, we also have a new website. If you've not gone to it, it is tremendous and it has a ton of information. It wasn't so great before. I think it was held together by gum and, and tinfoil. But now we can really put some more information in there and do some great things. We're also out there doing community presentations on literally a weekly basis at every entity that will, will hear us to share information and let them know about the stuff that we're doing and, and gather feedback. DRP in the news, we, we try to get out there again and, and get some information out to, to let our assessment payers know in addition to our, our lunch and learns, what they're getting for it, but to let the community at large know. Because sometimes there can be perceptions about we, what we are or aren't doing. And so we really try to get out there and share as much information as we can about the stuff that we're providing and the new initiatives that we've launched. And you can just see some of the summaries here. Um, and of course, we have some amazing ambassadors that we try to always highlight in some of our media. Again, here's some of our social. Please follow us. Um, you can get some great information there. Again, thank you, Kristen Sabini, for doing a great job. Vacant storefront beautification. This was another program that we launched this last year. And what this did is it sought to find a way in which to beautify some blighted closed buildings um, in a way that was eye-catching, colorful, and artistic with the clear understanding, we want these buildings occupied. We want people in there. We want the buildings sold. We want them activated. We all want that. You want that. The realities are we don't always have control, and in these instances with private properties, don't have the control to make someone do something with their property. But what we can do is do a more expanded role of the in-between. So when we're left with conditions of fencing or, or blighted, boarded up buildings, we can get creative, which is some best practices in other cities that we went out and, and did some research on, and we can engage artists to do some, something on the store frontages while, in particular, we are in economic downturn. We're in a flat period right now. And so having some empty buildings is something that we have to deal with the now. You know, what, what are we doing to beautify them in the now while everybody's working on the next or how to get uh, these buildings occupied? And this is an example that we did with a local artist here, Ian Harrison. He did just a fantastic job of beautifying these um, properties. They light up. And if you kind of squint on the nugget on the left there, the little nugget, what's the little nugget known for? Do you see it? It's there on the left. There's a hamburger. Oh, I'll go back to that. What did I do? Okay. Oh, there we go. Yes, so that is a hamburger on the, on the lower left there. That is uh, the awful offer. So he did, he did a fantastic job and we got so much good feedback. We see so many people taking Instagram uh, and pictures in front of this. And again, at night, if you go downtown, you'll see they're all lit up and it's, it really is a, a vibrant space that people, um, otherwise it just would be dark and blighted. 
blue carpet treatment. We literally, for new businesses or expanding businesses in downtown, we roll out the blue carpet. We have blue stanchions and blue carpet, and we just celebrate those that are coming into downtown and investing in the core of our city. And you can see some of the examples here where we have, we have uh, come and celebrated those new businesses, and we're so thankful for them for, for investing in our downtown. And we, we just scream it from the, from the rooftops, and that's your cafe right here in your lobby. Some hosted events that we did this last year. On the left there is Roll in Reno. It was a roller skating event that we held on Locomotion Plaza. And I have to say out of all the special events that we did in the last year, this was the biggest hit. We must have had 300 people that showed up for this event. About 80% brought their own skates, which I thought was an interesting uh, statistic. But the entity that came and put this on, they brought the skates, they brought the music, they brought the lights, and we brought some resources in to just activate this space. And um, we heard from everybody that attended, whether it was visitors or residents, they said, we had no idea what was going on downtown. We haven't been down here in a while. Oh my goodness, can you do this more? What this does is it brings people who maybe have an old perception of what Reno was to bring them down and have an experience that gives them a new perspective. And so these types of events, I think, are really critical to have in the heart of our city. On the right is we have at our um, office location at Partnership Plaza, we hosted Downtown Tuesdays. And this is where we brought in food trucks and music and local artists and brought the community members and the locals out to just enjoy the space, which we have, have totally renovated and it's no longer blighted and awful. Lunch and Learns, I touched on this earlier. We used to do quarterly town halls. Um, it's tough to do a town hall and really dive into the specific neighborhood issues because the issues of a business on 4th Street is dramatically different than a resident issue. So what we did is we divided it up into the different districts and we go into those districts and dive into the specific issues, um, whether it's the residents or the brewery district or the Riverwalk district. The next one will be the arts theater and museum lunch and learn. These have had a great turnout. We've been able to share a ton of information and we've also built um, relationships. They've built them with each other uh, during these lunch and learns. So these have been a great success and we're very happy about uh, the outcome. Event support, we're there for every special event. We, we surround the areas, we clean it, we go through it, offer um, directions, you know, they need a restaurant referral, and we're just there as a additional support during all of our tremendous special events that we have downtown that draw, by the way, did you know that there is 10 times the entire population of the city of Reno visits downtown for special events? 10 times. So when you talk about the resources for downtown, you have to understand that 10 times the entire population of the city of Reno comes to downtown on an annual basis. Downtown event foot traffic, we track all the foot traffic for all these special events. This is so that we can see how things are, what events, uh, how things are trending. You can see here some statistics. Nathan DeGange in our office uh, tracks all of our data and does an amazing job as our economic development director. And anytime if you need any data for downtown, Nathan is your guy. He's got it all. He can tell you all these things. And you can see coming out of the pandemic, people are hungry for special events. They want to have an experience. They want to come together. And they, they want to have the shared um, experience. And we want to offer for as many of these as we can downtown, particularly when economic conditions stall out a little. You want to be able to keep the foot traffic coming into the core of your city um, while some other things, maybe the vertical construction, might be uh, taking a little bit longer. So this is just some examples. Downtown developments. Going to hit on this one a little bit here because um, I think sometimes uh, we can focus on the things that aren't happening but we want to focus on the things that are happening. We have some tremendous developments happening in downtown. And here's just a few of them from Vintage at Washington, which I know this group had a tremendous amount to do with. Ballpark Apartments, the UNR Business Building. The Nevada Museum of Art is doing this in massive expansion. It is pretty tremendous. And then University Crossing, which is right off the freeway. Um, Jimmy John's, Wing Zone, Teriyaki, Planet, they're all coming in. Great things coming to downtown to be an amenity for everybody living, working, or the students um, visiting downtown. Partnership Plaza. Quickly, this is our plaza where our offices are. Used to be the RTC bus station. Was If you look at the bottom right photo, this is what it looked like previously. It had jagged rocks and all the flower beds. It didn't have any seating on it. Um, it was pretty blighted and awful. And um, it wasn't the best thing when people were traversing from downtown or Virginia Street 
over to the brewery district or the downtown event center or the ballroom. This was not a space that you wanted to stop at and it's certainly not a space you wanted to uh, spend any time at. And so what we did was we went in, one of the first initiatives when I came on was to completely renovate the space. So we have secured it, we have planted all the flowers, we had over a hundred volunteers that planted over a thousand plants. We have 44 mature trees that are fantastic. I know that's your passion, Councilwoman Dewar, and they are magnificent right now. If you get a chance, come by. It looks amazing. This has really become a beautiful space, and this is what you can do when you put a little elbow grease and you get the community to come out and be a part of it. City collaborations, I want to thank the council members um, and city staff that have come out to either be a part of renovating a space or walking with our ambassadors. I know, Councilwoman Ebert, you came out on a particularly hot day, as I recall, but you got a perspective of what our ambassadors deal with, 100 plus degrees, minus freezing, 24 seven. And so it, it was, I appreciate very much all the council members that have come out, walked with our ambassadors, which are the heart and soul of the organization, or, or spent some time at our plaza to just experience some of the changes that we're making. Now we're gonna look ahead. Here's the, here's the stuff we're so excited about going forward. So we're looking to increase our ambassadors type and the number. We're looking to launch a security ambassador program bringing our numbers of ambassadors from 28 to 32. We want to deploy some other resources in downtown, and I have a couple slides here. I'll just jump right into them. So in security ambassadors, what are these and why do you need them? Well, the national trend since the pandemic is to move in the directions of licensed security personnel. Many cities across the nation, and there are some 1,600 business improvement districts across the nation, are moving in the direct direction of having some component of their organization being security ambassadors. I don't know if you all know, but our ambassadors currently don't have any sort of defensive protection measure. And they're out there doing the tough work in difficult conditions. And so having a security ambassador program to augment what we're already doing while they're cleaning up issues, they're engaging with individuals, is really a significant safety issue for us, but also offers us an opportunity to put security ambassadors in hotspot areas to help deter some of the things that we're seeing repetitively in some of the areas. And we work very closely with Reno Police Department and collaborate on a weekly basis about what are you seeing? Where are you seeing it? Um, they, they are supportive of us um, going in this direction. And this will really just provide an augmented security for the ambassador team as well as the downtown uh, in, in everything that they do. And it'll help to increase that feeling of safety downtown. You know, crime has gone down in downtown. But people perceive that it's not as safe as it could be. So another benefit of deploying the security ambassadors is to drive up that sense of safety and security when you're coming to downtown, whether you're an employee or a visitor or a student, we really wanna focus on the security ambassador team as the next step. Again, many cities across the nation have done this. Um, so this is the next step that we wanna to move to. This is the gator to enhance our cleaning. Uh, we can't get our washing truck into some of the narrow areas of downtown, so we wanna buy one of these four-wheeled gators to get us on the river path to do some additional cleaning, as well as get into these tighter spaces because um, our truck just can't get into everything. DRP hosted events, we want to do more of the roller skating. Um, that was such a big hit, we wanna continue to do that, and then we wanna continue to host events at our plaza as well. Vacant storefront beautification. So I would be remiss if I didn't tell you some of the blight in downtown has become what you're looking at. This is such a significant part of our downtown. It is adjacent to the arch, the most photographed image in all of downtown. And this is what you get to see right now. So we are proud to say today that we came up with an agreement with the city center representatives yesterday, and we are gonna be doing this. So we know we want this space activated. We want it populated. We want it beautified. We want this project to go forward. The realities are is that it may be fenced off for a while. So we want to be able to screen that so that the, the hundreds of thousands of visitors that come to our region on a basis 
aren't looking at the interior of the blight that's on some of this property. And again, we as an organization, you as, as council members, don't have control to make them construct this any sooner. And some may giggle, this is important to the stakeholders downtown. Very important to those that pay our assessments. Next, we have a map. If you go to any other city, you will see that uh, when you go to your hotel or you, you see some imagery in your downtown with, its, um, with some of its branding, there's a map and it directs you to some of the highlights or the districts where you, where you may be visiting. So we have put together this map and you can see it's got some creative imagery on it. Um, what's cool about this map is that QR code that you see down in the right hand corner, we are building this out still, it's, although a lot of it is complete. You'll be able to click on this, uh, scan this code, and you'll be able to find every parking spot in downtown. Whether it's a parking garage, whether it's parking meters, whether it's customer only parking, you'll be able to scan this and, and find all that out. Additionally, we're, we're building in all of the businesses within the bid boundaries within this map. So let's say you're at the Discovery Museum and you want to go get a coffee. You could say, you know what, I wanna go, oh, let me see, I'm gonna scan this, I'm gonna find the parking or, or where I can walk nearby, maybe get a coffee. So this is gonna become an asset for everybody visiting the downtown so they can orient themselves. All this is within walking distance, by the way. State of downtown, Nathan DeGange again has put together tremendous data on all things downtown. This is such an asset for our people that want to invest in downtown or considering investing in downtown. Uh, want to know what is the demographic makeup, what, is, what construction is going on, what has been completed, what is on the horizon, how many, just what is the parks and open space. So this uh, should be published here pretty soon and we are looking to hold an annual State of Downtown uh, luncheon as well to share this information. Bid parcel groups. We were asked last year and sometimes we get asked who pays the majority of the bid assessments? So we did this breakdown. You can see the vast majority comes from commercial properties followed by residential and city of Reno. And again, residential gets a 15% discount off of the formula, the rate formula, and uh, nonprofits and governments pay 50%. One of the biggest things that our board voted on this about three months ago was to be in tune with the, the conditions out on the street. What is, what is happening with our public spaces and our commercial properties? What is trending with our residents? What are people experiencing with um, getting tenants? What is the vacancy rates? And what we found is there are still some challenges going on. This is not unique to Reno, this is global. Um, but what the board uh, decided was to say, we're gonna do what we can with what's in our control and we are gonna lower our assessment formula by 5%. So while increases in property values have outpaced the 5%, we went to the maximum of what we could do to provide some relief to, you know, property owners and, and to stimulate further interest in the downtown core. So kudos to our board, this hasn't been done before. Again, here's the assessment formula rate table. And Brian McArdle touched on this as well. This just shows you the history. Happy to share this if you guys don't have it. I think you do though. And then the final slide um, is our budget. You saw this in your materials as well. Just shows you kind of what our overall budget is and, and the main areas um, where we're focusing on. So with that, I hope I wasn't too horribly long. Um, any questions that anybody may have? All right, thank you so much. I appreciate the presentation. Um, and then also I know that uh, there were some outbursts over there, so maybe you guys could come in public comment and uh, ad address how you feel about it. Sure. So I appreciate it. Pardon? Yes. That would be great, thank you. Uh, Madam Mayor, um, hold on. Okay. Before we move on, I want to um, I want to do something. I think that this is really important. Um, gosh, I don't know why, but like this room just today just has felt so heavy yeah. and stressful. And it, no matter what you do, you can't get it right. You know, I know, <sighs> right? And you'll be criticized for anything you do, even when you do something good. It's always going to be criticized, and it's. Um, you know, it's tough. 
And, you know, I also want to say, like, I think we do a pretty good job working with um, amongst the community. Uh, one of, like, I just want to point out, um, you guys have done a really good job working out with community members. I think the city has. We certainly listened to your concerns, work with RISE. We sat down, made that happen. I, so I want to make sure that you guys know, um, you know, we're always at the table, I think, and open for any suggestions in any capacity. Um, but I do want to point that out because I think it's always, it's become a really, really incredibly challenging landscape. So I also, I'm going to read a disclosure before I start. Um, and again, it's kind of, you know, pertains to, you know, the very difficult landscape uh, now more than ever. And, um, you know, it's something that gives me incredible anxiety. Um, and I'm going to read it. Uh, it's in regards to the GPS tracker that was put on my car, and especially since I know there are people in this room that know who did it. And um, it's really distressing. So I also want to put this disclosure on to the record. Um, and then I would ask Madam Clerk to please, um, I would ask to please make copies uh, for council members that need this disclosure. I think that that's important that they have it for their records as well. Um, fellow city council members and Madam Clerk, item D3 and 4 involves the acceptance of the downtown Reno partnership fiscal year 2025 bid operation plan and budget and fixing the public hearing to receive complaints and objections. I understand that Josh Hicks, an attorney from McDonald Carano, represents the bid in this matter. In my private life, I've retained Adam Hosmer Henner, a partner at McDonald Carano, to represent me on a civil matter unrelated to the bid and Mr. Hicks. I don't even really know you. I just know you represent the bid. So I want to make that very, very clear. Uh, I've sought guidance from the city attorney's office as a client of of McDonald Carano, I have been advised that I may have a commitment in a private capacity to the interests of McDonald Carano pursuant to NRS 281A.065. That said, any action that I may take on item D3 and 4 would not be reasonably affected by my commitment in a private capacity to the interests of McDonald Carano. This item has nothing to do with my civil case. To the best of my knowledge, at any action I may take today on this item will not have any impact on me or McDonald Carano. Given that this is not a clear case where the independence of judgment of a reasonable person in my situation would be materially affected by my commitment in a private capacity to the interest of McDonald Carano, abstention is not warranted. Abstention is not warranted. The fact that I am represented by McDonald Carano will not impact my ability to impartially review and render a decision upon this particular agenda item. Madam Clerk, please accept this disclosure for this meeting pertaining to this agenda item. Thank you very much. As you can see, it's um, still very emotional, especially when people put um, these types of devices on your car. Um, in that capacity. So I want to make sure that um, I read that disclosure because it's um, been very trying and, and challenging, especially then whenever you have to relive it. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shipman. I appreciate you. All right, getting back on track. Um, and then just giving me copies, Madam Clerk, would be great. Um, any questions from uh, for the bid director? Mm -hmm. Naomi Jarden, go ahead, uh, yeah. Councilwoman Dewar, I appreciate well, you. Well, let me just start by saying how wonderful it is to see you. you and um, I appreciate all those comments about being on this side of the dais, that side of the dais. And um, the incredibly hard work that you and your team have done, I see the ambassadors everywhere. Um, they're always out doing cool stuff, working on stuff, talking to people, introducing themselves. I mean, it's really working. And they are not only taking care of security and um, trash, but they're welcoming people to our town. And it's so very important as a major tourist town um, that we have people like that, even to help them find a bathroom, right? 
Um, so I just, I can't say enough about it. It's, you know, the presentation was very informative. You made the comment about the trees and it was very, I actually teared up myself because there has, there had been a proposal to tear down all those trees and put a motel, a hotel in their place and um, lots of debate about that. But now 10 years later, you're actually seeing, you know, getting to enjoy you and your whole staff and team, the beauty of those trees. And you know, it is the only, um, downtown space uh, like that's a civic plaza that has trees no other one does it's the only one that we do have um, so it's a special place and I'm so so happy that you were able to take out the aggressive uh, rocks uh, jagged materials that were placed there and make it a welcoming place that's so important to me um, I had a couple just a couple real quick questions because I know we've been talking about this for a long time uh, today and that was, I was interested when you mentioned the carts, and I wanted to know, did you have, when you talk to people about their carts and that it, it prevents them from getting services, did you have another alternative for people in their carts? Yes. What was we that? Do. I'm trying to pull up the slide here. Yeah, um, I think I it was way back. It the, was towards the, the beginning. I wish I would have had the photo of what we offer. I almost interrupted. I think you just passed yeah. it. Yeah. So what we do is, um, and we're, we're always open to donations. If anybody has large suitcases with wheels on it. Yeah. 40 East 4th Street is where our offices are. Please donate them. That oh. is the, the main thing that people are always looking for are the larger wheeled suitcases. Okay. Um, we have some great relationships with the Katie Grace Foundation, um, but we have just cleaned them out of all their um, suitcases. Okay. So uh, those are fantastic. And then we also have some additional bags that are kind of a reinforced handles. So we help them transfer their items into that um, so that they have something that they can still transport their items, but we can get the um, stolen carts back to their rightful owners as well. And maybe you even need a backpack or something. I don't know. We, you know what? And and Katie Grace has actually been pretty tremendous in in offering backpacks as well. But okay. yeah, those wheeled suitcases. The other question I had, you brought up a really difficult issue, and that's with the Union Pacific Railroad. And I just wonder. I mean, it's you don't have to answer, but I I do want to put it out there. It seems incredible to me that we cannot even consider finding finding this pro private property owner for allowing this disaster to occur on their property. So it, my time's up, but you understand what I'm talking about, and I really think we should take some kind of enforcement action. We've been talking to them for years. They have to take responsibility for their property, and maybe code enforcement should start writing them tickets. I'm sorry, Union Pacific, but that's how I feel. We share in your frustration. It is our highest location where we um, address issues, and we too have been frustrated with their response of coming or lack out of. or lack of coming out uh, every three months, maybe. Um, as you know, these issues can't wait three months. Um, and and the, the resources that we're expending, that your staff is expending, and the cost associated with it from law enforcement to the you know toxic waste cleanup is, is just, it's unreasonable for They're them. acting like it's private, public property. And it's, it's private property. It's not. So we share in that frustration, and we we verbalize that at the end meeting on Monday. Okay. I also I, I, th I find it just hard to believe too um, that they don't care more about uh, the dangers of what that could do to someone, right? We presented some. Um, That's never been part of the discussion with them, and it's really dis uh, people really concerning on the tracks. that There's, they don't have any yeah. regard of how dangerous it is for people. There's fires uh, that are started next to, we have a photo that shows a, a tanker next to where there was, clearly there had been a fire. And, um, you know, just the volume of people and materials so close to the railroad tracks is really a safety, public safety and health concern. And um, just to, to give you a visual of a one-year basis between what the city of Reno and we collect and dispose of, it would fill, fill Mackey Stadium up to almost my height. Wow. So that's just the volume off of properties <laughs> along the railroad tracks. We're not talking about the rest of downtown or the oh, rest wow. of the city limits. We're talking their there. private property. And I know they say we're meeting with the city of Reno and we're being good partners. Uh, there's a meeting coming up, and I hope they live up to that, but they haven't to this point. Yeah. All right. Uh, Councilwoman Ebert stepped out, so we will skip her. <laughs> Going to Councilwoman uh, Bruckus. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Jordan. It's good to see you. I appreciate your enthusiasm for um, the job you're doing and uh, a lot of good stuff. But I, you know, am the, the five-year 
analysis hasn't been done. Mr. Uh, McArdle said there's something somewhere that some people feel suffices, and I will have a copy of that um, because it's in our contract with you. I will have that from May 20th, but that's you know levying these when the folks you know all the residential folks get their cards about their levy. I, I need to say that we're we're following a contractual agreement. You know, I, that's what I need to do. And I, I know you said they're only doing 524000 for the residential, but these residences down here are taxed pretty heavily because they're also paying special assessments on the railroad tracks and maybe even one other. So these are the most taxed people in the city of Reno, and they're our residents. And so I hope to see that. But... Um, that puts me at concern. One question I did want to ask, and it would have been in the five year, because you know I've got the twenty, you know how we embarked upon this journey back in 2017, is um, your budget was going to have 150 thousand dollars at that time of private contribution. It's it was set, suggested as me private membership, and I saw on your budget you have 100 thousand dollars of other support. Where how how is that support coming in that 100 thousand, and where is it going out? What is it supporting? That comes from um, an RTC contribution that is specific to um, the the transfer. Excuse me, the transit station on Fourth Street. So that comes from the RTC. Okay. Okay. So, you know, that's fine. It's your organization to run. But, you know, through the five-year, and it says membership there, I thought you were going to grow a membership organization and have other support to go, you know, for other services that were going to come in from the private sector. And, you know, I didn't hear that. And I just want to also confirm that that is... It, those numbers we're seeing is the total budget for the downtown Reno partnership, your organization. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the hundred thousand, you don't have a membership. You're getting money no. from RTC to backfill that. Okay. Okay. No. And, and just to, about the five year review, um, you know, we, we have met with the residents. That was our very first lunch and learn in meeting with the residents. And our board did conduct a five year strategic plan. Um, and we do have communications with the city of Reno that said through the city's audit process that we have satisfied that five year review. Yeah. You know, that, you know, my conversations with Mr. Satinsky, my agreement to go and levy these people and set up this was all based upon something different. And that's why I'm, I continue to have. Issues Understand. with it, yeah. I'm just Thanks. sharing what my experience is. Okay. Is that it? Um, All right. What about Mr. Martinez? Anything? No. Okay. Ms. Taylor? Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. I am thrilled with everything that you do and all of the ambassadors. I am so lucky to have you in our neighborhoods. Thank you. We're not supposed to be clapping, but I'm wondering... <laughs> Um, I'm so thrilled I want more. Um, <laughs> so if it would be agreeable to you and your team and our team at city, um, the city staff, I would love to see your services expanded just a little bit west for all of Wingfield and Barbara Bennett and along the river. Um, that would be my only, because I think we, the ambassadors do such a great job and then they cross the street um, when they're working with people and the I think it causes some more problems for downtown. The other thing I would just like to highlight, um, slide 37, if you could bring that back up again. Of 44. I know, 44 I slides. apologize. We had so much to celebrate. We put a lot of slides in here. <laughs> okay, hang on a second. Fourth, five, six, 37. Yes. This is, this is a big want? deal. Yes. This is a huge deal, and I don't, I mean, I, I'm so excited about this because living downtown, being one of the residents down there, I it's our top five concern is this building and being able to do anything to beautify it just a little bit is huge. And I know that you have worked tirelessly with the property owners and the banks. So thank you so much for this. It means a lot to the people that live down there and I think to the people that are going to be visiting there. So thank you very much. Thank That's you. all I have. Thank you. Member Ebert, anything? Yeah. Uh, so is is the budget what pays for this artwork here? 
We um, just kind of like the uh, beautification program that we did uh, at the Little Nugget and the Horseshoe. We go in with the property owners and we discuss, um, you know, how we might be able to screen or beautify the project. So it's a partnership. Okay. So this budget doesn't cover the artwork. It would be within um, some of our budget. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the other artwork that you showed, um, the painting, I, I don't remember what slide it's on. I apologize. Oh, yeah, I know. Let me scan back through all these multiple slides. <laughs> this too was a partnership with the property owners. Okay. So who, who picked the artist in that situation? Is it the board works on it or does the property owner? Uh, a little bit of both. Because okay. both had a little bit of skin in the game. Okay. So um, we worked with the private property owners and then um, uh, with, the, with the artist. Okay. Did you yeah. get any community feedback on that at all? Or was it just kind of like, because I know since artists private, are subjective. Yeah, but. since it's private property um, and, and we, we kind of go with what the private property owner and, yeah. and their contribution and investment. Yeah. So we went that that route. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. you okay. Bet. What about um, Council Member Reese? I don't know if you're still in line or have questions for uh, the DRP. Yes, I do. Thank okay. you so much. Thanks. Um, first of all, um, <laughs> Council Member Jardin, it's a pleasure to see you. I'm so sorry that I'm not there in person, uh, but I will tell you we've had some very substantive conversations about the work that the Downtown Reno Business Improvement District is doing while I have been here in Washington, D.C. Uh, everywhere I've gone on the Hill, our senators and our congressional delegation have been very uh, impressed with the work that you're doing. So you are not far from my thoughts, even though I'm not there today. I wanted to first uh, sort of comment about what I have seen as I have gone to other communities. And, and it's interesting because when you are a council member and you start to travel for any reason, you look at what communities are doing to bring back to Reno. You also tend to notice things that you might not otherwise have noticed. So what I have noticed is in Salt Lake, uh, here in DC, in New York City, everywhere you go, there is a downtown a business improvement district. In DC, I found out yesterday that there are 12 uh, business improvement districts, and each one of them has very similar missions to provide services. I wanted to ask specifically about um, some of the Narcan training that your staff has actually deployed. Um, I just, if you could just fill me in a little bit about that, that particular issue is important uh, to me. And so what can you speak to about that? Yes, thank you, Councilman Reese, for bringing that up. Um, yes, all of our ambassadors are trained and equipped with Narcan. So whether they're on foot or you'll see our T3, that three-wheeled unit that's out there, um, they all have Narcan. They completely understand the importance of administering that. And I will share a story with you. There have, have been many a life saved um, with the ambassadors deploying Narcan. And as many of you may be aware, it takes more than one. Sometimes it takes two or three Narcan distributions uh, or, um, you know, giving it to the patient to, to, to revive them. And if you don't think that doesn't have an impact on our ambassadors, it does. They have seen them blue and dying and have brought them back to life. So, yes, all of our ambassadors are trained on Narcan, and sadly, they use it regularly. And um, it, it's just part of your budget that that's how it's paid for, that the training is had. Do you apply for grants, or how does it happen? Um, all of the above. So we um, have great relationships with different providers that some, some will donate Narcan, um, but we have built it into our budget to make sure that we have a sufficient supply of Narcan because we understand the life-saving um, properties that it, it we, like I said, administer uh, sadly on, the, on a daily basis. And then the other question I had, I wanted to ask first about your bringing back uh, some of the related events that you showed earlier. I was able to go to a number of the events that happened in the, um, the Friendship Plaza, um, and I did not unfortunately make the roller skating, but what have you got planned for this season? So we're going to do two of the roller skating events, and let me see if I can pull that slide up because it actually had the dates on it. Um, on Locomotion Plaza. So we're going to do two on Locomotion Plaza, roller skating. Um, and then we are looking to see a special event on Partnership Plaza. And um, we don't want to completely reveal everything yet, but let's just say there might be dogs involved. 
So um, we have just <laughs> such great shade trees and it's just such a great experience during the heat of the summer. So we're looking to use Partnership Plaza on the right. You see we have these great picnic tables we break out and the music and the trees. So um, we're, we're thinking it's gonna be dog centered and can really highlight um, some of the great assets we have in downtown that are dog friendly and, and we're certainly one of those facilities. No, that's great. If you would just include us on the dates for those when you have them, uh, be sure to come out. I, I found them to be very engaging, especially those at the um, Friendship Plaza. It was uh, usually on nights where there wasn't otherwise engagement downtown, and I think everyone had good time even when we were maybe snowed or rained out. Let me also ask, um, what is it that you need from us? When I talk to the downtown Reno residents and also the business owners, they all seem very happy with the service that's being provided um, and believe very much so. And I think we got a number of correspondence related to it, that the work that you're doing has improved the downtown environment. What can we do to assist and be a partner to you? Um, I would say that the biggest thing you can do is just share our hotline, 313-4080, um, and, and share that we are there as a resource for what our assessment payers and our properties downtown need. And even if it's not within our scope to help fully resolve an issue, I mean, we're not towing vehicles and dealing with RVs and that sort of thing. We help to direct people to the right place um, so that they can get some resolution to their issues. So I would just say um, share information. If you hear somebody talking about something in downtown that they either are excited about, want to see, or have a concern with, please connect them with me. Anybody that has uh, an idea or a concern in downtown, just reach out. We are here to serve the entire community. We understand that downtown Reno is the heart of Reno and um, it needs to thrive. And, and quite frankly, the, the um, study that the city of Reno did a few years back, um, forgetting the name of it, um, said focus on downtown. That was, that was universally from the community members said, we want you to focus on making downtown safe, clean, and vibrant, and we're doing level best to, to do that. The last thing and the most important thing is just thank an ambassador. Uh, again, they're out there doing a difficult job in tough conditions 24 seven. So just say thanks to them and the work that they do. This okay. isn't about, this is right. me. This is all the, all the folks in blue that do all the work every day. All right, any other questions for, I keep wanting to say, Councilwoman Jordan, go ahead. Go ahead, Councilwoman Ebert. I do have a question, actually. And sorry, I forgot to go over this earlier. Um, it's in regard to the security team. Mm -hmm. Can I just get some more information about that security ambassadors? Because we have a police Whoop. department. So what what kind of security work would they be doing? So just like any other private entity. Um, including the city of Reno, you have security guards that help you protect property and people, um, and many, many businesses do. And so the Downtown Reno Partnership is no different than that. We are wanting to protect our asset, which is the only thing we have to offer is people, and they're out there in their daily work. Um, additionally, we know that you can't put a police officer on every corner. It's not fiscally possible. It, they are going to higher calls of service. And this security ambassador program, again, has been done across the nation in many cities. It's really there to act in that middle space in between ambassadors and police to really augment presence and to address issues um, as a security, a licensed security personnel. So this is a state licensing. They get equipped with additional equipment, um, and they just have a broader scope of what they do. So will they be armed? Like what kind no. of additional equipment? Will no, no, they, they won't have. They won't have. They won't have. Okay. A, 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 okay. No. Okay. So I guess I'm just trying to understand, like, what's the difference between the security team and the downtown uh, ambassadors? Is just what they do? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So what what we currently have is our ambassador team is made up of hospitality ambassadors, and they go out and they're the ones that um, check on the businesses. What do you need? What are you seeing? Um, they're the initial ones to engage maybe with our homeless population. Then we have social service ambassadors. So if there's a higher level of need, 
um, then those ambassadors step in and they are trained and know how to engage uh, with those situations. And then we have cleaning ambassadors. And while all of us are cleaning all the time, if you've seen any of us, we <laughs> have a trash bag and a glove all the time. Um, but what this is, it's that next level of security ambassadors. Our ambassadors don't have any level of protection currently. This allows them to protect um, our, our staff and the work that they're doing, as well as help to address some issues out in the community in hotspot areas that this, this will, will help us to position them to do that in a deterrent way. Yeah, that, I guess that's what I'm asking. Like, what is that layer of prote protection? Like, what's the difference? They're licensed there? security personnel. Okay. So it's, it's just like any, your security guards out here, they go through an entirely different licensing and training okay. program. Okay, thank you. Sorry if I wasn't clear at the beginning. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you so much. Okay, I'm going to send it to you for one second. There is someone that I do want to recognize because I would shudder to think if you guys were not doing the work that you're doing. I have seen it firsthand. It has been remarkable. There are stories that truly are miracles out there. Um, and I love also the culture that you have fostered, fostered uh, with your whole team. And they were all sitting here, and I'm super bummed that they left. They had um, to get back to work. <laughs> I know, I know. But I wanted them to stand up um, and really recognize how tough their jobs are and how much they really care. And for many of them, it's sort of, it's even bigger um, on a whole broad level, and people don't know that about uh, the people that you work with, because... Yeah. They're very special, and um, I know she just kill me, but Danielle, I'd love for you to come up here and just because your story just yes. I know she I know I'm embarrassing her, but and no, I don't remember red, I don't but. remember how we met, um, but I just knew right away that I was like you have got to be a part of this team, and I am so proud. That was how long ago was that? Over two years ago. It was two years ago, mm -hmm. and. This girl has been through so much hardship and said, I'm going to pull myself up by, you know, what do you call it? Your bootstraps? Anything yes, that you could possibly do. How many? You have two children? I have four. Oh, my God. She's got four children. And we went through this. You were living in a motel. You were doing everything possible. You came from a really, really bad situation, domestic violence. Yes, I mean, you are like, I don't I have I don't think people understand um, how special of uh, the ambassador program is and also what it did for you. And you're still here and you did everything that you said you were going to do. And I just can't even begin to thank you enough and how much you inspire me. You inspire me so much. But I would love for you to say a few words because it's just, I don't think people know that well, also you. so many of the ambassadors have been through such hardships and they're yeah. out there because they their love for the community and people but also it's not easy to do what you do so i want people to hear a little bit about your story and why you think it's important that this council supports you um because i i don't think people realize how much you support our community well thank you i appreciate for the kind words but um i don't think there is words to explain what sorry but um this job's changed my life. <laughs> Sorry, I get emotional because um, when we had first spoke, it was because I was getting kicked out of a domestic violence shelter because of the time. Not anything that I had done or not following rules. It was just, you only get 90 days and you're booted. And um, I wasn't about to be homeless again with my children. And that's when you had reached out to me. And you were like, you talked to me, I think, for a good hour on the phone about just my story and I was just being transparent because I just wanted a, an opportunity to change, you know? And, um, and I was able to do that. And at first I was like, oh, I could just do this temporarily. I've never done anything like this to where I want to make this like a lifelong thing of wherever it is. But I, my, my heart is here because not only do I connect with the people that are, that are homeless or in the houses community, but also it helps me to connect with the businesses as well. Because being on the other side of the spectrum of being homeless, like you, we think people in business don't care. Mm -hmm. We think that people that are higher up and are mm -hmm. don't care, but you, you do. You guys do care. We bring that bridge. I think we bring that gap to being like, hey, we do. And we've been there, but guess what? This is where you can go as well. And if you can bring that, you know, 
to any establishment, any, anywhere that you're working, and then it's it's a beautiful thing. And like I said, I didn't think I was going to be doing this this long, and now I'm I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> and now I'm and I went from hospitality to lead to outreach, and I love my job and I love the people that I work with. And so many of them have gone from zero and then feeling like they're doing something out there, which we are doing something, and it's not easy. Mm-hmm. But um, I'm also a recovering addict. But seeing these people out here, it keeps me wanting to still stay clean, mm-hmm. be sober, and being a role model for my children, you know. Um, I live in a four-bedroom in South Meadows. My kids go to Damani Ranch High School. Like, to me, I never thought that would happen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? My kids mm-hmm. come from a really hard place. And so I just want to say, like, this, this company does make a difference. Mm-hmm. It makes a difference in the people who work there and for the people out there. Yeah. And... Um, I just appreciate you're, it, you're, so thank you. You're, um, you are truly a miracle. Thank you. You guys, she really is. <laughs> oh, my God, Danielle, she's I love coming, you. She's coming Mwah. for my job next. That was fantastic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was fantastic. But I, I don't think people realize, because they're thank so you. quick to judge and criticize, like I was talking earlier, like it doesn't matter what you can you do, you know, they're out there criticizing you, and, you know, it's just never enough, and... I think it's really important to tell the human stories of how it like impacts you. Because Danielle, you had everything stacked against you. Yeah. And I can't tell you how much you inspire me. I don't think people have any idea what you've been through and how this job has just been a godsend in your lives and in your children's yes. lives. And the people I work with, too. I love yeah. them. They're like family to me. So. See what I'm saying? Yeah. So, you know, people see it on the outside, but they don't see on the inside of what's really impacting uh, our community to this level. And the so. thing is, while she told her story, uh, every one of our ambassadors have a very similar that, story. Yeah. And that's very what similar. I'm saying. I didn't want to share theirs because obviously it's so personal. Yeah. But um, thank you for letting us, you know, share it. Of course. I appreciate it. Thank you for hearing me out and listening. I appreciate it. Future mayor. Huh? Yes. Future mayor. <laughs> Future senator, future something. You're incredible. Danielle, you're amazing. Okay, Do you need go me ahead. Any further? No, I'm going to send it to Councilwoman Taylor. Give me a motion. We're going to get everyone moving because I know we have um, all, still a very heavy agenda. So I'm going to ask council members, I'm going to start to streamline because um, today has been kind of long and emotional. So go ahead, take it away, Councilwoman Taylor. I move to approve staff recommendation. All right, I have a motion. Second. I have a second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? I'm opposed. Motion carries. All right, thanks, you guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. All right. Danielle. Okay. Thank you. Madam Clerk, next. Item D4. Does council require a presentation on this item? I don't think so. Nope. <laughs> Councilman Taylor, take it away. Uh, let's see here. I move to adopt the resolution. All right, I have a motion to adopt. Second. I have a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Opposed. Okay, thank you. All right, moving on. Our- clerk. All right, Mayor Shivy, if we can go back to item B11. Thank you for keeping us on track. No worries. Oh, no, I'm, I'm sorry. Item D5 is what I really meant to say. All right, we're all over here. Yeah, the feedback. Okay. All right. Do we have any public comment on this item? We do have public comment on this item. Okay, Sorry great. for the feedback. We're looking into that right now. So Good we, time. I'm not really sure. Thank you. Our first public commenter is Piper Stremmel, followed by Chris Riley, followed by Jeff Church. D5. I just haven't updated it yet. Can we turn it off? You can actually just go off. It feels more comfortable for everybody. Well, hello. Welcome. Nice to see you. I'm shocked you can get away from everything that you, all the wonderful things you've been doing throughout our city. 
Uh, I'm happy to be here. I'm very nervous. No, don't I be. I feel like I'm about to faint. Oh no, you're God. fine. No, you're okay. totally fine. I'm very, very nervous. <laughs> you're, you're doing great. Trust me. Just look at me. Okay. And we'll be fine. Okay. I've been there. Trust me. Oh my God. The, let me tell you something. The three top fears in life, they say, are public speaking, flying, and the dentist. And I hate all three. I, think I don't even know how I got speaking, here. Public speaking, public speaking, and public speaking yes. for me. So just look at me. You'll okay. be fine. And it's very normal. Okay. So you're, you're all good. It does feel very heavy in here, though. I agree. Well, sometimes it, it gets like that. There's a lot of emotion. And, um, and, and so you can just feel it. Okay. Inside, especially, I think, when you're sensitive to how others feel, so. Great. <laughs> I, can, I can come hold your hand, too. <laughs> you come hold her hand. <laughs> come on. Come on up. Hi, guys. Okay, hi, Bot Bot Take it away. Hi, guys. Some of you know me. I own Marmot Properties. We're developers in Midtown and Downtown. Uh, it's actually a perfect transition from the downtown Reno partnership to this project here because this neighborhood right here is one of the most active neighborhoods for the for the downtown partnership program because a lot of the problems and a lot of the the negative parts of downtown is the areas between the bus station and the the homeless shelters so this project is one of the riskiest neighborhoods for a developer to go in mm. and as a developer we talk as, as a local developer who is living right off California Ave, who all of our team works and lives in Reno. All of our investors are here. All of our banks are here. And there's only a few of us in town. We all talk, and we've talked about this project. We don't want this project. Uh, this developer who's here today, they've already put together so much brain damage to put this project together between talking with lenders, investors, talking with contractors. At this point, they're ready to go. Our recommendation to you guys is give them a really aggressive development contract and let them do this project. This building, if we were to keep it as is, I'm sure every nonprofit wants it, but feasibility wise, between cost, timeline, and actual usability of this building, it's for it to come back to life, it's close to impossible. And for someone to actually take that path, it could take them years. Uh, a lot of people are talking about doing an open bid RFP for this building. The concern that we have with the RFP is if the wrong party buys this building, it could very much end up like the west side of downtown where the building is either abandoned, sits like that, or is a parking lot, and that whole neighborhood is not benefited. I think I'm speaking on behalf of all the business owners in that neighborhood there. We need some action there. These guys are here. They're willing to put skin in the game, and they're willing to sign a development agreement to do this project. Generally, we like to stay within under a rock and, and not come out and say things in public. I think this is really critical that these guys take this and run with it, give them a contract, and, and let them do the project. And if you would state your name for the record, please. Yep, my name is Batwan Zadeh with Marmot Properties. Okay, thank you so much. Madam Clerk. Piper Stremmel, followed by Chris Riley. Okay, wait a minute. Chris, come up first. Or okay. Everyone gets to go before Piper. <laughs> all right. Uh, thank you all so much for having me. Um, Manager Thornley, <coughs> members of the City Council. Uh, my name is Chris Riley. Um, <coughs> my wife and I uh, are renovating or have renovated the properties at 300, 400, and 424 East 4th Street. So Jesse, Estella, the Morris, and Abbey's Highway 40. Um, we're commenting in full support of the staff recommendations on taking next items for this item. Specifically, we're supporting those recommendations to prepare this for sale and to enter in a negotiating agreement with Bash Capital. And as I understand a negotiating agreement, and you know, I'm sure I'll be corrected if it's not true, I do not understand it as being for sale and sold at the dais today. I, I believe this is to allow that conversation. And a really important part of that conversation is over the past decade, we've added 336 market rate housing units downtown. This statistic sits at the core of so many of our issues and conversations. This lack of development for residents 
leads businesses to have less food tra foot traffic and to close. Um, it, and you have businesses who really care, who have that heart and, and who are trying to make that positive impact. And I know you all are working hard to help nonstop. We're, co we're hosting residential developers locally from other cities uh, to try to see this downtown potential. Um, but there's real headwinds. From a cost side, you know, you can you can build the same product in Austin, Portland, um, and Vegas for up to 30% cheaper, and you have less risk, less cost, and and these are real headwinds, um, and that's why it's so important just to have this discussion today. Um, developers have already looked at this property. Uh, everyone has looked at this property. Uh, there has been literally nothing stopping anyone else from sending you all a proposal for this. Uh, and that's why I just, I really appreciate this conversation because uh, as a neighbor on 4th Street, we've we've had conversations, we've cheered others on, you know, we've, we've asked them to take a look at it and, you know, we're here today. Um, and, and I think this group has been doing everything they can to change that. You know, they're trying to create a creative solution that can be a win. Um, they've met with, you know, the Reno Sparks Gospel Mission. They've met with Catholic Charities and received support from Catholic Charities. They've met with Brewery District neighbors to talk through how this could actually work. They're led by a third generation Renoite who's been part of inspiring developments in Columbus, Ohio that our city's seen firsthand and whose family's had a presence for decades. And we should absolutely be vigilant in reviewing disposition of properties. We also need to be clear these buildings have been shut since 2021. We've been trying to find uses for them. And the city does not have those funds ready to bring these back up to code for other purposes. And we're investing significantly as a city, as a county, in other services. So, you know, we have an opportunity here to put these parcels to use where a single project could do a third of what housing was added in the past decade. So let's let's have the conversation. Thank All right. you. Thanks, Chris. Lily Barron, followed by Trish Bolartini. Mm, okay, of course. Hello, Lily Barron for the record. Um, I just would once again like to talk about uh, this parcel in particular. I believe that I live closest to this area of anyone else in this room. Um, I live about three and a half blocks from this parcel. I walk by it every single day, several times a day. My understanding of what is the need of people in this community is probably strongest um, of anyone in this room, and I have yet to have any conversations with anyone. However, I do patronize your businesses and enjoy them very much. Thank you. Um, closest bars to my house. Um, I would like to talk about solutions-based research. Um, I am a part of national think tanks on these issues. No one comes to us for information. You go ahead and uh, make decisions based on whatever you think might be the, the solution. However, there are really policy-based solutions for these things. Um, I've read and studied these issues. I'm constantly engaging people on how we can help where things are falling through the cracks. We have fires because we need warm places to go. We have human bio biohazards because we don't have enough restrooms. And I'm talking if I need to use the restroom and a business isn't open, I have to walk from uh, at least a mile to find a restroom myself as a non-person not experiencing homelessness. We have waste because we need more trash cans. I walk for several blocks with dog poop in my hands because we do not have enough trash cans in my neighborhood. And those are just some of the very simple things that if we were very concerned about these issues that we would be seeing um, downtown in that specific corridor on East 4th Street. The highest traffic area by the train tracks is in the most need because a valuable housing asset has gone dilapidated and unattended for, and that is the parcel that we're talking about right now. It has the most need because it used to ha it used to serve some of the most uh, needy folks in that area. I would like to see the kind of housing that we need. Once again, we have market rate housing in that area that people cannot afford because of summary evictions, which is a bill that I worked on for the last two sessions that has not been um, passed, which is not your fault at all, obviously, but summary evictions are the reason why these people that are in suites who can afford market rate housing are not able to go into the market rate housing across the street because they have an eviction on the record. It's very complicated. It's much more than what people think that it is. It's not that people can't save a first class in security. It is they are never able to rent a home again because of an eviction on their record. And it's not because they can't pay $1,500, $1,600 a month. Um, 
Best practices around the country for cities are to identify a property for disposal and to request for uh, the request for qualifications to go out to a city to get the best development team to achieve the goals of the city. We're going to request all that communication between um, this group, between Brianna and the city of Reno in the past six months to see how we got to this spot. Um, and I guess with my remaining time, although Madam Mayor who asked me specifically to address the quorum, which I think is ridiculous, but here I am, um, to... Uh, address why you apologized recently for a council member's remark to a commenter. However, I did not hear an apology, an apology when a council member called other people's commenting theater. I'd like to remind that member uh, that I host a Narcan dispensary. I host a community refrigerator. I host many of these services that you say that you care about and it is not theater. Um, we have much different a uh, much different relationship outside of what happens here. The last thing Madam Mayor said to me was, thank you so much. So kind of you, Lil. Hope you're doing well. Thank keeping up the good fight at the ledge. What do you think I talk to people at the ledge about? I say the same thing that I said here today. They don't complain about how hard their job is. They don't sit here and say, nobody says you do anything right. It takes a thick skin to be able to do public service. That's what it takes. Yes, it does. No one is, no one is personally attacking anyone. Right. It was funny because offense is the last thing I can think that my neighborhood needs. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Lily. Trish Bollertini followed by Piper Stremmel. Hi, I'm going to make mine real short. <laughs> um, so we're at 530s, 4th Street. We've been there for 85 years. Um, we've experienced a lot of crime. We have night security on our own. We've had to put up different fencing and cameras and all sorts of stuff. So when a project like this wants to come into our neighborhood and take over a vacant building, I don't see an issue because it's a legitimate, good project. It's going to bring reasonable housing to that area. And I think it'll cut down on the vagrants in that area and the crime that we experience at our job with theft and vandalism and human waste, all sorts of stuff every single day. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Trish. Is there anyone else? Did you Piper say? Stremmel. Just for the record, I echo Trish in all of those comments as well. Um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Piper Stremmel. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I am here today in full support of the staff recommendations to take the next steps on item D5. Specifically, I am supporting the recommendation to prepare the 315 and 335 Record Street properties for sale and for the city to enter into a negotiating agreement with Bash Capital. I have written and rewritten this comment a few times over the past week, hoping to strike a certain academic tone with some and wanting to prove that I understand what good urban planning looks like to others. Initially, my approach is going to be an argument in favor of the proposal for the purpose of building more housing, because that is absolutely the critical need here. I wanted to argue that dynamic and functional downtowns require a healthy mix of both residents and businesses. That downtown Reno's lack of residential housing has been an issue for decades and continues to be the main reason we don't see the growth we want or expect to see in our downtown. That as a city, we can't continue to ask people to invest in building businesses if we don't aid in growing the residential community around them. There is, of course, more to say on housing, but I wanted to speak on the value of the neighborhood at the heart of this proposal, East 4th Street. I am a business owner on East 4th Street, but more specifically, I own businesses on either side of the Record Street properties that are being prepared for sale. One of my businesses is a hotel, which as a 24-7 business means I am on East 4th Street morning, noon, and night, and often seven days a week. I am invested in this street. And when I say invested, I mean I am physically, financially, and most importantly, invested, emotionally invested in the street. The street is personal to me. The street brings me both incredible joy and extreme frustration. But it also brings hope. In regards to the proposal, to the proposed project, to the proposed project at 315 and 335 Record Street, I feel hope. There are some projects that spark hope. I hope that the hope that we are moving in the right direction as a neighborhood, that we are part of the change we want and expect to see in our city. The Greater Nevada Field Complex and consequently the ballpark apartments are an example of projects that spark hope. 
I am on the street every day and I am here today to argue that I don't believe we have the luxury of waiting for the perfect developer with the capital required to be rewarded this project after a lengthy RFP process, only for the project to ultimately not move forward and for the building to remain vacant for another three years. The property in question has been shuttered since 2021 with no real viable chance of reopening and certainly no chance of reopening to serve its previous use. The proposal put forth by Bash Capital is a real proposal a real proposal that addresses a critical need, housing, which I think we can all agree on. And I'll say that again because it feels so important here. A real proposal that addresses a critical need with a clear mission and obvious motivation and the capital needed to take on this project, even with its many, many, many obstacles. Our downtown needs more people willing to take risks and less boarded up buildings. We need to give ourselves the opportunity to grow into the city we envision for ourselves and the city we know that we all deserve. Piper, thank you so much. Um, did you say it? Yep, <laughs> he did. Uh, yep, yeah. Madam Bill, Clerk. Bill Shrimp via Zoom. Okay. Bill, if you'd like to unmute, state your name for the record, and begin speaking. Thank you. Yep. Great. And just for the record, we are on item D5. We did read, receive correspondence on this item. Three Hello, letters. Hi, sorry, can you hear me now? We can. Please state your name for the record and begin speaking. Apologize for that. Hello. Good afternoon, all. This is Phil Shrimp. Um, yeah, it's a heavy room today. Um, I want to talk about D5 a little bit. As somebody who used to um, drop off diapers and formula, in what this facility used to be. Uh, it was kind of an amazing thing. Uh, it's very sad to see what it's become. Um, there's one thing that I kind of agree with everybody on on this, and that is that building is not being used properly. Um, the one problem with the Bash Capital thing is it really kind of has the look and appearance of a sweetheart backroom deal. Um, there are plenty of people who have come this morning and again this afternoon to express support or alternative ideas saying, hey, we would like to engage, and uh, it doesn't sound like they've been able to get to the table. Maybe it's hopes and dreams, whereas these guys have a real offer, I don't know. Uh, but it sure has the appearance and the perception of a sweetheart backroom deal for like a million dollars or $1.5 million. Like the dirt is worth more than that over there. Um, the other thing too, while I was waiting here, uh, I looked up Bash Capital LLC and the Nevada Secretary of State. Um, I don't know who those people are. Um, I look at Bash Capital LLC on the Nevada Secretary of State. It says they were dissolved in 2020. So is this a foreign corporation or is this a Nevada-based business? Uh, I heard somebody say that these are Reno people, but they're not incorporated here. So my suggestion is, yeah, keep talking to Bash. Maybe they're really, really good. Maybe it's the right answer. But direct staff, please ask them to actively reach out to anybody who's come today and in the past and expressed interest and say, hey, come forward with something real. The time is now step up to the table, let us see what you got, and then you as a body can pick the best solution for that property. Because yes, it's sitting the way it is, it's a problem. But maybe there's other people who really can do something, have a public process, go through it, make it transparent, give people an opportunity to participate. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Bill. Back to you, Madam Mayor. All right, thank you so much. Uh, any more public comment, Madam Clerk? That is it for our live public comment. For the record, we received 39 letters or voicemails to our um, reno.gov online public comment form or by email to our office, 25 in favor, 10 in opposition, and four letters of concerns. Those have been distributed to the Reno City Council and are available on reno.gov forward slash meetings. Okay, thank you so much. 
Okay, a um, couple things. There is a lot of dynamics here, as we all have heard today, which I, I that was my um, concern yesterday. Um, I think that um, I want to be respectful because you guys are here. I understand you've put a lot of work in, um, not to mention your local, and I think that that matters. Um, and also, you know, you just heard the public commenter talk about, you know, it's like, it sounds like a backdoor deal. That is why I wanted to move forward today um, to hear this. Uh, because I think if you don't, then they could say, hey, you know, there was backdoor deals going on, which wasn't the case. That's why I said, you know, bring it forward, right? Um, and it's really, really unfortunate. I think we all want the same outcome here. Um, which is really important um, from a community level and standpoint. So I want to make sure that there, we live here. So I don't, I don't want, I mean, I'm sure Lily, do you know some of these people over here personally? No, I live in the neighborhood. Okay, but you probably, Reno small, we all know each other, right? Um, so we live amongst each other and it's really important that we have community consensus. And the last thing that I want are people coming up to you saying, Oh, you're a shady developer. You know, I, I'm just over that because I think a lot of good people and good intention um, sort of gets uh, tarnished of the really good work that they want to do and provide. Um, I think also that it's problematic. Uh, you know, Council Member Breckis is right. I remember when you brought it forward and you said we should have a process, we should do, um, you know, X, Y, and Z. I understand, and I'm going to have, uh, uh, what do we call you, ACM attorney come up and talk about that, because I said, where's the process? Evidently, there is a process in place, so I want to hear about that, because I, I think some of us don't remember the process. And um, so I want to kind of be clear, so moving forward, that we can have an outcome that everyone can participate in and that it's not being called a backdoor deal. Um, I think it would have been way worse had we not have heard this today. I think it would have been um, not the right direction. I want some clarity, and I think the community wants clarity, but I'm going to leave that up to you because I kind of said, where's the process? And you said, we have a process. So I need you to clarify that for me. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Ashley Turney, Assistant City Manager, for the record, um, to answer your question and clarify for all of Council today. There was direction from the body back in 2016 to establish a policy for disposition of city property. That was enacted. It was also updated in June of 2019. And staff has followed that process for an unsolicited bid or a letter of interest. Essentially, the next step would be staff gets that and they bring it forward to this body for you to decide what you would like to do. So staff is following the process. That's why you have this before you today. Mm -hmm. Just for clarity, again, mm -hmm. staff did not open up an RFP. This came into us, so we just followed process. Mm -hmm. And I took it for the opportunity to have this very conversation if this is the direction of the council and if we wanted to. So I think that that's the best thing instead of uh, pulling it off. So you, you don't get it both ways. I think, um, you know, it's much better if we all get to participate in the conversation. Madam Mayor. Go ahead. Yeah, Madam I'm the Clark. one who proposed on. the okay. unsolicited. Okay, thank you. Go I'm, ahead. I'm the one who proposed the unsolicited process and, you know, the disposal property. And it was never designed this way. You know, it never was. One, the concept was if proposals come in, they'd be circulated to the council. Never got that. Didn't even know. Didn't even know. And secondly... Um, you know, it was always the manager's discretion whether or not to bring it forward as a concept and circulate it to us. And this manager not only decided to do that, he was having discussions or his staff with these people. And then we had a discussion. It wasn't even disclosed that they were in negotiations. I just learned that in, in, the, in the online reporting the other day. I mean, in September of last year, we had a discussion. There was no discussion that there's an unsolicited proposal and that we're in discussions with someone. That was, that was asked 
as I recall, and it wasn't even disclosed. I don't understand it. So three days later, I circulated to every member of, of the body, and, and it's there, a request to have it on the agenda. And what continued to happen was negotiations between our staff and these people. I, I, I'm, I'm so stunned. I'm so stunned that our process is so broken that under our council rules, a member asked for an agenda item, cannot get it on, and staff is under negotiations and not even disclosing it. I, I need to tell my colleagues, there's something called the Dewey Rule, okay? And that related to Civic Plaza and the explosion of the old Mapes Hotel. And that was behind the doors, negotiations leading to a decision without having a quorum and the council doing business. People challenged it. And what they found out is that serial meetings were happening, coming to a conclusion and a, and a council action. And I feel that's where we are here. We have an action of a negotiated deal, you know, proposed before us, never any discussion, never on the agenda. I feel there's been serial meetings and a decision has been made to bring this forward as an option to these people. I, I feel that we have a walking quorum and we're in troubled waters here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Madam first Mayor, of all, can I clarify a couple of things? Yeah, just but first for the of record. all, I do want to say the buck stops with us. Regardless of what staff does, I don't care what you guys do. Um, it, it stops with us, Councilwoman Bruckus. So that's why I want it here. I want it open. I want it transparent. That is not exactly, I, I think it paints this perception that everyone's doing deals behind closed doors. It's up to this council. And I want to reiterate that. That's why we were elected. We were elected by the community to do that. Um, and no one is bringing anything. I just feel like it undermines why we're here today by by using that kind of rhetoric, I think it's important. Um, like I said, I never met with them until yesterday, and I was very clear about, hey, I think this has honestly come on the agenda and probably going to do a disservice to what you guys have probably worked really hard on. I'm being very open and honest and transparent, and I think that's critical. And th to do that, we should be doing it here like we are right now. I think that that's the best and fair process. So anyway, go ahead. Sorry. I just want to make sure because that to me, whatever you guys do as staff, we have a very different role, right? And sometimes you interpret our, our role differently or we can say things and you, and you come back and you say, oh, I thought you meant this. I mean, it can be interpreted very different, but I also don't want to attack your efforts. I get it. You guys have a tough, tough job. Uh, but at the end of the day, the buck stops with us. We get to make the final decision. Um, and I think that that's important. So I just want to, I want to reiterate that. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. We'll get into more details with the presentation, but a few things just to clarify for the record. There is not a deal in front of council today. There have been no negotiations with staff because that direction has not been given by this body. There are no deals, there are no deal points, there are no negotiations. And additionally, the previous policy stated that the manager had the discretion that was changed in 2019 to bring everything before this body, as was the request of this body. So again, no deal has been made, and that is also not what is in front of council today. You are not being asked to sell a process or sell a property today. That is not what is in front of you. You are responding to a letter of interest, and we'll get into what the specific things in front of you are. Okay. Would you like to hear a staff presentation at this time, Madam Mayor? Can you also clarify, did we have some in the past the same? I want to say we did on parcels. You did so on 4th Street, I, I want to be clear so everyone understands. This has actually been pretty common. We've had yes. people come forward on, on parcels that are for sale Correct. many times, I think, right? So, Madam Mayor, I would say that this body has actually had this process in front of you at least three times, Zero Riverside and two properties on 4th Street that the city owned. So those were also unsolicited bids, letters of interest that have come forward to this body. We presented them in the same format. Council can choose to engage in that process or to tell staff we're not interested. Okay. But again, in full transparency, we bring those. Staff does not negotiate deals on behalf of council until we are given direction in public to do so. Also City Plaza. Also City Plaza. Mm -hmm. Same deal. Okay. We had an offer and we went on an RFP process. Uh -huh. On DRP Plaza. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That was 
yes, years back, correct. I was just looking in the last probably year to 18 months. You've seen this three other times. Okay. I, I just thought it's just interesting how this one becomes um, different, and it's not. We're following the policy that's been in place for almost five years now. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Madam Mayor. Go right ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I Before we get into a presentation, I do think it's important to um, point out two things. One is that um, this question of political theater, one of the public commenters had asked about it earlier. And I do think that when a member claims that there are backdoor deals going on, when a member says that we are violating our rules because they could not get an item on the agenda, that's the type of political theater I'm talking about. I'm not talking about people who've come to speak in public comment. The public commenters today have been awesome. But the problem is, is we have a member who continually says things that are not true. That same member has sued us. And today we found out from Judge Hardy that they had lost in court. And that member continues to spread disinformation. Um, the, the, and it's unfortunate because we do have to have substantive conversations about the C site. It's an important piece of property. It's something that we own. It is something that has been talked about for many years. I have had conversations with people, sometimes just in passing. Other times people are very much more specific about that site. Um, there are challenges with easements. There are challenges with the power pole that's in the middle of it. There are challenges about how it was funded and what the funding has to go to. But it is not made more. It is not made easier when people are simply lying. And and that really is the theater that I think that we should divest ourselves from. We all have differences of opinions, but one member continues to lie about things, and that's what's not acceptable. And so that is the kind of theater that I think our public becomes discordant by. It is the kind of theater that uh, becomes clickbait for um, pseudo journalists. This is Carl Hall. Just, Can we stay on, on this agenda item, please? Yes, Mr. Hall, but I will use the time that I have to speak about the issues as I see them uh, without regard to your comment. Um, you <laughs> seem to get involved in comments when you uh, want to, but not when they're needed. And so I'm a lawyer just like you, and I think I know what is on the topic. Uh, one of the members claimed that this was improperly in front of us because of some uh, email that they sent years ago. That is not what our rules say. Have you corrected the member about what our rules say, Mr. Hall? You know, we can have that conversation offline. If we could just stick on this agenda item, I'd appreciate it. No, th this was what was started by the membership. So the body asked about this item, and I want to talk about and the I'm CAC. I'm asking you to please talk about the item. Yeah, the CAC is the item in front of us, and the question was whether or not this had been <laughs> properly agendized because a member had sent an email. That's not what our rule says. And so I just want to make sure that the public is aware of what our rules are so that we can situate things. Similarly, when we were on the setting up agenda for the meeting, that was the same kind of theater that was being engaged in. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam Mayor. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Okay. Um, I think Councilwoman Taylor was trying to get my attention. Go ahead, Councilwoman Ebert. We're on round one. I'm going to remind everyone. Okay. This is wild. Um, so, <laughs> first of all, I just want to call It's really out, not. <laughs> like, it's really how not. hilarious it is to me to make comments <laughs> about political theater for three minutes. Just the irony of that. Um, also, um, I want to say that I did have a meeting with the applicants. I think they were from, um, what was it? Bash LLC. And... One of the first things they said to me um, during the meeting was concerning to me. Um, they mentioned that they had spoken to um, former council member Delgado the week prior about the development. And this is not the first time I've had a developer or um, an organization that's looking to do development tell me that they've spoken to counts, former council member Delgado prior to me. It raises a lot of concerns to me about the process that the city is following with regards to these developments and what's really going on, who's really planning the city here. Um, I know that um, 
Council Member uh, Martinez still consults with uh, Council Member Delgado, but he's no longer on the council. So I just want to call out that I'm concerned about that. I'm concerned about the process that's being followed by organizations. Um, so that's number one. I also want to call out that I believe um, Council Member Breckis requested this be on the agenda a while ago. Nobody's really addressed that. I mean, we've talked about the process that we have to talk about it now because somebody's requested um, that we consider selling this property. But why haven't we talked about why this hasn't been brought to the agenda because Council Member Breckis requested it? Like, is there any process there? Because there's a lot of people that have said that there was interest. I've heard that RISE wanted to use a facility. We have the Gospel Mission right there. We have Catholic Charities right there. Like, this is a good spot to have a, a facility. It was a facility. And it didn't fall into disrepair overnight. It wasn't um, bombed. It didn't get hit by an earthquake. This was a facility that we let fall into disrepair. And now we're going to spend $5 million dollars to um, expand and refurbish a f the Neil Road facility for Community Health Alliance. And I just want to understand why we're not giving the same care to all the facilities that we own and why we overlook this facility to the point where it's now no longer usable and we're discussing, you know, selling it, um, you know, at a reduced rate so somebody else can put in housing. I just don't think that we're being good stewards of the properties that we have. So. All right, thank you so much. Go ahead, Council Endure. Okay, all right. Um, hard to know where to begin right now. Um, I had a lot to say about this item. Um, we have been in this position as um, Assistant City Manager Ashley Turney mentioned several times. And every time that this happens, we are accused of oh. some uh, devious doings yeah. when we had no idea that a person was going to come forward and ask us to do something. <laughs> and we're sitting here as recipients of a proposal, and yet there's allegations made that we are somehow in cahoots, and it's all a big global conspiracy and a big plan. And it just it, it deeply offends me. And I don't get offended easy. I got broad shoulders. I've been in this job 10 years. Um, but, but sometimes you reach a breaking point, and you've just kind of had it. And, and that, this one is kind of it for me. I want a very, maybe the process that we adopted in 2019 needs to be further refreshed. That's five years old. And maybe if an unsolicited proposal comes in, we need to immediately bring it to council the very next meeting, let, the, let all of us know that it's been received, and ask direction on how to handle it. That, I think, would... Uh, you know, in the quickest way possible, eliminate some of all this speculation. It would certainly eliminate people spending time on things mm -hmm. that aren't going anywhere, okay? And I also support the request for having a public workshop on this meeting, on the building, because it's a city property. And I concur with you, Dem demolition by neglect is a real thing. When you neglect something and it then becomes worth pennies on the dollar, that's an intentional move or an unintentional move. I mean, people aren't always paying attention to every single thing that's happening in the city the way that they need to or should. Um, I, I could point to a number of older buildings that we have, whether it's the Lear Theater, the California Building, the South Side School, on and on. Those are some of our older buildings, and they haven't had the love and attention that they need either. Um, so it's very hard, given our budget realities, to do all the things we need to do to take care of all the things we have. And that would include the courtyard, this building. I mean, this building is from, what is it, the 60s or 70s? It is 50 years old. Our people w live and work here. It is finally having a little bit of renovation. I have a lot more to say about the proposal. What I, would, I am impressed that someone wants to come forward for housing. Love that. Um, the question is, what kind of housing, right? And it is more and more difficult for developers. I've, they've been told me the biggest challenge is buying the land or buying the property to renovate. That's their biggest challenge. It's not our, our uh, Title 18 requirements. It's, it's not all the nuances on the side. It's not the setbacks. That's what they've told me. What it is is the cost of land, the cost of property. 
I will come back on my second round with some more specifics, but I, I still had to express myself on this issue. Okay, thank you so much. All right, go ahead, Councilwoman Taylor. I was just hoping we could get a presentation. Yeah. <laughs> if we could start that process, well, maybe. <laughs> I didn't know if we well, were commenting. The, the biggest reason why I don't want to do that is because I wanted clarity of, because I went to uh, Ashley and I said, what is the process? But what are we, what are we doing? Discussion now, so, or are we going to have a presentation so we have something yeah. to talk about? Well, first of all, I didn't want to waste anyone's time, but I wanted some clarity because we're, we're being up here criticized for the way we've handled it. Do you think I, I do? I think we um, have handled it well. No, I think we could do a much better job when it comes to outlining it to where there's more clarity, more discussion before we get in here. I was very clear about this yesterday. I was worried about this. And, um, and so I don't like it. Uh, the fact that, you know, you guys have probably done a lot, a lot of work. And then you get in here and then it's like, uh, what's happening? But our attorneys um, look at the agenda, right? They, I mean, you know, so have well, we followed don't the even process? Get me going. Have we done anything um, out of line? Are we okay to hear a presentation and get moving on this? Well, They've been here all day. Yeah. Right, but I also think that we owe it to what to the public, like what it is. Yeah, but the public, we haven't done anything wrong, and our attorneys. Oh, I don't would think not we have, but I also would forward, like some clarity. So, yeah, because I totally I think, agree. I think we did this backwards. I think we really, honestly, we did, and I had concerns about it. I was very upfront and honest, so I want to. I just want people to know that I think we, you know, the way that this I went that we, down I mean, is. I'm, I'm sorry. I think we are getting, we're letting public comment, which is very valuable, dictate how we operate. A meeting because we've had this three or four other times and we have not had this discussion. So, I mean, Ashley, uh, I'm sorry, Assistant City Manager City Turner just said we had this same yeah. agenda, same process three or four times. We've never had this discussion before. Is it a good discussion? Yes. Great. But let's move forward with the presentation and, and hear what we're supposed to be talking about in my mind. Thank you. I, I'm just saying I, I want to be very careful so that it doesn't... Um, backfire on anyone that wants to come over and come in and do a great project. Uh, does that make it worse for you? I don't know. And especially I want to be super sensitive because you are local and you do care about this community. Um, so I don't want to do anything that uh, puts you in a position where uh, you're maligned for wanting to do something really positive in the community. So that's my big concern. I'm trying to be sensitive of, of your needs as well. So. Um, I'm going to let Councilman Breckis okay. go ahead, and then we're yeah, going to move on. Yeah, um, so, so, you know, um, I, um, he's going to bring up what I sent to the every all the members and the manager asking to have just the future of the CAC on in September of last year, okay? I learned yesterday from This Is Reno, that staff since July has been talking to the Bash Capital. And so I think to move forward, I understand the eagerness to, you know, dive into the item, but that letting them give the pitch disadvantages everyone else. And I'll add in addition to some of the list, Ms. Ebert or Ms. Dewar said, a domestic violence group person kind of spoke to me in 23 and said, hey, you know, what is the city doing with that building? I really wanted to get there. And I'll tell you why. I, I have a lot of history with the organization. I remember what went into building that building, okay? And I also know how special purpose it is. I also have requests for nine months to go into that building and see for my own eyes its condition. We, we got this report that it's fallen into repair, but I've wanted to go in. I've told staff I would hazmat suit up and take the risk to go in and look at the building. Has Bash been in the building? I don't know. That's what I wanted to do because it's such a special purpose building Willie. to be able to understand. So, it, you know, I know we're having a long day, yeah. Madam Mayor, and I, I know Ms. Taylor wants to hear the pitch, but... Let's take a vote on whether or not to hear the pitch, because I'd like to, because the pitch gives them a leg up, and that's why I wouldn't meet with them on anyone else who's not at the table to propose, okay? So let's take a vote whether or not to hear the pitch. If we say, no, we're not going to hear the pitch, then we'll, then we'll do what I asked to do. 
you know, when it can come back in that form. And hopefully in between, I would like to go in the building and maybe I'll see it so terrible and say, yeah, this thing does need to get demoed. What a shame. Mm. So that's, you know, that's, that's where I'm at. Okay. I'm ready to speak again. Um, hold on a second. Mm -hmm. I might take a recess just okay. for a minute. I think it's been a very emotional day. It um, is. and I think, you know what? I'm sure you guys followed the process when you contacted the city, right? From what they told you to do. And so I don't want to put you guys in a position where you're the bad guys. I also want to be respectful for all the work that you put in. Uh, Councilwoman Breckis is, is probably right in that sense. Like, does that hurt you or help you if we go into RFP, right? If you come and present? I think that's what you were alluding to, Councilwoman Breckis, right? Well, I mean, we just have more dis more ability to set set the the understanding of our desires for the for the property. W if we hear what their desires are, we're skipping the step of having our discussion of what the desires are. Well, and <laughs> that's the, and the that's, problem. And I think that that's true. Um, it, it actually to find out what do we really want to do with that property. I mean, honestly, like, has there been that discussion? So, um, again, I just, I want to be very careful because I think that you guys did everything you were supposed to do that we asked of you. And now here you are and going, huh, because uh, we're not organized. And that, that's got to be super frustrating. So I'm going to actually leave it up to you guys to decide if it's something that you want to present today because obviously, um, you know, it's important to you. Sorry, can you go up to the podium yeah. and state your name for the record so that we can hear you? Hi, I'm Brianna Bolantini. We are absolutely uh, going through this today. We submitted an offer just like it's always supposed to be done. We did it the exact legal way, and we are here to go through the normal routine that's done on any city project ever. Thank you. Okay. So, and I think you have um, a point there that, I mean, I'm going to ask our city manager. We've done this before in this capacity in this way. We have. Okay. So I want everyone to understand that. Okay. Um, do you want to come up and address the ACM attorney? Uh, Madam Mayor, if I can help the body at this juncture, I would recommend either if you want to take a five-minute recess to give everybody yeah, we're a gonna take. I would. We are. We're going to take a five-minute recess. I want people to go outside. I want people Get to... Get some sunshine, and then when we come maybe back... Maybe eat something. We, just, we all with... have to come back with a better... Yeah. Um, frame of mind. We'll come back and do a staff presentation to go over what's been received, what's in front of the council, and okay. what the actions are requested of you today. Okay. We'll then transition over to the applicant who submitted their letter of interest, and then council can deliberate and decide how you'd like to proceed at that point. Okay. All right. Thanks so, so much. So we'll reconvene at 425. No. How about 430? Yeah, 430. Okay. Thanks, everyone.
get started soon. I've got Councilwoman Breck is here. I've got Councilwoman Ebert here. We can if you'd like to. We have I Council need... Member Martinez and Council Member Reese online. All right, Council Member Reese is online. And Council Member Martinez. All right, perfect. Would you like to reconvene? Yes, let's go. Okay, we're calling this meeting back to order at 4.30. At this time, Vice Mayor Doerr is absent and Council Member Taylor is absent. Okay, thank you so much. All right, I'm going to send it over to ACM uh, Attorney, or no, I guess Mr. McArdle. You're going to come on up. Um, I want to reiterate for the record that this has been the process. Uh, so I, I, wanted, I want everyone to know that because you know how it is in the press. It'll say they didn't follow the process. And then, you know, social media gets going. But I'm if only on social media staff, this much. So quiet down, please. Anyway. Thank you. Madam Clerk has spoken. She wants you to quiet down. <laughs> so anyway, okay. Um, take it away. All right. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and Council Members. Brian McArdle, Revitalization Manager here at the City of Reno. So uh, city staff has received a letter of interest for the properties located at 315 and 355 Record Street, the buildings formerly known as the Community Assistance Center. And as the process, we bring those offers uh, before council to get direction on how they would like to proceed. And so just start off with the staff recommendation. Um, given the current status of the property, we do have a very clear process on disposition of city property. Uh, and we have a way of, of reviewing current city buildings. Uh, and it is based on, does the property currently, is the property currently used by a city department uh, does it support a municipal function? Is the property vacant and will be vacant for the foreseeable future? Uh, is it a non-performing or performing asset? Could it provide greater economic and social um, value to the community? Could it serve an economic development opportunity? Could it create future property tax if it goes back on the property rolls? This property does satisfy all those things. And so, um, you know, if someone were to solicit an offer, uh, we would at least entertain the idea, mainly because the city is under the, that building is underutilized. Um, additionally, when the process is now that if the staff does receive a letter of interest, uh, we take it before the body. When a request is received, staff will prepare a preliminary analysis at the re of the request and present it to council, who shall by motion, motion instruct staff whether or not to obtain appraisals and draft a development agreement with the proposer. And so that is what we're here for today. Um, our staff recommendation is to start the process. Uh, we have some general idea of what the property is valued at due to an appraisal we did just assessing the current status of the building a while ago. Uh, we would like to go get current appraisals so we actually know what the true appraisal value is on this property. Um, enter in negotiations with uh, Bash Capital. Uh, dependent on direction we receive today from this body. Whatever you would like to see in that, we can take that as direction and go back and talk to them about it and see if we can come up with a deal that we can bring forward. Because um, as of right now, we have not talked about any of those issues so far. Um, this, this process was initiated by, by Bash Capital. Uh, and then additionally, there is a collection of parcels in that area. Some of it is on the former Record Street area. And we would like to clean up that whole parcel area and do a reversion to acreage. So it's just a little bit cleaner for us to, to handle this going forward. And so a little bit of background on the property. Uh, in 2003, council identified that that location on, West, on, on Record Street should be a uh, location to coordinate a bunch of city services, wraparound services. And so a lot of other partners moved into the area, the men's drop-in center, the Reno Sparks Gospel Mission, St. Vincent's Dining Facility, they were all relocated over there. And then in 2008, the city built the Community Assistance Center, and that ha held a women's shelter, a family shelter, a triage center, uh, and a community resource center. Um, this is a mixture of shelter space, of um, almost like office space, and uh, almost hospital facility space. And in, when that building was built, $20 million went into the, to the d development of that complex. Three million of it came from community development block grant funds, which is important. Uh, and I'll get to that in a minute. And in 2021, 
Washoe County took over providing primarily services for our unsheltered population throughout the area, and they moved to the, the new CARES campus further down 4th Street, which remained the which left the uh, community citizen center um, underutilized and vacant. And in 2023, the last remaining tenants left the building. That was Well Care Volunteers of America. The current condition of the property is not good. It's had substantial degradation. Much of this degradation occurred, occurred before even the last of the tenants moved out. The building received very heavy use uh, over, its, over its lifetime. And um, it currently, it's been broken into 13 times. Uh, not over a very long period of time, but very quickly from the time that the tenants moved out, uh, we secured the property, but it just daily turned into, turned into a hazard. We looked at providing security services at the cost of $300,000 a year, um, and it just became quite a, a challenge. And so since then, the property has been fully boarded up with plywood um, to prevent any further, further tampering. But there has been leaks in the property. After a review, there was a, it was identified that there's mold in, in the area. Uh, there is, roof tiles have fell in. A lot of copper throughout the building has been stolen. A lot of the electrical wiring has been stolen. And both elevators have been absolutely decommissioned. So if this property were to be able to brought back online, uh, two new elevators would have to be totally reconstructed in the building. The five years previously to the tenants moving out, the city spent $2 million on the five-year timeline on annual maintenance on the building. And based on a review, the cost to bring the building back up to a usable state would be $2.7 million. Uh, if it were to come back online, we would have the additional maintenance costs as well as the funding required to operate that facility. When reviewing the status of, the, of the, those two properties, um, we really wanted to understand the cost to repair and improve it versus the cost of what it would, would be if it, uh, if it was just a, a just the land, as well as if the buildings were to maintain on it, to be maintained on it. Um, the reason why it proposes that the 355 um, building be demolished is that was a concrete tilt-up building. It's very, very hard to do any sort of adaptive reuse on that building, mainly because once you start poking holes in that or doing other things, um, it, it jeopardizes the structural integrity. So it doesn't look like in any sort of adaptive reuse that that building would be usable. The building on the north side is steel structure, so there is some, there is some capabilities there. However, the large, very large floor plate does not make it suitable for adaptive reuse into housing. The building is just far too wide. You would have to split the building in half, put in a sort of alleyway with windows um, facing that, and the cost to do that adaptive reuse is quite substantial. And so all these things just left us in a state where um, we, we couldn't easily identify a future use of the building. No one had come forward to propose a future use of the building. And so for a while there, um, we were just, we didn't want to put it out for RFP mainly because, or request to put it out for RFP due to interest rates, due to um, the labor challenges going on, uh, the pandemic was still in place. And so we left the building as is. Uh, and over that time, many, many developers throughout town have reached out and inquired about this property. We've provided them with the same amount of information that we provided to Bash Capital. And there's mainly two, two things, two pieces of information we have, is that our best guess on the property is that it could be worth roughly $4 million based on that appraisal, and that the city had an obligation of $3 million because we put those funds into the C, those CDBG funds into the project. If the property were to ever be sold, the, the city would have a financial liability of $3 million to have to give back to CDBG programs. Um, since then, we've found that this is necessarily true, uh, that the CDBG funds can go in pro rata the way they, they came out. Um, and I'll get to that in the next slide. And so in the, in the process of, of having this property sit there, Bash Capital said, you know, said they think they can make an offer on this property. And this is the, this is the offer they proposed, the term sheet. And they did two options, given that the fact that we had that CDBG liability. Option A was, um, they said the most they were willing to pay for this property is $1.5 million to do a workforce, attainable workforce housing project. Um, we'll get into some nuance there. But workforce housing is essentially 60 to 120% AMI, average median, median income. 
Um, and that is roughly people making about $55,000 a year all the way up to, I believe, about $120,000 a year. Um, under option B, those CDBG funds could stay in the project if the project remained eligible under that program, which means that it would ha have to provide at least 51% of rents between that under 80% AMI, which is people were uh, making about $55,400 a year. If the city sold it for a dollar, the CDBG funds would stay within the project and the city would have no financial obligation to, to refund those CDBG funds. Um, and as I said, since then we have learned that uh, the $3 million, there isn't a liability of $3 million. It's actually since 15% of the funds went in, 50% of funds can come out. And so if the, if the property appraised for $4 million, the city's CDBG liability would be about $600,000, which is what the city would have to come forward, give back to CDBG. Our hand team here, Housing and Neighborhood Development, could use those funds to do additional affordable housing projects that are CDBG eligible. And so just doing the math on option A and option B, uh, if option A, the city were to sell it for $1.5 million, pay back that 600,000 in CDBG funds, the city would net $900,000. Option B, if they sold it for a dollar, roughly zero, um, did not have to pay uh, the CDBG funds back, it would essentially net zero dollars. Option B alternate, if the city wanted to ca have its cake and eat it too, it could sell it for $600,000, that's CDBG obligation. Um, and the city could take those funds and deploy those CDBG funds elsewhere. I'll mention that if the project does maintain the CDBG funds, it's gonna take some cost to manage and monitor that project to make sure it's maintaining its eligibility under CDBG. And the reason why we think this is a good opportunity to, to bring this building back online, provide necessary housing, is that it has become a blight and a nuisance in the area, and it is the city's responsibility around that. Uh, not only that, it affects the entire area. Fourth Street and the Brewery District is a thriving area. Um, this property transitioning to housing can provide a lot of substantial benefit for that. Obviously, we know we need attainable and workforce housing throughout the area. As I said, it really could revitalize Fourth Street. A lot of property owners here today have talked about what it could mean to those businesses down there if this property were to move forward. Uh, and then more specifically, it adds the property back into the property tax rolls, which creates tax increment where we can deploy funds to further provide services throughout the city. So that's a very short presentation before I uh, welcome the developer Bash Capital up to give their um, proposal for the property, but just to reiterate, um, if we, if council would like to, we can decide today uh, to start the process of getting appraisals to enter into negotiations with Bash Capital based on your direction, uh, and then to start the process to do a reversion of acreage of the par parcels. Okay. And so with that, I will uh, welcome up Madam Bash Mayor. Capital. Can we ask Mr. McArdle a question? No, I, I want to move forward because we'll get around and then you, we can bring you back up for questions. So let's get through this, because um, we still have a massive agenda. Let's get through this, and then we can ask Mr. McArdle questions and you guys. So go ahead. All right. My name is Troy Keeney, partner at Bash Capital. I um, want to start by sharing some gratitude for... I want to share some gratitude uh, first to Hillary for having us take a second and take a deep breath earlier this morning. It has felt a little dense in here and I really don't think that's necessary because Every single person in this room, every person, every citizen who came this morning to speak, and everyone who's listening online, we're all doing our best to do the best thing for our city. So I just want to thank you for kind of calming the nerves for everybody. Um, second, I want to thank all the citizens who came this morning and all of the citizens who provided public comment online, whether they oppose us or not. The fact that they're taking time out of their day because uh, they care about the city is really neat to me. It's really nice to be amongst 
a community of people that care, like us. Um, I live downtown. I care about this place. These microphones. Uh, so we're going to get into the project now um, and start by just introducing ourselves. Uh, so as I said, my name is Troy Keeney. I've lived in Reno for 10 years uh, this summer. And when I came here, I thought I was only coming for a couple of years when I came to UNR, but this place stole my heart. And I love it here. Oh, you went to UNR, huh? Yes. And um, yeah, the last, the last several years, I've been buying and building apartment complexes in different location cities across the United States. Um, and now that I've realized that I'm not leaving here, I am bringing my business home. So this is our first project, Bash Capital's first project in Reno. Um, Brianna and I came together a year, year and a half ago. With, we realized we had the same vision of revitalizing and elevating our downtown. And um, we've been working through that the last year with helps of many people like Chris and Piper and other business owners. You know, we're identifying projects to help the city with their goal of 10,000 beds in 10 years. I want that. I live downtown. I want more people downtown. I want more neighbors. So this is why we're here. And then we'll, after they speak, we'll get into the project. I will also let you know our slideshow is quite long. So we're going to skip some slides today uh, so we can have more time at the end of our presentation for conversation. Here. Uh, my name is Greg Stupler. Um, I am an impact investor. I uh, founded a company. Uh, I spent 20 years doing the evil real estate investment banking and private equity world. And 12 years ago, I left it to set up a company that only invests in environmentally sustainable or socially impactful missions. So everything we do is intending to improve the community and help the community. We spend about 40% of our, my team's time on nonprofit, exclusively volunteer pro bono work. And 60% of our time amassing capital for cool, you know, socially impactful ventures. Um, it was a little difficult to sit through some of the commentary today because I love this person. Uh, Brianna Bolantini is one of the most authentic, caring individuals and good friends a person could have. Uh, we, I had the good fortune of meeting her in 2017 at a place like a leadership and placemaking event that took place by, with some pretty impressive other people that run the table. And um, of the 100 people that showed up at that event, uh, everybody loves Brianna. Um, and so I really just wanted to introduce that. We'll talk a little bit more later about the, why I want to invest in this and other people as well. Thank you, Greg. Hi, I'm Brianna Volantini. Um, I was excited to move to Reno maybe six hours ago. <laughs> you know, that might have changed. I'm born and raised in Reno. I've been gone for about 15 years, but no, that's a joke. I'm, I'm thrilled to be back. I am born and raised on 4th Street. Um, so I am the third generation construction on 4th Street. I've watched it go through many different life cycles and I've seen um, this, this building be built and I've seen it turn into what it's turned into and I've seen it turn into blight and that's where this started. I decided to move back here because I wanted to help solve housing for downtown. Um, my own family employs hundreds of employees on 4th Street and there's nowhere for them to live and so I really was passionate about that. I have yet to do a ground up or adaptive reuse multifamily project here in Reno. I've done them all across the country. Many, one that many of you have been to in Columbus, Ohio, Gravity, and I was Gravity lead. So I'm very excited to bring something like Gravity here to Reno. And uh, I wanted to do it in a P3 way. I think working with the city and showing a precedent of how we can do something really well designed that could revitalize the neighborhood, but also bring housing for the workforce there that's not that's not there today. So I'm thrilled. I also have kind of like a legacy drive for this. Four Street's where my grandfather came three generations ago. And so I'm called to do it here more than any other place in Reno is on this very street to carry on the family legacy. I also have never met a female developer in my entire career. And I would love to do that in my own hometown to just leave again a legacy for young female developers that it can be done. And I also gave a TED talk here in Reno um, on homelessness. I lived on Skid Row um, as undercover for my senior thesis project. I'm extremely 
passionate about the houseless. I did an entire project about it that got me a spot to do a TED Talk and also won a few different awards about it. So we're not here to displace. We're not gentrifying. Nobody's lived in this building for four years. We're here to actually bring more housing downtown and help build and revitalize the neighborhood. So just wanted to start it that way, and we're going to go into the project a little bit. Thank you. Thanks, Bree. Um, before we jump into the project, just to for everybody who is paying attention to what is happening right now with this project, uh, we want to give our history with 335315 Record Street. So last summer, um, Chris and Piper, who own the Jesse and the Morris, as you know, um, they brought this to us. They said, guys, there's, there's this opportunity, and you should look at it. I think it's perfect for what you guys are looking for. And so we started looking at it. We got in touch with Brian, and we asked some questions on the property. Um, I think an email or two went to Doug asking some questions. We're getting some information on this deal so we could start looking at it. Um, we started spending money and time on architects and putting together some plans. And our first plan was a really big building. Uh, and then we realized we couldn't build that because there's a giant power pole in the middle, right in the middle of the site. So <laughs> uh, we adjusted our plans and we started looking at the building itself. Like, well, you know, we're trying to be sustainable environmentally friendly builders, how can we reuse the product that's already there? So we've been through the building. Uh, we've had our contractors, the contractor who built this building has been through the building with us. And we've looked at it and um, we're, ooh, that was in September or October, I would say. And uh, kept doing due diligence. And in December, we decided that we were prepared to now write an offer. So in December, we submitted our offer, unsolicited. We had not talked to any of you in front of us at that point. In fact, up until two weeks ago, I don't think we had talked to anybody at the city really besides Brian. Um, so there has not been any negotiation. We kind of just threw a dart at the wall. <laughs> uh, so we would hope to get into negotiation after today's meeting, though. Uh, we, we feel very strongly that we can get this project done. Um, and then in January, we did resubmit our offer after Brian uncovered some different nuances with the CDBG funds. We submitted a new offer that would benefit the city more instead of having to be net negative dollars for, for our first offer. We provided an option that would make sure that the city was not losing money. So that brings us to today. Um, so this is our project. 335 and 315 Record Street. Uh, so our mission is to transform downtown Reno 4th Street District. Um, we have met with all of the 4th Street constituents. We have definitely started to intertwine ourselves in that, in that sub-market. And uh, the mission is to help transform 4th Street. Just like you know Midtown was years ago, it's become a really cool place. And 4th Street's on the way. And we want to be a part of that. We'll skip that one. So, yeah, this is the site, as we all know. We have about two acres of land. And some key points. Uh, so we are going to build approximately 100 units. And we're going to have 118 surface parking spots, offering over one-to-one -one parking. Um, we plan to have several amenities at the property even though it's going to be a workforce housing product. And um, we're going to have studios, one bedrooms, and two bedrooms, anywhere from 370 to 1,000 square feet. And uh, we don't have it on here, but we did say workforce housing. So we are looking to rent to people who make 20 to $25 an hour. Now, it is our understanding that there are 1,400 affordable apartment units in the pipeline right now that's in that 30, 40, 50% AMI. And then we have as many market rate as you know, thousands that have come up in the last couple of years and are still coming up. And those brand new market rate units are gonna to be top of market because construction costs are really high. This is that missing middle. This provides for the person who's making 20 to $25 an hour that they can't get into the 30 or 40 percent. Nicole, that was talking this morning, she says, yeah, we don't really have very many options for the workforce who makes $20 an hour. 
we do need more options for that. And we do need the affordable housing and we need the market rate. And there isn't very many options in the middle and that's what we see this being. Uh, this is Brianna Bolantini for the record. I also just want to piggyback that real fast just to state we put in an offer just like you're supposed to do. Um, we went through the normal routine just like it's always been done on city site. We didn't do anything different. We put through an offer. So all of this today um, was a little bit, uh, we weren't expecting all of this. We thought today we'd be talking about the project. So really we followed the steps of just submitting an offer like um, anybody that's ever done anything on a public-private partnership site before. So just want to state that. Um, I'm extremely passionate about design. I went to architecture school in New York. I've worked on several design projects across the country. I don't care if we're designing a public water fountain or if we're designing the next city city hall. I think design is extremely important and I don't want that to lack on our workforce housing. So I uh, brought in the architect that I worked on the gravity project in Columbus to he, this is his workforce housing project in Denver and right around the same budgets, almost same specs that we're doing. And he has done everything with us thus far. We obviously want to continue working with him once we get a warmer agreement um, for negotiations. But I just want to reiterate that we want to raise the level of housing here and design and amenities as well as integrating with uh, the, the fabric of the community. And so regardless of who we're housing at what price point, we think design and the aesthetic is important um, for an emerging neighborhood. some more imagery of uh, the one in Denver that our architect has done. Um, just for the sake of time, we went over a lot of our goals, um, you know, really just providing housing and uh, continuing to, you know, better the, better the neighborhood uh, without displacing. Integrating, continuing to integrate with our neighbors. And uh, like we spoke earlier, the need with everybody here as the business stakeholders is housing, workforce housing. Um, you know, my family's company included, there's nowhere for their employees to to live close to their establishment. So that's the main the main goal here. So I've been really contemplating whether to even touch on this, uh, the CAC topic, because it is a hot topic. Uh, but I think I should touch on just two points, that whether this should be a shelter or not doesn't really matter because it's actually impossible for this site to be a homeless shelter. Legally, uh, a homeless shelter has to be 600 feet from residents, uh, from residential property, and the new ballpark apartments are 400 feet away. 470. As the bird flies, it's like 300. Also, um, I am told, I have not seen this legal jargon yet, but I am told that we can, we have been told that we can only have one shelter in the city of Reno. Now we have the most expensive homeless shelter in the country a mile down the street that was just built. So I don't know legally if we're able to even open it up as a shelter again. Yeah, Reno needs housing. We all need that. We all know that. So yeah, site hurdle one. Uh, I touched on this earlier. There is a giant transmission pole uh, that feeds. It's the main power feeder to the city. It's right in the middle of our site. I will mention that the old appraisal on this site that happened a couple years ago did not take this into account because it cuts the buildable area of this site by almost half. Uh, there's also an easement. 25 feet in radius around the pole that you cannot build on. You can't have parking under it though. Um, and we, NV Energy didn't know what to do with this. So they brought in a German uh, energy company to talk to us about this. It would cost a million dollars a foot to move. So it's not moving. Uh, so no street frontage. Anybody who's in real estate knows that you want some street frontage for your property to help pull people in, um, to you know have presence on the main arterial roads. We don't have that. We're tucked in the back here. Uh, 
the, the buildings are in disrepair of, as we've gone over and over and over again today. I don't think I need to touch on that anymore. We are adjacent to train tracks. I have been there when the train's going by. It is not quiet. So whatever we build, we're going to be spending significant amount of money on sound dampening on our exterior, um, the exteriors of the building, at least on the south side. Uh, also, kind of hard to market apartments with a train nearby, at least to get high rents. Like we're going to have to, again, go to the workforce. You know, hey, you're next to a train track. Uh, our next door neighbor, the Gospel Mission. So around 4 to 6 p.m. every day, um, their patrons line up outside of their building and um, really crowds the streets and uh, can be quite unsightly and, and it makes it challenging for access into the site. Uh, we're planning on just having access um, off of Evans and blocking off the record street if the Gospel stays. Uh, but we have been in conversations with them. I, they're going to be a good neighbor at the very least. And at the most, you know, we might have some solutions for them. But they are next to us right now, and it is something to take into consideration. Uh, we do want to preface that even with all of these site hurdles, we still want to proceed forward. We see a path um, to completion here. So we're going to talk a little bit about, a little more about our team. Greg? Sure. I mean, I think the development team is clearly Brianna and Troy. Um, I have been a, a mentor to Brianna in different ways and, um, you know, decided to come in and support this project because of what it represents. Um, I'll, I'll start with, uh, I'm just going to jump to this slide right here. So my company, Surf Capital, invests in partnerships with municipalities and nonprofits. We primarily invest in areas that are um, going through some form of revitalization. The town that you see in front of you right now is Hempstead, New York. Um, it is a 98% um, Latino and Latinx and, uh, and African-American community that has about a $50,000 annual income compared to all the communities that surround it, which are in the hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. This is, a, this is a, about 12 minutes from JFK Airport in Long Island. Um, my company came in through a master developer agreement with the town and a community benefits agreement with the town. And we changed the secret zoning of this whole area to empower about 5 million square feet of new developments on a democratic basis. So we didn't own any of the sites. We did all the work for democratically the whole community in exchange for an option under appraisals to buy land from the municipality afterwards. So we are seeing about 700 apartments come out of the ground now. Um, most of the apartments are affordable housing at this point. And our next phase that we are just in negotiations on right now is to build 1,000 units of mixed market rate housing, 80-20. So, um, you know, the mayor of Hempstead and the lieutenant mayor um, love us. You know, we're like deeply kind of impacting this town to the better. Um, this is obviously a very concentrated situation. We have similar investments and similar relationships in towns around um, the, the East Coast and then in San Jose and not anymore, but a couple years ago in San Francisco. Um, when I see 4th Street, I see a lot of the same things and a lot of the opportunity. I think we're coming at it through this partnership transactionally with respect to the first project, but um, it's really about the impact we could have on the whole city, on the whole street rather, and impact that town. So that's why I'm interested. Um, when I go into projects, I always focus on investing with people who understand the local market and have the capacity to build trust with the community. With Brianna, you have that. I've had the pleasure of getting to know Troy pretty well, and he's an amazing guy. And I think that these two would be amazing stewards. So that's, uh, that's pretty much it. Oh, one more thing real quick. So I'm also an advisor and close with a group called Shift Capital. Shift's interested in this. Shift has done, Shift has done the most remarkable turnaround of some of the worst impacted communities in the United States. They started in a place in, called Kensington in North Philadelphia. Um, the New York Times called it the um, Walmart for opioids. 
So it's, it has the highest concentration of op opioid, you know, of OD deaths in the country. And Brian, you see the guy in the little green jacket right there, uh, assembled a team. They bought 7 million square feet of industrial space, totally derelict, and they've turned it all around and activated a whole part of town. Amazing, heartful, fantastic, and they're interested in this project. Great. Um, I also just want to go back to some of the hurdles here. Um, we, it, it is very difficult. Uh, a lot of developers, a lot of groups, organizations, and nonprofits have looked at this site. We might be crazy, uh, but we're committed to do housing. We know it's going to take a lot of effort. Uh, we know the city is going to need to be involved regardless of the three options on the table today. Um, but we need housing, and so we have committed to whatever this takes to make that happen. So I just, we stated all the hurdles just so everybody's aware that this isn't just your average clean slate, ground up, new build, multifamily project that we can cut a ribbon on in two years. This one's going to be, it's going to be a tough battle, but um, through our past experiences, uh, us working on public private partnerships before, working with attainable housing, bringing experts in like SURF and shift, um, I'm very confident that we can we can tackle this this interesting project. So just wanted to touch upon that. Uh, a little bit about my background. Uh, most of you got to go to Gravity. Uh, it's a 12 acre and growing multifamily uh, development in an underserved area. I was Gravity lead and we were able to bring in workforce housing along with market rate and all new retail on the ground floor and now it's a thriving community. So I am passionate about bringing that back to Reno and I think this is a great start, especially working so closely with the city on this site. Um, I've also worked on projects kind of all throughout the United States and I'm just really excited to come back here. Like I said, third generation. I did work on the post office as a consultant um, and brought in and started the basement project. So I'm familiar with the city, I'm familiar with the process and this will be my first time doing um, housing, ground up housing or adaptive reuse. And like I said, I would, wouldn't wanna choose anywhere else um, besides 4th Street just to continue the legacy of, of what our family has done there. Just some pictures of my projects. Very heavy on activation. We're not just heads to beds. We love to create lifestyle and really ingrain and include the community. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so a little bit more about me and uh, Bash Capital. Uh, so Bash Capital has been around for about five years now. I've been in commercial real estate going on nine years. Um, and like I said, I've been going to different markets across the country and buying and building multifamily properties. Uh, I want to clear there a little bit on Bash Capital LLC. The entity, for administrative reasons, moved to Wyoming in 2022. Um, so that's why you see it dissolved, Bash Capital, in the Nevada Secretary of State, but it's very much an active company. Uh, this is one of the more beautiful projects that Bash Capital has done. Uh, this is in Portland, Oregon, um, and it's the only picture of um, pro projects that I've put on here because a lot of the projects that we've done are not as pretty. We've bought in some Class C rough properties in South Carolina and Georgia and given them a lot of love and lit up the parking lots and put security cameras and made these places safe because I think everybody deserves to have a safe place to live. Um, Bash Capital's motto is instilling conscious capitalism every day and we do this in many ways. In development, we're using environmentally sustainable building methods and technologies to build the, the cleanest buildings we can. Um, and we're also looking into revitalizing or reusing current um, materials, which is why we're even looking at potentially using the existing buildings at 335 record. We don't know if that's gonna happen yet or not today, but we want to try, because it's the best thing for the environment. On the acquisition side, like I said, you know, we're coming into properties and getting out dangerous tenants, lighting up parking lots, spending the extra money to make these places safe and clean environments. Uh, so those are the values that Bash Capital sits on. There's some more. Photos. Uh, a little timeline. So we're here in April today. Our goal would be to have a soft commitment through negotiation by May and be in the purchase agreement by June this year. We plan to have plans submitted to the city by October and pulling our permits next year in March. 
So this is not something that we're going to buy and just sit on, you know, like some of the other projects that we've looked at down in downtown, if you know what I'm talking about. We want to go. We, we actually wanted to go months ago. So, um, you know, hopefully we can actually have this building open. That, <laughs> that's a little typo. It, we want to have the building open by December 2026. Um, so we're going to go as fast as we can, as fast as the city's process allows us. Okay, you're one minute over, so Perfect. not bad. Good, I, good job. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. I, interesting. I didn't know that about the the poll, and I mean, un, unbelievable. Interesting. Okay, thanks so much. Okay, we're gonna stick to the regular process. I'm gonna go two rounds, and then uh, we're gonna go to the council members' ward. Uh, I'm going to send it uh, right now to Councilwoman Breckis. Go right ahead. Three yeah. minutes. Yeah, you know, I think that was a good presentation by you folks, and I thank you for your interest in our community. You really are the types of, you know, mm -hmm. um, investors that I, I thought Mr. Jacobs was looking for once he prepped all that land and built it. And, you know, someone said earlier, why don't you talk to Mr. Jacobs? It's on 4th Street. But, uh, you know, we'll see what movement is there, but you've chosen our property and you've been inside the building. I was told in my briefing you had not. I have not. As I mentioned, I've been asking for eight or nine months to get inside and see the building. And I'd like Mr. McArdle to come up. Mr. McArdle, you read initially, and I'll tell you why this is important. On your notes, could you put that up, what you said, the determination that the property is to be disposed of. You had a list of findings that have to be made. And, and the reason why this is important is I was here in my seat when this process was adopted. As a matter of fact, I championed it. It was based upon one that I worked on 25 years ago for the city of Albuquerque in a redevelopment office that had a lot of land and had processes. I took that disposal policy to a rural community that also had a lot of property to sell and had it adopted by that council. So then I come here in 2012 when people want to buy property and we put in a process and I don't think it's being represented right. Now, could you, and, and you know, no one's fault, a lot of people have changed over, but what were the findings that have to be made to dispose of a property? It doesn't. It says, uh, sorry, Brian McArdle, revitalization manager, in the policy 204, I think it's section three procedures, B, sale of city-owned property, it says doing a real estate review, and it says, shall from time to time review the city's property inventory to determine which properties are no longer needed for public facilities or to support elements of the master plan and where disposition will provide a greater public benefit. Um, a parcel owned by the city may become available for sale if the property is not currently used by a city department, does not support a municipal function, the property is vacant and has no foreseeable use, uh, the property is non-performing and underperforming, um, uh, the city will be relieved of potential liabilities or costs to continue maintaining the property. Um, that property tax increment could be generated by putting this back on the property tax rolls, uh, and it could stimulate the economy by providing opportunities for economic development and redevelopment. Yeah, so that's all familiar to me because it's language that I work to propose. But it was never going to be a staff decision, okay? It was always going to be a council decision. The council needs to dis you know, we never had that conversation. That's why I wanted to have it up here. I'm not sure that it is. Should be disposed of. I want to dispose of this property. We've been at a standstill, and yeah. it only took this letter of interest yeah. as a request yeah. to purchase yeah. property to force us to yeah. even but, see but, if this gets but, brought forward. But your recommendation is make is you know to engage with these folks. So by presumption, you've made, the decision's been made. The council needed to have that discussion. I cannot make that decision. Uh, that it goes on the disposal list until I've been in it. And, you know, I feel I own it to someone like Bob Cashel, whose heart was in that building, and who I served with, and other staff who helped put it together to, to, to really identify, is it a goner for other purposes, particularly the purpose that it was designed for? It's not necessarily a shelter. I actually, a staff, planning staff, wrote that ordinance years ago when I came here. Uh, I think it could be a congregate facility um, and, and other classifications of institutional residential use. So 
as as great as your proposal is, as energetic you are, I'm ha I cannot get there until I've made a determination. Come on, Breckis, I let yeah. you go a minute over. Thank you. Okay, heading on over to Councilman Martinez. You up? You there somewhere? See on the. Yes. Zoom? Can you okay. all hear me? All right. Do you have any questions? <laughs> um. Not at this moment, okay. but I, I think I will during the next okay. round. Okay, I'll come back it. to you. All right, yeah. thank you. Go ahead, Councilwoman Taylor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you for the work that you've done. I always like to say Reno is open for business. We're ready to do business, and I don't think that we showed you there that today. Um, it's a little disheartening, to be honest with you. I My question is for our legal team. There was something in the presentation that the applicant or the bash capital brought up that asked about a shelter. Can you please confirm? We had a lot of public comment about this being a shelter, this being something, some requests. I would like to understand if this can even be a shelter so we can move on from that discussion. Um, we, we'd have to get back to you on that. I mean, it, I, I think the applicant did raise, I mean, some of the practical problems, um, but we'd have to just go back and check code. Um, and in terms of when you talk about shelter, are we talking, I mean, there's a couple different ways that that could be interpreted. And there are things that are potentially prohibited um, legally under Title 18 and under um, um, like some... Uh, Yeah, there, I mean, I don't want to get into the specifics, the legality, but like there was a settlement agreement um, uh, on the Skyways litigation back in the early aughts that um, might potentially bear on whether or not the city has the ability to have more than one shelter in the city. Okay, so it's a valid, it's something valid that they brought up in yeah, their yeah, presentation. Yeah, a hurdle and we can... Okay, so I'm going to go with we're not going to, we shouldn't be having a shelter there based on the information that I have from legal and and the ordinances and stuff. My other question is, um, when you, you mentioned something about the power pole and the appraisal, the appraisal that we had did not take into account the utility pole that was in the middle there. Is that accurate? And that there was, in the presentation, you said that we, that building wasn't even suitable for housing. That's why it would be dem demolished. Brian McArdle, revitalization manager. Yeah, that I believe that is true. Uh, we just issued the appraisal just to get a quick idea of the context of putting more money into the property to bring it back up versus the value that it sits on. Um, and I do not believe that they recognize this, the complexity of the power pole on that property. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Councilwoman Dewar. Okay, thank you. Um, oh, on, sorry, I oh. should have gone to Devin and then you. Sorry. Oh, fine. Go. Okay, no, go ahead. No, no, uh, go, go down. No, oh, go ahead. all right. We'll come back to Councilman Reese. Okay. Um, so thanks so much for being interested in building in Reno. Just start there. Uh, building housing in Reno. Let's start there. And then I think, and this is where I start lacking clarity. When I listen to the proposal. I'm not really sure what you want to build. I heard something about housing, but I didn't hear uh, numbers of units, uh, goals for pricing, uh, what population you might serve other than people that make 20 to $25 an hour. I heard that. Um, I heard someone talk about missing middle, but I didn't really hear clarity on the proposal. And prior to this, when we've considered proposals, we, we've always had a pretty definite idea of what was going to be built. Sometimes we've had conversations about um, would there be an allocation for people at a lower uh, price point. Uh, that, and, and almost every one that city properties have been involved in, we've made that ask. So just something to think about. Um, every one of these unsolicited proposals I've asked, uh, once I re realize that there's interest in the property, I've asked for two things, I've asked for an appraisal, and I've asked for the city to engage in RFP. Um, often we've had a conversation about what we'd like to see in the RFP. I have a couple things I might like to see. I think housing uh, would fit one of those bills. I'm also open, just so you know, for potential uh, nonprofit services. 
I always have been ever since I heard that we vacated the shelter. Um, I thought it would be a good, given you, you brought up yourselves about the co-location of other service providers in that region, and I always thought that might be a good use too. Um, I never thought that it should be more commercial because we have a lot of commercial happening naturally, so it obviously doesn't need our help. Uh, what does need our help is housing, and in fact, I mentioned earlier that one of the biggest issues I've heard from developers, especially for affordable developers, is that the price of property is their greatest obstacle to overcome. And uh, there might be a pre-existing building on it, which requires demo, and that adds to the cost as well. Um, I don't know what's in this building. I was surprised today to hear that it was only built in 2008. Uh, which is less than 20 years. So to find that we have a very recent building, but it's degraded to this point was surprising. Um, I'm impressed with the work you've done. I've been impressed with lots of developers that have come to town and, and shown what their area of expertise is. And you obviously have you know, an interest in design. I love that. Uh, many people have complained that the buildings that are getting built in Reno right now are rather prison-like, uh, lack of certain... Je ne sais quoi <laughs> about them. Um, don't really reflect the Reno uh, modality or interest. So anyway, my, my proposal, Madam Mayor, would be that um, if there is this level of interest, that we ask, get an appraisal and that we go through an RFP process. Okay, thank you so okay. much. Okay, um, Councilman Reese. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, my questions are first for Mr. McArdle, and I have a lot of them, so I'll just see if I can't get him uh, back to the dais. Okay, he's right here. Right. Great. So, Mr. McArdle, I, I want to sort of fundamentally understand why your office is running point on this site, meaning I, I think the public is owed some explanation about our redevelopment and revitalization efforts. So why are you the one running point on this project? As a redevelopment project it kind of sits under me um, a lot of the unnecessary properties owned by the city that aren't currently used uh, sits in the property asset plan that sort of is reviewed um, by the department formerly a redevelopment agency but it does kind of sit in there uh, I wouldn't oversee the the maintenance operations and stuff like that on the property but if it is a property asset inside the city that is currently being unutilized it would fall likely and if it's in downtown would likely fall under me and how many groups or people or entities have looked at this site in any capacity to see if it was an appropriate thing for redevelopment i would say roughly in, five in serious roughly five serious parties looked at this site and requested due diligence information. Uh, they all looked through it. They, many of them said, this is a really difficult site. Uh, even if the city gave it to us, even if the city paid us for it, we don't want to touch it. Um, which is sort of why we didn't, didn't facilitate or ask to go off on RFP because we didn't think that there was a lot of interest out there, period. And mm -hmm. so why go out to RFP if everyone throughout the community has told us that this is an impossible project? Uh, and we, you know, even if it was was free from the city, we would not be interested. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and I was with you when we were in Columbus uh, several years ago now and looked at the Gravity Project. And, and ultimately, um, I don't know Ms. Bolantini um, as well as some do, but I was impressed by the work that was going on there. It was very encouraging to see the type of redevelopment that can happen in the city, especially in an area of town where there is a need for redevelopment. Um, but of course, it, it comes with uh, a lot of issues. I, I tend to agree with Ms. Breckis uh, that this is not the process that I would have preferred, uh, meaning I think that there, I know that you followed process and, and you brought it to us in the way that it would normally come to us. Um, but it feels like uh, many of the community members who might otherwise have interest in it have not necessarily been aware of the, the machinations of how it comes. And that's probably the problem with government sometimes is that we have processes, but we need to make sure that those processes don't uh, keep uh, people from being aware of what's going on. I have a, 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 some more questions, but I'll wait for my second time around. All right, thank you so much. Okay, Councilwoman Ebert, go ahead. Okay, so um, first I, I just wanna say too that um, 
the frustration that you guys have dealt with today, I'm sure that was really a surprise and I apologize for that. And it's been a long day for everyone. I know I've had too much caffeine, so if I'm a little, you know, I'm sorry. Um, but, um, you know, Reno's got a lot of stuff going on and we have a lot of conflicting interests. And we've had a lot of different discussions today about needs. And, you know, I don't know if you were here for the downtown ambassador um, discussion and we had was it Danielle came up and, and shared her experience about being in a, a shelter with her four children and only having 90 days to find a place to live and how stressful that was for her because she had to leave um, and I think that highlights the fact that the city of Reno has a gap there we have the cares campus but we don't really have a place for women in, to go with their families so um, I think that's why there's such an outpouring of um, community input when this facility came up because we're really aware of that gap in services. And a lot of people have been expecting the city of Reno to rehabilitate that facility. And there's been um, you know, a request from a city council member to discuss it and it hasn't come forth. So unfortunately, you guys got the brunt of it today. But um, you guys didn't do anything wrong. You followed the process. I don't you know, you're not the bad guy, I get it. Um, but I just want to say, you know, we have a lot of conflicting interests and to Mayor Sheevy's point, like the buck does stop with us. Like we have to make the decision. We're the ones that are going to get the angry phone calls if, if we make a decision that people don't like. So, um, you know, we do have to kind of wade through all this stuff. Um, so anyways, all that being said, um, you know, with this project, is there any guarantee if we move forward that this project has to move forward the way they present it? Thank you for question, Brian McArdle, again. Um, that is sort of up to you to dictate how you would like to proceed from today. If you would like to proceed with the negotiations and put things in there that says that you would like to see this permits filed by X day, completed by X day. If you would like to see um, that commitment of at least 51% of the projects be, you know, restricted, income restricted. That is sort of the direction we're seeing if you would like to proceed with this with this negotiation. What sort of things you would like to see to bring back that would make you happy enough to proceed with this project? Um, so that is sort of our question to you is you, you it's up to you to sort of identify those those points you would like to see okay um, I also have questions about the the legal issue with the the location um, I know that there's a question about you know can the city have more than one facility but it hey madam clerk Thank is you. the cares campus I mean it's in the city of Reno but is it considered city of Reno because the county runs the facility yeah it's in the city and yeah so it's it's essentially the city okay at this point, yes. okay so i had a question on that and um you know i just i'm i'm just kind of disappointed that we couldn't have those discussions about rehabilitating the cares camp or the record street facility um and maintaining um the city's properties prior to you guys coming for us um i think that there's a kind of a gap in our city's process here um it shouldn't have happened in this order. Um, and I do want to see things happening downtown. Last time I asked, we have a 70% vacancy downtown. I think that it's important to activate. Um, but obviously we have a lot of community interest in what happens in this facility and, and we have to really weigh all of that. So. Okay. All right, um, I'm gonna ask you a few questions. Um, Oftentimes we see projects before us that never come to fruition. I can probably count <laughs> uh, way too many. Um, so you know that that's a real thing. So that's another thing that everyone needs to understand. It takes a lot of work to get a project off the ground. That being said, what are the, some of the things that we need to identify? I would say, obviously, an appraisal. What I thought was interesting, too. Now, there's a bigger discussion to be had. This, we're just starting yes. now. Um, we actually don't. Know I the never real even saw the, the property. I never saw the proposal until today. Um, you know, so I think there's a lot more that we got to get down the road. I guess I'm just trying to clarify um, what that is. So an appraisal. The other thing I, I going back to what um, with the power pole. You know, we're looking at putting lines underground and things like that. And then those are some of the things where you go to NV Energy and you say, Hey, <laughs> hello. <laughs> Look at these things, right? Um, things like that to say it's, it's very real and exists. Um, 
just so, so I guess I'm identifying challenges that we need to know, um, you know, because I think there's a lot of due diligence uh, to be had. Again, I don't think people realize how long it takes to get a project off the ground, how difficult it is financially. I mean, everything that goes into a project is tough. So it's not like this is just one and done. This is going to have to come through a process of uh, identifying what those needs are. So. Uh, Mr. McArdle, tell me what those would be. Typically, uh, thank you for the questions. Typically, you would, any city-owned property, maybe request that the property either get permits filed by a certain day, break ground by a certain day, get their certificate of occupancy by a certain day. Okay. Um, you know, under that 1.5 million project with essentially no development agreement, it's essentially, if you don't want to have a lot of restrictions, the price would be 1.5 million, but you could request that if they are suggesting a workforce housing project, that they sort of make a commitment to to achieve those types of rents. Yeah. Um, if you would like the project to be at least 51% uh, low income, 80% below, um, there's some wiggle room that you would like to see with the price and mm -hmm. some other requests. So when would we there. negotiate that? When's the best time to like jump into this project if we were to after, do it? After like, today. I guess. If we decide okay. to proceed. Yeah, so um, don't put the cart before the horse. There's a lot of due horse. diligence to But I done. guess my point is there's a lot of stuff to unpack, a lot of stuff to get through. So don't put the cart before the horse is what you're saying. Let's Just like any other development project, there's a ton of due diligence that has to occur, both on their side and sure. ours. Uh, and that's the part where we haven't really yeah. started to get into those because we haven't been negotiating. We haven't de delved into those things. Um, they have not spent a lot of money on doing pro formas and getting the financing and architectural renderings. Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done on their part. In that process, we could take the, the wants and needs of, of council, um, work with them, and try to bring back a project that works for them, works for the city, works for everybody. Mm -hmm. That would be the intent going forward from Okay. Today. And then the one thing I do want to point out, we do have um, our place for women and children um, just so that people know for the record that there is a place um, that's dedicated just to uh, families, the family services site, correct? I for the record. So. Okay. Um, Councilwoman Breckus, I'm going to call on you because yeah. I'm just going around. So yeah. do you want me to skip you and then come back? Um, sure. Okay, I'll come right back to you. Um, Councilman Martinez. Yeah, thank you so much, Madam Mayor. Um, I, I don't have any questions, but I did want to make a couple comments. Okay. Um, I think when I am speaking to constituents um, in the world of housing and the cost of housing is definitely one of the things that um, I hear. And so when I, when I learned about the proposal from BASH, I think uh, I was um, uh, intrigued about the the thought of bringing more attainable housing into the region um, and making sure that we alleviate some of those uh, concerns of the number of, of units that are available um, and specifically bringing that into uh, the downtown region, which is something that we hear uh, a lot from uh, for folks downtown uh, and what they want to see um, there. Um, I, I, I think I'll leave my comments um, at that for now. Okay, thank you so much. Going to send it back to you, Councilman Breckis. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I'll just, you know, I heard during Mr. Reese's question about a five five groups have been showing. It, it just seems like this has been a property on the market and being shown to anyone who suggests interest, not a council member who's elected to, you know, be a steward of the public resources, which is, is very troubling, frankly. But I'll reiterate, reiterate, reiterate to the council, you know, I remember the great effort, the heavy lift it took out of the settlement, Bob Cashel is a new mayor, to get this built. It was really a big, big deal. It was a very special purpose design building. Unfortunately, you know, the problem outgrew. But I still think the building has a purpose as our asset to be a facility um, of some sorts. And I think we should have that discussion. Um, you know, it's, I, I really, really do. Um, it would be very sad to see it demoed. And another thing, you know, because the council seems like, you know, can, you know, looking into this bash up, uh, um, proposal, 
staff's been, been negotiating with them since July on it and um, not allowed me to have a forum to talk about, you know, the, the disposal of the property. So if the if the council is thinking about it, you know, think hard about this on the housing market. When we did the master plan, when we did the downtown study, we did housing analysis, okay, on need and demand. And, you know, these people seem great. Um, I have questions, you know, because I've worked in subsidized housing before on the monitoring and, you know, the burden of them as landlords to do income checks and so on. Um, I think it's landscape. I didn't see that they've been in before. But, um, you know, it just may not be the need with all the other things coming off, particularly that Ms. Jardin highlighted of coming on. You know, it may not be the need. We know the social services needs are really out there and are big. And to have a building that is designed for that sort of communal living setting, um, whether it's a, you know, a, an outreach center or a congregate care facility, um, I think the social services providers need an opportunity to come forward and get a proposal to us. Um, and so that's what I think. But if you are gonna go down the housing route, you know, we sold the property, if you recall, with the parking lot with the air quality monitoring um, station on it. That thing took a long time to get going. It's not even occupied yet. I, I just, I think that, I don't think the mark, the feasibility of getting this delivered is, is really realistic. And so, you know, I would, if you're interested, I would have another housing needs analysis done because we are in a market where projects are stalling out left and right. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Go ahead, Councilman Taylor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, just again, I don't know how many times we can say it. Staff has not been negotiating. This is not a negotiation. They have not been negotiating. There's no deal on the table. I don't know why it's hard for some people to understand that. The other thing is we did receive lots of public comment in favor of this project. Um, maybe uh, somebody can let me know, but I read through all of the public comment. There was at least 30 to 40 people, comments that I received that were in favor. A lot of them were developers. Probably, I don't know if you've talked with them or not, but people that have said that this is a very hard site and they are supportive that we would be looking for in an RFP. The other thing is Catholic Charities supports this. When we talk about social, uh, social services coming through and looking at this building or putting out an RFP, one of the public comment that we received in favor was Catholic Charities. So I guess my question is, what was the public comment? I know we heard a lot here today. Unfortunately, people can't sit here for eight hours to bring public comment all the time. Does, does Brian or Mr. McCurdle, do you know what the public comment was as far as in support of yeah. moving forward with this? Councilmember Taylor, if I can, there were 25 letters of support, 10 letters of opposition, and four letters of concern for a total of 39 comments. Okay, thank you. That's my question. All right. Um, you know, that's kind of interesting because now when I think back about it, I've had companies like BlackRock ask me about it. I have had like some major, major investors. I'm actually surprised it took this long to get there. So then whenever you say that, then I start to think very, very true. I don't know. I just thought that that was interesting. Um, okay, go ahead, Councilwoman Dewar. Yeah, I, I really don't have anything additional to add at this time. Okay, uh, Councilwoman Ebert. I was going to ask if there's any other conflict with putting housing in uh, due to the proximity to the other services that are happening there. That might be a planning question. I don't know that, um, but I don't believe so. Okay. We'd have to look into that. Okay. Um, all right, yeah. Um, and another question for the applicant. Do you do you live in Wyoming, or why is the business in Wyoming now? Uh, Troy Keeney on the record. Council Ebert, uh, it is just, um, it's just for legal reasons. I live here. Uh, Bash Capital operates in Georgia, Portland, Oregon, South Carolina, 
in Reno, Nevada. It doesn't really, you know, a lot of entities are Delaware entities. It's just a tax thing. Okay. So. Okay. So there's no actual physical location in Wyoming. It's I've, just. I've never a... been to Wyoming. Okay. Actually, that's true. I've been there once. I've been there once. Okay. But, All yeah. right. Thank you. Councilman, Councilwoman Evert, do you have any more questions? No, none at this time. Thank okay, you. thank you so much. Okay, we are done uh, with our rounds, except for maybe <laughs> Councilman uh, Reese. I don't think I called on you. Please take the floor, and then uh, and then we're done with our rounds. So go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I don't think I totally understood the slide presentation from Mr. McArdle about the layered funding and how it would be backed out if we sell it for another use. Um, and so, Mr. McArdle, are you able to provide some clarity? Uh, first of all, I think we've, we have to have a, a more recent appraisal. It can't just be some uh, speculation about whether it's four million or three. And then you said that there was a formula for the CDBG recovery. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out if we did sell it and we don't have strings attached to it, what do we get out of it that can be then used to support, you know, some of the important issues that we have going on in the community? Brian McArdle here. Um, so the CDBG funds are somewhat restricted uh, how they're deployed. And $3 million in CDBG funds went into this project. And so if this project sells for a non-eligible use, the city owes, the, the city has to give back those three, the CDBG funds, and find another eligible use. Uh, we thought it was $3 million, but we now realize that um, if, if the CDBG funds were 15% of the money going in, then whatever it sells for, the, C, the city's liability is 15% of the fair market value. And so if it's $4 million, the city's liability would be 600000 If it's $3 million, we can do the math. Um, and so that is the obligation. The city would get those funds, give them to our housing and neighborhood development team um, to find another eligible use uh, or to do more income support, uh, rental support, things like that. But it would be the city's liability to pay that money back if that project on the site isn't CDBG eligible. Does that answer your question? Look, it's a little I, confusing. I think so. I and, and to my colleagues, here's why I am struggling this evening. Uh, I think that BASH is a, a good uh, group of folks that has some energy and, quite frankly, is the type of developer that we want to attract to the city. Does that mean this is the piece of dirt where I think that they should uh, jump in. I, I'm not sure I'm there tonight. Uh, Fourth Street is an incredibly important Im piece of Reno's, both its history, but also its future. Uh, we've had some great public comments today from uh, folks who have spent a lot of money and effort to revitalize stretches of Fourth Street, and we continue to see groups moving in. But of course, this site has challenges, not only because of where it's located, but the uh, power line, the other services that are adjacent to that. And I think that we are struggling as a city to get into that 30 and 40% AMI. So I don't think I can figure out all of those things tonight. Uh, what I am interested in, and perhaps Madam Mayor, if I may just take a few more seconds, is to know whether or not we could work on getting an appraisal and a reversion to acreage without regard to this particular proposal, meaning whatever we do, we've got to do those two things. And I know appraisals go stale, uh, but I would much rather have us have some of the legal questions that Mr. Shipman has to work on, this question about the appraisal happen, and maybe some more clarity on the allocation of the CDBG funds I just cannot make a decision tonight. Um, too many variables and too many questions for me to be able to, you know, say that this is the time to dispose of the property. Um, and again, I, I think there are issues on both sides. I just think there's uh, too much that has not yet been resolved uh, for me. I do, um, you know, one thing that I um, was a little curious about any money that is made off of that, um, or how how does this work, Brian? Maybe you know, because aren't there railroad bonds? 
I don't believe this site is encumbered by any bonds or um, liens. Or, or read of or um, retract. Was bonds. it maybe? No, um, we were able to sell the forestry properties because those revenue bonds mm -hmm. were were done away with. Um, I do not believe this site is encumbered by any of those. No bonds. Okay, what was the other thing? CDBG? Some yeah, we money? can't do the CDBG math because we don't know the actual fair market value uh, mm -hmm. of the property. And Council Member Reese was correct. Those appraisals only last six months before they are, they go poof and you, you know, you don't know the real value of the property. So if it lasts more than six months and we want to sell the property per mm -hmm. NRS stat statute, we would have to go out and get another appraisal. Mm -hmm. And those take some time at a cost. Okay. All right. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. Okay, go ahead, and then we're going to move on. Does our disposal property talk about offering properties to other entities? Um, it does, uh, depending on the type of use. Uh, yeah. There's there's a few ways. Uh, you can go out RFP. You can go to a public auction. If you go to a public auction, yes, you do have to notify uh, other ag agencies if they would like yeah. it first. Yeah, I think that was something that we contemplated in that proposal. I think it's synced up with state law is offering it for other, you know, service purposes. And that was always the discussion that I wanted to have. It's a special purpose institutional building. Today, hearing about all these encumbrances, I feel it's even more suited for acquisition rehab, probably eligible also for some funding sources that we have through the, um, you know, qualified, the QAP possibly for a... Um, ACK rehab property for transitional housing or something like that. So it has a lot of potential that I think really needs to be discussed about using it for a public purpose. It was designed for that. It could be eligible for funding for that. It's, it's a tough property. I mean, there's so much property downtown for these folks to pursue. And you know, if the motion doesn't go forward, I'm not ready to go get appraisals because I'm not entirely sure to jump over the fact that we're going to sell it rather than offer it. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to offer it. And we have no shortage of social services down there. So we'll see where it goes on the vote. <clears throat> but I want to let the council know if it doesn't go forward, I'd like to have that discussion broadly. And I'd like to get into the building, please. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much. Okay. I'm going to send it over to, um, okay, one minute. We got to move No, I'm, I'm just here to ask you whether okay, you would okay. like me to make a motion sure. or do you not want a motion um, here today? Would you like to make a motion, Councilwoman Taylor? Yeah, I think it's I've, your word. It's Miguel's word. I'm happy to start with the motion. I've, I've written out some points for a motion. I'm going to send it to you. Go ahead. Um, well, it was really, um, I wanted to know what your interest was, but um, I, first a comment, it is, I've spent a lot of time buying and selling uh, publicly owned land, publicly owned land. And Council Member um, Breckus is correct that generally there's an offer to local governments, state governments to see, or a nonprofit to see prior to sale. That often happens. Unless we have our other policy where we're selling to a neighbor next door, which we adopted a long time ago. If you're interested, I could make a motion and we can see where it goes. I would recommend that the staff um, do an appraisal, uh, given all of the um, appurtenances and issues with the property. Um, move forward, draft an RFP. Visit with the council uh, members in individual briefings to make sure that they understand what the RFP would have and uh, any issues such as what Council Member Breckis brought up or Council Member Ebert earlier about what their interest would be. Um, and then if, uh, if that's okay, bring it back. I mean, two options here, bring it back to council to approve the RFP, just given the heightened interest in this, or you could uh, recommend that they go forward with the RFP. And then finally, um, I would like to see a change process for the unsolicited proposals that might include notifying council immediately when one's re within seven days, when one's, um, received, and then also, um, making sure we follow our usual public process. Okay. So really the bottom line is if, if there's interest in the council, we could request an appraisal, have staff draft an RFP, 
um, and uh, move forward. Yeah, and I want to move, uh, and uh, the only thing I would just say is the timeline, because it's been so long, um, and I think, you know, the purpose is very, very valid, whether it's housing or wraparound services or other services, right? Um, but I do think that we should move forward instead of, you know, kind of... Just sit? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's why I'm just saying now, I am cognizant of the fact, I, I haven't gotten a second, and I'm cognizant of the fact that appraisals have a shelf life. They're only good for six months. So I don't want to go into an appraisal process and then be uncertain about what direction we're going while the appraisal is aging, and then maybe towards the end of the appraisal, get into the RFP process. I want to make sure it's timely. Yeah. Also, and also, I'm curious, does that help you guys in a sense as well? I would think, um, because honestly, and uh, like Councilwoman Brecka said, I think I th I thought your presentation was fantastic. Obviously, we're in a housing crisis. I think there's a lot of times where we, uh, not a lot of times, we really want to see more housing, obviously, um, in our city. And uh, like I said, I was I just started thinking about all the people that have inquired about housing, and no one has come forward. Is Ms. Brianna Volantini, for the record, that's what I wanted to reiterate. Um, nobody has put forth an offer, whether they're a service or a nonprofit or an organization, in four years. We yeah. are the only one. Um, a lot of people have looked at it, including Blackstone Institutional, yeah. including a lot of local other developers who submitted a, a comment today. Nobody, no nonprofit, no organization, no housing authority, nobody has put in an offer except us in four years. Yeah. So, yes, an appraisal, um, and we understand there's a time frame that we need to execute in. But going out for an RFP will only delay this process. And then also, um, due to a public comment earlier, you heard that this could turn into a parking lot. This can turn into a multiple different things if we go up for an RFP. And could you put in the stipulation, because I also love the fact that you're local, born and raised here. I mean, like, we should look at those kinds of things. Yeah. Well, you mean with a pre preference for a local yeah, uh, institution or a yeah. developer? Uh -huh. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. I'm fine with that. That would be a preference, but not a restriction. Usually those preferences carry extra points, mm -hmm. but they're not uh, restrictive to other people that want to come in. They just don't get extra points. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I and also, it may be, given to your point, that you are the only one who answers the RFP, um, to your point. But what's important about it to me is that the world's been put on notice, and it's a fair process. And that's what we're here in government to do, is to ensure, again, that we don't have inside dealing, that we don't have our favorite people um, come before us and get you know, some property at a discounted value. Those are the things we have to guard against. And that's why a formal RFP process is important. And uh, Troy Kinney on the record, um, I understand completely that this needs to be a fair process. Um, but to answer your question, Mayor Sheevy, um, if, if an RFP would help us or not. I don't think it really helps us. Our request was to do an exclusive negotiation. Uh, we understand that's probably not going to happen today, it sounds like. Um, but we've already spent considerable resource and time on this. So we ask that you at least take into consideration when choosing your uh, horse with the RFP about what we've already brought to the table mm -hmm. that even instigated this yeah. This is how they all happen. Somebody comes to us. Every one of these things we've done, someone comes. They've done an investment. They've spent time. That's a you know a cost to do in business, which we all know. I'm in business myself, and I do it all the time. It's on a speculation. I hope it'll work out. I expect it'll be a great thing. But I also know I'm, I'm working at risk. But I, I totally admire and respect what you've done. But that aside, every person that responds to RFP will have to do the same in a much quicker time frame. Mm -hmm. I guess also, you know, we do run the risk. I want everyone to know that. We run the risk that it could sit vacant for a long time and also, you know, what that what that looks like, mm -hmm. right? I so. guess no one can answer the RFP. That's an option too. I will also point out that there are uh, cases in the city of Reno where you have just taken unsolicited offers without going to RFP. Um, so mm -hmm. it has happened before. Mm -hmm. And that is true. Like, You're exactly right. You don't have to go so, to RFP. Um, but Okay. I well. don't think you have the support, unfortunately, um, but I think I think you're right, and that's kind of where I'm leading in the sense of, I think, um, you know, I don't like the way that this was done. I think it was 
unfair to you. Um, obviously, it caused a lot of stress. Uh, I think your presentation was fantastic. It was, I honestly, I really, really hope that uh, more developers look at projects like that. There's a massive sustainability piece, conscious capitalism, everything you, I mean, I've never seen a project like that in Reno ever. Um, and so I, I just would really encourage you. I, I kind of also think, though, it would be good for you guys to also know what the appraised value is completely. I think that also would really help because we could today vote on a different process and you wouldn't even know what that is. And then we're going to push that out and that out. If you're really serious about it, you'll come back. Um, and then you'll also have this more information because... Um, you know, like you were saying, there wasn't a deal, and you were saying the same thing. No one was dealing, right? No one was making deals. So now you have, you'll have more information. So, well, Madam Mayor, I guess I'll, I'll just say I, I would have st probably stood alone on this. I was super excited. Um, I know we don't have a second, but I, w I was super excited about this project when I read about it. Um, I, you have my full support. I would have made the motion as is to move forward. I think there's affordable, housing is the number one thing I hear from our constituents besides code enforcement. Adding more housing, all types of housing, housing increases affordable housing. Mm -hmm. The calls for service at this That's location true. are a huge liability and a huge risk to the city of Reno. We didn't talk about the costs associated with that. I also, from the information that I received in my email. I don't think this is um, a location for a shelter. And most importantly, you know, I talked with the businesses on 4th Street. I've had conversations with all of them, and this was important to them. Mm -hmm. This is important for people that are investing in 4th Street in our city, and it's in a redevelopment district. So, like I said, I would stand alone on this, but... Um, I guess you weren't asking for my comments I don't know. At this time. I don't know about that, because honestly, I, I really, I think she's right in a lot of ways. We want to see workforce housing, especially downtown, and it stayed uh, vacant for a long time. But also, you know, we get criticized for anything that we do. It's just, it kind of comes with the territory. We never seem to get it right, no matter what it is. Um, but I, I would agree with that. I don't like the way that this process went, uh, but I am supportive. But I don't think that we have that support today with the council. And I was very upfront and honest with you guys yesterday. Um, but I, I'm glad we're moving forward anyway, because I think it's important we needed to do that, because otherwise it could take a very long time to even bring a project forward. So, Councilwoman Dewar. I haven't gotten a second, so I don't know. I will second. Okay. Um, I will second. I will support. I mean, I, I would have gone differently. I would have said, um, I can live with it. But I would have said, y'all can sit down. I don't, I don't have any questions. <laughs> um, I would have said, you know, let's let's get a space analysis, a facility analysis. What we saw on the property, I think, was a building inspection, like a building inspector. I would have gotten a true architect to come through and look at the property and have the starting point for any disposal, not just be an RFP, everyone out here in the world, but one that looks at using that property, that building for its design purpose. That's where I really wanted want to be because it's going to be hard for a social service agency like the county or, you know, someone who really can make it go for a dollar. And, you know, I hear, I hear housing too as a as a need, but you know what? I hear a lot of social services needs and a building designed for social services is a hard building to build and there aren't a lot of them around. So I would have started differently, but I can live with where you're at. Thank okay. you. Well, and I wouldn't be opposed to as part of the appraisal, having some assessment of the square footage and the layout of the building, I mean, included in any RFP. I mean, that's yeah. information yeah. that helps people respond. Yeah, I mean, maybe when it comes back to stat, to us with the RFP, um, we commission a, a use and a facility use analysis. All right, thank above you. Above and beyond a just a building. Okay, inspection. I have a motion and a second. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, go ahead. Sorry, uh, Ashley Turney, Assistant City Manager. For the record, can we get clarification on the reversion of acreage? 
that wasn't included in your Well, motion. I did not include that because I wasn't ready to go there. That's a process we can do later. That's fine. We just wanted clarification okay. for the record. Not mm -hmm. to be included. That's a, that's a work effort that we have to go through okay. in order to do a sale, potentially. Maybe they only want a part of the, pro you know, the land. They don't need it all. Maybe that would interfere with somebody making a motion. Maybe even these folks only want this part of the property and not this other remainder parcel. Mm -hmm. So, Just a clarification for the motion. Thank you. Um, the other thing is clarify for me how quickly we can go through this so that we can get a use for something that's sitting there doing nothing. That's become a nuisance. What, what, what does that look like? If Brian McArdle, for the record, if we follow the same process at Zero Riverside Drive, uh, we would put out the RFP and have a, a short window of time, maybe 30, 60 days, for respondents to come. Um, what we did that time is we went out immediately and got an appraisal. And when we released the RFP, we released the appraisal value as well so that the responders to the RFP knew what the appraisal value was. And potentially a description of what exists would help some respondents respond. Yeah, correct. And um, it sets that timeline to bring back to council within that six month window right. before we have to go out again. Right. And so the- I think that expediting the process would be helpful. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think that that's important because I, I think we've waited for a long time and we probably could have avoided a lot of this. It wasn't your fault, like to be honest with you, I gotta say that I have a lot of heartburn here because I think there was process followed and we've done it before on other properties and st staff is going to go back and I know how this is. Oh, see the council, they bang their head with us. The council is so hard to deal with. Um, you know, I, I think all our critics out there uh, at the same time, then we hear the same thing from, you know, people that work in the building. Oh my God, that council, they're so difficult. They're so hard. You know, so like I always, like, this is where I say we can't win here, right? So um, just, Brian, do whatever you can to help us uh, move move us forward, because I think moving forward is, is really important. So, and timely. Well, with the exception, we've been incredibly consistent on asking you, since you've been here, and even before you got here, to go through this RFP process, to just be fair to all people that are interested. And just for clarification, RFP process at the end does have a proposal and a price attached right. to it. Exactly. Is that what you're thinking? Yes. Correct? Okay. A price can be zero. Sure. I am the county and I am offering zero and I'm asking the city to preload some CDBG and some uh, QAP um, priority applications. And then don't forget the third part of this was, which was just to clarify what our um, unsolicited proposal process, any improvements we might want to make in that to avoid this kind of um, unwieldy conversation, make clarity. Okay. okay. Madam Mayor. Yes, go ahead. I, I, I'm so very sorry, but I do not know what the motion is at this point. <laughs> okay, it's to Go direct ahead. staff to, I'm sorry, do you want me to repeat it? Go ahead. Yes, I have okay. no idea what the motion is It's now. to direct staff to conduct an appraisal of the property, to draft an RFP, and to propose uh, an unsolicited um, proposal policy to come back to council. The one question I'm not sure of is, does the RFP come to us before it's issued? So we can all, that's what I would prefer, just to clarify, just so everyone has clarity about what the RFP says. We've spent too much time on this to add any, any um, confusion. So that would be my inclination mm -hmm. with this. So an appraisal, draft RFP, RFP comes back to council, we issue it, we receive responses, we... Uh, evaluate those and make a decision. All right, um, do you want to bring- RFP, I'm sorry. Do we just say that we wanted to streamline the process or are we gonna bring the RFP back? I, I, I'm i confused. Can you- Clarify ACM RFP, attorney. Can you get the RFP out without us? 
Ashley Turney, Assistant City Manager. Yes, staff can move forward with issuing an RFP without approval of council if that's the direction of the body. That would be my preference. Additional clarity that I need from your motion, Madam Vice Mayor, is are you wanting the appraisal to happen first to then come back before the RFP is no, drafted? No, we don't have to. Um, well, isn't that generally what we do? We would, they would happen in tandem would be what we would recommend yeah. because the appraisal is going to take I'm not saying one has to happen to before the other. They okay. can happen in tandem. That's what I needed clarification on. So it would be up to this body if you want us to bring back the RFP before it is issued. That will slow down the process by anywhere from two to six weeks, depending on when that comes back. So you could be looking at 120 days or more before the But that's the not what I'm hearing. You just said two to six weeks. I mean, in addition, once we get all of that information back based off of internal staff report deadlines, mm -hmm. so depending on your timeline of what you're expecting. Well, I got to say, before this goes out, I would like to ha have the appraisal and I would like to know what we're putting out on the street, frankly. And I would like to know what that RFP looks like. If people don't agree with me, that's fine. But just given the amount of interest and attention and the amount of time we have spent on this today, yeah. I think it's important to have a check-in. Yeah, that's me. I, and I, that's what I understood when I seconded it, too. All right, well, I feel like we've really overcomplicated this, so it's very hard to support in that capacity. Okay, so I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? I'd like to opposed? just make... You, huh? I was going to make a comment. Okay. Just, you, you know, I ahead. think a lot of this could have been avoided if we could have had a meeting about this. I'm just going to say it again. Way back in, was it July or when the initial request was made? September. Uh, September. A lot of this discussion could have been had a long time ago, and we wouldn't have had to have like an hours long conversation today. I feel like this was really put on the developer unnecessarily because we didn't, as a council, yeah. um, do, our do something when another a fellow council member asked to review this. So I just want to apologize to you guys for that. Um, but yeah, I will support the motion. Okay. Um, all right, so you're supporting the motion. I am not because I think that we have failed you and you followed the process exactly like we said. We've done it before in the past. Um, and so I think consistency matters. Uh, I think, you know, uh, you're, it was fantastic. So I really hope you guys come back in with an RFP. I hope everyone else does too, um, so that, that they know it was fair. Uh, it was a very fair, fair process. But I think. Um, we failed you guys and we tend to typically err on the side whenever it works for us uh, and then err on the other side when it doesn't work for us. It's like we always want it both ways up here and um, I think, you know, we did a really poor job today. So I'm not going to support the motion. All right. Uh, motion passes, I believe. Madam Mayor, can I call for a roll call vote, yes, please? Yes, please. Go ahead. Breckis? I'm an aye. Doer? Aye. Martinez? No. Ebert? Aye. Taylor? Was a no, but she's out of the room at this time. Reese? I'm a no. Sheevy? No. Motion fails. Okay. No, motion passes. Passes. We have oh. three nays. I heard. Just for the, um, for well, the record. But, oh, sorry, okay. yes, because Taylor's out right now. Yeah, yeah. For, if, if we could have. Or, yes. She's coming back. Is there a way I can um, modify this motion that we could get to passing? I mean, I mean, what's an alternate motion? Well, Councilmember Taylor, what was your vote? Nay. All right, so then motion fails. I'm going back to Councilwoman Taylor. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm going to go back to the original motion that's in the staff packet. I move to direct staff to obtain appraisals of the properties and to into, enter into an exclusive negotiating agreement with Bash Capital and conduct a reversion of acreage together with matters which pertain to or are necessarily connected therewith. All right, I have a motion. Um, I will second for discussion. Councilwoman Dewar. What? Do you want me to vote? or No, I want you to. <laughs> <laughs> I, you always weigh in, so. Oh. Um, and, can, and then go ahead, Councilwoman okay. Breck. I'm going to go with you and then Breckus. I'm just oh. going to the people that I know have. 
I, I mean, Thoughts. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not going to support the motion, and it's okay. nothing to say about our um, persons in front of us. I have been very consistent for years about a public process, and I'm completely fine if they are the only um, respondent to the RFP, but that's just where I am. I, I mean, it's okay. good government. So. All right. Okay. Anyone else? Madam Mayor. Okay. Yes. Go ahead. Thank you so much, and and I perhaps this will come back to Miss Dewar in a moment, but I was unwilling to support the prior motion because I thought it went too far mm. and required too much and was overly complicated. What I am inclined to support is an appraisal and an RFP process, without all the other things that have been loaded onto it, which I cannot ultimately follow from okay. the comments. Made. Well, that's what I was asking. Yeah. Okay. I understand, Ms. Dewar, and it just the process is what it is. And so I am going to be a no on this motion as well. But it, and it is because I believe we can still do something appropriate with this site, but it will take us more time than we have been able to give it tonight on the current trajectory. I, I think there are lots of variables still to be a, uh, answered, including some of the legal ones. So uh, I am not inclined to si support this motion. Okay, thank you. So all those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed? opposed. No. No. Okay. So, um, I think that was five. I think that one fell too. Okay. Uh, roll call vote. Madam Mayor? Yes, go ahead. Thank you so much. I'm ready to make uh, another motion. Okay. Um, oh, sorry, Council Member Martinez, we need to do a roll call on that last one. Sure, yeah. Breckis? Nay. Doer? Nay. Martinez? No. Ebert? No. Taylor? Yes. Reese? No. Sheevy? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, moving along. We're gonna get there, I promise. See, and you're, everyone's witnessing all of us working together. Okay, go ahead. Um, Councilman Martinez? Go ahead. Thank you so much, Madam Mayor. Um, I won't belabor the motion with some of my thoughts, but I will just move to approve uh, the following staff recommendation. So staff shall take all actions necessary to prepare the Community Assistance Center property uh, for sale, including but not limited to ordering appraisals and completing any necessary parcel maps or boundary line adjustments. And staff shall prepare and release a request for proposal for the sale of the Community Assistance Center. I'll second, second that. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Can, can you repeat the motion? Sure, I'd be happy to. I move to approve the following staff recommendations. Staff shall take all actions necessary to prepare the community assistance center property for sale, including but not limited to ordering appraisals and completing any necessary parcel maps or boundary line adjustments, and staff shall prepare and release a request for proposal for the sale of the Community Assistance Center. Thank you. All right, I have a motion and a second. All those yeah, in Yeah, Madam favor? Mayor. Yeah, um, go ahead. I'm not gonna support, I think it's good, it's getting there, but here's an important thing is we had a discussion hours ago about another city facility that we lease to a so social services provider, and that's the Community Health Assistance. And this says sale. And I think by getting it ready to sell and disposing it for sale, it precludes a process for a social services provider uh, like CHA type or the county to be able to lease our property and it continue to be one of our properties. So for that reason, um, I think it takes us away from some options on the property and I won't support, thank you. Okay, I would assume that you could, anyone that wanted to come forward with that type of option Right, that they could do that. Well, I I I'm hope so. They can. I hope they can. Okay. All right. So you heard Madam that Mayor, it's on record. Yes. Madam Mayor, if I may, I, for my part, I believe that it would allow anyone, whether that's uh, Rise, the county, CHA, if they chose Catholic Charities, to make a proposal. Whether that proposal is successful is an entirely another question. So I want to make sure that those groups have the same ability to in, inquire and put together their best proposal that anyone else does. They could have done that for several years, but have chosen not to. I think most people are going to find when they look under the covers 
that there are so many problems with the site that they may just not mm -hmm. be inclined to do it. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to foreclose that for them because I cannot speak for them. Okay. All right. Uh, we are, we can't interrupt the motion, so I apologize for any of you guys out there because um, I see hands. Um, but we're going to move forward. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, we are, Madam Clerk, anything else? We are at 615. Um, I need everyone to get up for 10 minutes and um, come back. Could okay. the manager during the break look to see if there's items that could be continued to the next meeting? What do we have? Uh, we have quite a few things. Yeah, let's see. Here we go. And actually, we're going to go 15 minutes, 630. So here's how I usually do it. Whoever is in, um, how many people are in the room, obviously tells me that there's a lot of people waiting for an item. Um, Madam Clerk, did you take a poll? You did? OK, so give me what you got. Do you want to connect on break? Or do you want to do it now? Yeah, let's go on but break. The only we'll thing is, what if we end up not hearing? Gotcha. Give me Everyone in this room will be heard. OK, give me just okay. a second. So that's the most important thing. Then we can break. Everyone in this room will be heard. We're not going to continue anything that these people are. Right. OK, so just so everyone knows, we're not continuing continuing anything um, if you are here for an item. OK, so Madam Mayor, in the, um, well, obviously, we have staff here for every item. But we, in the public side, we have um, members of the public here for majority of them are for our C items at this time. Um, so C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6. Um, and then outside of that, I believe everybody else is here for, staff is here for the, the, the remainder of the D items and uh, the B items. Okay. Could we continue D6? I don't know. What is that? It's a policy discussion about code changes for parking. Yes, please. I believe there is a timing issue with the budget if we continue D6. We, and then the other thing is uh, we're going to take the C items as well, I, I guess. I'm getting reports from staff that there are people waiting on some of the C items. So guess what, everyone? We will be here all night. We're going to actually go through the whole agenda. All right. I think that's going to be the most effective, <laughs> unless you can think otherwise. Let's do it. Yeah, we're going to do it. Okay. So then uh, we'll come back in we'll fifteen see minutes. Thirty. Okay.
All right, Madam Mayor, if you're ready, we'll reconvene the meeting. It is 644, and at this time, it looks like all members are present. Mm -hmm. So we are going to actually open up item F1, F is in Frank 1, which is the ordinance adoption for Dermody Trust annexation. Okay. <clears throat> that would be Councilwoman, is it Ebert? All right, I have a motion. Second, all those oh, in favor. I'm sorry, we need the city attorney to read the ordinance number first. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Carl, take it away. And then we'll move forward. <laughs> Here we go, ordinance adoption. Ordinance number 6673. Case number ANX 24-00002, Dermody Trust Annexation Ordinance, annexing to and making part of the city of Reno, certain specifically described property of a portion of each of two parcels being plus or minus 4,113 square feet of property generally located south of Aspen Trail and north of Bridal Way, together with other matters which pertain to or are necessarily connected therewith. The site is adjacent to the city of Reno's jurisdictional boundary, but is not located within the sphere of influence. Upon annexation, the site will have a large lot residential neighborhood, master plan, land use designation, and large lot residential, one acre. Zoning designation, award one. All right, thank you so much. Move to adopt. Okay, thank you, I have a motion. I have a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All aye. those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right, Madam Clerk. Thank you. We're moving on to item our C items. We're going to open item C1, C2, and C3 together, I believe. Okay, any public comment? Do you want to open the public hearing? Oh, uh, I apologize. That's At this okay, time, I would you. like to open the public hearing. It was proper notice given and any correspondence received. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, proper notice was given on this item. We did receive correspondence, and generally speaking, we received the same correspondence, C1, C2, C3. Um, those have been distributed to the Reno City Council, and we received 20 letters of support on these items. We do not have any public commenters in the audience who would like to speak. Okay, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, we do have one Zoom participant. Okay. Frank Shank. Frank, if you would unmute, state your name for the record and begin speaking. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, Frank Shank, Cold Springs. Thank you. Okay, oh, good. Uh, it, yeah, earlier today on public department, uh, I tried to speak, but I know I got disconnected and um, I just, yeah, I've, I've talked to Peter Lisner and, uh, and I've also talked to, um, um, Grace McAdon about my concerns and I'm, I'm not against the project. I know people, you know, kind of want to see some retail, but I, I'm just concerned about the planning. You know, I hope, you know, I, I've seen some of the stuff in the past, like it, what happened in Stead area. How I thought, you know, and I, I just want to make sure that there's some <laughs> kind of planning done to where, you know, the buildup is is already out there, and then all of a sudden it's five years later to get the infrastructure for roads and streets. So that's a big concern for me, and um, I'm concerned about the flooding a little bit. If if the, you know, if was a plan in place. You know, because we're in a closed-in basin like Swan Lake, and you know, I just want to see if there's a plan to, you know, like if, if we get a big, big rain or something, you know, and snow, and because I know there'll be maybe more runoff, you know, for, from the build out near there because it's right on dry lake. Um, and also, I'm concerned, like when 911 calls, like police, you know, how that works. And uh, it would be good if, if it did pass, if there was maybe a substation there. And uh, also, on the, I heard that it could be double lanes maybe in 2030, depending on the build out. But I just, I would feel good that if there's something in stone that, you know, that there's infrastructure in place. Like I said, as as Megan can tell you, uh, Councilwoman Megan, 
you know, and that's why I really supported her, and she's done a great job, and uh, you know, on, on on infrastructure. But anyway, that's a lot of my concerns. And uh, oh, real quick, it, I would like to, it would be good to see a bike lane, but you know, I'm just everything I say is just an opinion. I'm not saying I'm going to do this or anything, you know, because you know I'm just representing myself. <coughs> but um, I think that's about it. Um, Thank you very much, and I know you've had a rough day today, everybody, you know, so, but thanks for hearing me out. All right. Thank you, Frank. All right, our next public commenter is Rebecca Flannery via Zoom. Hi, you guys. Hi, Good Rebecca. Evening. Sorry, I know it's been a long day for you guys. Um, I have massive amounts of concerns for this develop the development that they're trying to bring out here to Cold Springs. We literally live out here to see the stars, to have peace, to not have Reno. Okay, and I'm born and raised here. And What's I love it, what Reno. are you? Why are you against Reno? <laughs> I'm just, I love I'm Reno. just kidding. I'm it's just kidding. <laughs> We're um, trying not to I take think, it personal. <laughs> okay, keep going. I would never. This is my home, y'all. <laughs> um, I just, it, and I've talked to a lot of people out here in Cold Springs. I have lots of family and friends out here. You know, I grew up in Golden Valley. Um, it's just, these people are trying to bring in this big development, and they're claiming, I watched the Reno Planning Commission, and they're saying like 20 people approved it and two people denied it. But nobody out here actually knew that this was happening. So I don't know how they're getting the knowledge out here to citizens. And I don't understand the, the point that they're trying to make. They're trying to destroy our home when we're already being overdeveloped by all these homes. Our 395 is like horrible to get into town anymore. We don't need to add all these extra semis and this extra... Um, I would like to like speak on most of us out here in Cold Springs that doesn't want to see this. This is going to be another Swan Lake disaster. Um, and then we're going to also have to be mitigated with all this semi-traffic and noise. We already know what's happening over in Golden <laughs> Valley with Chewy and their noise. The, these people can't sit here and claim that they let us know when they didn't. So I am speaking for a majority of Cold Springs when we don't want this. So I hope you take that into consideration. Okay. Thank you guys. Thanks Rebecca. <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> All right, Madam Mayor, with that, we have no additional public comment on these items. Okay, thank you so much. Grace, nice to see you. Sorry it's so late. Yes, good evening, Madam Mayor, Council Members. Grace Mackinnon um, with Development Services, and I'm here to discuss the White Lake SPD Master Plan and Zoning Map Amendments. So the subject site is located in Ward 4 in Cold Springs, east of White Lake and generally west of White Lake Parkway. The applicant is requesting a master plan amendment from suburban mixed use, single family, parks, greenways, and open space to mixed employment. And a zoning map amendment from neighborhood commercial, single family three units per acre, and parks, greenways, and open space to a specific plan district. That's a lot of zoning districts and colors, so we'll discuss these changes in more detail later on in the presentation. Some of the key issues staff looked at was compatibility, availability of services and infrastructure, and conformance with the master plan. Here is the proposed zoning map amendment that demonstrates the change. As you can see, there's a handful of different zoning districts that are currently assigned to the site. This is a carryover from, of county zoning from when the site was originally annexed. The proposed SPD zoning comes with a handbook and specific development standards that we will discuss later on in the presentation. So although it's all turning to that light pink color, there's a breakdown of what's allowed in certain areas within the handbook. Similarly, with the proposed master plan, we see a handful of different master plan designations replaced with the mixed employment, which generally supports light industrial, employment, and research type uses. Now we can discuss the SPD handbook and what type of development we can actually anticipate. The proposed handbook includes about 12 acres of neighborhood commercial or NC zoning that would typically be located between White Lake Parkway and the rest of the development. This would serve as a buffer to have more commercial uses closer to the residents and the industrial uses behind 
the commercial uses. The rest of the area would be allocated to about 182 acres of mixed employment and 25 acres of open space. Additionally, in this handbook, we account for mitigations for industrial development near residential zoning, include 24-hour use mitigation, loading dock restrictions, and additional screening requirements. The applicant has also proposed a trail along White Lake for residents and future employees to use along the playa. There are some major points in the handbook. Um, anything that is not addressed in the handbook will defer to RMC standards as amended. Oh, that was, sorry. Something I wanted to highlight is the 24-hour use. This can be impactful to surrounding neighborhoods, so I, staff worked with the applicant to provide some standards that can help mitigate some of these impacts. I would especially like to call your attention to the condition which prohibits backup alarms and beepers between the hours of 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. These restrictions are specific to the mixed employment zone and 24-hour use in the neighborhood commercial area would re require additional review. The development standards that are proposed are very similar to what we see in Title 18 for respective zoning districts. Some of the differences that are more restrictive include lighting and front setbacks to ensure compatibility with the surrounding neighborhood. Additionally, with the uses, this is similar to the respective zoning districts um, and, and mixed employment, we will see that the single family and multifamily are not allowed. However, we would like to show that we did remove the multifamily or residential uses in the neighborhood commercial zoning district by recommendation of the neighborhood and through neighborhood outreach um, to make it more commercial centric. In conclusion, we do not necessarily know what the final development project will be, but this provides us with some parameters to understand what can be constructed in the future on this site. We have received a number of public comments in support of the proposed project due to the need for commercial and employment uses in this area. We've also received comments opposed to this project with concerns regarding traffic, flooding, and general nature of industrial development. Here are the findings for a zoning map amendment. The project does not conflict with state law and conforms with a number of our master plan policies. Here are the findings for a master plan amendment. And finally, the findings for a specific plan district. Planning Commission recommended approval of this project. The recommended motion is on your screen and I am available for questions. And the applicant and the applicant's representative are also here with a presentation. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, come on up, Mr. Gordon. Madam uh, Mayor, good evening. Good evening. For the record, Garrett <laughs> Gordon, uh, today representing Lifestyle Homes. Um, it's my pleasure to represent the listener family. They've been developing in this area for decades. I did have three generations of listeners with me, but I think I'm down to two. Uh, Bob and Peter Listener are here uh, in the audience today. Mm -hmm. I uh, appreciate Grace's presentation. I will try not to be uh, repetitive, but as mentioned, uh, the area is approximately 218 acres on the south, um, uh, on, excuse me, on the northeast side of White's Lake. And you can see currently there's kind of a smorgasbord of different uh, master plan designations. Uh, you have uh, single family, you have open space, um, you have SMU. Uh, we're converting those to just one overall mixed employment uh, master plan designation. Along with the zoning you can see is currently NC, SF3, and some industrial. And we're move combining all those into a specific plan. We thought this was a perfect location and working with staff for months now on a number of conditions that really lay out how you can build and where you can build in regards to this development. I should note, you can see there's a piece carved out, which is the existing Reno Truss uh, industrial operation. So there's industrial operations there today, both indoor and outdoor. So we certainly think it's compatible with our handbook and commerce center surrounding the in, uh, existing industrial facility. So we landed on moving forward with a handbook. Why? Because we could lay out really four items, a development schedule, a land use plan, some development standards, which were very important and probably took the longest to negotiate with staff uh, in, in conjunction with um, and being sympathetic to the residential across the street, and finally some site planning standards. 
So development schedule. Um, you've seen some specific, some specific plans come before you recently. Uh, all are about 15 years. So there's a 15-year development schedule to build out uh, this area. And if we don't meet that deadline, the plan has to come back to this body and request an extension. Two, a land use plan. So you can see, even though we are rezoning this area to SPD, within that SPD are specific land use categories. You can see the green there. Let me start with the open space. Planning Commission had a concern. You can see on the left side here, there's open space zoned uh, land. That remains the same. That remains the same in that that 25 acres does not change, and we're not asking to alter any of the existing open space zoning designation. What we are doing are two things. One, in purple, we go to mixed employment, about 182 mixed employment acres. And what we're also doing, which hopefully comes um, to the excitement of um, Council Member Ebert and Ward 4, is some commercial. Uh, we, I know I've been before this body many times at projects in the North Valleys, and we've always heard we need commercial, we need restaurants, we need retail. So it worked perfectly in this handbook to be able to put in a minimum, we can always go more, but a minimum acreage of, of commercial, and also have it along White Lakes Parkway. Not only does that make sense for retail, for accessibility, for visibility, for retail, so it's successful, but, all, but also provides a very nice buffer between any of the mixed employment industrial warehousing buildings that may go on the lakeside. There's a buffer of the commercial uh, between that, uh, between White Lakes Parkway and the residential across the street. So it does serve a couple purposes, but mainly to get uh, that neighborhood commercial out there. So we put together some renderings. Certainly this is not ex um, what potentially what exactly would be built, but it could be built under our handbook. Again, a minimum of 11 acres. Uh, we envision a nice uh, retail shopping center all the way along uh, White's Lake Parkway. Again, we heard from the NAB, we heard, and let me just note, uh, one of the residents said on Zoom that they hadn't been notified. We've done neighborhood meetings, we've done a NAB meeting, and despite my best efforts and recommendation not to engage on Nextdoor, the client and the listeners put this project on Nextdoor, including a link to the staff report and the application to be as transparent as possible. In addition, they went to the board of Woodland Village and made sure that Woodland Village was aware of the application and also the hearing dates. So I think we've been as transparent and open as possible about what we're proposing and the dates and time of the hearing. So back to the neighborhood commercial. There's a use table which would include retail, restaurants, personal services, child care, community serving offices like medical offices. Really what this community and neighborhood have been asking for for a long time. There's now a requirement in this handbook to have at least about 11 acres of that neighborhood commercial. In addition, we thought, well, there could be bars and restaurants and potentially they want to be 24 hour. Well, we put an additional layer of discretionary approvals in there for any businesses going between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. So if there's a bar or a restaurant that wants to go 24 hour, they have to come back for a minor conditional use permit uh, to make sure any um, restrictions or conditions are, are, that are appropriate are placed on that permit. And again, just another rendering. I mean, I was got kind of excited about this. So did the listeners. I mean, commercial, commercial. We've heard for a lot of years, that's what this community wants. That's what they need. So we think this is perfect. You can see here, not only does it serve White Lakes Parkway and all of Cold Springs, but will provide a nice buffer in between any of the other mixed employment uses that could be warehousing or otherwise. So this is probably one of the most important slides I have to share with you tonight and really took the longest months to negotiate with staff to come up with some conditions for mixed employment 24 hour operation that really address the residential adjacency across the street. So again, here's a, a rendering of what the project could look like. Again, you have the uh, neighborhood commercial on White, White's Lake Parkway, and then you have <laughs> the, the warehousing and industrial behind. What did we put in the handbook that are absolute conditions in order to operate in mixed <coughs> employment 24 hour? One, the employee parking must be behind a 10 foot combination berm rock wall within 200 feet of residential. So you can see in this rendering, there's not only the commercial buffer, but there's a parking uh, buffer as well. Two, 
no loading docks, absolutely no loading docks within 300 feet of any residential use, and those have to be oriented away from White Lake Parkway. You can see here in the rendering, there are no docks pointed anywhere close toward residential. Three, no docks facing White Lake Parkway within 500 feet of residential use unless screened by another building. Four, all loading and unloading between 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. have to be between an enclosed trailer and a sealed dock door. So all that activity is happening within the trailer and dock door, not outside um, in the parking lot. Next, no backup alarms beeping between 10 p.m. and 7 a.m., and also no running refrigerator equipment between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. We think those last two conditions we've heard in the community have been issues in other locations, so they're absolutely prohibited uh, in the handbook. And finally, uh, tenant buildings are limited to a, a 500,000 square feet. If you want to go larger than that, we'd have to come back with a, a CUP uh, to figure out if there's any additional conditions that would be required. So we spent a lot of time on this. I want to thank Grace and her team. I think we got it right in regards to residential adjacency concerns. Project entries. Uh, obviously, we want this project to look great, to be aesthetically pleasing as you come up and down White Lakes Parkway. Um, so there's some strict standards about project entries. Minimum of landscape areas, what the trees should look like, how many trees should there be, um, where they should be located, um, including the height at the time of planting. We did pull some of these from other projects that this body has approved, uh, making sure that we're consistent with tree standards and, and provide a really nice project entry to the project. Also, sidewalks. Uh, we have some very strict sidewalk standards, and you can see a, a rendering here. Um, there'd be sidewalks up and down White Lake Parkway with landscaping, with trees, with some commercial, with parking, and eventually the larger buildings uh, in the back. So we worked hard with staff on the sidewalk standard as well. Traffic. So we've heard out here, uh, obviously, traffic is always brought up of what um, benchmarks or what safeguards are we putting in the handbook to make sure that traffic is adequately looked at when there is a project. So prior to the issuance of any building permit, the master developer shall be required to provide a trip generation letter to the city of Reno. Um, and that trip generation letter would include what the actual use would be at the time. Is it an industrial building? Is it a restaurant? Is it a dry cleaner? Whatever it is, we'll have a trip generation letter. Um, and that if that exceeds 100 peak trips, then we would have to come forward with a comprehensive traffic impact analysis. I'd also note in that second paragraph, uh, it's absolutely clear that any offsite improvements that are required in these traffic impact uh, studies would have to be constructed by uh, the master developer. Trails and open space. So when we went to the NAB um, and when the listeners went out to their community and got input, it was important that there was a trail and a trail connecting um, the north side of the project down the lake to the south side of the project. So we have a minimum 10 foot wide green belt shall be preserved from the high water line up to uh, the White Lake Playa. And then we'll also have an all surface weather trail and I have a picture um, on the next slide uh, what that would look like to make sure we have that great connectivity and also some interpretive signs. There's some great wildlife out there. There's some great views, have some signs out there that really address um, some facts about White Lake and Cold Springs and the Valley. So we look forward to working with the NAB um, and Council Member Ebert on maybe what those trail signs um, should include. So you can see here, here's a rendering that trail would run uh, between the lake and uh, the project. You can see here, it, it kind of runs uh, diagonal uh, nor north to south down. It connects to White Lake Parkway on the south side of the project and also on the north side of the project. And this will in fact be public access, but maintained by the master developer. So there's no maintenance obligations on behalf of the city. And again, here you can see uh, the trail system that we think is pretty neat that really connects um, this area uh, and the, the east side uh, of the lake. It was also important when staff reviewed, this kind of came in late, but I think it was a good catch, making sure the trail comes in, you know, not at the end, but at the beginning. And so then the proposed trail shall be installed prior to the approval of any building permit for vertical construction. 
So when we're doing horizontal permitting, horizontal construction, the trail has to go in and then we go vertical. So that I think is an important point that the trail is coming in earlier in the process. Sometimes in developments, trails come in later, but this will come in earlier. And you can see that last sentence, maintenance and ownership um, would in fact be uh, by the master developer. Fiscal impact, um, uh, as a master plan amendment, you have to submit a, a fiscal impact analysis. Uh, this analysis anticipates a revenue surplus for the city and over $200,000 for the city's general fund and over $1.8 million in the city's street fund. So certainly a positive fiscal impact to the city for this project. Master plan, uh, Grace touch on, touched on this, um, but not only is this a master plan amendment that has to comply with your master plan policies, but also it's a finding for your zoning map amendment. Uh, there are many we could pull out of the master plan, but here's a few. Um, certainly, uh, this area is encouraged for a modern industrial hub. We think we've done a good job here. If there is industrial built, we have the safeguards in there for screening um, and that neighborhood commercial along White Lakes Parkway. Neighborhood services, we think that absolutely the, the, the uh, neighborhood commercial that would be built is going to serve this neighborhood that's well overdue. Uh, and again, transition from unincorporated county to open space. Uh, we think White Lakes Parkway. Uh, then you have the commercial, the parking, the larger buildings, the trail system, the green belt, then the lake. I think we've done a great job transitioning from White Lake Parkway down to, uh, down to the lake. So it absolutely complies with the master plan. Changes as a result of public engagement. Very important to the listener family. They've been out here for decades making sure we had not only one but two neighborhood meetings. Um, they went above and beyond with the second one. Had a NAB meeting, went on next door, went to the Woodland Village HOA, and we heard. Um, and we also heard, I, I think uh, uh, Council Member Ebert was at the NAB, you know, commercial, commercial, commercial. So we made sure we added in that commercial and even uh, um, added to it a little bit in response to your NAB. Two, this was important from your NAB. They said, well, you're promising us commercial, but one of the uh, uses allowed in your commercial is multifamily. So is this a backdoor way of putting apartments along that stretch? The answer was no, but it was a good catch. So we took that out. So now apartments are not an allowed use in that neighborhood commercial. It is just strictly commercial, retail, personal services um, that would be allowed there. And as I mentioned before, probably the most important slide I had was those strict residential adjacency standards uh, for the 24-hour use that we pulled from many other projects, um, as well as came up with some new ones to make sure we got it right. And then the traffic impact safeguards. When a project under this handbook does come forward, there's traffic letters, there's traffic studies, and an absolute statement in the handbook that the master developer uh, is, requ is, is required to, to fund any improvements that are necessary based on the ultimate project. So we agree um, with all conditions of approval. Um, we certainly agree with staff recommending approval. Uh, there have been numerous public comments in support of this project. I believe at the Planning Commission, we were close to 15 or 20 in support, and they were all focused on this, this neighborhood commercial component. And finally, the Planning Commission voted unanimously. Our Planning Commission is not always unanimous, but in this case, they absolutely were. They were unanimous uh, in approving uh, this application, and we hopefully ask you uh, to do the same. And I'm here for any questions, and thank you for your time. All right. Thank you so much. Perfect. Okay, we're going to now bring it back to the body. I'm going to send it over to Councilwoman Eber. It's your board, so please kick us off. Great. Um, so we do get a lot of um, requests for commercial out in that area. That's I'm one sorry. of the top. Go ahead. Sorry. One of the top requests I get, you know, after traffic and infrastructure roads, the second thing people want is commercial. And in, in particular, I was out at the senior center in Cold Springs and had lunch a couple months ago and just to meet people, interact. And I know that's county, but the people that live in that area, you know, surround that this um, area. Um, and the people all told me they wanted places to shop out there. So, um I do think that it's it's something that we need out there, and um, this is something that I had talked about um, 
with the listeners before about the um, the area out there, the, the lake bed. I know that when the lake is drier, there's some concern with the dust that comes off the lake and that there's no barrier currently between the lake bed and the residential area. Have you done any environmental studies uh, regarding the impact of that dust that would be blowing into residential neighbors, if there's any uh, negative health impacts for that? We did not get any specific environmental studies, but we do send all these applications out to Washoe County Air Quality. Um, we didn't get any comments back from them, and so that is not something that they didn't provide any comments at this time. Okay. Um, and also, did you say that there is no traffic study done yet? It's not going to be triggered until there's actually a permit for development? For the record, Garrett Gordon, thank you for the question. Yes, we have a, a table of uses in there that would be allowed. We just don't know what the project will be yet uh, to be able to do the calculations for a traffic study. So we have the strict standards in there that when a project does come forward, if that's an industrial building or a restaurant or a dry cleaner, they would have to go through that uh, traffic either letter process or study process depending on 100 trip over or under 100 trips. Okay. And if we didn't make these zoning changes, what, what could this land be used for? It's a great question. So residential and a lot of residential. So I, Grace can correct me if I'm wrong, but under the neighborhood, so the existing zoning, there we go. The existing zoning is on the left. So that NC, neighborhood commercial, I believe allows by right over 1,300 multifamily units. And the SF3 would allow over 300 single family. So you're looking at over 1,600 residential units just by the current zoning with none of these important handbook standards that we've put in. So we think what we're proposing is a lot better than what, how it's currently zoned. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Um, Councilman Breckus, go ahead. Yeah. So, um, Ms. McAdin. Oh, first of all, he, said, he just said 1,300 on the NC. How big is that NC? Um. Let me pull it up, but it's 30 units per acre. So whatever that breakdown would be, if I can get the exact. Well, I, I guess, you know, I don't want to lose too much time. What's the NC zoning? How, how many acres? It would be, I think it's about, hold on. If it was all to build, well, let me just, let me just, I, I, we're so strict here and it's been so late. Let me just go through compatibility because you said compatibility is important consideration. Yes. Washoe County wrote that the existing zoning of the city has a high compatibility to the land use on the county. Okay. So they have a rating scale. It's rather objective. They say it's high compatible. They say the change to industrial zoning, and this is Washoe County Community Development, represents a substantially higher impact, higher potential for impacts, okay? So you're saying compatible, more compatible than the existing zoning. Washoe County is looking at it differently. Can we look at the 24-hour strict standards that Mr. Um, uh, Lewis Rocco was talking about on his, okay, right there. So 24 hour strict standards, okay? No loading docks within 300 feet of a residential zone. Well, I sure as heck have heard of 301 feet within loading docks to homes being a real problem. Have lived experience up on North Virginia Street, but that's not 24 hour, that's just, that's a design thing. So 301 feet to a loading dock to someone's existing house. No docks facing within 500 feet, okay? So they can go sideways, but they're within 500 feet, even 500 feet, you know? So I agree with Washoe County. All loading and unloading between 10 and 7 between an enclosed trailer. That means between 10 p.m. and 7, they can be doing this in these areas. No alarms or backups between 10 p.m. and 7 a.m., but they can be circulating on the property with their diesel trucks during that area's time within 300 feet. No refrigerator equipment between 10 p.m. and 7 a.m., but others can. I, I don't see that as strict 24-hour operation, and I've heard time and time again that any 24-hour operation 
is very intrusive to a residential setting. And I have Washoe County here saying it, it does propose a conflict. Now, let me, let me go into this concept of commercial. How wide is the commercial area that's on this SPD? So it's not specific to the width, but the 12 acres, and it has to be in certain areas blocking the, um, or within the, between the residential and the rest of the site. Okay, so 12 acres to me is maybe a Maverick, maybe a Starbucks, Dutch Brothers, and maybe one other use. And, I, and I'm not going to malign those as important uses to people, but... It's, it's not certainly giving people a commercial center in their area. But the more important thing to me is the SPD cannot modify other provisions related to services and infrastructure. And I've supported the SPD, and here we are way out here at the exurban fringe bringing in an SPD, and I think it is modifying services. The fire chief said, what is he, 14 minutes away? Councilman Breckus, I'm so sorry. I'm going okay. to cut you oh, off. Yeah. I'll come back to you. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Councilman um, Martinez. Um, yes, thank you. I appreciate the insights that were given um, today. Thank you, Ms. McAdon, for the presentation and you as well, Mr. Gorian. I just want to give a huge uh, shout out to Livestock Homes and the listeners for their abundant including of public comment and making sure that there were multiple ways that folks were able to provide um, feedback on this. Um, and then I, th I, li I appreciate your attentiveness to the needs of commercial out in that space. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Councilman Taylor, nothing. Councilman Reese. Madam Mayor, I would sort of echo the comments made by Councilmember Martinez. I know that this community has uh, largely been built by the listener family over a period of many decades. And it sounds like it's finally at the point in time where it can support the type of small uh, commercial development and, and some light industrial that is needed in that area. And so I, I'm hopeful that this will spur the kind of, uh, we'll call it small scale coffee shops and the like that is so desperately needed in the area in which uh, Council Member Ebert has long championed. And so I am, uh, I am supportive. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Councilman Doerr. Yeah, I think this is amazing. It seems like the applicant has worked incredibly uh, diligently with the neighborhood and with our council member Ebert. And I love to see that. I love projects to, to get uh, born and then evolve through a process that will work for everyone. I mean, we heard a couple negative comments, but I think on, on uh, balance, it's extremely positive. I had a couple quick questions. I um, wanted to confirm, I'm glad you have this one up, about the time of use. I know that's been such an issue, and we're looking at changing our regulations uh, to not automatically allow this kind of use and to only allow it with a special use permit, I believe, and then to cl closely evaluate it. So it's a little tiny on the screen, but what I'm seeing is no backup between 10 and 7, but I guess I'm unclear. Can they load and unload? It says no loading, all loading between 7, 10 p.m. and 7 p.m., is just on the backside, on the side of the lake? So it has to be between the um, trailer and the enclosed dock door. So if you back up your trailer to the dock door, you can load and unload in that sealed um, location. Nothing can be done outside of that. So but when you say sealed, it's an enclosed? Or? Correct. Okay. And because they can't have the... Be one of the issues that comes up a lot is those backup alarm beepers, the flashing. Right. And so that was super important to staff that we address that in some way, shape, or form. And because they can't be backing up between 10 p.m. and 7, um, the activity on the docks will be limited just because of that action being prohibited. Well, you can't back up, so you can't right. really load. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Unless you backed up before 10 p.m. and then you loaded and you could pull away. Correct. Is that the idea? Okay. Correct. Then um, I was I did have a question about the dust, and I just it was a little different than Councilmember Ebert's question, but I just wanted to make sure that I mean the doors are going to be facing the lake, although it's going to be enclosed, and the dry, lake is dry at times, and the dust does blow. I mean this is a desert terminal lake. I mean it's it's a um, it's there and it blows and it's dusty, and I just wanted to make sure everybody knows going into it what that means. 
in terms of activity and how that can affect machinery. You know, the, the dust is alkaline. Um, you know, it could be difficult for the operation. So just wanted to make sure they all know. And then um, on the trees, um, I know that uh, Mr. Listener, both listeners are very committed to trees. I wanted to say that um, a dry alkaline lake is not the best environment for trees. And um, they may want, as they get into this project, they may want to consider doing something that uh, Ormat Geothermal did, which was their location wasn't the best for trees either. And what they ended up doing, rather than plant trees where they either weren't going to thrive or weren't going to be seen or weren't going to provide a benefit, they bundled up the funds they were going to spend on that and um, did a donation to uh, for mitigation to Relief Reno to have the trees planted, but maybe not right there. So they may want to consider that for some of the trees. So just a thought. But good work to everybody. Okay. Thanks. All right. Uh, Councilman Ebert. <clears throat> yeah. So this round two. Okay. Um, I'm not sure. They think this is more for the developer. Um, so... I have concerns about the soil too for landscaping, but um, we need vegetation in, in Ward 4. Um, and I want to make sure that um, the funds that we receive go to Ward 4. Could we possibly explore any other kinds of um, landscaping that would be more inclusive, maybe of native vegetation? Um, we have a lot of sagebrush out there. I know there's some trees and things like that, but maybe specifically look at native um, vegetation that could thrive in these areas so we're not planting things that die. I don't, I don't know what kind of uh, vegetation you guys were looking into, but maybe um, you know look to be more inclusive with, with the native plants. Uh, sure. For the record, Garrett Gordon, thank you for the question. Yeah, I think we, we worked with our landscape architects on the language and on the landscape plan and with mm -hmm. your staff. I, I think we feel comfortable what's in there can be planted and will survive, but we are happy to work with you and your urban forester uh, to make sure that we get it right. So okay. Um, okay. before we move forward, we'll, we'll come talk to you and him. Okay. Yeah, that would be great. Okay. And also I did, I forgot to say thank you earlier for coming to the NABs and for being available for comment. And, and I did want to say that I've seen changes in this, you know, during this whole process of coming to the NAB and, and planning commission that you guys have modified this, um, along the way, based off of feedback you've received from constituents. So I just wanted to say thank you for that. And, um, yeah. Um, oh, first responders. I've had some people ask who would be the first responders. And um, I know it's City of Reno, but it's pretty far out. So if we could just kind of yes. get an overview of that. Yes, thank you, Grace Mackinan, again, for the record. So this is within 13 minutes from the closest Reno Fire Department. There's a Truckee Meadows Fire Department that's you know, right there. Um, it is within the automatic aid area for structure fire response. Um, and that would come from that fire state or the Reno said fire station. And then, sorry, the station that is in Cold Springs, I believe is a volunteer station. So the closest one would be the Reno said one. Um, and then this is also within the area for mutual aid, but talking <coughs> to the Reno fire department, that's more of like an at request basis. Okay, so if somebody were to call the police, though, would it be Pol Reno PD or sheriffs that would show up? It depends on, and I'm not an expert on the mutual aid, but from what I've heard from Reno Fire Department, it depends on what they're calling for. Okay. And we would either dispatch, we would dispatch the closest person at that okay. point. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. I'm glad you brought up the, um, the NABs and also the public process. What I have found, honestly, with... Um, the listeners projects they do the best outreach of anyone so that is great to hear I did hear one woman on the phone though I think her name was Rebecca and she um, said that she had not been part of the process and then I think you had a slide that kind of showed your outline of how you do reach out to people um, I guess just to reiterate that and Councilwoman Ebert might be someone through a public comment card that you want to reach out to because I know you do a lot of engagement. She is actually um, going to be appointed to my NAB later today. So yeah, yeah, okay. at some point today okay. or 
tomorrow morning. Oh, I was going to say <laughs> maybe tomorrow morning. Yeah. Um, okay, well, I just want to make sure because yeah. I, I was surprised only to know because I know how much outreach goes out. Yeah, and so, she comes to most of the NAB, so she might have just missed confused. this one. Yeah, maybe she, she was confused. This one, okay. For the record, Garrett Gordon, yeah, Peter Listener, I'm sure has already written down her name. Yeah. Finding her phone number and yeah. we'll go meet with her because Peter lives out there. He lives yeah. in Cold Springs, so that's why he knows everyone yeah. and knocks on doors and gets input. Yeah. So that's why I was surprised because I know how much you do, and I thought, okay, something had to have fallen through the cracks. But I wanted to reiterate the things that you do do, so that's good. So probably okay. be having coffee with Peter in the morning. Um, so you know. All right, here we go. I'm going to send it back to Councilwoman Breckus. Yeah. Go ahead. It's all yeah. you. Uh, I guess Three in minutes. In, in, in the compatibility is, you know, the limit is 500,000 square feet. So that's under roof, that's half a Meadowood Mall. So time and time again, we see that these large industrial buildings with all that docking, and 500,000 is pretty big, is not compatible. It is not compatible. We have enough experience, whether it's Verdi in North Virginia, to see that people's lives are miserable when they are in close proximity to this. So if the council really wants to do a specialized district here, make this smaller flex space. Do not do a mega warehouse here, okay? And then I do want to bring up the um, the aid or the response because that's one of the findings. You know, our own 13 minutes and 14 minutes to two RFD stations over a major hill that sometimes ices down up. And I know that because I'm driving up that way quite a bit. And if it's if it's medical. You know, we don't even have a protocol, our own captain says, for calling on a medical to, to Truckee Meadows. The one I'm most concerned about, and I've said this time and time again during Stonegate, is running the police up there. You think Stead is underserved right now? Because they are. I mean, I've heard before time and time again that on a busy night, Stead officers have to swing through urban Reno to go out to far west Reno. That's how stretched thin they are. You really think that you're going to expose this whole, our fire, our police responders over the hill into this area? We are not service ready in this area. There is no way that we can get over there and do the job that we need to do without compromising already very thin patrols and responses instead. And, you know, here's the world how this should have worked. This should have worked for Stonegate. This should have worked for this one. We should have convened when we got the annexation. Mr. Listener was the annexation. And you think you've got issues coming. He and Mr. Thomas own Evans Ranch and Silver Wing way up off Red Rock Ro or Lemon Drive extension. And that's going to really when they are able to sell that land, that's really going to cause issues. But we need to convene the county and do a plan for the Cold Springs Valley. There's issues about the playas that we need to understand the science. We haven't done that. The county did that many years ago in their planning efforts, did science through their planning process to understand the playa activities. We haven't even talked about sewer. Now we're sewering over to, you know, a very inadequate county facility that we don't have an agreement with. We can't be doing a specialized zoning entitlement to someone when we're so stretched on services. We're stressed on fire. We're doing a real disservice to our poor police officers who are driving call to call instead to have them go over the hill. We just cannot do this. And everything in our master plan, and I, I'm, I'm sad to see that staff isn't going into that, no comment of concurrency. We were going to have the services ready when we made these sort of decisions. Staff saying we have, but hasn't even done an analysis on the concurrency. The existing zoning is the right zoning up there. It's the right zoning for the services we have up there to respond from the first responders and for their infrastructure. This is a real flawed uh, recommendation. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Okay, sending it back to you, Councilwoman Ebert. It's your word. Um, I, I have one more question. Sorry. Okay, we'll do one. We're going to okay. do one more. Yeah, and actually, you, just a couple quick questions. Okay, you go right ahead. Has there been any flooding there? Is there concerns about flooding? I know that there's no <laughs> development like right up against her now, but has there been yeah. historically flooding there? Yes, yeah, this is in a flood zone, and um, as part of development, they will have to mitigate that through the North Valley's 1 to 1.3, um, which is, you know, extra than we would see in any other area just due to the close 
basin nature of this area. So they will have to do significant flood mitigation at time of development. Okay. And if we don't make this change, this developer could, in theory, put in 1,600 homes instead, correct? Correct. Okay. To me, I'm not in charge of first responders or anything, but I think that would generate more calls for service than a commercial and industrial development. Um, so I just wanted to call that out. Um, okay, does anybody else have any other questions? I just wanted to follow up on your point about the flooding. I didn't hear the answer. Just if This isn't a flood zone, so they will have to mitigate 1 to 1.3 at time of development and do other flood mitigation at that time. And where would the flooding go? I mean, it's a... It has to fill the lake as to the previous speaker's point? Correct. Lake Swan Lake? I mean. Correct. Yeah, so they would have to mitigate it on site through retention or detention. On site through retention. Yes. Yeah, a couple things if I could just. Okay, hold on one okay. second. Uh, Councilwoman Ebert, um, I was giving you three minutes. I just want to let you know you only exhausted a minute. So I'll, I'm going to go to Councilwoman Breckus and I'll come back. Yeah, that's fine. Thank okay, you. thanks. Go yeah. ahead, Councilwoman Breckus. Yeah, I don't believe the 1,600 units. I think that's not a design feasible consideration. So I don't know who's stating that information. Um, I, I don't believe it. Two is um, uh, the, um, the, there's a reason Stonegate hasn't gone. I understand. And they're probably waiting in the back wings to turn their whole land into industrial, which is what it was and what I said it should have been when Stonegate was approved. But it was the inadequacy and in the considerations of the playa, I understand. The water table was just too high. So what do we have here? We have a whole lot of development even closer to the lake. <laughs> That's going to be problematic. Um, we need to go out there and do the science and understand the ability to serve the the public services, and the um, sewer um, utility out there, and the water utility. What water utility is on, this on? This is Great Basin Water yeah. Territory. Yeah, we've never put city services on these smaller satellite water resources. Reno is Tumwa. We don't do deals out into these private investor-owned water utilities. That is not our service level. So that's a problem also. Um, and you're saying this, the mitigation is 1.3 for, where is that existing code? So I do have Trina on the line as well. She might be able to answer this question a little bit better. But all of our North Valley's areas with, that are in that closed basin have to do a 1 to 1.3 cubic feet of runoff to one mitigation. Yeah, let's make sure that because this isn't North Valley's, this is Cold Springs Valley. And I could see someone working a loophole really easily that says, oh, that's just for the Swan and the Silver Lake Basin. It never was done over for the Cold Springs Basin because we never thought about it. But we might even need, with this being the larger of the playa, we might even need more. But that's how we get out and do the science. This is so problematic. This is like Stonegate all over again. This is at the edges of our city going on to utilities that we don't even have any experience on. I am just defied that we are not doing planning in these areas. And I don't need to hear from Mr. Gordon. Madam Mayor, may I address the comment? Yes, go ahead. So it's in the staff report, Council Member. If you read the staff report, page 5, it says 1 to 1.3. There's no loophole. It's in code. For the record, we will comply with the 1 to the 1.3 because it's code. Thank you. What's the code reference? It's on page 5 of no, your No, the staff code report. reference, the on RMC. Page 5 of your staff report? Yeah, what's the RMC? 1804102 uh, in your staff report, page 5. Okay. The third paragraph okay. is called hydrology, mm -hmm. and it answers all of these questions. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Councilwoman Ebert, do you want me to go to Councilwoman Dewar? Before? Yeah, you okay. can go. I don't, I don't, Nothing? I don't have any okay. further questions. Go ahead. Councilwoman Ebert, uh, you have got two minutes left. Okay, so I'm I'm pretty much ready to make a motion unless okay. anybody else has anything to say. I, anything. Just, I just wanted to make sure if okay. you had any more yeah. questions. Yeah, I um, just Oh, wanted... sorry. Sorry. Oh. Uh, any council members on the phone need to weigh in or have questions? If not, I'm going to entertain a motion from Councilwoman Ebert. Nothing. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Okay, go ahead. Councilwoman Ebert, it's you. 
Okay, so first I want to uh, put some things on the record. Um, one being that I'm aware of the concerns about infrastructure um, getting in and out of the North Valleys. It's something that I deal with every time I come in and out of uh, Lemon Valley. Um, but with that in mind, I think that building 1,600 homes, which um, is allowed right now would have a greater impact on the traffic than this proposed development. Um, and given the thought put into um, the accommodations to have um, a reduced impact um, to the residential area, um, I'm comfortable with doing this zoning change and also um, just based off of the um, requests I've received from constituents um, regarding commercial development. I think that this um, fills a need that my constituents have expressed to me and it might not be perfect. It might not be exactly what everyone wants, but um, there's a need there. And um, I think that this is um, a good use of the, the land. So um, I'll go ahead and make a motion to approve. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a motion. And just for clarification, this is for item C1. We, we do need item, we, I think we need individual motions per item, and then we also need the city attorney to read the bill introduction. Mm -hmm. So Second. do I need that? Do I have to have you read it now, Carl? Can you wait? Might as well. Um. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That way I don't get too far yeah, ahead. So, Go ahead. Um, ordinance introduction on C3. So this is ordinance introduction, bill number 7264, case number LDC 23-00020, White Lake Parkway Master Plan and Zoning Map Amendments. Ordinance to amend Title 18, Chapter 1802 of the Reno Municipal Code entitled Zoning Rezoning, a plus or minus 218.69 acre site located south and west of White Lake Parkway and Cold Springs, east of White Lake and US Highway 395 from plus or minus 124.32 acres of single family, three units per acre, plus or minus 38.67 acres of neighborhood commercial, plus or minus 24.99 acres of parks, greenways, and open space, and plus or minus 30.71 acres of industrial commercial to 218.69 acres of specific plan district together with matters which pertain to or are necessarily connected there with Ward 4. But, but we're on C1, right? Yes. Okay. So I seconded the motion. Okay. So I have a motion and a second discussion. Anyone for discussion? No? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, Madam Clerk, so I get back to you. A motion on item C2. All right. Councilman Ebert. Um, does anything need to be read or? Nope, just a okay. motion to adopt the resolution. A uh, motion to adopt the resolution. All right, I have a motion. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Opposed. Motion carries. Okay, back to you, Madam Clerk. Item C3, a motion to refer the bill that was read by the city attorney's office. Okay, uh, Councilwoman Niebert. C3. C3. Motion to refer. Just motion to refer. Motion to refer. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, Madam, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Grace. Appreciate you. Okay. Um, Moving Next, on to uh, item C4, which is a bill introduction to be read by the city attorney's office. <coughs> item C4, bill number 7265, case number LDC 24-00033, Plum Lane Properties, ordinance to amend Title 18, Chapter 18.02 of the Reno Municipal Code entitled Zoning, rezoning a plus or minus 0.88 acre site from professional office and single family residential, eight units per acre. To mixed use urban, the site is comprised of four parcels located on the south side of East Plum Lane, plus or minus 685 feet west of the intersection with Kitsky Lane. The site has a master plan land use designation of urban mixed use, Ward one. All right, great. Uh, Madam Clerk, do you have any public comment for us? We do have public comment on this item. Okay, let's do it. Rebecca Flannery via Zoom. Hi, sorry, I, whatever the plumb line thing, I'm going to say that we were not notified if they wanted to notify us, these developers, 
they would have went to our community center and actually like let the community know that there was going to be a full meeting but none of us knew and then the second thing is that i don't understand why they think that we need commercial development if you ask anybody in cold springs literally they will say maybe we need a walmart or a smith's or a grocery store they're not looking to warehouses they're not looking to any of these things to have freaking this whole development that these people are trying to do to us so sorry miss flannery if you have public comment on the last item we need you to make that under the j1 closing item because we've already closed that one out well, so we this needs to be that relevant out because to I raised my hand and nobody actually responded we had already closed we out the public need... comment period how are we closing it out when we weren't done because i listened to these developers that are com completely lied they lied nobody out here knew you cannot look at a yellow sign on a corner when you're trying to drive somewhere and know what they're saying i literally took photos of their signs and you can't even still read it. They're not actually out here actually involving our public and our community. Okay, Madam Mayor, with that, we have no additional public comment on this item, and we're on item C4. Okay, thank you so much. Um, presentation, nice to see you. Thanks for staying so late. <laughs> it's been a long Members day. Members of the council, <laughs> when I started working on my presentation this morning, I said I was practicing good morning, then I was practicing good afternoon. And now it's good night. now it's good night. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff Foster, Associate Planner for the Record, bringing you tonight LDC 2400033, uh, zone change for Plum Lane properties. Uh, the project site is approximately 0 0.88 acres, comprised of four parcels on the south side of East Plum Lane, west of Kitsky, uh, near Little Flower. Uh, the parcels are, two of them have single-family homes and two of them are vacant. The general development pattern in that area is commercial, uh, re uh, retail, offices, restaurants, things like that. Uh, before you tonight is a zoning map amendment request to change from professional office and single family residential eight units per acre to mixed use urban, which would bring the zoning into conformance with the master plan. And no uses or buildings are proposed at this time. Zooming in a little bit closer, the key issue is zoning compatibility. Um, drawing your attention to the surrounding land uses, we have office across Plum to the north, on the east and on the west, and on to the, to the south we have single family residential. For zoning, uh, you can see on the, on the left that three of the parcels are zoned uh, professional office and one of them is single family residential eight. These zoning designations do not conform with the master plan. The proposed change is to mixed use urban, which would be in conformance with the master plan. Um, and saving the time for now, but I can come back later if anyone would like to, to, to look, uh, discuss the other potential zoning options uh, that are essentially not feasible. Uh, diving into the zoning a bit more, um, professional office uh, is essentially designated for uh, office conversions and small office developments. SF8 is of course primarily for single family detach detached residential. Mixed use urban accommodates an integrated mix of higher density residential, commercial, retail, employment, and other service uh, oriented uses. Um, I have a table on the screen here that d discusses the various use types and uses within the table of allowed land uses in Title 18, along with the uh, whether or not those uses would be allowed under the proposed and the existing zoning designations. The master plan land use is urban mixed use, and here are three policies and goals that the uh, proposal lines up with. The development standards are on the screen for the existing zoning as well as the proposed zoning. What's important to note is that um, code contains numerous residential adjacency standards to mitigate for things like light, noise, uh, setbacks, and whatnot. These standards would provide an added level of protection uh, to maintain compatibility with the existing residential to the south. Here are the recommended findings. Uh, and the recommended motion, and uh, noting that the Planning Commission uh, approved this unanimously. Okay, I'm thank you. For questions. 
Thank you so much. Um, I believe, is this Ward 2? Ward 1. Ward 1. Councilman Breckus, go ahead. Yeah, I don't have any questions. Okay, thank you. Anyone else with questions? Councilwoman Taylor. Councilman Martinez. Councilman Reese. No. Okay. Uh, Councilwoman Dewar? Nope. Councilwoman Ebert? No. Okay. Sending it back to you, Councilwoman Breckus. Move to uphold and refer. Okay. I've got a motion. Second. I have a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Next. Well, that item. was the easiest one of the day. We're on item C5, <laughs> an ordinance introduction to be read by the city attorney. Ordinance introduction, bill number 7266, case number LDC 24-00036, 525 East Plum Lane, zone change. Ordinance to amend Title 18, Chapter 18.02 of the Reno Municipal Code entitled Zoning, Rezoning, a plus or minus point 0 0.19 acre site from professional office to general commercial. The single parcel is located north of East Plum Lane, plus or minus 180 feet east of its intersection with Rondell Way, which is at, located at 525 East Plum Lane. The site has a master plan land use designation of suburban mixed use, Ward 3. All right, thank you so much. Um, you want to come right up? Councilman Martinez, would you like a presentation? Um, not if anyone else needs it, I'm ready to motion. Okay, but before you do that, hold on one second. By the way, Brooklyn, nice to see you. Nice it's see you. it's Happy familiar day. face day. Um, everyone that has come before us today has uh, been here many times before, but nice to see you. I wanted to recognize that. All right, um, any other council members? Seeing no questions, Madam Mayor. I'm prepared to make a second. Okay, thank you so much. So Councilman Martinez, give me a motion, and uh, and then I'll get a second. Go ahead. Uh, I move to uphold the recommendation of the Planning Commission and refer the bill for a second reading and adoption. Okay, thank, thank you so much. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. aye. All aye. those opposed? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Great job. Okay, next, Madam Clerk. Item C6, ordinance introduction to be read by the City Attorney's Office. Ordinance introduction, bill number 7267, case number LDC 24-0041. 9590 North Virginia Street Zoning Map Amendment, Ordinance to Amend Title 18, Chapter 18.02 of the Reno Municipal Code, entitled Zoning, Rezoning, a plus or minus two acre site from mixed use suburban to industrial commercial. The single parcel is located on the north side of North Virginia Street, plus or minus 200 feet east of its intersection with Double Back Road, located at 9590 North Virginia Street. The site has a master plan land use designation of industrial, Ward 4. All right, thank you so much. Hi, Leah, come on up. <laughs> uh, okay, <Hello>. word, <laughs> word for, we're going to hand it over to uh, Councilwoman uh, Ebert. Go ahead. Um, hold on one sec. Do you actually have a presentation on this? I do. Yeah, I do. can we see that? Absolutely. Well, Madam Mayor, members of the council, my name is Leah Picotti, and I am an associate planner with Development Services. I know you thought the one that Jeff did was pretty easy. This will be even easier. So this mm. is a request for a zoning map amendment. Site is a two-acre site, and it's located up there on the north end of Virginia near Stead Boulevard. This is the same request you've seen over and over and over. Uh, when we did the master plan, mm -hmm. we did a master plan land use designation of, of industrial all through this area. Yeah. When the zoning converted over, it converted to mixed use suburban, which created a nonconformance. Now we allow applicants to come forward and request to have that change to bring it into conformance. So that's what you see here today. Mixed use suburban to industrial commercial. The whole area is located in an industrial land use designation. You can see those conforming base zoning districts right there. Do not include MS, but they do include IC. Main issue that we looked at here was conformance with the master plan land use designation. The best part about this is that there's no nearby residential. There are existing warehouses all around it, and staff found that it is completely appropriate. 
Here you can see that summary of uses and the development standards. This is the same table you've seen before. If you'd like me to go over it, I can. Or we can just move on to the zoning map amendment recommended findings. Staff can <coughs> review and analyze these. It does conform with state law and it absolutely conforms with the master plan. Planning Commission heard this item on March 20th and made a unanimous recommendation of approval. That concludes my presentation. The recommended motion is on the board, and I'm available for questions. <laughs> Very good, Leah. <laughs> this is an you easy just, one. <laughs> bam. I'm you just you. hit every single point. Good I, job. I, I, no problem. I, I, I think you're doing that in your sleep. I, pretty much. It's been okay. a long day, right? Oh, we yeah. All, but I think you, you <laughs> nailed it. Okay. Councilwoman Ebert. So just... Just to be clear and have it on the record that this is a change to bring this parcel into conformance with the master plan. Correct. Correct. Okay. So just wanted that on the record. Um, does anybody have anything to say? Any oh, go ahead. All right. I'll make a motion to approve. Okay. I have a motion. Second. I have a second. second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right. Good job, Thank Leah. You. Have a good night. You too. Madam Clerk, sending it right back to you. I would just like it to be noted, John Krampotic was very sad that you didn't ask for a presentation. Well, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I feel kind of bad because they come in and they're, you know, it, I'm sure there's got to be a lot of pressure and there's a lot of work that goes into it. And then whenever you don't request someone to bring up that presentation, they've probably worked weeks <laughs> and months and months and months on. They're disappointed. All right. We're moving on to item D1, which is a resolution um, and presentation from our finance team. All right. Hi. Numbers at 8 o'clock at night. I know. Like, <laughs> How are you scary. doing? I'm doing well. You doing okay? All right. I'm very short. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Council Members. Uh, Lindsay Hatfield, Senior Management Analyst with Finance. I'm bringing forward the third quarter augmentation. This covers augmentations and revisions from January 1st through March 31st of this year. This item is in compliance with the council priorities of fiscal sustainability, public safety, arts, parks, and historical resources. Um, this should be a pretty quick one. Generally, and this follows this, the, the general pattern that the third quarter is our smallest augmentation. We're not um, doing any of the procedural things that we do with the first quarter, like carrying forward all those POs, or on the second quarter, um, turning up our fund balance. This is just to kind of capture some grants and reimbursements that have come in and any potential um, FTE changes that we're proposing. Really quickly, um, the general fund, we're proposing appropriations of $3 million. Um, 3.4 million of that, doesn't seem like this is maths, but hold with me. Um, 3.4 million of that are grants and reimbursements, primarily for um, public safety. 2 million of that is for wildland fire reimbursements, and 500 for the um, urban forestry grant that the Parks Department received. <clears throat> also proposing to augment for the $867,000 that we got for the sale of the 4th Street properties. Um, we have received those funds, so this is going to true up the budget for that. Um, then we're also proposing to reduce the budget f by $1.2 million. This is related to the CAD purchase for dispatch. Originally, the E911 board had um, proposed to reimburse us for $1.2 million of this purchase. Now they will be paying that $1.2 million directly. So the city will not be responsible for making that payment and we won't receive the, the revenue reimbursement. So we're just zeroing that out. That's really just a cleanup item. We are proposing one new um, full-time equivalent, one new position in municipal court. This is a grant-funded case manager position. It will last the duration of the grant. It is 100% grant-funded, so there's no impact to the general fund for that. We're also proposing a reorganization of a vacant position um, to add some, some needed help in the general fund for our IT department um, with a network engineer, and then also proposing to move part of a grant funded position for our housing and neighborhood development department over to the general fund so that it's 100% general fund uh, covered. Um, this is no change in FTE. It is eliminating a position, adding another. So um, zero, zero change for that. 
From the room tax fund, we're proposing $100,000 be um, transferred over to the general fund for special event support. In our capital projects fund, our fire department did uh, sell some equipment that they have. So they have auction proceeds of $34,000. They're requesting to augment that so they can spend those funds. Um, and then finally, um, augmenting for from the sewer fund for the asbestos abatement and remodel um, of the 10th floor. This floor is um, solely utilized by utility services. So all of the effort that they perform is for the sewer fund. All right. Good job. I'm here for questions. Okay, I think you did a great job. Thank you. All right, Councilman Breckis, go ahead, three minutes. Yeah, <clears throat> and this is really important stuff, particularly leading into budget. Um, and I'm sorry it's late at night. So we have a medium term obligation on the CAD. Is that now that gonna come off our books? We're gonna keep it as a medium term obligation? It shows as a debt. I don't, I don't think Vicki Van Buren, Director of Finance. It's not a medium term obligation. It's an agreement, agreement. interlocal agreement with the county. So. I thought we had to book it when we bought those CAD. Um, no. Okay. Okay. Now, I also want to bring up, you said that there's no new positions. Other but, than the one for meeting. Yeah. Court. But you did reference that the Chief Innovation Officer position no longer exists, right? That, that is what we're proposing, is to eliminate that position, add a network engineer into IT, so that would be a one-for-one one What happened? Exchange. Well, I understood that we have a third ACM now. We didn't budget for it. We were told there's a third ACM. So where's that ACM pos money position come from? That position was budgeted. Oh, really? We closed out last year's budget with three ACMs? Is that true? Go ahead. Uh, um, Manager Thornley, go ahead. We have... Uh, we have three positions in the same band, and historically one has been identified as a chief of staff, and now they're just identified as three ACMs. Okay, so the charter requires the city manager to file a staffing complement by July 1 of every year, and does the one in place show three ACMs? Yes, it does. Okay. I'd like a copy of that. Was it updated mid-year, or... You, as you made this change and got rid of the innovation officer, does that one? I don't know if that shows on the existing complement or not, um, but I do know that the complement that you asked for shows three ACMs like you asked. Okay. Um, we can agree to disagree, but uh, we were just told there was a third ACM, a new ACM. There were t only two ACMs. I thought we had stopped doing mid-budget position um, hirings, because if we're asked to come rectify something during an augmentation and it's already been done, someone's been offered a job, then we're just doing catch up. And I thought we were going to stop that. Now, on page six, fire salaries, there's a large augmentation there, I think. Um, fire 1.3 million coming in, page six of your, what you're sending down to the state? Yes. Those are reimbursements for the wildland. Are those the reimbursements? Mm -hmm. Okay, changes. So what about the 1.0 we're adding? What, what is that? For in the service and supplies? Mm -hmm. Those are um, the rest of those grants and reimbursements that, okay. that FIRE has okay. received. Okay, so all of that is the 2.5 is that. Okay, because I thought we already augmented for FIRE salaries. Now, okay, Councilman Breckis, I'm oh, going to okay. ask if there's any yeah. other questions. Go ahead, Councilwoman uh, Taylor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you for the presentation. I have two quick questions, and I don't know. Um, it might be something for a later time or as we get into budget more. But with the sale of the properties, that goes into some sort of revitalization. Do you know what that looks like moving forward and um, where that bucket of money, what, what will happen with it? Um, it's It lives in the general fund um, under economic development, so it'll be used for economic development efforts. Okay, have we decided what those economic development efforts are? Okay, so I guess a, a comment or maybe a request is that we take a look at what that money is used for in future. Um, and then the other question I had was on um, 
the activation, there was a little bit of funding that was moved into the activation space. And again, this is probably a larger, larger conversation, but it's just here right now. Um, I'm interested in an overall activation budget because I see some in the locomotion um, agenda item and seen some in this. So at some point, a, a complete activation budget would be helpful to me. Thank you. Good comments. Okay. Um, Councilman Martinez or Councilman Reese? No, ma'am. Okay. Councilwoman Dewar? No, thanks. All right. Councilwoman Ebert? No? Okay. Back to you. Councilwoman Breckus, go thank, ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so on page three, the $878,000 for sales of general fixed asset, what, were, what did we sell with that? Um, that is primarily the 4th Street properties. The, the majority of that, the 867. Oh, okay. I didn't realize yeah. we were still booking those. Okay. And then you said 1.037 out of the sewer fund to reduce City Hall? Yes. That was from item B12. Okay. You know, earlier the mayor made a comment about I'm mad at Plenium. And Plenium, as I recall, are, is our contractor for the Public Safety Center. Correct? Mm -hmm. and, and have we added any money in this augmentation to the Public Safety Center in any facet? No. Okay. What is the Public Safety Center budget at right now? Where um, can one track that down? I don't have that on hand, but we can Okay. It's not me. on the augmentation. No. It's okay. not being touched. Well, you know, and everyone knows, I know, I haven't been able to meet with our finance director quarterly like I did for 10 years because of an embargo from Mr. Um, manager. So I'm really having the hardest time doing my job on the finances. And I'm very worried. Very, very worried. And um, when I, especially when I hear the mayor say things about Plenium and our contractor, and I understand we're in litigation, maybe with them. And we are. I was, we're not oh, in litigation oh, okay. with them. Okay. okay. We're in contract and with the them. Okay. And I have my own reasonings, and that's okay. based on... Okay. Well, let me say also is I was going through in preparation for this meeting some old agendas, and we used to have the accounts payable as an item on the agenda. And every meeting, we got multiple spreadsheets on every, every dollar that went out of the door here. Okay? And I always felt very up-to-date on where the money was going, and that helped me do these items. So that's why it's relevant. Then the council decided to not put those on the agenda. We would just get them regularly and ask if we have any questions. I haven't seen an accounts payable spreadsheet in months, okay? So I don't know where they are. I think we do I have, when she I think we do have an work, ordinance no? that talks about letting the council see the accounts payable. And I just want to express that it's very hard to read these augmentations, not meeting with the finance director, but most of all, not following through with the practice of having the accounts payable given to the council on a regular basis. And, you know, this is the stuff that's most important for us to be the final check on the dollars. And I think a lot is slipping here. Um, and so I just, I just want to let that know, people know, when I came on in 2012, the city was in bad shape. And every single city, per, city council member said, I never read the CAFR. I never read the notes that the auditor said about this deficiency, that deficiency, that deficiency. I see the same landscape if the council's going months and months without seeing the accounts payable, which build up into these. So that's, that's that. But I am really troubled by a million dollars out of the sewer fund into this building. Councilman Breckus, okay. Thank you. And I won't augment for that. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, and the only thing is, I would just say, if there's any information you need, um, I'm sure that you can get it via email through Vicki, whatever you need on any questions you no, have. No, I want to meet with Vicki quarterly. Well, but it would, you could, I always write down an email as questions. I like to see it in writing. So sometimes if you need information, it might be another yeah. good way to get it. I need it. to go have a back and forth on every page on these augmentations. I need to meet I'm with her quarterly. There might be a way to get some answers if you wanted them. We're, we're not doing the job here if we're not um, seeing I, accounts I'm glad you mentioned the CAFR because um, we were required to read it, and it really got us up to speed, and that's one of the reasons we've been so fiscally responsible for the last uh, 10 years, um, quite honestly. So 
I think, uh, you know, we've really been, um, we've really been aware of what our finances are. So thank you. Is there anything you want to include, Vicki? Nothing? Okay. All right. Go ahead. Councilwoman Taylor. Anything? No, I was just going to say for those of us that were here at the first budget hearing that we had, it was very informative, and I thought we were doing a great job when we all showed up for that, except for some of us. Thanks. Okay, good. Thanks. All right. Anyone else? Seeing there are none, uh, Vice yeah. Mayor, go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to make a motion to... Uh, or to approve the resolution to augment the budget. Thank you. I have a motion. Second. I have a second. All those in favor say aye. Yeah, Madam Mayor. Aye. I, I'm a no okay. on one, the backup, which should be the accounts payable that I haven't, I haven't seen this quarter. I don't think they've come the full quarter. And I am a no of 1.37 from the sewer fund that's being tapped by the need to finish up the Stead property, has a lot of collection needs, has the Tub Wharf general plan, and we just did a lot, a lot of money out on it for the, um, the affordable housing. So I'm really nervous about the sewer fund, which is on a cost of living increase to our rate player, payers. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. All right, uh, you gave me a motion, I have a I second. Did. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion aye. carries. Okay, thank you. Uh, Madam Clerk, back to you. Thanks, Madam Mayor. We're on item D2, presentation discussion and potential approval for the Locomotion Plaza. Mr. McArdle, how are you? It's been a long day. <laughs> and you're smiling. <laughs> Hi, it's me. No problem. It's me. <laughs> You're not frowning. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> oh, before you do that, hold on. Madam Clerk, do you have any public comment on this item? Madam Mayor, I do not have any public comment on item D2. Okay, go uh, ahead. Take it away, Mr. Ricardo. All right, thank you. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor and Council Members. Uh, Brian McCarro, Revitalization Manager for the City of Reno. Uh, we are here to discuss the next step in our placemaking efforts, uh, following up on the GEAL placemaking study and uh, what we're going to do to bring Virginia Street and Locomotion Plaza back to life. Okay. How it aligns with our strategic plan. Uh, infrastructure uh, is one. Bringing arts, entertainment, culture, vibrancy to our parks and plaza is definitely one. And then, as it's listed, bringing more vibrancy and life into our downtown as it relates to redevelopment and economic development. Just a little history lesson on how we got here today. Uh, in March 2023, uh, in the list of ARPA-funded projects, uh, Council uh, allocated $2 million towards the placemaking efforts. We didn't at that time have the GEAL placemaking study done yet, but we knew it was uh, forthcoming. And so $2 million was put aside to uh, deploy to, towards those recommendations that came out of that, that placemaking study. The following month in April 2023, uh, we did receive that GIL placemaking study. They had implementation plan laid out in there and priority number one was to focus on Locomotion Plaza and the streetscape along Virginia Street. Uh, and in July 2023, a uh, portion of that budget went towards engaging a designer to go ahead and start designing uh, how Locomotion Plaza would look like uh, and the improvements along Virginia Street. We have the designer here, Cynthia Albright, who can answer some questions uh, if you have them after the presentation. And what we're here to do today is discuss primarily phase one and more importantly, stage one. Uh, we, do not have enough, we do not have enough ARPA funds available to do everything proposed. Uh, so we're gonna take it up in chunks with the, with the ARPA funds that we have available. Um, so that's what we're gonna discuss today. Uh, phase two primarily is more streetscape improvements and micromobility and to start the design, uh, future design of Pl Believe Plaza. And then phase three, as it was recommended in that Kill Placemaking study, is to construct a, a new Believe Plaza. But today we're just focusing on, on phase one, stage one, with the funds available. And so just to reiterate, what we're discussing today is to approve the design that we received. Uh, that highlights Locomotion Plaza and the streetscape, authorized the remaining funds of 1,635,000 from those ARPA funds to start 
the process of improving it, and then allow staff to move forward with contracts, services agreements, because as we know, we're on a specific timeline with these ARPA funds to be deployed by December. And so to not hold up this process any longer, any further, um, to go ahead and to start putting those things into place. What we won't be discussing today is uh, identifying any future funding sources to get that full suite, the future stages and the future phases done. And so today uh, is where we're introducing this. By December, we have to have all the contracts laid out uh, for the ARPA funding. If approved today, uh, completion of Locomotion Plaza will be done uh, spring of 2025, just in time to host events throughout the summer in that plaza. And then we plan to do activation and events uh, with this budget over the next two summers through 2026. And at the end of 2026, that, that ARPA funding ends. Um, and by that time, we've, we should have really brought Locomotion Plaza back to life. And so why do this now? You know, one thing that came out of the, the placemaking study is that downtown necessarily isn't very unsafe. It's that people feel unsafe. And they feel unsafe uh, due to lack of activity, lack of other people around. Uh, and essentially just the uh, inactivity in the street. And so what we really need to do is give people a reason to come back downtown. Uh, it's not that they don't want to come, it's why would they come? Give us a reason to come. And so this provides an opportunity for people to gather in a public space. It addresses comfort in the fact that one thing we heard is that in all of our plazas, um, the physical environment, the, the, the sun and the shade is one of the reasons why we can't use these spaces in the heat of summer. Uh, so, provide, so handling for shade and providing some seating elements uh, make it more comfortable for people to gather. And then bringing it back, once we have the place uh, set up, bringing liveliness to it through events and activities. And this is actually, these are pictures uh, that have been done on Locomotion Plaza in the past through special events. That Gill study, we met with a lot of people, I believe 2,700 responses. We met with stakeholder groups downtown. We did interviews, uh, ran through micromobility models. That placemaking effort was a, a massive outreach strategy. We really heard from everyone on that, which informed <laughs> our, our uh, decisions on this. 90% of people said that downtown is really important. They do care about downtown. And 70% said that Virginia Street lacks a reason to go, and that's what we're trying to solve here. And so from, if you remember from the placemaking study, this was the contemporary design that, uh, that Giel had given us. Uh, it covers a, a few things that were addressed. Lighting on the site is one. Uh, currently, the electrical infrastructure on Locomotion Plaza does not allow um, the lighting. If someone goes to try to do a special event, plug something in, the breakers pop, so that has been a challenge. Um, so we want to bring lighting to the site. Shade has always been something that has uh, been deemed necessary. Uh, movable chairs, movable seating, an opportunity for bikes, food to bring food trucks on sites. And of course, what every downtown needs is a roller skater right there. And so Nathan Oliat with uh, our parks managers decided he will volunteer to be that uh, token roller skater downtown. So. This is the, uh, we're getting into the full design of, um, of Locomotion Plaza. This is how it could look. Uh, this has permanent shade, shale, permanent shade um, structures uh, that are set up. These are, these are um, found, they're heavy steel structures. They're in the foundation there. And they'll provide year round share, shade. Uh, T-Mobile Plaza in Las Vegas just did something very similar. It's really nice, they light up at night. But it still allows us to do special events on site and um, bring some movable chairs and movable seating. And so as we look at the site, just want to break it out what we're looking at here is as we focus on the Virginia Street side, you have those shade structures, you have movable furniture, you have shipping containers that not only provide for um, bar access to do refreshments, but could be used for storage for the, for the movable furniture, as well as uh, retail, potential retail locations. Um, towards the back half uh, on that, you have more food trucks, you have food truck pads, 
an additional seating back there. So from Virginia Street all the way to Sierra, uh, that is how this, this has been designed. Another component of the placemaking study was to uh, get a concept for streetscape furnishings. And so we have that, and we'll, we'll show that here in a second. That is, uh, this is the design that has come up. It fits with the aesthetic of, of Locomotion Plaza. It gives people places to sit, um, provides trees where trees can be planted, and um, allows, I think those are metal, metal planters, and then some are concrete as well. And so that could be a future uh, element to add towards this. Did I lose my clicker? Getting back in the budget that we have to work with today, it is stage one, which is we've already paid for the design. The remaining funds of $1,635,000 1, will go to specific elements, um, primarily the movable furniture, temporary umbrellas, and uh, the shipping containers. Phase two is those permanent shade structures. Those come in at $3,500,000. And then last, stage three is, uh, is some additional furnishings as well as creating like a selfie area on Virginia Street for them, for people to take photos in front of the Reno Arch. What hasn't been decided is uh, events and activation and maintenance budgets past the end of the ARPA funding. So breaking this out, the area in pink is, is phase one, stage one, where you'll get all the movable furniture, temporary shade umbrellas, You'll get the shimming containers, lighting elements, uh, fixing the electrical, things like that. Stage two is those shade structures that we identified. And stage three would be the locomotion entrance area. And that's how it's breaking up stage one, stage two, stage three. And so as I mentioned, first thing is electrical and lighting improvements to make the plaza usable again. Uh, doing umbrellas for shade. These are uh, industrial umbrellas. And so we know that, that the area through that locomotion plaza can be a wind tunnel at times. These are heavy industrial shade structures uh, that will be used in place of before we get those, those metal shade elements. Storage containers for beverage service as well as storage for the movable furniture and retail components. And then unfortunately, Due to the heavy use that this plaza is to receive, we cannot pressure wash a clean locomotion plaza with that mural on it right now. And so we're gonna have to go in and, and clean up that mural, reseal the concrete um, and start fresh. And that will allow us to keep it clean going forward. Fixing the gates and fences and then adding uh, opportunities to put those ship containers in those food truck pads. Part of this budget, we have activation planned, um, which is quite exciting to see. It's pretty much gonna be weekly and monthly throughout the summer from June to September. Uh, Rachel McIntyre, our activation coordinator, has been working hard working with Offbeat Music Festival to bring a summer concert series every other Thursday through June to September. Um, some of those bands have already been selected. Uh, we have a food, weekly food truck event, either on a Friday, uh, Saturday or Sunday throughout the summer. And then theaters in the park, which is almost like a movies in the park that we, we piloted last, last October. And that will be the first Friday of every month. And so part of this budget goes towards not only creating a space, but activating the space. We don't want to build a space without any plan to maintain it. And so there is a budget in here to handle weekly cleaning, trash removal, pressure washing, keeping the place clean through December 2026. Uh, because this will likely have a peak season and off season, those, those needs on around maintenance are adjusted to, to recognize that. Breaking out this entire budget uh, between the electrical improvements, the umbrellas, the shipping containers, the movable, movable furniture, the site improvements, uh, with a bit of contingency, that is how we get to that 1,635,000. In the future, uh, when funding is identified, we will go ahead and get going on these uh, permanent shade improvements. And then stage three is creating a selfie spot along Virginia Street. This could either be used with pavers, 
concrete etching, but part of that will be a selfie spot in the O of locomotion where people can safely take a picture uh, of the Reno arch. Working with our arts team to do artistic vents around the retrack vents towards the back end of the plaza. And then additional uh, furnishings, furnitures and furnishings for that food truck pad in the back. Those have a cost of an additional $4 million that we have not identified where that will come from yet. What this does and do, does not include, uh, it gets us activation through 2026. The plan is, is that once we can pilot some activations, show people how the how this space can be used, private event promoters will want to naturally use this space themselves uh, once, once it's shown it can be done. And then some of those current challenges we have are taken care of. And so that is the budget we're, we're looking at today. Yep. Yep. Are you, um, okay, are you finished? I am finished. Okay, great, good job. Really appreciate it. You had some slides in there just to clarify. I'm, I'm just curious uh, with designs, are, is that what the design is supposed to look like? Are they going to look like that? Yeah. Like that? Yes. And, how do, and where do we come up with those types of designs? That is what Cynthia Albright worked in her design. So if you have questions specifically around that, I can ask her to come up. Okay. Yeah. No. Okay. I just wonder what makes something look attractive, um, you know, where you come up with that, because it's super subjective. It's very artistic, but it's also very subjective. Um, so I just wonder, and it has a lot of holes in it. I mean, I guess is the purpose that it will be shade? Is that what that main purpose is? Yes. And it's got a lot of holes in it. So I don't necessarily know if that's shade. Do, have they used that same structure in another city? Do you know? Cynthia, come on up. Come on up. Good evening. For the record, Cynthia Albright. Well, to answer your question, Mayor Sheevy, um, we came up with this design because we think it's beautiful and it's interesting, and we came up with something that we wanted people to be attracted to the space to. It was that we had several different options for shade that we presented to staff, so we had a full covered one. We had an artistic element, and it was kind of universally decided amongst the team, including city staff, that it was an artistic element that we wanted to proceed with. Um, this is actually the least expensive option. And the idea being is that if we were to create a Cortan steel structures with shade on Locomotion Plaza, we could, we could um, copy that element only at half scale in Virginia Street so that we could continue that element in places along Virginia Street with shade that we cannot install trees on. And then we could, we're trying to also use the same kind of look and feel with Believe because Believe is a metal structure that has cutting etchings out of it. So that was something that we built on too. The idea here was to not create a fully shaded area, but to provide an area that has a design element that makes it interesting and attractive, and then utilize furniture for the purposes of creating spaces for people to gather. And this is on Locomotion? This is for Locomotion Plaza, for stage two, yes. Okay. Um, I worry a little bit because it, it hasn't been used in other cities. How much does that cost? Well, um, whoops. Because sometimes we think it looks really great, but then the functionality of the de design side, if it's not something that has been typically used before, mm -hmm. um, you know, over in cities, you know, so you might not know, um, you know, I, I really want to see shade, and we've heard shade, 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 mm -hmm. but that concerns me just with some of the holes and and I guess what it sounds like with you did it with staff and anyone else well no yes we 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 certainly have a design team and I can tell you that go ahead our, our design concept that we created it turns out when I talked to someone in town, Paolo, um, at Tutoferro, he actually came up with a design that's somewhat similar to this that the city of Sparks did install on Victorian Avenue. If you've been down Victorian Avenue, they have 11 structures that, they don't look anywhere near as nice as this, but they look 
very similar to this, and they cost a great deal of money, mm -hmm. much more money than what these cost. Yeah. And the cost estimate that Paolo gave for that specific project was just as much as what we're proposing, and then the contractor okay. did a different design than what was proposed. So I feel confident in the pricing, and I feel confident that it can be built, and there's certainly like Mm -hmm. Brian had mentioned there's something somewhat yeah. similar in the city of Las Vegas at the Wind Park. Um, okay, so first of all, I want to just say this is super important for me because we've talked about revitalizing downtown forever and ever and ever, and it has not happened. This is the first time that we actually get to have significant investment. Um, Cynthia, I think you are beyond talented. I love a lot of the conceptual ideas and designs. It looks amazing, um, and I want to be excited and supportive. Um, I would just ask, because I don't want to, I know it's late and I don't want to suck up anyone's time. I actually would ask that we bring back some of the design concepts and have um, people weigh in. Because here's what I think people forget, and this is really important. Um, think about this. When, that, when you go out there and do something like that, I can't begin to tell you how everyone thinks that we have approved it. We are the ones that are responsible for designing it. We wear it. The council ends up wearing it. So I don't I want to make sure that we have input. If I'm gonna wear something, I wanna make sure the reasons why I say yes. I I you know, I was responsible for doing that. Um, because we've seen before where, you know, it might not be something that the majority of the people, um, it's subjective. Sure. Right? I'm so, I'm so, I, I completely agree. I can't believe, it. I can't tell you how many times people say, oh my God, how dare you? You you did this and this. We had nothing to do with it. It was, it was the Public Art uh, Commission and all of that. And so uh, I just think that this, to me, I would like to have more input and it would come through a little bit more for council to say, okay. Um, and we've seen this before. I know uh, Bob Cashel actually did it several times. I've tried to never stop a, a, a process in that sense, but um, I just want to be a little bit more sensitive when it comes to the design. If it's not something in another city is used, and um, and also we're talking about shade, but I'm seeing a lot of holes in shade here, so I, I'm a little concerned. So that's just where I'm coming let, from. Let me clarify then for you. Okay. Um, first of all, this particular action for tonight isn't necessarily to approve this design. Oh, okay. I think what it is, first of all, it's to approve the stage one, which includes heavy-duty industrial shade umbrellas okay. for purposes of providing shade now in stage one. Okay, that was the white ones. Yes, there's there's uh, seven... And I've seen those them. used in cities. Yes, so those they are work. Fine. And these yes. have been used in cities, too. Oh, I can okay. tell you that. But... To get back to the point is, is that stage one includes umbrellas for purposes of shade, and then stage two includes a budget of $3.5 million for a long-term permanent shade solution. It doesn't have to look like this because we can come, we've come up with another option that's okay, great, same budget. Yeah. I mean, the point being is that if you want to have more of an input into the design alternatives for the permanent shade solution, mm -hmm. we're certainly happy to talk about yeah. that with you when we get there. Yeah. But we have to find the funding first. Yeah. But the idea being is that what we would like to do for purposes of tying Virginia Street and tying the river all together into one cohesive unit would be to come up with a design solution for shade that works for everything. Sure. Yeah. So. A good, great points. Thank no, you. I appreciate it. I'm sensitive because quite honestly, we got ran over in Midtown. We really did, uh, it, you know, I, on so many different levels. Um, so I'm super sensitive about it. Uh, so, because we, you know, we wear it today, but I really, really appreciate your clarity and um, it, it makes a lot of sense. It looks incredible. Like, I'm super excited. But I am also gun shy from, um, from Midtown. So there was one more thing, Brian, I wanted to ask you about this. Oh, I know the other thing that we yes. experienced in Midtown, and I think you'll understand this. We didn't have any money at all. Everything was organic. And the reason why Midtown was successful is because we, we activated it started out with the first art walk, and people came out. Do you remember they were falling off the sidewalks because the sidewalks were in such bad condition? Remember that? And it was awful. Those were not wide sidewalks. <laughs> no. But my point was, like, we really built a sense of community out of very organic activation. Um, and so what I've seen, we're doing it opposite now, right, where we're like, yeah, let's invest money in it. Let's do that. 
Um, so I just want to say, and I'm just going to reiterate, and I know you know this because we've had this conversation, yeah. the activation is going to be so critical because otherwise you're doing all this and it looks really fancy, but there's nothing for anyone to come down to enjoy and actually be a part of and um, like, you know, an event or whatever we're doing, a concert, whatever those things are. But just keep that in mind because we're doing this completely backwards and how Midtown was successful. If, if the investments into Locomotion Plaza aren't made to make this place a great place to organically activate, once our proactive activation starts, it kind of dies off. Yeah. And so we need to make this plaza usable so that when we taper off and people start to naturally <laughs> activate, uh, it's, it take, takes care of itself. Okay. And so providing shade, providing opportunities to linger and sit, uh, and then giving the opportunity to remove all those things to host a big special event is really important. Yeah, awesome. So, okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. All right, Councilman Dewar, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks. Thanks for tremendous amount of work, right? I've seen this several times, all different iterations, but this is like coming in for landing. Um, so I just really appreciate the team's work on this. Um, there are a few points that I want to ask questions about. So I quickly wrote down, so it looks like $10 million to do the whole deal. So what I'm wondering about, we have less than $2 million, 1 1.6, and I was unclear what we get for that. Could you just go over that again? Yep. I'll go back to that. <coughs> Is there like a bullet list of what we get for the yes. one? Yes. Okay. So this is stage one. So I'll go back. So the next, the blue uh, highlight on top is what is what we're getting. Yeah. Um, primarily, it starts with electrical and lighting improvements. Yep. I, I got that. Let me just yep. look at it really quick, and I only have a few questions. The um, umbrellas for shade. So I saw white tents. They didn't look like umbrellas. Is that the umbrella? Or is no, there we were, that, that picture was uh, giving an example that... Oh. Um, these for special events, vendors can still put up. Their so where where are underneath. these umbrellas? Let me see if we have a, a slide with those. Um, lower left, there is one of those umbrellas. Okay, so an umbrella, but it's made of metal, or yeah, I believe they have heavy concrete bases. Ah, thank you. Yeah. You can have we, a. Can I go on? Up there? Can we pull the projector out? There you go. It's up here. Um, so, okay, the, they're square umbrellas, right? Mm -hmm. Rectangular. Recta rectangular. Okay, yes. I have there's, some. There's another style back here. They're small that could be moved around more organically. Okay. Well, as long as there's shade, that's good. Um, if you could go back to the page you were discussing with Mayor Sheevy, um, I had the same exact response. I love the design, but worried that I, I felt it needed uh, about twice as much metal to create twice as much shade. So it could still have holes, I get it, like not solid shade. But I think, I agree with Mayor Shiba, I think we need more shade. Um, and I was going to say that, wow, this looks like the Sparks umbrellas, because I've been down there, but they sort of go up. And could you bring up the umbrellas again? Um, the Sparks umbrellas kind of go up, and I think they're colors. Turquoise. They're turquoise. Well, there are some color. No, all the same. What's that? All the same. What is it? Baby blue. For the record, Cynthia Albright. They're like a seafoam green blue. Yeah, okay. Well, I just remembered it was a color. Um, and I think this is, I think your concept is very cool to tie into the Believe and ha that holy structure. So I think that's cool. But even on Believe, has a lot more metal than holes, bottom line. Okay, I wanted to know, when you showed this picture, there's no mural there. So really, the vision, you want to keep the mural, is what I heard. No. Uh, you said repaint to, and put shellac. And no, in order, in order to make this play, in order to make the plaza um, high use and to be able to pressure wash it and clean it, uh, the mural has to come off. And oh, we have okay. To reseal the so it would go site. to concrete like this. It would. Okay, just wanted to make sure that I was grasping. Un unfortunately, we all back. love the mural. No, he's Murals, saying no mural. We wouldn't put the mural back. No, we would not put the mural back. We do okay. not have the budget to do that. Okay, thank you. Um, unfortunately, we love those murals. When, you're, okay. when you place a mural on the ground like it's that. It's okay. I'm very short on time. It's so hard to maintain, right? I just wanted to make sure. I wanted to just make a comment. So when we did the mural, maybe it was meant to just be a two-year project. I don't know. But um, a lot of times we'll do something that's an interim. And the mural is a good example. Uh, the arch, we, we didn't do the full lighting that we would have liked to, if you guys remember the lighting plan for the arch. We did something less than, and now we're having to write, Mayor, go back and up, 
upgrade all the lighting again. Yeah. And what I get worried about is my experience working for government for over 30 years is that you really only get one chance and you got to do it right. Yeah. Uh, I used to have arguments with some of my staff. Uh, should we buy the $300 table because it's cheaper? Or should we buy the 800 table, which back then probably would be like equivalent to a $3,000 table today. But we knew it was going to last for 20 years. And so I was always one that wanted to make the investment to last because I figured I'd never see that money again. I better make sure it's going to you know, work for long term. So my thought is just as we're doing this project, I, I would love us to make sure the investment is good, solid stuff. It's going to last for a while. It's not just, well, we'll have a temporary trunk storage stage, whatever. But that wasn't really the real one because we didn't have enough money. So we're going to do a substandard one and come back later, but it's very hard to come back later, right? That's another 10, 15, 20 years out. So I just want to make sure whatever we build is really solid and really good. Um, and I just, I just, you know, the final thing was food truck pads. I mean, do you have to reinforce the locomotion plaza to withstand the weight of the trucks or what is that? Is that? Yeah, there's it's just an for, area. For the record, Cynthia Albright, yeah. no, we're not doing anything to the plaza itself. We're just designating those areas. Oh, just here we have food trucks. Correct. There we have, like paint. Absolutely. Well, oh, not gotcha. even paint. As much as we've moved things off of the plaza that were originally programmed for the purposes of having more food truck places available at all times. I got you. So we don't need to reinforce anything to Nothing. get trucks onto the Correct. lid. That's exactly right. And gotcha. just for the record, it's... I mean, it's really difficult to plan for amenitizing this place when you can't anchor anything on it. You cannot? That's no, what my question is. No, everything has to be yeah. anchored, structurally anchored off plaza. So yeah. things that you would normally want to do, like if you were going to look at Glow Plaza, for example, yeah. things that they can do there, we can't do here. Because they're in solid ground. Because they're on solid ground. Okay. And so we've... We've worked collaboratively for quite a while to come up with okay. all of these amenities that we know that we can structurally yeah. reinforce off plaza. And okay. last comment is just, I wish, 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 I, I'm so sorry that we can't do more. I mean, I feel like I thought we were going to come back with like a two and a half million dollar budget, not a $1.6 million budget, that we would be able to do the furniture and some shade. Uh, apparently not, but... Well, I think, we I, think, I think the large four, 14 by 20 foot umbrellas are a really great Huge. interim shade solution. Yeah. That we can then move those to another location yeah. when we get the Makes money sense. in order to build them permanently. Okay. But we've offset that with a lot of really great, colorful, sturdy, durable, interesting, and innovative furniture mm -hmm. that you don't see on any public plaza in any city space. Wow. Not and glow, maybe the not white sparks. tents could, or umbrellas maybe could be a bright color. I, I want to ask you, because I noticed this, the sitting structures that you mm -hmm. just referenced. Mm -hmm. why, why is that? What, why are those something that, what, what is so rare about them? Um, well, they're, they're, Durable HDP, HDPE materials, they're durable, they're colorful. So we're utilizing color on the plaza with the furnishings in lieu of removing the mural, which was colorful. So we've started this design not knowing that. Is it the mural. round one you were talking about when it has the... Oh, we're just talking about we have chase lounges, we have benches oh, and tables, okay. we okay. have Bravo bistro tables and chairs. Okay. We have lots of interesting, fun furniture that you don't see on any other public plaza in Reno. Okay, cool. Today. All right, got, gotcha. Thank you. Um, okay, any other council members? Go ahead, Councilwoman uh, Ebert. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Go right ahead. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, she's having a little temper tantrum. I am. I'm having a temper tantrum over <laughs> here because I'm so Go excited ahead. about this. Um, so, so first of all, I guess I have high-level comments on this stuff. We are not looking at these shade holy things. They're $3.5 million that we don't have, that we haven't identified for a stage that we don't know the timing on yet, right? Correct? Okay. So um, my, my questions or my comments are, it took us approximately a year to get to this detailed budget, right? Is that accurate? About a year, we uh, the funds were allocated in March. We went through the process. It took us a year to get to this very detailed budget that we have confidence in. And I'm just trying to think about other projects that we looked at today, where you know we're not at that level yet. Um, my my question is, long term, 
how does this become sustainable? And it might go back to one of the questions I asked of Mr. McArdle in our last item of these revitalization funds. How do we look to the future? What are the recommendations or what are we looking for as far as solutions and how, you know, we have activation for a year in here or two years or once the ARPA money is gone, there is no more activation money. We have to plan for it. So how do we start thinking now for the future so all the work that we put in doesn't just go away? You know, we are, that's a big Brian McArdle, uh, revitalization manager. Um, we have an activation budget beyond what is in just this locomotion ARPA budget. Uh, and so there will be additional funds to continue to program this, just not at the frequency designated and identified in the ARPA funding. And so we'll continue to, to activate that plaza as well as the three other pri priority plazas, Believe, Westry Plaza, and Locomotion. Um, Beyond the, the funding and keeping this going, we will have redevelopment funds in the next few years that we Say can that do more improvement projects. <laughs> yeah. Um, that you don't know how much that like is. That's a long term it, strategy yes. where we're planning for the future with stuff, right? Yes. Yes. We will have additional funds in the future to do more streetscape improvements, uh, infrastructure, things like that. We just don't know how much and when at the moment, but we'll get there. Uh, and so as long as we have plans like this that we can execute on, uh, when the money becomes available, that's what's really important. Okay, and the other thing I wanted to really commend you on and the whole team, and it's not sexy, it's not pretty, is the maintenance part of it. And that is something that we really need to look at moving forward because if we can't maintain it, again, going back to other things that we heard today, it's it's going to fall to the wayside and it's an asset that we're going to, we're investing in now. So I want to make sure it's something that we keep doing in the future. So thank you very much for the work yeah. on this. I know it was a long year and... Uh, I got to give a shout out to Amy Pennington who's worked very, very hard on the entire placemaking project. Um, she's done a fantastic job. She has. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, anyone else on Zoom that I can't hear? Madam Mayor. Go ahead. Thank you so much. First of all, I appreciate um, Ms. Albright's presentation very much. Uh, I'll say uh, for my part, and this has maybe explained some of the differences, uh, Madam Mayor, between men and women. When the team came to me and started to ask me all sorts of questions about which shade structure or which bench I was interested in, I I really was somewhat uh, gobsmacked because I, I have no ability to choose one of those two things, right? Um, I, I just see the budget line item and, and believe that there are better persons like Ms. Albright to help me figure out what would go there. I, for my part, am not going to pick between which color of shade structure versus another, because it's just not my skill set. I will say that when I travel and I see different places with different things, I'm often interested in what they're doing. And I don't always like it, uh, but I'm interested in the variety that I see out in the universe. Um, these shade structures, I think, and I just tried to do a Google search on it, uh, are used in various places all over the world. Um, and they're, I think they're, they have that dappled look because you know trees don't let light in you know fully they're they're, they're sort of holy as well um, and the ones in sparks are quite attractive I've, I've walked over there and under them and and i don't know how cool it is to hang out under them uh, but they seem nice in the end i i sort of find myself agreeing too with the comments made by councilmember taylor in as much as um you know i i I know that we have big aspirational goals for these spaces. I'm hopeful that we can take sort of bite-sized approaches to each of the plazas that we have and, and try to dedicate the resources we have, knowing that we don't have the full $10 million today. Um, but I am interested in getting moving because it's sort of a chicken or the egg thing. If we don't do something with the plaza, we cannot get the activation that we're seeking down there. Uh, and then you won't have a critical mass for you know maybe doing the next phase. Um, I, I think it was cool today when uh, former council member Jarden talked about activating that space with roller skaters. And I think Ms. Uh, Ebert has um, some roller derby 
folks who are very interested in, in her uh, ward. And I would love to see that happening in this space too, or pickleball, right? I mean, there's all sorts of things, but I, I continue to believe that our staff are working very hard. Ms. Pennington and Ms. Ricardo, I, I know that these are uh, thoughtful processes you've engaged in. And, you know, I've known Ms. Albright for probably 25 years. I, I, I trust all of them implicitly with helping us cast a vision for this space. So I'll hope to uh, be able to support additional actions in the future. Okay. Go ahead. Councilman Eber. Okay. Thank you. It's getting late, man. Um, I want to say thank you for the presentation. I know it's a lot of work and thanks for staying here so late. Um, I do want to say um, the shade structures look cool, but if, you know, I do want to give input on it. I would prefer that they be more solid, that we have actual shade. Um, Reno gets hot. We're one of the you know fastest rising temperatures in the country for global well, climate change. I think that you know, make sure that we get some more city council input on what the actual finished project will be. Um, I know also that we don't have all the budget worked out yet, but maybe this is a project that we could have, like I mentioned earlier, like um, kind of a contingency plan if we don't end up using our ARPA funds um, for other projects in time, maybe we can divert them to this project to get shade structures that are maybe more expensive, but maybe provide better shade as well um, to just kind of maybe put that out there. So, mm -hmm. oh, also I wanted to say that um, Nathan, I will take turns with you being the roller skater down there. We got two. You got two yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? No. Okay. I will say we're we're not approving the budget for those shade structures, yeah. and so when we bring that back, we can have a discussion on the yeah. type and form. I and guess shape I want to be clear those. on what a what we're approving. I think b what I've seen many many times here, and I think um, Councilwoman Ebert doesn't know this because she's still uh, what are you a year in now? Um, I think you make a great point because we have to allocate if we want to actually accomplish the whole vision of what we want to get done to where we're going to make that a priority because otherwise it just doesn't happen. So I'd love to be able to identify that so we really can do everything we want and not just like piecemeal it because I've seen that done many, many times. I saw it done with the arch and here we are now going, ugh, we, we should have invested the money. So I'd love to see that. The other thing is I want to figure out how you have these stages. Some of the things I think, and, and maybe that's not with everyone else, but I'm going to be pretty vocal here, that are more important. One of them is getting every city in America has it. Reno does not have it um, for, for some reason. Um, but it's the lighting that goes over the streets. Um, and it can create a, a really good uh, sort of placemaking environment. And it's also really good for, for safety. The reason now, you know, I, I hear all the reasons why we can't do it, and that's because of the electricity. But I think, did I see that in like stage three? So I'm curious how we get something like that in stage one, because I think the lighting is super critical downtown, especially for safety reasons and the ambiance. And then the other thing is... Um, the, uh, oh, I notice this all the time, and I think it's a big safety thing. People run out into the street every night to take their picture in front of the arch. <laughs> the other night, and I, I mean, it was, it was really scary. Uh, the, a couple almost was taken out. And you see them, people running out there all the time in the middle of the street. I had to take a picture of it because I was like, I need to show this at council. Um, and so that's in stage three. I'd like to, you know, so some of these priorities, I'm feeling like that was totally a safety priority mm -hmm. um, to me. So what do we do about like where you put all these different stages? Was there a reason like, hey, this, this goes last, this is, I, I mean, I, I guess I'm trying to figure out. I think out we were prioritizing shade. I think uh, from what we heard from everyone, shade is probably the most wanted what? thing to uh -huh. really let this plaza be naturally activated. It's the, it's the biggest deterrent for people to go down there and using it now. Uh -huh. uh, and so In I the think, day. Yeah. But we and don't so give I them think, any I reason think, uh, to go down there at night. A shade was priority. And there's, no, and there's lots of shade at night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it'll have lighting now in that plaza mm -hmm. as well. 
<laughs> See, activation, yep. activation. Good for day, good for night. <laughs> Midtown. <laughs> All right. Um, so what exactly are we approving? So wait, again, I would like to see the electricity, the overhead lighting, um, the safety component. Is that something RTC should be involved in when we come when we're talking about that? Because I mean, I've heard a whole bunch of different ideas that we could put a little island in the middle of the street, but then you got to run out there. Like what? I mean, those are not listed in this in this proposal. Yeah. Um, creating a selfie spot to create uh, a safe place for people to take a selfie in front of the arch is included in this as in stage three. Um, that is something the Gale Place Making Study looked at. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a little bit challenging with the bike lanes and the lanes we have with no center lane to put an island or something in the middle. Uh, and so that's that's has been a challenge to figure out yeah. how we make okay. taking pictures of the arch safe. Right. I feel like this is a big deal. I'm super excited about it, but I see a lot of times we design without thinking. And I'm not saying in this instance, I'm super excited, but let's just talk about one thing that I look at almost every day and it still looks the same decades, decades later with the um, maroon, the maroon um, paint along the river yeah. is so outdated. But the bigger issue is all the money that we spent um, beautifying that with the fountains, those fountains don't work. They, you know, haven't worked for a long time. So I think it sounds great and practical and all that, but really when you get down to it, it's really not. So I just... I don't know, I, I just get pretty nervous. And I hate to do it, like, it, I just think it's gonna be so huge, huge. it's gonna transform what downtown looks like. Um, this is gonna set the tone. We've prioritized bringing people back into downtown, activating those plazas, this gets us yeah. going. I also didn't see anything on there uh, for covering up blight uh, whenever we have bad actors that are downtown. Um, you know, those types of things either. Nothing in there. No. Um, so what are we No, the placemaking project was, stage one was specifically to focus on locomotion plaza and the design for streetscape improvements. Okay. Um, beyond that, future stages are design of other plazas and doing more micro-mobility through Virginia Street. That is the extent of the placemaking study. Um, during the placemaking study, it did reference the Gill placemaking plan did reference things like uh, the facade improvements and beautification and things like that. So we're still referencing that plan regularly, um, but as the specific implementation plan that they recommended, that is what we're uh, operating off of. Okay, so what, what exactly are we approving then? So let me... Because I feel like we didn't address anything, like some of the concerns. Let me go back. Electricity. We are getting electricity okay. and lighting improvements. Perfect. We're getting the temporary umbrellas for shade. We're getting the six storage containers for beverage service, storage, and retail. We're getting a whole diversity of movable, movable tables, chairs, uh, and heaters. That's, a, that's one I didn't mention. Um, site improvements, fixing the gates and the fence around it, uh, doing the food truck pads, uh, redoing the concrete areas. And then a little bit of contingency based on uh, getting it over the finish line. And then an activation budget and a maintenance and operations budget. That is what we're approving today. Mm -hmm. okay. And this gives us a great plaza and full activation for the next two summers. Okay. Do you have to remove the mural? Can't you leave it on there until it kind of starts to go or no? Um, it'll have another year. Okay. Uh, it was recently repainted. It's just, it constantly needs to, to get repainted. Um, it's been five, six, seven years now that it's been up there. It's been, it's been a while. It's pre-pandemic, so you have to add four years to everything. Yeah. When did it go in? Do you remember? Years ago. Three. The other, the other thing 21. that I want, I'm just curious, maybe Cynthia, you know, why wasn't there done like a walking track and a running track around um, Locomotion Plaza? Like it could have literally been outlined you know, and 12 times around it is a mile. Why wasn't that ever looked at? <laughs> it's and so, we're bringing it's up uh, easy. the total runner here to ask <laughs> like, this question. It, it's such an like, easy get. Well, I think we could certainly 
do something like that on the sidewalk. I mean, there is a full sidewalk all the way around it. Yeah. So what we could do is we could put a marker on there for quarter mile, half mile, whatever. Or let's design it in a way where people would Well, the sidewalk exists. It. So all we need yeah. is some marking, but signage or markings. But I think with some paint mm -hmm. and making it look like it actually is something. Oh, you mean like painting the sidewalk to make it look like a trail? Yes. Like a track. Track. We could certainly look at that. <laughs> if that would make you happy, we can look at that. It would make me happy. Okay. Let's, we can let's utilize okay. the space we have. All right. All right. Um, well, it would I, certainly bring people out. Look how many people walk around Virginia Lake. Uh -huh. And it's just, it brings everybody. And if there was an actual marked out path and everybody knew they were all out there together, but I don't know that it's wide enough. Or Well, I think if we incorporated the dog park. And maybe even That's, the other yeah. one, we could do one whole big, huge space. So we could certainly measure that Figure out. Figure it out. Come yeah. up with a mile Twelve circle. times makes a mile or something. I don't yeah. know. Exactly. Okay, good. Or maybe three. All right. Well, I know everyone's excited about this one. So go ahead, Kathleen uh, or Councilwoman Taylor. I just have, I'm sorry, I have one other question. Oh, go ahead. On this budget, I, I guess I didn't understand this. So we still need another $400,000, 408 Four hundred thousand dollars for design. That's coming out of the one point nope. six. This is no. a, this is all full into that. So there's some contingency built in here to get. So it. of the one point six, though, we're going to spend another four hundred thousand dollars on design. That could be for design for electrical. Sorry, yeah. Amy Pennington. Uh, for the record, that number it's actually a combination of a few line items that have to do with the remaining. Um, contingency for design to get us 100% design as well as all of those numbers that are the budgets for electrical umbrellas storage those are like the actual like the cost of the lighting it doesn't this construction is a construction comma contingency so that's actually the cost of like the construction contract and the contingency in the contract okay so let me ask you a question so it's basically 30% on all of those numbers. The, what was the, what's the total design out of the two million that we allocated, what's design? The design is actually um, Cynthia's contract, which is um, that number, two million minus that. <laughs> three, yeah, three, $300,000, $365,000 is her design contract. So it's, there's just a little bit of contingency in that, and then it's the construction contract. Okay. Well, where is it up there? Because I don't see 360. It's been spent. So it's already been spent. Oh, okay. Yeah. But out of the $2 million, say, let's just do a simple math yeah. for me here. We had $2 million for this yes. out of ARPA. Yes. How much did we spend in design? 365000 Total. Was for, yeah, total. For what? For what? That, that was for all of the um, d design investigation of the site. Um, there's a sm there's a small amount of contingency for design. It, it's okay, but just do. tell us what's in it. <laughs> for the record, Cynthia Albright. So the the design budget included a full survey of the ten blocks on Virginia Street, face ten to blocks. face. Ten blocks. CFA did a survey from the freeway all the way to Liberty, face to face, block to block. Then I had an electrical engineer with Titan Construction and Jensen Engineering study and map every single electrical supply and amount of power and every single outlet and every single source on those 10 blocks. Cool. Then we did a geotechnical investigation. So that was you giving us the bad news? Well, no. <laughs> that was us giving the city, as part of the design budget, all of the information that they need going forward, not just for Locomotion Plaza, but for the streetscape enhancements that will ultimately come over time yeah. for the entire town. But blocks. we didn't know that we did not have electrical down there. Right. Well, what you didn't, you knew that you had some, you just didn't know what you had where. Uh -huh. And so we've created a base map with all of the power and all okay. the circuits and all the amps and all the everything for every single power source on Virginia Street. Okay, awesome. For 10 blocks. For 10 okay. blocks. Okay. Then we also did a geotechnical investigation at Locomotion Plaza for structural design for any shade solution that we design and you ultimately approve. Cool. Then we okay. did... Then, the, then after that, we have uh, light and space doing the electrical design for additional lighting at Locomotion Plaza because we were told that the desire would be to increase the amount of lighting there, plus add LED changeable lighting. Mm -hmm. So we have budget for that. Then we have a structural engineering budget if we need it. And then we have design services, myself and my team. Okay. That's where the 365 went or is going. 
because we haven't spent it yet. So this line item of 418.273 sounds like more of that money is going to come to me when it is not. Mm -hmm. It's really a 30% construction budget as part of the overall construction element, and then a little bit of the um, the little bit of that money is in there for contingency for design development and construction documents, just in case. That's well, is it like is. the three? Excuse me, ma'am. Ma I'm sorry. sorry. Is it like the three hundred forty thousand? that we just approved today for the CHA design? Like that's a percentage of the total cost, five million, that this one? Yes, I, I know what you're asking and I don't know for sure if I can answer the question okay. because I don't know what they're- Yeah, you weren't there, I'm sorry. But, well, I, I listened to it, but what I can tell you is that when you, when you put, for us, because typically we do a conceptual design and then we actually design development and during the design development phase, we come up with costs. Well, because we are who we are in the city and we know where we are with the terms of the money that we have, staff asked us to come up with all of these design, these, these elements of cost now before we do design development. So we've had to put a contingency in there because gotcha. we haven't designed it yet. Mm -hmm. And we know that there's going to be some markup from the contractor, so we put a, a contingency on top of that too. That's where that number comes from. It's just a buffer because we actually haven't done the design yet. We're still doing, we still did conceptual design. So you front loaded the cost, unlike the CHA, yes. where they're going into 30% design and then coming up with the cost. Right. You needed the money knowledge now yes. before you finalize the design. That's right. Okay. So will we get another bite at the apple? Nope. What does that mean, Ashley? <laughs> We're pretty cash here short. this time. And this is not the, this probably is not the item we should have, we really should have had more time on this because I know we're going to regret it. Well, go ahead. Bring it back? And I mean, I'm, I'm of the stage of let's continue. Yeah, huh? I'm fine. Okay. That. All right. Then I'm, I'm just going to cut you off right there. I'm going to make a motion. I would like to move to continue uh, to the next meeting. I don't know. I want, like, I want us, or else, you know what, I'll just meet with them privately. I don't want to approve of anything, but I would like to sit down and ask, like, a hundred questions. And we can arrange for that, Madam Mayor. Ashley, Attorney Assistant City Manager, for the record. I know a lot of the other things that you mentioned, I believe, are going to be part of the Truckee River Plan that will be coming forward to Council next month. You mentioned about the painting. You mentioned about other aspects along the river area. This item was very specific just to Virginia Street from the Gell placemaking study and then locomotion specifically. So what's in front of council today So that's is, good to know. It's only that. Because here I am beating up Cynthia going, where, where are my lights? Oh. Where is my purple paint? Yes. So Should this we? is very specific to just this allocation is just locomotion plaza and the design around future investments on Virginia Street. Okay. Does that answer couple of questions. So a you mentioned bit. about bite at the apple. The other reason why is staff is asking to go forward to be able to approve this design concept today so we can go out to get bids and go to contract. Yeah. Again, because of that December 24 this year, we have to have all of those contracts executed. Yeah. The, I mean, the other thing that I talked about, and um, and it was one of the things, bringing back the art element, is uh, we've seen of like a Wynwood Walls project where the walls can totally change, because otherwise I don't see any artwork um, or, you know, an art element. Yes, the pieces are very artistic. The colors are very, you know, art oriented. But um, I, you know, one of the things that I have, have been saying is like, what about, you know, the walls that can change for different muralists? Um, and those become very Instagrammable, uh, very interactive. Um, what about the, something like that? Yep, I have to turn it over to you. Uh, yeah. uh, Amy Pennington for the record. Um, one of the things that's great about the current design that's in stage one is the containers are really a blank slate. And so if we go to contract now to build this, we actually went through a lot of thought with stage one to make sure that the end product was something that was fully usable now. we like I know the selfie spot's not in there, but the selfie spot, um, if we had a little bit of money, we'd love to do it. But um, all of the other pieces that are built into stage one are like functional building blocks. Like you have to have electricity, you sure. have to have umbrellas, you have to have places for people to yes. sit, you have to have the bar containers for mm -hmm. activation. So, um, but the bars are all quite neutral. And so there's room in the future once they're built to maybe have murals put on them and bring mm -hmm. art to the plaza. There, we have lighting budgets that could 
be LED lights that change color. There's lots of things that can be done to bring vibrancy yeah. in this current okay, budget. Great. And there's time to still decide that even if we approve stage one today. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I do think that the council should come up with a plan to be able to fund everything um, that we want to see come to fruition because honestly, unless we do that, then it just doesn't happen because other things come up, they become a priority. And you know, downtown, if, if you look to see what some of the um, feedback was for downtown. The comments, I mean, there were over <coughs> 450 comments of what people wanted to see downtown. Um, and it was just, you know, constant, like, this is the number one area people want to see revitalized. Um, the perception of downtown isn't good. And so I think we want to give every possible effort to making it the best it can possibly be. So that's where I'm coming from. Do you want to say something, Cynthia? And uh, we'll, we'll move ahead, but let's like sit down and really collaborate because I feel like I, I've only met with Gail maybe twice and it was very sort of surface. Obviously, there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes um, that I really don't know a lot about. I tend to think that staff keeps me in the loop, but then I feel like seeing this, no, not at all. So um, maybe you can make me feel a little bit better. <laughs> For the record, Cynthia Albright, uh, two things. First, I want to say that if if we move forward tonight with a recommendation for approval, I can promise you, if you have time tomorrow, I'll be over there. Any time that you want to meet to go through this in detail, fine tooth comb, everything, I will spend as much time as you need in order to be comfortable with it that we're moving forward. But it's really important that we do move forward with this aspect, with stage one, for the simple reason that we have to the city has to allocate the money before the end of the year. And so we need to come up with our final design and it needs to go out to bid and it needs to be go through the, the bidding process. And mm -hmm. we're going to need as much time as we have possibly available in order to do that. On our schedule that we first prepared, we were supposed to be already into, into design development a month ago. So we're, we're behind schedule, if you mm -hmm. will, because it's just taken us quite a while to get to the point where we all, as a team, yeah. So you're trying to push me. I got no, you. No, no, no. It's okay. I'm just saying that we, we <laughs> want to I want to see the electricity, because we need to have the infrastructure first. Totally. I think you're there's, totally right, 100%. The most, the, so we're going to move forward, but I am doing it reluctantly. OK, well, okay. I promise you okay. we will meet with you. And also, I, I'm thrilled to work with you, Cynthia. You're very talented. So OK, then I'll make the motion, motion to uh, approve, move forward. <laughs> Poor Carrie's like, oh my God, you're giving me a heart attack. Hillary? I'll second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. All right, Madam Clerk. See, that one was a big one. All right, Madam Mayor, we're moving on to item D6, parking enforcement code changes. Oh my gosh, Alex, come on up. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Do we need to do this right now? Do we need to do this? Yes, yes ma'am, we You're do. You're here. Yes, because yeah, we're, we're we do. been a 14-hour day for me so far. So yes, so we have, you are not leaving now. No, no, ma'am. Go ahead. No, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Council and Madam Mayor. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, so this presentation is a follow-up, um, and it's necessary for our intent to bring our civil infractions for parking enforcement violations onto the fee schedule. Best management practice for cities and agencies is that when you have a long list of infractions, civil infractions, unless they're directed by state law, is to have them on a fee schedule. So that way you have the ability every year to review them, and if you want to raise them or keep them steady, you have that ability. Having them codified, you'll see in this presentation, has its downsides. Well, what I'm going to do is first uh, give you a little bit of background on the actual history of Title 6.30, Chapter 6.30 on civil infractions, and I'm gonna show you some comparisons of our infractions as they exist today compared to other cities. Then I'm gonna show you some um, antiquated or archaic uh, code sections that we still have in there that we are going to be removing because we don't want to bring over these citations or these infractions that we don't even cite if we're gonna change it from the code into the fee schedule. So with that, I'm going to uh, start. So the, the chapter was first adopted in 1990 at that time, the parking enforcement officers who are responsible for um, enforcing these parking infractions, citations, they were not identified in the code. Uh, the majority of the infractions have never increased. That means since 1990, 
The city has never increased them, and that, once again, is because they were codified. It's difficult. So the council never got to see them on a yearly basis. And in the process of looking at those infractions, I sat down with the officers, and we identified over 25 of those violations that are archaic, obsolete, they never issue a citation for them. So obviously we're not gonna bring those over into the fee schedule. We need to remove those. And if we're gonna remove them, we also need to remove the uh, code sections that are also um, archaic or obsolete. So here what we have is a, uh, an example of what our current infractions, these are our top 10 citations that we issued. So we wanted to compare them to the other cities around us. City of Boise, City of Sacramento, City of North Las Vegas, and then you'll see over to the right, the City of Sparks. That's the one that stands out the most. As you'll notice on our um, column, it's all in the 20s and 30s, mostly 20. The average is 25. Notice that compared to the average of $89 at the City of Sparks. That's what happens when you have these uh, citations codified and not on a fee schedule where you have the ability to look at it, and so do we as staff, and say, okay, we need to increase these uh, citations. Keep in mind, that's also the reason why we continue to see 700 to 900 violations a month that we get uh, complaints from our citizenry. Because obviously these, for lack of a better term, these very small citations aren't deterring the violations as we would like them to. And as part of uh, the review of those citations, these are the type of um, existing codes that we have. Shall not let the vehicle stand without removing the key. Well, we all know nowadays no one even puts a key in the ignition <laughs> anymore. So True. we never issue a citation for that. Unlawful to park in the travel lane of highway, we don't issue citation for that. Either we tow the vehicle or the police department has the vehicle removed if we have a vehicle in the travel lane. Um, unlawful to park on a highway adjacent to a school, that's obsolete. A uh, bus or cab cannot park outside of a designated spot. We have signed spots and they're specific for those vehicles. Um, unlawful to park in front of a theater entrance, we've never cited for that. Unlawful to park in front of a hotel entrance, park in a hotel loading zone over 10 minutes. We have loading zone laws regardless of wherever they exist. So we really don't need these specific um, for specific businesses. Uh, lighted headlights shall be dimmed while parked. Well, we know nowadays you can't even turn off a headlight if you wanted to. Okay. They're all, they stay, they remain in the on position. So our recommendation before you today, uh, Council, is um, we um, are requesting to be able to update the RMC Chapter 6.30, strengthen the language as it exists, remove um, those uh, archaic or obsolete sections of the code, um, update the, that list of infractions. We want to make sure we correlate our code with the uh, current NRS that is exists and remove any, uh, remove all the fines from the chapter and move them over to an annual fee schedule, fine fee schedule that you have the ability to review. And so will us, and this is standard every year, every department gets to review our fines, our fees, and some we do raise and some we don't. And then of course that goes before you and then ultimately you have uh, the ultimate say. And my recommendation is uh, I move to accept the report. All right, thank, thank you. you so much. Great job. Um, just really quickly. Yes, ma'am. Is there any like rhyme or reason they're like, because Sparks was wow. And when did they change theirs last time? Yeah. And it just, to me, I couldn't see anything other than like Boise. It looked like it was pretty stable and this is the sort, which I'm not so sure that's a good idea because everyone starts to become kind of immune to the different that violations like one is more important than the other like the fire lane correct exactly and that's what's good too because then we have the ability to <coughs> see the trends so if we're getting more uh, people parking in the fire lane well obviously we need to raise that because it's not deterring but the city of sparks um the 89 dollars is being their average 29 dollars of that is their court fee because they do go through the courts so without that court fee, it would be $60, but that's still significantly more than our average $25. Okay, thank you. Good job, Alex. Thank you. Ma okay, go ahead, Councilwoman Dewar. Yeah, I want to make, I am totally fine with taking this out of, out of the code, absolutely. Um, what I'm not sure, are you proposing any rates today? No, no ma'am. Okay. No. All right, when would you be replacing uh, that, that, would, the rates? that would be as part of the uh, budget um, So here's process. my challenge with that. Um, the budget, we have pages and pages and pages and pages of fees. Mm -hmm. Even with parks reducing their fees, you haven't seen this, it goes like 40 pages of, or something of fees. And you can't com comprehend them. I would love, since this is such a big change, I would love it if you brought it back and just showed us what 
the fees are so we could focus on it, not at the same time we're looking at 400 other fees. Okay. So I'm totally supportive of what you want to do. Um, I'd just like to see it somehow separate so we could grasp it. Okay. All right, thanks. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Councilwoman Ebert. No? Yeah. Um, I had a question on the expired parking meters. Do we currently have like somebody that goes around and checks them? Do we have enforcement specifically for that, or is that just kind of it gets checked? Yes, ma'am. Our parking enforcement officers check those. Okay. Okay. And are is there any issues with our meters or anything? Are we going to need to replace them anytime soon? Is there anything we need to be worried about with the budget regarding our actual parking meters? Not that I'm aware of. No, okay. Ma'am. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Sending it to you, uh, Councilwoman Taylor, since I'm going to go with the majority of the parking meters are in your ward. I, did, I'm, I move to accept the report. <laughs> I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? aye. Motion carries unanimously. Okay, thanks. Great job. Such a good job, Alex. Okay, right, Madam, Madam Mayor, Clark. we're back to item B11. Councilwoman Dewar, I believe this was you. Yep. Go ahead. Oh, no, B11 was Councilmember Ebert. Oh, sorry. Councilwoman Ebert, go ahead. See, we're just getting you back, Chris, because you had to leave early last time. So we want to make sure you have to stay this Fair way. is fair. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here. I'll come back to um, that item. Let's go back to Councilman uh, Dewar, pulled yeah. one. Uh, I'd like to call Megan Burner. Okay, let's um, do it. This is the most um, expensive art we've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> We're just catching you off guard. you got to wake up, Megan. <laughs> We were right <laughs> for a I, minute. We were, but we're just waiting for yeah. Councilwoman Ebert. But listen, um, this is five hundred twenty-five thousand. I think the full budget something like seven hundred twenty-five thousand. Um, earlier today, not that long ago, I sent you a letter from a constituent, Barbara <laughs> Fenny, who had a lot of recommendations or concerns about the art in, at the pool. Her, she loves the art. She actually thought she saw. I haven't seen it, so the reason I pulled it off was so all of council could just see what's being proposed. Number two, um, I know that you cut the budget back to leave money for maintenance. So when you explain to us what's being approved, is it glass, is it acrylic, what is it? Is it susceptible to graffiti, is it up high, low? What's the story? What are we looking for? How excited can we be? Very excited, okay. Um, good evening, <laughs> Madam Mayor, City Council. Megan Berner, Arts and Culture Manager. For the record, I do have a presentation. I, I heard it's amazing, so we should yes, be prepared it's, to be it's wowed. It's gorgeous. Um, I was here almost exactly a year ago at the start of this process, um, talking about the process for the public art and at the um, call for artists and those things. And so um, this is one of the artist renderings here on this first slide. But I was going to do a quick overview. We're at where the little blue square is approval of the artist and the design proposal for the Moana Springs Aquatics and Fitness Center Public Art. We did a whole process before this, put out a call for artists. It was an RFQ. It was narrowed down to five finalists. We did robust community engagement at various parts of the process. Um, the finalists got to engage with the public, and then we also did online surveys. And then um, at the end of that, we selected one artist, which is Michelle Gutlove, Studio GH, um, which is in front of you today. And an overview of the budget, there was 700,000 total allocated in that 2% for art. Per our code in RMC 22, we take 15% for administration of the project, and that includes things like finalist travel, they come for on-site visits, uh, proposal stipends for the work that the artists do those kinds of things. And then there's 10% that comes out for public art maintenance. And then that took our total for the public art budget to 525,000. So that's where that number comes from. The call, um, this was working with city staff 
et cetera, to identify these spaces for artwork. So we actually asked for five spaces to be programmed with artwork. One was the parking grounds, one was the entrance lobby, the front facade. There's a back facade by the soaking pool there in the lower left corner and then in the main corridor. And so um, Michelle Gutlove proposed these works. You can see this is, this is actually uh, steel, but behind it you can see the light reflections happening. And so this artist actually does work in glass. Um, they're pieces of formed glass with dry dichroic coatings on them that reflect light, and she has lights positioned there to create these reflections. So she was very inspired by the mountains around the site when they came for the visit. They were looking at the area around and the views um, and the light in the sky, the clouds, things like that, and that's kind of where her inspiration came from. So she has something similar on the backside at the South Pool. And then this is the main corridor hallway. So those pieces, by the way, are up high, out of reach. So they're not touchable. You know, somebody, yes. So it's not the a... front of the pool. It's the back. There's that... some on the front, too. So this is... is the front facade of the building, the north side. And this is the south soaking pool. Um, and then this is the main corridor. So there's this long corridor that goes back to, like, the locker rooms and the, the pools. Um, and she's created this incredible, I think it looks kind of like underwater, like light reflecting underwater. <laughs> um, she's calling these skyscapes and mountainscapes. But, so they're glass pieces. There's a channel there between that sort of drop ceiling and the wall and the glass pieces and the lighting tracks are in there. And they create these reflections on the wall. And then there's also artwork that she created for the lobby space. And those are also out of reach. And is this a light reflection or is that a mobile or what is that? It's this, the, the blue pieces yeah. are actually glass pieces hanging. It is a mobile, but mm -hmm. of glass pieces. Yep. Okay. Or mobile. Or suspended art, yeah. Okay. okay. I'm not sure how much movement there will be there because of you know yeah. seismic restrictions okay. and things like that. But All right, are you done? No. So the, and then the playground space, there was this. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> Sorry, Matt. There you go. I'm like, okay, wait a minute. So, yes, there is funding okay. for maintenance allocated in this. Yeah. Just a quick question. Um, the one on the front, the only question I have, first of all, it looks beautiful. Uh, it already looks beautiful at Moana because, as you noted, the siding is metal. I was so inspired by it. I was thinking about putting on my own house. It's like metal siding. It's amazing. But let me ask you on the front, will any of that reflect back into the parking lot? Like, is it reflective back? I, I, all I'm worried about is um, I didn't know if that's reflected onto or will be reflected back into like drivers and people walking outside. The, that's the only thing the, I was worried about. The light or like light reflecting off of the metal? Can I, the, well, the light is, is not reflecting the light off the metal. Reflect. Yeah. No. It's, it's designed so that it creates these reflections onto the wall. <laughs> okay. And I don't think that they're, they're, they won't reflect out into That's you know, what I was wondering. driver's vision, but I don't think they're bright enough really to do that either to okay. create it. Okay. Well, just a cautionary note, because I know even sometimes even sitting in a restaurant or coffee house when the, peop the people are parked or whatever, the lights shine in. And it, the reflections off the cars are make it very difficult. I didn't want us to incidentally create a system where people are being blinded in the parking lot. That's all I was concerned about with that one. It looks phenomenal. I'm ready to make a motion. Okay, thank you so much. Um, really quickly, because I've had a lot of people ask me about the cost, and I think there, the formula is dependent on the cost of the whole overall project. Yes. 2%. All right, 2%. Just a lot of people are like, why are we spending this kind of money? But it's already, I mean, it's, it's something It's been in ordinance for over 10 years. Yeah. Well, people go out there and say, oh, my God, and it's already, you yes. know, done. So, okay. All right. Thank you. Um, I have a motion. Yeah, I make a motion to approve the uh, approval of artist Michelle Gutlove for the Moana Springs community. Wait, also, is she local? She is not. Uh, she lives on the East Coast. Um, <laughs> but I do want to say I think we should start 
to make sure that local art gets um, a priority in the city. I, that, it, it hurts my heart. We have incredible artists in the city and it just, and don't get me wrong, that is stunning, it's gorgeous. But I really wanna see us invest and create jobs for our local artists. Um, you know, I just, that hurts my heart, I don't like it. Anyway, okay, I have a motion and a second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, motion carries. Thanks, Megan, great job. All right, Chris is like, finally, I you finally. Be last. I you be last. Chris is, is Chris the last victim? I think so. <laughs> 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 On a consent. Good evening, consent. everyone. Council Chris Woman Pingree, Hebert. Director of Development <laughs> Services. Go I did ahead. not provide a presentation for this as this is a standard operating procedure <laughs> and a contract <laughs> that we've used for many years and we are just <laughs> continuing this contract into the next five years. Oh my gosh, Chris, I am so, so sorry. <laughs> I am so sorry. It's okay. Go We're ahead, Councilman Ebert. Go ahead. <laughs> I just had a question. What Estella software does? Just to have it on the record, if somebody you know is is going through our agenda, what is Estella? Are you okay, Kathleen? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize we'd be doing this at nine thirty when same, I pulled same. it this right, morning. Right. But you know what? And here's what I would just say: like sometimes you guys got to help us out because this obviously isn't going to take long. And yeah, you just get, I, it's really like yeah. a two sentence answer. Yeah. And so he's been here all day. Excella yeah. is our platform that we use for all permitting <laughs> and all things related to development services, business license uses. So it's our it's our global, we are a regional partner with the other jurisdictions within the region um, that we are obligated to use the Excella platform. But we have individualized our own system to use virtual and digital um, technology to help enhance the paperless process. And so Excella with this contract is up to $250,000 a year if need be. They raised their rates from $150 an hour to $165 an hour over the course of the last contract. And we're just bringing that forward as really a technicality of the, we earmark 5% of our revenue that goes to Excella for the maintenance and operations and enhancements for that on an annual basis. Okay, thank you. Uh, motion to approve. Quick question, just yes. one, you did a great job. I just have a quick question. <laughs> Let me ask you this. Do you think there will be a time that um, we will move away from Asala? You know, we have invested so much time and energy and, it, and, and there are still things that could be improved in it, um, but we have been able to go just about 90% paperless over the last, since COVID, okay. um, to reduce the amount of traffic and trip traffic to City Hall and the, the, the burden of carrying paper and transferring paper. Yeah. Um, so until we come up with something better and as a yeah. region, we would have to opt out still of Still works, okay. Yeah. All right, good job. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, I have a motion. Give me a second. 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 All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you so much. Okay, Madam Clerk. We're off of our game here because if you guys remember before COVID, we, this was very common for us to have council meetings that go till 10 o'clock yeah. at night. Well, one of the challenges too is just, um, we had gotten down to about 45 minutes of public comment and today we had almost three hours. <laughs> three hours and that yeah. just sets the, yeah. pushes the know. agenda back. Right. I forgot All right, Madam Mayor, we're on item G1, which is an appointment to the Ward 2 Neighborhood Advisory Board. Yeah, uh, thank you. I'd like to appoint, um, reappoint Patrick Fisher and Stacy Shin, and then I'd like to appoint Audrey Keller. All right, I have a motion. Can I have a second? Second. I have a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those aye. opposed? Aye. Motion carries. All right, Madam Clerk. Thank you. We're on item G2, which is a staff or as a appointment to the Ward 4 Neighborhood Advisory Board. All right. And Man. one more thing on the G1. I mean, these can take effect immediately, right? I have a NAB meeting coming up. I mean, do we have to? I mean, I hope so. I'm planning to have them come anyway. That's fine. Okay. Even if they weren't, just bring, have yeah, I will. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, my appointment, it will be Rebecca Flannery, who we heard from today several times. So I'll be reaching okay. out to her tomorrow to talk more about the uh, White Lake uh, development. Oh, good. Okay. I have a motion. Yeah. Second. Do I, I have a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Thanks. All those aye. opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay. All right, we're on item G3, which is an appointment to the Ward 5 Neighborhood Advisory Board. Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I move to appoint the reappointment of Gary Cecil and Bryce Chisholm. All right, I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Good 
Good choices. Okay, next. We're on item H1, city council comments. Any comments? Dare we? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Council, Councilwoman Tabler, would you like to comment? No, Madam Mayor. Okay. <laughs> I just had to see her face. Okay. Um, next, count, uh, next, Madam Clerk. Go ahead. We're on item J1, which is closing public comment. If you're in Zoom and would like to make public comment, please raise your hand at this time. For the record, we did receive closing public comments either after 4 p.m. yesterday um, or items throughout the day that were general in nature. We received seven letters of support, four letters of opposition, and six letters of concern for a total of 17. Those have been distributed to the Reno City Council and are a part of the permanent record. And at this time, I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. All right. Okay, I have a motion. Motion to a second. I have a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those aye. opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Good job. Didn't have to ask for that motion. All right.